Talmud, Mas Medicoth A C H A P T E R I Mishnah. All meal offerings from which the handful was taken under any other name and their own are valid save that they do not discharge the obligation of the owner with the exception of the sinner's meal offering and the meal offering of jealousy as to the sinner's meal offering and the meal offering of jealousy if the handful was taken therefrom under any other name than their own or if they were put into the vessel or brought nigh or burnt under any. Other name than their own or under their own and another name or under another name and their own they are invalid. How can they be under their own and another name if offered as a sinner's meal offering and as a free will meal offering and how can they be under another name and their own if offered as a free will meal offering and as a sinner's meal offering tomorrow? Why does the mission state say that it could have simply stated but they do not discharge the obligation of the owner it teaches? This the owner's obligation is not thereby discharged, but the meal offering itself is in each case valid and it is therefore forbidden to make any further changes with regard to it. This is in accordance with Rabba for Rabba said if a burnt offering was slaughtered under any name other than its own, it is nevertheless forbidden to sprinkle its blood under any other name than its own. You may if you wish explain this by logical reasoning or if you wish by reference to a verse you may if you wish. Explain this by logical reasoning is it to be permitted because a change has been made with regard to it to go on making more and more changes or if you wish by reference to a verse for it is written that which is done out of thy lips thou shalt observe and do according as thou hast vowed unto the Lord thy God a free will offering a free will offering it is a vow is it not hence the verse is to be explained thus if thou hast done according as thou hast vowed then it is a votive offering and if not it shall be a free will offering Talmud, Mas Menachoth B and is it permitted to make any changes in respect of the free will offering must we say that our mission is not in agreement with the view of our Simeon for it was taught our Simeon says all meal offerings from which the handful was taken under any other name than their own are valid and they also discharge the obligation of the owner since meal offerings are unlike animal offerings for if the priest takes the handful from a meal. Offering prepared on a griddle and expressly refers to it as one prepared in a pan his intention is of no consequence for the preparation thereof clearly indicates that he is dealing with one prepared on a griddle or if he is dealing with a dry meal offering and expressly refers to it as mingled with oil his intention is of no consequence for the preparation thereof clearly indicates that he is dealing with a dry meal offering but with animal offerings it is not so the same. Slaughtering is for all offerings the same manner of receiving the blood for all and the same manner of sprinkling for all this indeed presents no difficulty according to our Ashi who said here he took the handful from that which was prepared on a griddle and referred to it as prepared in a pan there he took the handful from a meal offering prepared on a griddle and referred to it as a meal offering prepared in a pan for our mission is a case where one meal offering was referred to as another. Meal offering, but what can be said according to the answer suggested by Rabbah and Rabbah? For should you accept the answer suggested by Rabbah, namely here the change was as regards the offering there, as regards the owner. The difficulty of reconciling our Simeon's view with that of our mission remains. For our mission speaks of the change as regards the offering, since it reads, How can they be under their own and another name if offered as a sinner's meal offering and as a free will meal offering? And should you accept the answer suggested by Rabbah, namely here he took the handful out of a meal offering and referred to it as another meal offering there, he took the handful out of a meal offering and referred to it as an animal offering. The difficulty also remains for our mission speaks of a meal offering being referred to as another meal offering, since it reads, And how can they be under another name and their own if offered as a free will meal offering and as a sinner's meal offering? It is clear then that according to Rabbah and Rabbah, our mission is not in agreement with our Simeon. Now I can point out a contradiction between the words of our Simeon here and the words of our Simeon elsewhere, for it has been taught our Simeon says it is written it is most holy as the sin offering and as the guilt offering that is some meal offerings are like the sin offering and some like the guilt offering the sinner's meal offering is like the sin offering so that if the priest took the handful therefrom under any other name than its own it would be invalid as is the sin offering in such circumstances the free will meal offering is like the guilt offering so that if he took the handful therefrom under any other name than its own it would remain valid and as the guilt offering that is as the guilt offering is valid even when offered under any other name than its own but does not satisfy the obligation of the owner so the free will meal offering is valid but does not satisfy the Obligation of the owner Rabbah answered it is no contradiction here the change was as regards the offering there as regards the owner thereupon Abbe said to him but consider since it is established by analogy that according to divine law wrongful intention renders the offering invalid what difference does it make whether the change was as regards the offering or as regards the owner he replied the rule of our Simeon that the preparation thereof clearly indicates the true nature of it. Offering is founded on reason for our Simeon generally expounds the reasons of scriptural law therefore a wrongful intention which is not manifestly absurd the divine law declares capable of rendering an offering invalid but a wrongful intention which is manifestly absurd the divine law declares incapable of rendering invalid Nemotic of burnt offering he nipped off a burnt offering he drained a sin offering of a bird most holy sacrifices lesser holy sacrifices in that case it should follow. That if the priest nipped off the head of a burnt offering of a bird above the red line which went around the altar under the name of a sin offering of a bird, it discharges the owner since the treatment thereof indicates plainly that it is a burnt offering of a bird, for if it were a sin offering of a bird, he would have performed the nipping below the red line. Do you think the sin offering of a bird may not be performed above the red line? Surely a master has stated that the nipping of the sin offering of a bird may be performed at any place on the altar again if he drained the blood of a burnt offering of a bird above the red line under the name of a sin offering of a bird, it should discharge the owner since the treatment thereof indicates plainly that it is a burnt offering, for if it were a sin offering, he would have drained it below the red line and would also have first sprinkled the blood upon the side of the altar Talmud, Mas Menachoth, it might be said. That it is now being drained, the sprinkling having already taken place, and as for its being drained above the red line, has not the master stated that wherever upon the altar the blood was drained, it is valid again if he sprinkled the blood of the sin offering of a bird below the red line under the name of a burnt offering of a bird, it should discharge the owner since the treatment thereof indicates plainly that it is a sin offering of a bird, for if it were a burnt offering of a bird, he would have performed the sprinkling above the red line and would also have drained out the blood. This is so, but did he not say since meal offerings are unlike animal offerings, yes, unlike animal offerings, but not unlike bird offerings again if one slaughtered most holy sacrifices on the north side of the altar under the name of lesser holy sacrifices, they should discharge the owner since the treatment thereof indicates plainly that they are most holy sacrifices for if they were. Lesser holy sacrifices the slaughtering surely would have been performed on the south side. No, the rule of the divine law is that lesser holy sacrifices may be slaughtered even on the south side, but not on the south side to the exclusion of the north. For we have learned the lesser holy sacrifices may be slaughtered in any part of the temple court. Again, if one slaughtered lesser holy sacrifices on the south side under the name of most holy sacrifices, they should discharge the owner since the treatment thereof indicates plainly that they are lesser holy sacrifices. For if they were most holy sacrifices, the slaughtering would surely have been performed on the north side. It might be said that they really were most holy sacrifices, but that the slaughterer had transgressed the law and slaughtered them on the south side. If so, in the case where a meal offering prepared on a griddle was referred to as one prepared in a pan, it might also be said that the owner had vowed a meal. Offering prepared in a pan and the priest when taking the handful therefrom rightly referred to it as prepared in a pan for it was to be a meal offering prepared in a pan but he the owner had transgressed and brought one prepared on a griddle there even though he had vowed a meal offering prepared in a pan if he brought it prepared on a griddle it must be treated as prepared on a griddle as we have learned if a man said I take it upon myself to bring a meal offering prepared on a griddle and he brought one prepared in a pan or if he said a meal offering prepared in a pan and he brought one prepared on a griddle what he has brought he has brought but he has not discharged the obligation of his vow but perhaps he used the expression this as we have learned if he said let this meal be brought as a meal offering prepared on a griddle and he brought it prepared in a pan or if he said let this meal be brought as a meal offering prepared in a pan and he brought it prepared on
Expressly referred to it as a guilt offering for robbery or for sacrilege. Moreover, if one slaughtered the guilt offering for robbery or for sacrilege under the name of the Passover offering, it should discharge the owner since the Passover lamb must be in its first year, whereas the others must be in their second year. In truth, people don't usually distinguish between an animal in its first year and one in its second year, for an animal in its first year may sometimes look like one in its second year and one in its second year may look like one in its first year again. If one slaughtered a he goat under the name of a guilt offering, it should discharge the owner since the one has wool and the other here people might think that it is a black ram again. If one slaughtered a calf or a bullock under the name of the Passover offering or a guilt offering, it should discharge the owner since a calf or a bullock cannot serve as a Passover offering or as a guilt offering. This is Indeed, so Talmud, Moss Medico B, and by the term animal offerings, he meant the majority of animal offerings. Rob answered, It is no contradiction here. He took the handful out of a meal offering and referred to it as another meal offering. There, he took the handful out of a meal offering and referred to it as an animal offering. Where one meal offering was referred to as another meal offering, it discharges the owner's obligation, for it is written, and this is the law of the meal offering. There is but one law for all meal offerings. Where a meal offering was referred to as an animal offering, it does not discharge the owner's obligation, for it is written, and this is the law of the meal offering, but it is not written of the animal offering, but did not the ten our Simeon say for the preparation thereof clearly indicates the true nature of the offering he meant thus, although the expressed statement clearly does not correspond with the actual offering, and consequently it should be invalid yet it is not so for it is written and this is the law of the meal offering there is but one law for all meal offerings then what is the meaning of the statement but with animal offerings it is not so it means in spite of the fact that the same manner of slaughtering is for all offerings it is written and this is the law of the meal offering and not of the animal offering in that case if one slaughtered a sin offering brought on account of eating forbidden fat under the name of a sin offering brought on account of eating blood or under the name of a sin offering brought on account of idolatry or under the name of the sign offering of the Nazi rite or of the leper it should be valid and also discharge the owner for the divine law says this is the law of the sin offering there is but one law for all sin offerings according to our Simeon it is indeed so and as for the view of the rabbis Rabbi said if one slaughtered a sin offering brought on account of eating Forbidden fat under the name of a sin offering brought on account of eating blood or under the name of a sin offering brought on account of idolatry it is valid if he slaughtered it under the name of the sin offering of the Nazi rite or of the leper it is invalid because with each of these there is a burnt offering to Araha the son of Rob reports that it is invalid in every case for it is written and he shall slaughter it for a sin offering that is for that particular sin Arashi answered. It is no contradiction here he took the handful out of that which was prepared on a griddle and referred to it as prepared in a pan there he took the handful out of a meal offering prepared on a griddle and referred to it as a meal offering prepared in a pan where what is prepared on a griddle is referred to as prepared in a pan it discharges the owner's obligation for the wrongful intention is in respect of the vessel used and a wrongful intention in respect of the vessel used does not. Invalidate the offering where a meal offering prepared on a griddle is referred to as a meal offering prepared in a pan. It does not discharge the owner's obligation for the wrongful intention is in respect of a meal offering and it is thereby rendered invalid. But did not the Tanah Simeon say for the preparation thereof clearly indicates the true nature of the offering he meant thus although the expressed statement clearly does not correspond with the actual offering and consequently it should be invalid yet it is not so for the intention is in respect of the vessel and any wrongful intention in respect of the vessel does not invalidate the offering then what is the meaning of the statement but with animal offerings it is not so it means in spite of the fact that the same manner of slaughtering is for all offerings and the same manner of receiving the blood and sprinkling it for all offerings the wrongful intention is in respect of the slaughtering and it is thereby. Rendered invalid Araha the son of Rab asked Arashi then why does our Simeon say that it discharges the owner's obligation where a dry meal offering was referred to as one mingled with oil he replied the intention was for anything that is mingled if so when referring to a burnt offering as a peace offering it might also be taken to mean anything that brings about peace there is no comparison at all there the actual sacrifice is termed Shalemim peace offering as it is written he that offered the blood of the Shalemim which means he that sprinkles the blood of the peace offering but here is the meal offering ever referred to simply as Bala mingled it is written and every meal offering mingled with oil Bala Biashim or dry it is indeed referred to as mingled with oil but never as mingled by itself now they all do not adopt Rabba's answer for they say on the contrary an intention which is manifestly absurd the divine law declares capable of rendering it. Offering invalid, they also do not adopt Rabba's answer, for they do not accept his interpretation of the verse, and this is the law of the meal offering, and they do not all adopt Arashi's answer because of the difficulty raised by Araha, the son of Rabba, that which is clear to Rabba in one way and is clear to Rabba in the opposite way is a matter of doubt to Arhashai, for Arhashai put the question, others say Arhashai put the question to RC where one referred to a meal offering as an animal. Offering Talmud, Mas Menikotha, what would be Arsimian's view? Is this the reason for Arsimian's opinion, namely that a wrongful intention which is manifestly absurd does not invalidate the offering, and here also the intention is manifestly absurd, or is it this, namely it is written, and this is the law of the meal offering, but it is not written of the animal offering, he replied, we cannot fathom Arsimian's mind, he would not give Rabba's answer because of Abbe's objection to it, nor Rabba's. Answer because of the objection from the verse, and this is the law of the sin offering, nor Arashi's answer because of the objection raised by Araha the son of Rabba, with the exception of the sinner's meal offering and the meal offering of jealousy. It is indeed clear with regard to the sinner's meal offering for the divine law terms it is sin offering as it is written, he shall put no oil upon it, neither shall he put any frankincense thereon, for it is a sin offering, but whence do we know it with regard to the meal offering of jealousy from the following which Atana recited before Arnaman the surplus of the meal offering of jealousy was used for public free will offerings, whereupon he Arnaman said to him, Well spoken indeed for the expression iniquity is used with regard to it as well as with regard to the sin offering, and as the surplus of the sin offering goes for public free will offerings, so the surplus of the meal offering of jealousy goes for public free will offerings and Again, like the sin offering is the sin offering is invalid if offered under any other name than its own, so the meal offering of jealousy is also invalid if offered under any other name than its own. In that case, the guilt offering should also be invalid if offered under any name other than its own, since one can infer it from the sin offering by means of the common expression iniquity. We may infer iniquity from iniquity, but we may not infer iniquity from his iniquity. But what does this like? Variation matter was it not taught in the school of Arishmael that in the verses and the priest shall come again and, and the priest shall come in coming again and coming in have the same import for purposes of deduction. Moreover, one can infer his iniquity stated in connection with the guilt offering from his iniquity stated in connection with the hearing of the voice of adoration where it is written, if he do not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. Indeed, the inference from the sin. Offering relates only to the surplus that it shall go for free will offerings should you however retort surely an inference cannot be restricted to one point I answer that the divine law has expressly stated it with regard to the sin offering as it is written and he shall slaughter it for a sin offering it namely the sin offering if slaughtered under its own name is valid but under any name other than its own is invalid whereas all other offerings are valid whether offered under their own or under any other name then whence do we know that the sinner's meal offering and the meal offering of jealousy are invalid if offered under any name other than their own why is it that this is so regarding the sin offering because there is written it is a sin offering with these two there is written it is then with the guilt offering we also find it is that it's stated after the burning of the sacrificial parts as it was taught but with regard to the guilt offering the expression it is is stated after the burning of the sacrificial parts, and if the sacrificial parts thereof were not burnt at all, it is valid. Then what is the purpose of the expression? It is in the case of the guilt offering. It is required for the teaching of our who not in the name of Rab is if a guilt offering that was assigned to pasture was slaughtered without any specified purpose. It is valid as a burnt offering that is so only if it was assigned to pasture. But if it was not so assigned, it is not
them under any name other than their own they are invalid for they are brought in order to render the person fit and they have not done so an objection was raised we have learned all animal offerings that were slaughtered under any name other than their own are valid save that they do not discharge the obligation of the owner with the exception of the Passover offering and the sin offering now if the above ruling of Rab were correct then it should have also stated with the exception of the guilt offering of the Nazirite and the guilt offering of the leper for they are brought in order to render the person fit and they have not done so since there is also the guilt offering for robbery and the guilt offering for sacrilege which are brought for atonement the Tana therefore could not have stated it absolutely why is it that the guilt offering of the Nazirite and the guilt offering of the leper if slaughtered under another name are invalid it is, is it not because they are Brought in order to render the person fit and they have not done so then with the other guilt offerings too it might be said they are brought to make atonement and they have not done so our Jeremiah answered it is because we find that scripture distinguishes between sacrifices that bring about atonement and those that render the person fit those that bring about atonement are sometimes brought after death whereas those that render the person fit are never brought after death as we have learned if a woman had brought her sin offering and then died her ears must bring her burnt offering but if she had first brought her burnt offering and then died her ears need not bring her sin offering are due to the son of our Simeon because he demurred but are not sacrifices that render the person fit also brought after death surely we have learned if a man set apart money for his Nazi right offerings it is forbidden to make any other use of it yet there would be no infringement of the law of Sacrilege since it may all be used for the purchase of peace offerings if he died and the money was not yet apportioned for the respective offerings it all goes for free will offerings if it was apportioned the price of the sin offering must be cast into the dead sea no use may be made of it yet if one did there would be no infringement of the law of sacrilege with the price of the burnt offering a burnt offering must be brought and the law of sacrilege applies to it with the price of it. Peace offering a peace offering must be brought which must be eaten the same day but it does not require the bread offering now or not the burnt offering and the peace offering of the Nazi right brought in order to render him fit and yet are brought after death said our Papa this is what our Jeremiah meant we do not find an absolute offering serving to render the person fit that can be brought after death for as regards the Nazi right the offering which serves to render him fit is not absolute. Talmud, Masmanikotha for a master has said if the Nazirite shaved his head after the sacrifice of any one of the three offerings he has fulfilled his obligation and objection was raised if the guilt offering of a leper was slaughtered under any name other than its own or if the blood thereof was not put upon the thumb and great toe of the one to be cleansed it may nevertheless be offered upon the altar and it requires the drink offerings but another guilt offering is necessary in order to render him fit this is indeed a refutation of Rab's view our Simeon Belagish said if the priest took the handful from the meal offering of the Omer under any name other than its own it is valid but the rest of it may not be eaten until another Omer meal offering has been brought and rendered it permitted but surely if the rest of it may not be eaten how may it the handful be offered it is written from the liquor of Israel that is from that which is permitted to Israel or Adabi. Ahab said Rush Lakish is of the opinion that the prohibition of out of time does not apply to the same day are added the son of our Isaac raised an objection some conditions apply to bird offerings which do not apply to meal offerings and some conditions apply to meal offerings which do not apply to bird offerings some conditions apply to bird offerings a bird offering may be brought as a voluntary offering by two people jointly it is brought by those that lack atonement and an exception to the general prohibition is made for consecrated birds these however do not apply to meal offerings and some conditions apply to meal offerings a meal offering requires a vessel it requires waving and bringing nigh it may be the offering of the community or of the individual these however do not apply to bird offerings now if the aforesaid view were correct then with regard to meal offerings it can also be said that an exception to the general prohibition was made for that which is consecrated Namely in the case of the meal offering of the Omer since the prohibition of out of time does not apply to the same day it is not regarded as a prohibition at all our sheets raised an objection if the application of the oil was performed before the application of the blood he the priest must fill up the log of oil and must again apply the oil after applying the blood if the oil was applied on the thumb and great toe before it was sprinkled seven times before the Lord he must fill up it. Log of oil and must again apply it on the thumb and great toe after the oil has been sprinkled seven times. Now, if you are right in saying that the prohibition of out of time does not apply to the same day, why must the priest do it again after all what is done is done? Our Papa answered, It is different with the rights of the leper since the expression shall be as written with regard to them as it is written, this shall be the law of the leper shall be implies that it shall always be so. Our Papa raised an objection if his sin offering was slaughtered before his guilt offering, one should not be appointed to keep stirring the blood until the guilt offering had been brought, but the appearance of the flesh must be allowed to pass away and it must be taken away to the place of burning. But why does our Papa raise this objection? Did not our Papa say that the law is different with regard to the rights of the leper since the expression shall be as used with regard to them? Our Papa had felt this. Difficulty perhaps this law only affected what was a service but slaughtering is no service now if it is correct to say that the prohibition of out of time does not apply to the same day then someone might keep stirring the blood of the sin offering whilst the guilt offering is being offered and then the sin offering can be offered rather said our papa this is the reason for Rush Lakish's view he is of the opinion that the daybreak of the 16th day of Nisan renders the new harvest permitted for both our Yohanan and Rush Lakish said even when the temple was in existence Talmud, Mos Menachoth B it was the daybreak that rendered the new harvest permitted this view of Rush Lakish was not expressly stated but was inferred from the following we have learned one may not offer meal offerings first fruits or meal offerings that accompany animal offerings before the Omer and if one did so it is invalid neither may one offer these before the two loaves but if one did so it is valid. And our Isaac said in the name of Rush Lakish this rule applies only if the offering was brought on the 14th or 15th day of Nisan but if brought on the 16th day it would be valid it is thus clear that he is of the opinion that the daybreak of the 16th day of Nisan renders the new harvest permitted Rabbah said if the priest took the handful from the meal offering of the Omer under any name other than its own it is valid and the rest of it may be eaten moreover there is no need of another Omer meal offering to be brought in order to render the new harvest permitted for Rabbah is of the opinion that a wrongful intention does not affect the offering unless expressed by one fit for service in respect of what is fit for service and in the place that is fit for service by one fit for service this excludes a priest with a physical blemish in respect of what is fit for service this excludes the Omer meal offering which is not fit for any other offering for it is exceptional and in the place that is fit for service this excludes an altar which has become shipped our rabbis taught when it says in the next verse of the herd which is unnecessary it does so only to exclude a truff animal but surely this can be arrived at by an fortiori argument if a blemished animal which is permitted to man is forbidden to the most high how much more is a truff animal which is forbidden to man forbidden to the most high the fat and the blood of the animal however can prove otherwise for these are forbidden to man yet are permitted to the most high and if you retort this is so of the fat and the blood since they emanate from that which is permitted but will you say the same of a truff animal which is wholly forbidden i reply the right of nipping off the head of a bird offering which would render the bird wholly forbidden to man could prove otherwise for it is forbidden to man yet is permitted to the most high but you might retort this is so of the nipping since it is only rendered forbidden to man by this act which renders it consecrated the same however cannot be said of a truff animal for it is not rendered forbidden by any act which renders it consecrated and if you reply to this then I say that when it reads in the next verse of the herd which is unnecessary it does so only to exclude the truff animal what was meant by if you reply to this rap said because one could reply that the Omer meal offering can prove otherwise for it is forbidden to man yet permitted to the most high but this is so of the Omer meal offering as it renders the new produce permitted the Omer meal offering of the sabbatical year was meant but that surely renders the aftergrowth permitted it is indeed the Omer meal offering of the sabbatical year that is meant but the view is in accordance with that of our Akiba who said that the aftergrowth is forbidden in the sabbatical year Arahabi Abba said to Arashi even according to our Akiba's view one could refute the argument thus this is so of the Omer meal offering since it renders permitted the new produce of the
Sake of the limit is a precept of the law one could therefore say this is so of the Sabbath since there is an express command that it shall be so or Abba said one could reply that a garment of diverse kinds of stuff can prove otherwise for it is forbidden to the layman yet permitted to the most high but this is so of diverse kinds since an exception to the general prohibition is allowed to the layman in the case of the tzitzis surely the tzitzis is not for the sake of the layman. It is a precept of the law one could therefore say Talmud, Mas Medico this is so of the law of diverse kinds since there is an express command that it shall be so or Shisha the son of Aridi said one could reply let the argument revolve and the inference be made from what is common to both thus the argument this is so of the nipping since it is only rendered forbidden to man by this act which renders it consecrated can be refuted by the argument the fat and the blood can prove otherwise. And the argument this is so of the fat and the blood since they emanate from what is permitted can be refuted by the argument the right of nipping can prove otherwise and so the argument goes around the characteristic feature of this case is not that of the other and the characteristic feature of the other is not that of this case but what they have in common is that each is forbidden to man yet permitted to the most high so I might have inferred that trifid too although it is forbidden to man is permitted to the most high but they have this also in common have they not that in each case there is an express command that it shall be so or ashi therefore said one could reply that the first proposition of the argument is unsound whence did you infer it at the outset from the case of a blemished animal but the case of a blemish is different since in that case the priest who offers the sacrifice is on the same footing as the animal offered whereupon Araha the elder said to Arashi that which was extracted from the side of the mother's womb can prove otherwise for in that case the priest who offers the sacrifice is not on the same footing as the animal offered nevertheless such an animal is permitted to man and forbidden to the most high and if the objection is raised but this is so only of that which was extracted from the side of the mother's womb since it is not holy as a firstling or reply the case of an animal with a physical blemish can prove otherwise and if this objection is raised but this is so only in the case of a blemish since in that respect the priest who offers the sacrifice is on the same footing as the animal offered I reply that which was extracted from the side of the mother's womb can prove otherwise and so the argument goes around the characteristic feature of this case is not that of the other and the characteristic feature of the other is not that of this case but what they have in common is that each is permitted to man. Yet forbidden to the most high, then surely trifle which is forbidden to man is all the more forbidden to the most high, but the others have this also in common that in each case there is no exception to the general prohibition. Will you say the same of the case of trifle seeing that it admits of an exception to the general prohibition? Thereupon Araha the son of Rabba said to Arashi, What is meant by saying that trifle admits of an exception to the general prohibition? Should you say that it refers to the right of nipping off the head of the burnt offering of a bird, in which case the bird, although rendered trifle thereby, is nevertheless permitted to be offered to the most high, but this is also the case with physical blemishes, for a bird with a physical blemish is certainly permitted to be offered to the most high, for it has been said the unblemished state and the male sex are prerequisites only to sacrifices of cattle, but not of birds. You would say then that it refers to the Right of nipping off the head of a sin offering of a bird, in which case the bird is permitted to be eaten by priests, but surely the priests receive it from the table of the Most High. Indeed, the argument could be refuted, thus the others have this further in common, for in each case the defect thereof is perceptible. Will you then say the same of the case of Trifa, seeing that its defect is not perceptible? The verse is therefore necessary to exclude Trifa, and is the case of Trifa derived. From here, surely it is derived from the verse from the liquor of Israel, that is from that which is permitted to Israel, or from the verse whatsoever passeth under the rod which excludes a Trifa animal, since it cannot pass under all three verses are necessary, for from the verse from the liquor of Israel I should have excluded only those that were at no time fit for a sacrifice, just as Orla were diverse kinds in the vineyard, but where it was at one time fit, I would say that it is permitted. To be offered scripture therefore states whatsoever passeth under the rod and had scripture only stated the verse whatsoever passeth under the rod I should have excluded only those animals that were first rendered trifa and subsequently consecrated as in the case of the cattle type but where it was consecrated first and subsequently it became trifa since at the time when it was consecrated it was fit for a sacrifice I would say that it is permitted to be offered therefore all three verses are necessary mission whether it is a sinner's meal offering or any other meal offering if a non-priest or a priest that was in mourning or had immersed himself during the day or was not wearing the official priestly robes or whose atonement was not yet complete or that had not washed his hands and feet or that was uncircumcised or unclean or that ministered sitting or standing upon vessels or upon a beast or upon another's feet had taken the handful therefrom it is invalid if a Priest removed the handful with his left hand it is invalid then but there it says he must put the handful back and take it out again with the right hand if on taking the handful there came into his hand a small stone or a grain of salt or a drop of frankincense it is invalid for they have ruled if the handful was too much or too little it is invalid what is meant by too much if he took an overflowing handful and too little if he took the handful with the tips of his fingers only Gamarawa does. The mission state whether it is a sinner's meal offering or any other meal offering surely it should state every meal offering from which the handful was taken by a non-priest or a priest that was in mourning etc it was necessary to state it so according to Arsimian's view for it was taught Arsimian said by right the sinner's meal offering should require oil and frankincense so that the sinner should have no advantage why then does it not require them in order that his offering be not Sumptuous also by right an ordinary sin offering should require drink offerings Talmud, Mos Medikoth be so that the sinner should have no advantage why then are they not required in order that his offering be not sumptuous now I might have thought that since Arsimian laid down the principle so that his offering be not sumptuous it should be valid even where an unfit person took out the handful we are therefore informed that even according to Arsimian it is invalid if so there too the Mishnah should have stated whether it is an ordinary sin offering or any other offering if a non-priest or a priest that was in mourning received the blood it is invalid and we would have explained that it was necessary to be so stated according to Arsimian's view but it is clear that the expression all stated in that Mishnah since it is not followed by the term except includes every offering then in our Mishnah too had it stated all inasmuch as it is not followed by the term except it would have included every offering it was indeed necessary to be so stated for I might have thought that since we had established that the first mission was not in accordance with the view of Arsimian the second mission also was not in accordance with the view of Arsimian we are therefore informed that even according to Arsimian it is invalid Rab said if a non-priest took the handful from the meal offering he should put it back again and it is valid but have we not learned it is invalid it is invalid means it is invalid so long as he had not put it back again if so is not this identical with Ben but there is view in the case where the handful is still here the rabbis do not differ with Ben but there at all they differ only where the handful is no longer here the rabbis maintaining that one may not bring other flour from one's house to make up the tent while Ben but there maintains that one may bring other flour from one's house to make up the tent but then how can Ben but there say he must put the handful back and take it out again with the right hand. He surely should have said he should bring other flour from his house to make up the tent and then take out the handful with the right hand. Rather, we must say that Rab said so according to Ben Bathura, but is not this obvious? No, for one might have thought that Ben Bathura declared it valid only in the case where the handful was taken out with the left hand, but not where it was taken out by any of the persons that are unfit. Rab therefore teaches us that according to Ben Bathura, it is valid in all the cases, but why would the offering be valid where the handful was taken out with the left hand? It is, is it not because we find it allowed in the service of the Day of Atonement? Then, in the case of a non priest, too, we find that he was allowed to perform a service, namely the slaughtering. The slaughtering is not regarded as a service, but is it not? Has not Arzara said in the name of Rab if a non priest? Slaughtered the red cow it is invalid and Rab had explained the reason for it namely because the expressions Eliezer and statute are used in connection with it the case of the red cow is different for it is in the category of things consecrated to the temple treasury but is it not all the more so here for if in regard to things consecrated to the temple treasury the priest is essential how much more so in regard to things consecrated to the altar Arshisha the son of Aridi said it might be compared with the inspection of leprosy plagues
Why the handful should have been returned and it is all the same whether it was originally taken with the left hand or taken by any one of those that were unfit rather it is this that Rav teaches us that if he had taken out the handful and had even hallowed it by putting it into the vessel of ministry it may nevertheless be put back again Rav thus rejects the view of the following Tanaim for it was taught our Jose B. and our Judah the baker said this is so only where he had taken out the handful and had not yet hallowed it but where he had also hallowed it it is invalid others report that this is what Rav teaches us that only if he had taken out the handful it is valid but if he had also hallowed it it is not valid Rav thus agrees with the view of those Tanaim and rejects the view of the first Tan Arnam and demurred what is the view of those Tanaim if they hold that the taking of the handful by persons unfit is regarded as a service then it should be invalid even though it had not been put into a vessel and if they hold that the taking of the handful by persons unfit is not regarded as a service then what does it matter even if it had been put into a vessel later however Arnavan said it is indeed regarded as a service but the service is not complete until the handful has been put into a vessel Talmud, Mas Menekotha but surely when he puts the handful back again into its place it thus becomes holy consequently it should be invalid Are Yohanan. Said this proves that vessels of ministry hallow only what has been put into them intentionally it follows however that they do hallow what has been put into them intentionally but did not Reshlakish inquire of Are Yohanan can unfit persons hallow what they intentionally put into vessels of ministry so that it should be permitted to offer it upon the altar in the first instance and he replied they cannot hallow it he meant they cannot hallow it so that it should be permitted to be. Offered up, but they can hallow it so that through their act it is rendered invalid. Aram Rome said, We must suppose here that he put it back into a heaped up bowl, then how could he have taken out the handful originally from this vessel? Rather say he put it back into a brimful bowl, but surely when he took out the handful he left a hollow so that when he puts it back again he puts it into the vessel. Does he not? He put it back onto the sides of the vessel and he then shook it so that it fell back of its own into the vessel, and it is the same as though it were put back by a monkey. Our Jeremiah said to our Zero, Why not suggest that he put it back into a vessel which was upon the ground? We can then infer from this that one may take out the handful from a vessel which is upon the ground. He replied, You are now touching upon a question that was raised by our colleagues for Abami was studying the tractate Minahat under Arista, but did Abami even study under Arista? Did not Arista say? Many were the blows that I received from Abami upon the following subject. If the court intend to announce the sale of the property daily, it must be done during 30 days. If only on Mondays and Thursdays, it must be done during 60 days. Abami had forgotten this tractate, and so he went to Arista that he might be reminded of it. Why did he not send for him that he Arista should come to him? He thought that in this way he would make better progress. Arnaman once met him, Abami, and asked him, How does one take out the handful? He replied, Out of this vessel, said the other, and may one take the handful out of a vessel that is upon the ground. He replied, A priest has to lift it up, and how does one hallow the handful taken from the meal offering? Asked Arnaman, He replied, One should put it into this vessel, but may one hallow it by putting it into a vessel that is upon the ground. He replied, A priest has to lift it up, said Arnaman, then you require three priests. He replied, I don't mind. If thirteen are required as with the daily sacrifice he raised the following objection we have learned this is the general rule if one took out the handful or put it into the vessel or brought it nigh or burned it intending to eat a thing that it is usual to eat outside its proper place etc. Now there is no mention here of lifting up the vessel the Tana merely teaches the order of the various services the question was put to our sheets hate may one take the handful from a vessel that is upon the ground he answered go and see what is done within the temple four priests entered into having in their hands the two rows of shoe bread and two the two dishes of frankincense and four priests went in before them two to take away the two rows and two to take away the two dishes Talmud, Mas Menekoth B. Now there is no mention here of lifting up the table but was not the answer given in the former case that the Tana merely stated the order of the services then in this case too we can say that he only states the order of the services surely there is no comparison there the Tana does not state the number of priests but here he does state the number of the priests now if your contention were right he certainly should have mentioned the priest who lifts up the table this proves that one may take the handful from a vessel that is upon the ground this indeed proves it Rabbah said I am certain that one may take the handful from a vessel that is upon the ground for we find that this was so at the taking away of the dishes of frankincense also that one may hallow the meal offering by putting the meal into a vessel that is upon the ground for we find that this was so at the setting down the dishes Rabbah however was in doubt what is the law with regard to the hallowing of the handful are we to derive it from the meal offering itself or from the receiving of the blood later Rabbah decided that we must derive it from the receiving of the blood but could Rabbah have said so surely it has been stated if the handful was divided and put into two vessels Arnaman says it is not hallowed and Rabbah says it is hallowed now if the above decision were right then this too he should derive from the blood should he not Rabbah retracted from that opinion whence do we know that if the blood was divided in separate vessels it is not hallowed from the following which our Talaf Abhi learned if one mix less than the quantity required for sprinkling in one vessel and again less than the quantity required for sprinkling in another vessel the mixing is not valid and the question was raised how is it with regard to the blood is that a traditional law and from a traditional law one may not draw any inferences or is it so there because it is written and he shall dip it in the water then here also it is written and he shall dip his finger in the blood and it was stated our Zerika said in the name of our Eliezer even in the case of the blood it is not Hallowed Rabbah said there has been taught a very th also to this effect it is written and he shall dip but not wipe up in the blood that is there must be at the very beginning sufficient blood in the one vessel for dipping and shall sprinkle of the blood that is of the blood spoken of in the context and the expressions and he shall dip and in the blood are both necessary for had the divine law only stated and he shall dip I might have said that it was valid even though the priest had not received at the very beginning sufficient blood in the one vessel for dipping it therefore stated in the blood and had the divine law only stated in the blood I might have said that he may even wipe up the blood it therefore stated and he shall dip of the blood that is of the blood spoken of in the context what does this exclude Rabbah said it excludes the blood that is still clinging to the finger this supports our Eliezer who said the blood that is still clinging to the finger is not Valid for sprinkling Rabin son of Arata said to Rabbi your pupils report that Aram Rome raised an objection from the following it was taught if while sprinkling some blood dripped from his hand onto a garment if this happened before he had made the sprinkling it must be washed but if after he had made the sprinkling it need not be washed presumably the meaning is before he had finished the sprinkling and after he had finished the sprinkling no the meaning is if it happened before the blood had left his hand in an act of sprinkling it must be washed but if after the blood had left his hand it need not be washed Abbe raised an objection we have learned when he had finished sprinkling he wiped his hand on the cow's body now only when he had finished then did he wipe his hand but before he had finished he did not he replied when he had finished he wiped his hand before he had finished he wiped his finger only it is well to say when he had finished he wiped his hand on the cow's body for it is written and the cow shall be burnt in his sight but to say before he had finished he wiped his finger is difficult for on what would he wipe it Abay answered on the edge of the basin as it is written bowls of gold but could our Eliezer have said that behold it has been stated the meal offering of the high priest our Yohanan says is not hallowed it brought a half at a time our Eliezer says since it is offered a half at a time it is hallowed it brought a half at a time Talmud, Mas Menekotha now if he held that view he would surely derive the ruling in the case of the high priest's meal offering from the blood and should you say that our Eliezer does not derive one case from another but our Eliezer has actually ruled if the taking of the handful from the meal offering was performed in the temple it is valid since we find that the taking away of the dishes of frankincense was regularly performed there he derives the rules of one meal offering from Another meal offering, but he does not derive the rules of a meal offering from the blood, but does he derive one meal offering from another meal offering? Surely it has been taught if a loaf was broken before it had been removed, the shoe bread is invalid, and the priest may not burn on account of it. The dishes of frankincense, if a loaf was broken after it had been removed, the shoe bread is invalid, but he may burn on account of it. The dishes of frankincense, whereupon our
of the high priest may not be brought in two separate halves, but he must bring a whole tenth and then divide it. And it has been taught had scripture stated for a meal offering a half. I should then have said that he must bring a half tenth from his house in the morning and offer it, and a half tenth from his house in the evening and offer it. But scripture states half of it in the morning. That is, he must offer half of the whole tenth. This is only a recommendation there upon Arabi Habbekato. Said to Arashi, but is not the term statute used in connection with it. He replied that merely indicates that he must bring a whole tenth from his house. But did Aryohan and actually say that? Behold, it has been stated if a man set aside in a vessel of ministry a half tenth of flour for his meal offering, intending to add to it to make up the tenth rab, says it is not hallowed. Aryohan and says it is hallowed. Now, if he held that view, he would surely derive the ruling in this case from that of the high priest's meal offering. Should you say, however, that Aryohan does not derive one case from another, but Aryohan has actually ruled if a peace offering was slaughtered in the temple, it is valid for it is written, and he shall slaughter it at the door of the tent of meeting. And surely the accessory cannot be more important than the principle. It is different where he intended to add to it, for it has been taught it is written full and full means nothing else but the whole amount and are. Jose said when is this so only when there is no intention to make up the full amount but when there is an intention to make up the full amount then each part as it is put into the vessel of ministry is hallowed whose view does rab except with regard to the high priest's meal offering if you say are Eliezer's then he should surely derive the ruling in the case of an ordinary meal offering from the high priest's meal offering and should you say that rab does not derive one case from another. But rab has actually said a meal offering is hallowed even though it was put into the vessel of ministry without oil since we find it so in the case of the shoe bread without frankincense since we find it so in the case of the drink offerings without oil and without frankincense since we find this in the case of the sinner's meal offering we must therefore say that rab accepts are Yohanan's view the text above stated rab said a meal offering is hallowed even though it was put into the vessel. Of ministry without oil since we find it so in the case of the shoe bread without frankincense since we find it so in the case of the drink offerings without oil and without frankincense since we find it so in the case of the sinner's meal offering moreover the oil and the frankincense are hallowed in the vessel of ministry alone one without the other the oil without the flour and the frankincense since we find it so in the case of the log of oil of the leper and the frankincense without the flour and oil since we find it so in the case of the dishes of frankincense but our Hanana said Talmud, Mos Menachot be the one is not hallowed without the other then according to our Hanana why was the tenth measure anointed to measure the sinner's meal offering and why was the log measure anointed to measure the log of oil of the leper Samuel too is of the same opinion as Rab for we have learned the vessels for liquids hallow liquids and the measuring vessels for dry stuffs hallow dry. Stuffs the vessels for liquids cannot hallow dry stuffs neither can the measuring vessels for dry stuffs hallow liquids and Samuel had said this applies only to the measuring vessels for liquids but the sprinkling bowls hallow also dry stuffs for it is written both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meal offering Araha of Dipti said to Rabbanah but this meal offering is moist he replied it refers particularly to the dry parts of the flour alternatively I may say in comparison with blood a meal offering though mingled with oil is regarded as dry stuff the text above stated R. Eliezer said if the taking of the handful from the meal offering was performed in the temple it is valid since we find that the taking away of the dishes of frankincense was regularly performed there are Jeremiah raised an objection it is written and he shall take his handful from there that is from the place where the feet of the non-priest may stand bend but there says whence do we know that if he took the handful with the left hand he should put it back again and then take it with his right hand because the verse says and he shall take his handful from there that is from the place from which he has already taken a handful some say that here Jeremiah raised the objection and he himself answered it as stated below others report that our Jacob said to our Jeremiah be talifah I will explain it to you that verse merely serves to teach us that the right of taking the handful may be performed in any part of the temple court and you should not argue that since the burnt offering is most holy and the meal offering is most holy therefore as the burnt offering must be slaughtered on the north side of the temple court so the meal offering must be attended to on the north side but surely the case of the burnt offering is different since it is holy burnt then one could argue in the same way from the sin offering but surely the case of the sin offering is different since it atones for those who committed an act inadvertently which had they committed it willfully would have made them liable to correct then one could argue in the same way from the guilt offering again the case of the guilt offering is different since it affects atonement by blood nor could one argue in the same way from all these sacrifices taken together since all these are different from the meal offering since they affect atonement by blood that verse is indeed necessary for I might have thought that since it is written and it shall be presented unto the priest and he shall bring it unto the altar and then it says and he shall take out the handful therefore just as the meal offering was brought unto the southwest corner of the altar so the handful was to be taken out at the southwest corner of the altar we are therefore taught that it may be performed in any part of the temple court the text above stated are you and said if a peace offering was slaughtered in the temple it is valid for it is written and he shall slaughter it at the door of the tent of meeting and surely the accessory cannot be more important than the principle and objection was raised our Judah be but there is said once do we know that if the temple court was surrounded by Gentiles the priests may enter the temple and eat there the most holy meat and the remainder of the meal offerings because the verse says Talmud, Mos Menachoth in the most holy place shall thou eat thereof now why is the verse necessary to teach this one could say it is sufficient that it is written in the court of the tent of meeting they shall eat it and the accessory surely cannot be more important than the principle with regard to acts of service since a man would perform services in the presence of his master we apply the principle surely the accessory cannot be more important than the principle but with regard to eating since a man would not eat in the presence of his master it is permitted only because the verse expressly says so but had not the verse said so we would not have applied the principle surely the accessory cannot be more important than the principle it was stated if the meal offering was mingled outside the walls of the temple court are Yohanan says it is invalid Reshlegish says it is valid Reshlegish says it is valid for it is written and he shall pour oil upon it and put frankincense thereon and then and he shall bring it to Aaron's sons the priests and he shall take throughout his handful hence from the taking of the handful begins the duty of the priesthood this therefore teaches us that the pouring of the oil upon the meal offering and the mingling of the oil with the flour are valid even if done by non priests now since the mingling does not require the services of the priesthood it likewise need not be performed within the temple court are Yohanan says it is invalid for since it must be prepared in a vessel of ministry even though it does not Require the services of the priesthood, it must nevertheless be performed within the temple court. There is a very in support of our Yohanan's view, for it has been taught if a non priest mingled it, it is valid. If it was mingled outside the walls of the temple court, it is invalid. It was stated if the meal offering had diminished before the handful was taken from it, our Yohanan says he may bring flour from his house to fill up the measure. Reshlegish says he may not bring flour from his house to fill up the measure. Our Yohanan says he may bring flour from his house to fill up the measure, for it is the taking of the handful that determines it for a meal offering. Reshlegish says he may not bring flour from his house to fill up the measure, for it is the hallowing of the vessel that determines it for a meal offering. Our Yohanan then raised this objection against Reshlegish. We have learned if the oil in the log was found to be lacking before it was poured out, he may fill up it. Measure this is indeed a refutation it was stated if the remainder of the meal offering was found to be lacking between the taking of the handful and the burning thereof our Yohanan says he may burn the handful on account of it Reshlegish says he may not burn the handful on account of it according to our Eliezer's view there can be no difference of opinion they differ only according to our Joshua's view for we have learned if the remainder of the meal offering became unclean or was burnt or lost according to the rule of our Eliezer it is lawful to burn the handful but according to the rule of our Joshua it is unlawful now he who says it is unlawful to burn the handful clearly agrees with our Joshua but he who says it is lawful distinguishes the cases thus only in that case did our Joshua say that it was unlawful since nothing of the meat remained available but here where some of the meal offering remained available even our Joshua admits that it is lawful to burn the handful for it has been so taught our Joshua says if of
and the priest may not burn on account of it the dishes of frankincense if a loaf was broken after it had been removed the shoe bread is invalid but he may nevertheless burn on account of it the dishes of frankincense whereupon our Eliezer had said the expression after it had been removed does not mean that it had actually been removed but rather that the time for its removal had arrived even though it had not yet been removed he replied the author of that Beretha is our Eliezer he or Yohanan. Then said to him I quote you an undisputed mission and you merely say that the author is our Eliezer if it is our Eliezer why does the Beretha speak of only part of the shoe bread being broken even if it were entirely burnt or lost he would also permit the burning of the frankincense would he not the other remain silent and why did he remain silent surely he could have replied that it is different with the offering of the community for just as uncleanness is permitted for the community so. The diminution of an offering is also permitted for it. Our Adabi Baha said this proves that diminution is on a par with a physical blemish, and no animal with a physical blemish is permitted even for the community. Our Papa was sitting reciting the above teaching when our Joseph Bishi may have said to him, Is it not the case that the dispute between our Yohanan and Reshlakish refers also to the Omer meal offering, which is a communal offering? Our Makayo said one Beretha teaches the expression of it. Fine flour thereof implies that if it had diminished, however little it is invalid, and of the oil thereof implies that if it had diminished, however little it is invalid, and another Beretha teaches the expression of the meal offering excludes the case where the meal offering or the handful had diminished or where nothing at all of the frankincense was burnt. Now, why are two verses necessary to exclude any diminution? Surely it must be that one refers to the case where the meal offering had diminished before the handful was taken and the other to the case where the remainder had diminished between the taking of the handful and the burning thereof this then is a refutation of both views of our Yohanan is it not no one verse refers to the case where the meal offering had diminished before the taking of the handful in which case if he brings more flour from his house and makes up the measure it is valid otherwise it is not valid the other refers to the case where the remainder had diminished between the taking of the handful and the burning thereof in which case the remainder is forbidden to be eaten although he may burn the handful on account of it for the question was raised according to him who says that where the remainder had diminished between the taking of the handful and the burning thereof he may burn the handful on account of it what is the position with regard to the eating of the remainder ZEIRI said it is written and that which is left of the meal Offering, but not that which is left of the remainder. Arjane said it is written of the meal offering that is the meal offering which was once whole. If the priest took the handful with his left hand, it is invalid. Once do we know this? Arzara said the verse states, and he presented the meal offering and filled his hand there. From now I do not know which hand was meant, but when another verse states, and the priest shall take of the log of oil and pour it into the palm of his own left hand, I know that only here hand means the left hand, but elsewhere wherever hand is stated, it means the right. But is not this expression required for its own purpose? The left hand is mentioned once again, but should I not apply here the principle of limitation followed by a limitation extends the scope of the law? The left hand is mentioned yet once again, so that we may say that only here hand means the left hand, whereas elsewhere hand cannot mean the left hand. Perhaps I should say quite the Contrary, just as here hand means the left hand, so elsewhere hand means the left hand. The left hand is in fact stated four times twice in the case of the poor man and twice in the case of the rich man. Our Jeremiah said to our Zara, For what purpose is it written upon the thumb of his right hand and upon the great toe of his right foot? Talmud, Mos Manico, the one serves to permit the application of the oil upon the sides and the other to forbid it on the sides of the side. And for what purpose? Are stated upon the blood of the guilt offering and upon the place of the blood of the guilt offering. They are both necessary for had the divine law only stated upon the blood of the guilt offering. I should have said that only if the blood was still there it is valid, but if it had been wiped off it is not valid. The divine law therefore stated upon the place of the blood of the guilt offering and had the divine law only stated upon the place, etc. I should have said that if the blood must. First be wiped off, but if it was still there, it would be regarded as an interposition. The divine law therefore stated upon the blood of the guilt offering. Rabbi said, since there have been stated with regard to the application of the oil, the expressions upon the blood of the guilt offering and upon the place of the blood of the guilt offering, and moreover, since with regard to the application of the blood, the term right is used for what purpose? Then does the verse state concerning the application of the oil upon the leper, upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right leg, both in the case of the rich man and of the poor man? Rabbi therefore said, the term hand is required for purposes of analogy with hand in respect of the taking out of the handful. The term leg with leg in respect of Eliza, the term ear with ear in respect of boring of the ear. Wherefore is the left stated? Arshisha, the son of Aridi, answered in order to rule out the use of the priests. Right hand in the case of the leper lest you argue as follows if in the case where the left hand is not allowed the right hand nevertheless is in the case where the left hand is allowed surely the right hand is allowed too and wherefore is the left stated again for the reason taught at the school of our Ishmael any biblical passage that was stated once and then repeated was repeated only for the sake of some new point contained therein Rabbi Barhana said in the name of our Simeon Belakish. Wherever the words priest and finger are stated in connection with the service of the temple they signify the right hand only now it was assumed that both these terms priest and finger were necessary to signify this as in the verse and the priest shall take of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and there the finger of the right hand is meant for it is inferred from the case of the leper where it is written and the priest shall dip his right finger but there is the case of it. Taking of the handful with regard to which only the word priest is written, and yet we have learned if the priest took the handful with his left hand, it is invalid. Rabbi answered, It is either the word priest or the word finger that is meant thereupon. Abbe said to him, Take the case of the bringing of the limbs of the sacrifice to the altar, ascent with regard to which the word priest is written, as it is said, and the priest shall present the whole and burn it upon the altar. And the master said, This refers to the bringing of the limbs to the altar, ascent, and yet we have learned the right hind dash leg was carried in the left hand with the part covered with the skin. Outermost, the rule that the word priest or finger implies the right hand, we apply only to such services as would invalidate the atonement by their omission, and take the case of receiving of the blood in a vessel, it is surely a service that would invalidate the atonement by its omission, and yet we have learned. If the priest received the blood in his left hand, it is invalid, but Arsimian declares it valid. You raise this difficulty according to Arsimian's view, did you not? But Arsimian requires both terms, does then Arsimian require both terms? Surely it has been taught. Arsimian says wherever the term hand is stated, it signifies the right hand only. Likewise, the term finger signifies the right finger only. The term finger does not require with it the term priest, but the term priest requires with it. The term finger, why then is the term priest stated at all that he shall be clad in the priestly robes? Talmud, Mos Menikoth, be considered the case of the sprinkling of the blood with regard to which only the term priest is used. Yet we have learned if the priest sprinkled the blood with his left hand, it is invalid, and Arsimian does not differ. Abbe answered, he does indeed differ in the Beretha, for it was taught if he received the blood in his left hand, it is invalid, but Arsimian declares it. Valid if he sprinkled the blood with his left hand it is invalid but Arsimian declares it valid but then Rabbi's statement that the term hand is required for the purposes of analogy with hand in respect of the taking out of the handful is quite unnecessary for it would have been inferred from the expression priest one teaching is required for the taking out of the handful and the other for the hallowing of the handful but according to Arsimian who holds according to one view that the hallowing of the handful is not essential and even according to the other view that the hallowing of the handful is indeed essential but that it is valid if performed with the left hand is not Rabbi's analogy by means of the common word hand necessary it cannot serve to indicate that the actual taking out of the handful shall be performed with the right hand as this is already established by the teaching of our Judah the son of our high for our Judah the son of our high said what is the reason for our Simeon's view because the verse says it is most holy as the sin offering and as the guilt offering that is to say if the priest comes to perform the service with his hand he must do so with his right hand as the sin offering and if he comes to perform it in a vessel he must do so with his left hand as the guilt offering it is only necessary with regard to the handful of the sinner's meal offering for I might have said that since our Simeon has expressed the view that is the sinner's offering shall not be sum
Measuring the cubit this one is a finger and this one the thumb it is used only in order to smooth the edge how then was it done our Zitra Bitopia said in the name of Rab he bends his three fingers until he reaches the palm of his hand and then takes the handful of berry that has been taught to this effect it is written and he shall take out a full handful now one might suppose that it should be overflowing another verse therefore says in his handful but from the verse in his handful one might suppose that it may be taken with the fingertips it is therefore written a full handful how is it then to be he should bend his three fingers over onto the palm of his hand and thus take the handful in the case of a meal offering prepared on a griddle or in a pan he must level it with his thumb on top and with his little finger below and this was the most difficult service in the temple this and none other was there not the nipping and the taking of both hands full render and this was one of the most difficult services in the temple our papa said I have no doubt at all that the expression a full handful means in the manner in which people usually take a handful but asked our papa what if he took out the handful with his fingertips or with the side of his hand or if he took it from below upwards these questions remain undecided our papa said I have no doubt at all that the expression his hands full means in the manner in which people usually fill the hands but asked our papa what if he filled his hands with his fingertips or with the sides or if he filled each hand separately and brought them together these questions remain undecided our papa raised the question what if he stuck the handful to the side of the vessel must it be put inside the vessel which is the case here or must it be put down inside the vessel which is not the case here this remains undecided Mar B R Ashi raised the following question what if he turned the vessel upside down and put down the handful on the bottom of the vessel must it be put inside the vessel which is the case here or must it be put down in a normal manner which is not the case here this remains undecided mission how should he do it he should stretch out his fingers onto the palm of his hand if he put in too much of its oil or too little of its oil or too little of its frankincense the offering is invalid tomorrow what is meant by too much of its oil our Eliezer said if for example one set apart for it two logs of oil and why did he not suggest that ordinary unconsecrated oil or oil from another meal offering was added to it should you however retort that the addition of ordinary unconsecrated oil or oil from another meal offering would not render the offering invalid then there is the objection raised by our Zitra Bitopia how can the ruling that the sinner's meal offering another interpretation is he filled his hands with incense taken from the side of the vessel and not from the middle is rendered Invalid by the addition of oil ever be applied if you say that oil was especially set aside for it but it does not require any and if you say that ordinary unconsecrated oil or oil from another meal offering was added to it but you have now said that this would not render the offering invalid and our Eliezer what does he say to this it is a case of it goes without saying thus it goes without saying that the offering is rendered invalid by the addition of ordinary unconsecrated oil or oil of another meal offering but in the case where a man set aside for it two logs of oil since each log separately is suitable for the purpose I would say that it is not invalid he therefore teaches us that it is invalid but whence does our Eliezer know this Rabbah said our mission presented a difficulty to him why does it use the expression if he put in too much of its oil it should have stated if he put in too much oil for it but it teaches us that it is invalid even though he said Aside for it two logs of oil if he put in too little of its frankincense our rabbis taught if the frankincense had diminished until there remained one grain only the offering is invalid if there remained two grains it is valid so our Judah our Simeon says if there remained one grain it is valid if less than that it is invalid Talmud, Mas Menikoth be Talmud, Mas Menikoth be but have we not been taught in another Beritha if the handful of frankincense had diminished no matter how little it is. Invalid render if the last grain of frankincense had diminished no matter how little it is invalid alternatively I may say one Beritha refers to the frankincense that was offered together with the meal offering and the other to a separate offering of frankincense our Isaac B. Joseph said in the name of our Yohanan in this matter there are three different views our Meir holds that there must be a handful of frankincense at the outset and also a handful in the end our Judah holds a handful at the Outset and two grains in the end are Simeon holds a handful at the outset and one grain in the end. All these three rabbis derive their opinions from the same verses and all the frankincense which is upon the meal offering are Meir is of the opinion that the offering is invalid unless there is present now all the frankincense that was prescribed to be offered with the meal offering at the outset Arjuta maintains that the expression all implies even one grain and the particle eth adds to it. Another grain our Simeon however does not interpret the particle eth our Isaac B. Joseph also said in the name of our Yohanan they differ only with regard to the frankincense that is offered together with the meal offering but with regard to frankincense that is offered by itself all agree that there must be a handful at the outset and a handful in the end therefore the words which is upon the meal offering are expressly stated to indicate that this is so only with regard to the frankincense that is. Offered with the meal offering but not with regard to that offered by itself or Isaac B. Joseph further said in the name of our Yohanan they differ only with regard to the frankincense that is offered together with the meal offering but as for the frankincense offered in the dishes all agree that there must be two handfuls at the outset and two handfuls in the end surely this is obvious you might have thought that since the frankincense in the two dishes is brought together with the shoe bread it is in the same category as that which is offered with the meal offering we are therefore taught that it is not so this however is a matter of dispute between our M.I. and our Isaac Napaha one says they differ only with regard to the frankincense that is offered together with the meal offering but with regard to the frankincense offered by itself all agree that there must be a handful at the outset and a handful in the end the other says just as they differ in the former case so they differ in the Latter case too if he put in too little of its frankincense the offering is invalid it follows however that if he put in too much it is valid but we have been taught if he put in too much it is invalid Rami Biham answered that was a case where he set apart two handfuls Rami Biham also said if a man set apart two handfuls of frankincense and one of them was lost before the taking of the handful of flour the offering is valid for they had not yet been appointed for this meal offering if one was lost after the taking of the handful the offering is invalid for they had already been appointed for this meal offering Rami Biham also said if he set apart four handfuls of frankincense for the two dishes and two of them were lost before the taking away of the dishes it is valid for they had not yet been appointed for the shoe bread if two were lost after the taking away of the dishes it is invalid for they had already been appointed for the shoe bread wherefore was this case necessary it is the same as the other you might have thought that since in this case the handful is separate as soon as the time for its removal has arrived it is regarded as already removed we are therefore taught otherwise Mishnah if he took the handful from the meal offering intending to eat the remainder outside the temple court or an olive's bulk of the remainder outside or to burn the handful outside or an olive's bulk of the handful outside or to burn its frankincense outside the offering is invalid but the penalty of Kareth is not incurred if he intended to eat the remainder on the morrow or an olive's bulk of the remainder on the morrow or to burn the handful on the morrow or an olive's bulk of the handful on the morrow or to burn its frankincense on the morrow Talmud Mas Medico the offering is pickle and the penalty of Kareth is incurred this is the general rule if one took the handful or put it into the vessel or brought it nigh or burnt it. Intending to eat a thing that is usual to eat or to burn a thing that is usual to burn outside its proper place the offering is invalid but the penalty of Kareth is not incurred but if he intended to like outside its proper time the offering is pickle and the penalty of Kareth is incurred provided that the matter was offered according to its prescribed right how is the matter offered according to its prescribed right if he took out the handful in silence but put it into the vessel and brought it nigh and burnt it intending at each service to eat the remainder outside its proper time or if he took out the handful intending to eat the remainder outside its proper time but put it into the vessel and brought it nigh and burnt it in silence or if he took out the handful and put it into the vessel and brought it nigh and burnt it intending at each service to eat the remainder outside its proper time such is a case where the matter is offered according to its prescribed right how is the matter offered not according to its prescribed right if he took out the handful intending to eat the remainder outside its proper place and put it into the vessel and brought it nigh and burnt it intending at each service to eat the remainder outside its proper time or if he took out the handful intending to eat the remainder outside its proper time and he put it into the vessel and brought it nigh and burnt it intending at each service to eat the remainder outside its proper place or if he took out the handful
bolt thereof on the morrow or to eat an olive bolt thereof on the morrow and another olive bolt thereof outside its proper place or to eat a half olive bolt thereof outside its proper place and a half olive bolt on the morrow or to eat a half olive bolt thereof on the morrow and a half olive bolt outside its proper place the offering is invalid but the penalty of Kareth is not incurred our Judah said this is the general rule if the intention about the time preceded the intention about the place the offering is pickle and the penalty of Kareth is incurred but if the intention about the place preceded the intention about the time the offering is invalid but the penalty of Kareth is not incurred but the sages say in both cases the offering is invalid but the penalty of Kareth is not incurred tomorrow the question was raised according to him who holds that if the remainder of the meal offering had diminished in the time between the taking of the handful and the burning Thereof you may nevertheless burn the handful on account of it and we had established that that remainder may not be eaten the question arises can the burning of the handful have any effect upon this remainder that it should become pickle and that it should no more be subject to the law of sacrilege or not our said even according to our Akiba who said that the sprinkling of the blood has an effect upon the consecrated meat that was taken out of its prescribed bounds that is so only with regard to what was taken out since it is entirely here but has become invalid only through some extrinsic cause but upon that which has diminished which is an intrinsic defect the burning surely can have no effect thereupon Rabbah said on the contrary even according to our Eliezer who said that the sprinkling of the blood has no effect upon what was taken out that is so only with regard to what was taken out since it is no longer inside the sanctuary but upon that which has diminished since it is still inside the sanctuary the burning surely can have an effect Rabbah said how to arrive at the above because we have learned if he took the handful from the meal offering intending to eat the remainder outside the temple court or an olive bulk of the remainder outside and our high when learning this mission quoted if he took the handful from the meal offering etc but he did not include in it or an olive bulk now why did he not include or an olive bulk surely because he Assume the mission to be dealing with the case where the remainder had diminished until there was only an olive's bulk left and since with regard to the services of putting the handful into a vessel of bringing it nigh and of burning it or high could not have stated Talmud, Mas Menekoth B or an olive's bulk he therefore did not state or an olive's bulk even with regard to the service of taking out the handful nevertheless he states in the later clause the offering is pickle and it. Penalty of Kareth is incurred hence it is evident that the burning of the handful has an effect upon the diminished remainder said to him Abbe it is not so but the author is our Eliezer for we have learned if a man offered outside the temple court an olive's bulk of the handful or of the frankincense or of the incense offering or of the meal offering of the priests or of the meal offering of the anointed high priest or of the meal offering offered with the drink offerings he is liable but our Eliezer declares him exempt unless he offered the whole thereof since therefore the expression or an olive's bulk cannot be stated in connection with the burning of the handful the same expression or an olive's bulk is not stated in connection with the remainder but if it is our Eliezer why is it stated intending to burn the handful it should state intending to burn the handful and the frankincense for we have learned if a man offered either the handful or the frankincense outside the temple court he is liable but our Eliezer declares him exempt unless he offered both it refers to the handful of the sinner's meal offering and did the tanna trouble to teach us the case concerning the handful of the sinner's meal offering he did and likewise when our Dimi came from Palestine he reported in the name of our Eliezer that it referred only to the handful of the sinner's meal offering and it was in accordance with our Eliezer's view later Rabbah said what I said before was wrong for it has been taught the expression it is implies that if one of the loaves was broken all are invalid it follows however that if one was taken out of the sanctuary those that are inside are valid now whom have you heard say that the sprinkling of the blood has an effect upon what was taken out obviously it is our Akiba and yet it states that if one of the loaves was broken they are not valid thereupon Abbe said to him does the Beretha expressly state but if one was taken out the others are valid perhaps the correct inference is if one became unclean the others are valid and that is because the high priest's plate renders it acceptable whereas if one was taken out the others would not be valid for the teaching is in accordance with our Eliezer's view who maintains that the sprinkling of the blood has no effect upon what was taken out and by right the tana of the Beretha should have also stated the case where one of the loaves was taken out but he only stated the case where one was broken to teach us that even though it is still inside the sanctuary the burning has no effect upon it according to our Akiba however who said that the sprinkling of the blood has an effect upon what was taken out the burning likewise will have an effect upon that which had diminished Mishnah if he intended to eat a half olive's bulk and to burn a half olive's bulk the offering is valid for eating and burning cannot be reckoned together tomorrow now the reason why they cannot be reckoned together is that there was an intention to eat and to burn but it follows that where there was the intention to eat what it is usual to eat and also to eat what it is not usual to eat they can be reckoned together but it has been stated earlier in the Mishnah intending to eat a thing that it is usual to eat or to burn a thing that it is usual to burn hence a wrongful intention to eat is of consequence only in respect of a thing that it is usual to eat but not in respect of a thing that it is not usual to eat said our Jeremiah the author of our mission is our Eliezer who maintains that a wrongful intention to consume upon the altar what is usually eaten by man or to eat what is usually consumed upon the altar is of consequence for we have learned if he took out the handful from the meal offering intending to eat a thing that it is not usual to eat or to burn a thing that it is not usual to burn the offering is valid but our Eliezer declares it to be invalid Abbe. said you may even say that this mission is in accordance with the view of the rabbis but you must not infer from it that where there was the intention to eat a half olive's bulk of what it is usual to eat and to eat the same of what it is not usual to eat they can be reckoned together but rather infer this that where the intention was to eat a half olive's bulk and also to eat the same of a thing that it is usual to eat they can be reckoned together what does it teach us we have Expressly learned this case in the earlier mission if he intended to eat an olive's bulk of the remainder outside its proper place and another olive's bulk thereof on the morrow or to eat an olive's bulk thereof on the morrow and another olive's bulk thereof outside its proper place or to eat a half olive's bulk thereof outside its proper place and another half olive's bulk thereof on the morrow or to eat a half olive's bulk thereof on the morrow and another half olive's bulk thereof outside its proper place the offering is invalid but the penalty of Kareth is not incurred Talmud, Mas Menekotha what further does our mission teach us if it suggests the inference that where there was the intention to eat a half olive's bulk of what it is usual to eat and also to eat a half olive's bulk of what it is not usual to eat they can be reckoned together but you already know from the first clause and if it teaches that where there was the intention to eat and burn a half olives well, they cannot be reckoned together but you surely know this by inference from the preceding mission for if the intentions to eat what it is usual to eat and to eat what it is not usual to eat cannot be reckoned together is it then necessary to state that the intentions to eat and to burn cannot be reckoned together yes it is necessary to state that the intentions to eat and to burn cannot be reckoned together for you might have thought that only in that case the intentions cannot be reckoned together for there is an intention there with regard to what is not proper but here since each intention relates to what is proper in each case I might say that they should be reckoned together we are therefore taught that they cannot be reckoned together C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I mission if he took out the handful intending to eat the remainder or to burn the handful on the morrow in this case our Jose agrees that the offering is pickle and that the penalty of Kareth is incurred on Account thereof if he intended to burn the frankincense thereof on the morrow our Jose says it is invalid but the penalty of Kareth is not incurred on account thereof but the sages say it is pickle and the penalty of Kareth is incurred on account thereof they said to him how does this differ from an animal offering he said to them with the animal offering the blood the flesh and the sacrificial portions are all one but the frankincense is not of the meal offering tomorrow why does the Mishnah state in this case our Jose agrees because the Tana wished to state the next clause if he intended to burn the frankincense thereof on the morrow our Jose says it is invalid but the penalty of Kareth is not incurred on account thereof now you might have thought that the reason for our Jose's opinion in the last clause was that a wrongful intention in respect of half the matter does not render pickle and that consequently our Jose differs even in the first clause
Frankincense, but in fact, if he wishes, he may burn this first, and if he wishes, he may burn that first. And what do the rabbis say to this? They hold that we apply the principle a matter cannot render pickle another matter only to such a case as where the matters are not ordained to be in one vessel, but where they are ordained to be in one vessel, they are regarded as one matter. Arjani said, if a non priest gathered up the frankincense, it is invalid. Why our Jeremiah said this touches upon the law of bringing nigh. He is of the opinion that bringing nigh without even moving the feet is quite a proper act, and it is established that if a non priest brought it nigh, it is invalid. Armari said, we have also learned the same. This is the general rule if one took the handful or put it into the vessel or brought it nigh or burned it, etc. Now it is clear that the taking of the handful corresponds to the slaughtering of the animal, offering the bringing nigh of the handful to the bringing. Nigh of the blood, the burning of the handful to the sprinkling of the blood, but as to the putting of the handful into a vessel, what service is he performing? Should you say that it corresponds to the receiving of the blood, but surely there is no comparison between them, for there the blood comes in of itself into the vessel, whereas here the handful is taken and put into the vessel. We must therefore say that since it can in no wise be omitted, it is an important service, and perforce is regarded as corresponding to the receiving of the blood here too, since it can in no wise be omitted, it is an important service, and perforce is regarded as the bringing nigh, it is not so, for in fact it corresponds to the receiving of the blood, and as for your objection, there it comes in of itself, whereas here it is taken and put into the vessel. I reply that seeing that in both cases the subject is hallowed in a vessel, there can be no difference, surely whether it comes into the Vessel of itself, where it is taken and put into the vessel. Mishnah: If he slaughtered the two lambs intending to eat one of the two loaves on the morrow, or if he burned the two dishes of the frankincense intending to eat one of the two rows of the shoe bread on the morrow, our Jose says that loaf or that row about which he expressed the intention is pickle, and the penalty of kareth is incurred on account of them, while the other is invalid. But the penalty of kareth is not incurred, but the sages say both are pickle, and the penalty of kareth is incurred on account of them. Gemara: Arhuna said, Our Jose maintains that if one expressed an intention which makes pickle in connection with the right thigh, the left thigh is not thereby rendered pickle. What is the reason? You may say it is based upon a logical argument, or you may say it is based upon a verse. You may say it is based upon a logical argument, for surely the wrongful intention is not stronger than actual uncleanness. And if one limb became Unclean is the whole unclean, or you may say it is based upon a verse, for it is written, and the soul that eats of it shall bear his iniquity that is of it, but not of any other part. Our nomin raised an objection against our from the following: there is never the penalty of kareth incurred unless he expressed an intention which makes pickle with regard to an olive's bulk from both, thus an olive's bulk from both, but not from one now who is the author of this very. This should you say it is the rabbis, but according to them, even though the intention was in respect of one loaf only, both are pickle. Obviously, then it is our Jose. Now, if you say that they are regarded as one body, there then it is evident why they can be combined here. Talmud, Mas Menakotha. But if you say that they are regarded as two bodies, there why are they combined here? The author of that very is rabbi, for it was taught if he slaughtered the lamb intending to eat a half olive's bulk of the one loaf on. The morrow and likewise he slaughtered the other lamb intending to eat a half olive's bulk of the other loaf on the morrow. Rabbi says I maintain that this offering is valid now. This is so only because he referred to two halves, but had he referred to an olive's bulk of both loaves, they would be combined. Whose ruling does Rabbi follow if you say that of the rabbis? But according to them, even though the intention was in respect of one loaf, only both would be pickled. And if you say that of our Jose, then our original question confronts us again. It must be that he follows the ruling of the rabbis, but read not in the above mentioned Beritha unless he expressed an intention which makes pickle with regard to an olive's bulk from both, but rather unless he expressed an intention which makes pickle with regard to an olive's bulk in both, even though the intention was only in respect of an olive's bulk of one loaf, he thus rejects the view of our Meir who said a wrongful intention. Expressed during the service of half the matter renders the offering pickle and he teaches us that it is not so if so why is this introduced by the expression it must be if of course you would have said that the author of that very the meant from both loaves and in both lambs adopting thus the view of our Jose and rejecting the views of our Meir and the rabbis the expression it must be would be quite in order but if you merely say that he adopted the view of the rabbis rejecting only the view of our Meir why then the expression it must be moreover our Ashi had raised an objection against our from the following come and your rabbi says in the name of our Jose if whilst performing a service outside he expressed an intention which makes pickle in respect of another service which is performed outside the offering is pickle if in respect of another service which is performed inside it is not pickle thus if whilst standing outside he said behold I am slaughtering with the intention of Sprinkling the blood thereof on the morrow it is not pickle for this is an intention expressed whilst serving outside in respect of a service performed inside if whilst standing inside he said behold I am sprinkling the blood with the intention of burning the sacrificial portions on the morrow or of pouring out the residue of the blood on the morrow it is not pickle for this is an intention expressed whilst serving inside in respect of a service performed outside if whilst standing outside he said behold I am slaughtering with the intention of pouring out the residue of the blood on the morrow or of burning the sacrificial portions on the morrow it is pickle for this is an intention expressed whilst serving outside in respect of a service performed outside now in the latter case where the intention was of pouring out the residue of the blood what is it that becomes pickle should you say that it is the blood that becomes pickle but does the blood become pickle behold we have learned for the following things the penalty of pickle is not incurred is the handful the frankincense the incense offering the meal offering of the priests the meal offering offered with the drink offerings the meal offering of the anointed high priest and the blood obviously then it is the flesh that becomes pickle now if in that case where no intention was expressed with regard to the flesh at all our Jose holds that it nevertheless becomes pickle how much more so in this case where he actually expressed an intention with regard to the flesh of the offering moreover Rubina had raised an objection against our from the following come and here if he took out the handful intending to eat the remainder or to burn the handful on the morrow in this case our Jose agrees that the offering is pickle and that the penalty of Karath is incurred on account thereof now where the intention was to burn the handful what is it that becomes pickle should you say that it is the handful that becomes Pickle, but does the handful become pickle? Behold, we have learned for the following things the penalty of pickle is not incurred, is the handful, etc. Obviously, then it is the remainder that becomes pickle. Now, if in that case where no intention was expressed with regard to the remainder at all, Talmud, Mas Menakoth, be it nevertheless becomes pickle, how much more so in this case where he actually expressed an intention with regard to the flesh of the offering, rather said, Are Yohanan, this is the reason for our Jose's opinion. Scripture regards the two loaves as one body, and Scripture also regards them as two bodies as one body, since one cannot be offered without the other, and as two bodies, since the divine law ordains that each loaf shall be prepared separately, therefore, if they were reckoned as one, they are thereby united, since Scripture regards them as one body, if they were separated, they remain thus separated, since Scripture regards them also as two bodies, are Yohanan raised it. Following questions What is the position if one expressed an intention which makes pickle in respect of the loaves of the thank offering or in respect of the baked meal offering thereupon our Talifa the Palestinian recited to him the following teaching you must say the same of the loaves of the thank offering and you must say the same of the baked meal offering our rabbis taught if during the slaughtering he intended to eat a half olive's bulk of the flesh after its prescribed time and during the sprinkling of the blood he also intended to eat a half olive's bulk after its prescribed time the offering is pickle for the slaughtering and the sprinkling can be reckoned together as one some explained that this applied only to the slaughtering and the sprinkling since they are both matiron but not to the receiving and the bringing nigh whilst others explained that this applied even to these services which are not consecutive and all the more to those services which are consecutive. This surely cannot be for Levi has taught the four services by slaughtering, receiving, bringing nigh, and sprinkling cannot be reckoned together so as to render pickle. Rabbi answered, There is no contradiction. The one represents the view of Rabbi, the other the view of the Rabbis, for it was taught if he slaughtered the lamb intending to eat a half olive's bulk of the one loaf
The handful and not during the burning of the frankincense or during the burning of the frankincense and not during the burning of the handful are Mahir says it is pickle and the penalty of Karath is incurred but the rabbis say the penalty of Karath is not incurred unless the intention which makes pickle was expressed during the service of the whole of the matter he replied there is no comparison between the cases I grant you that there are Jose declares invalid the case where the wrongful intention was in respect of the handful of frankincense as a precautionary measure against the case where the wrongful intention was in respect of the handful of the meal offering and also that the rabbis declare invalid the case where the wrongful intention was expressed during the burning of the handful as a precautionary measure against the case where the wrongful intention was expressed during the burning of the handful of the sinner's meal offering and that they declare invalid the case where the wrongful intention was expressed during the burning of the frankincense as a precautionary measure against the case where the wrongful intention was expressed during the burning of the frankincense of the dishes and in the case of the lambs too they declare invalid the case where the wrongful intention was expressed during the slaughtering of one lamb as a precautionary measure against the case where the wrongful intention was expressed during the slaughtering of the other lamb too and they declare invalid the case where the wrongful intention was expressed during the burning of one dish of frankincense as a precautionary measure against the case where the wrongful intention was expressed during the burning of the other dish too in our case however is there ever a case of a wrongful intention expressed during the service of half a matter in respect of half the minimum quantity for eating that renders pickle so that we should take here Precautionary measures indeed it stands to reason that this is the explanation of the view of the rabbis for in the next clause of that mission it states the rabbis however agree with our mayor that if it was a sinner's meal offering or a meal offering of jealousy and he expressed an intention which makes pickle during the burning of the handful the offering is pickle and the penalty of karath is incurred on account thereof since the handful alone is the entire matter now why was it necessary for this last expression to be stated it is quite obvious for is there then in these cases any other matter we must therefore say that it teaches us this namely the reason why the rabbis declare the offering invalid in the case where a wrongful intention was expressed during the burning of the handful of the ordinary meal offering is that there is a handful of the sinner's meal offering which is similar to it and which is a real case of pickle mission if one of the two Loaves or one of the two rows of the shoe bread became unclean. Our Judah says both must be taken out to the place of burning for the offering of the congregation may not be divided. But the sages say the unclean is treated as unclean, but the clean may be eaten. Gemara our Eliezer said they differ only in the case where one loaf became unclean before the sprinkling of the blood, but where it became unclean after the sprinkling, all agree that the unclean one is treated as unclean and the clean one may be eaten. And in the case where one became unclean before the sprinkling, on what principle do they differ? Our Papa said they differ as to whether the high priest's plate renders the offering acceptable where the eatable portions had become unclean. Talmud, Mas Menachot the Talmud, Mas Menachot the rabbis are of the opinion that the plate renders the offering acceptable even though the eatable portions had become unclean. But our Judah is of the opinion that the plate. Does not render the offering acceptable where the eatable portions had become unclean. Thereupon, Arunah the son of Ar Nathan said to our Papa, Behold, the plate certainly renders the offering acceptable where the sacrificial portions had become unclean, and yet they differ, for it has been taught if one of the dishes of frankincense became unclean. Our Judah says both are offered in conditions of uncleanness, for an offering of the congregation may not be divided, but the rabbis say the unclean is offered in conditions of uncleanness and the clean in cleanness. Moreover, our Ashi had raised an objection, thus come and here our Judah says, Even though one tribe only was unclean and all the other tribes were clean, all the Passover offerings shall be offered in conditions of uncleanness, for the offering of the congregation may not be divided. Now, in this case, how does the principle of the plate rendering the offering acceptable apply? Furthermore, Rabbanah had raised an objection, thus come and here. If one of the two rows of the shoe bread became unclean, our Judah says both must be taken out to the place of burning for the offering of the congregation may not be divided, but the sages say the unclean is treated as unclean, but the clean one may be eaten. Now, if that were so, then it should have stated for the plate does not render the offering acceptable where the eatable portions had become unclean. Our Yohan and therefore said it is an accepted teaching in the mouth of our Judah that the offering of the congregation may not be divided. Mission of the thank offering can render the bread pickled, but the bread cannot render the thank offering pickled. Thus, if he slaughtered the thank offering intending to eat a part thereof on the morrow, both it and the bread are pickled. If he intended to eat of the bread on the morrow, the bread is pickled, but the thank offering is not pickled. The lambs can render the bread pickled, but the bread cannot render the lambs pickled. Thus, if he slaughtered the lambs. Intending to eat a part thereof on the morrow, both they and the bread are pickled. If he intended to eat of the bread on the morrow, the bread is pickled, but the lambs are not tomorrow. Why is it should you say it is because of our Kahana's teaching who said once do we know that the cakes of the thank offering are called the thank offering from the verse he shall offer for the sacrifice of the thank offering unleavened cakes, then the reverse should also be true. This, however, is no difficulty for the bread is referred to as the thank offering, whereas the thank offering is nowhere referred to as the bread. But when the mission states the lambs can render the bread pickled, but the bread cannot render the lambs pickled, the question will be asked where do we find the bread ever referred to as the lambs? It must be that this is the reason for our mission of the bread is pertinent to the thank offering, but the thank offering is not pertinent to the bread, the bread is pertinent to the lambs. But the lambs are not pertinent to the bread. Now both cases had to be stated in our mission. Before had it stated only the case of the thank offering, I would have thought that only in that case is it held that an intention which makes pickle expressed in respect of the bread does not render the thank offering pickle since they are not dependent upon each other for the right of waving. But in the case of the lambs, since they are dependent upon each other with regard to the right of waving, I would say that an intention which makes pickle expressed in respect of the bread would render the lambs pickle too. Therefore both cases had to be stated. Our Eliezer put this question to Rab. What is the law if he slaughtered the thank offering intending to eat an olive's bulk of it and of its bread on the morrow? Of course, as to whether the thank offering becomes pickle thereby, I have no doubt at all that it does not. For if where the intention was in respect of a whole olive's bulk of the bread, it Thank offering does not become pickle. Can there be any question where the intention was in respect of an olive's bulk made up of it and of the loaves? My question is as to whether the bread becomes pickle or not. Is the thank offering to be reckoned with the bread so as to render the bread pickle or not? He answered in this case too the bread is pickle, but the thank offering is not pickle. But why is this so surely one can apply here in a fortiori argument? Thus, if what helps to make the other pickle does not itself become pickle, then surely what cannot even help to make the other pickle does not itself become pickle. And do we apply in a fortiori argument of such a kind? Behold, it has been taught it once happened that a man Talmud, Mas Menachot, be sowed with his own seeds, his neighbor's vineyard, which was in the budding stage. The case came before the rabbis and they pronounced the seeds forbidden and the vines permissible. But why surely one could apply there this kind of a for your right argument thus if what makes the other forbidden does not itself become forbidden what may have made the other forbidden but did not do so surely does not itself become forbidden there can be no comparison there with regard to diverse kinds the Torah has forbidden hemp and aram but other seeds are forbidden only rabbinically therefore he who transgressed the law is penalized by the rabbis and he who did not transgress the law is not penalized by the rabbis in our case however one must certainly apply the for argument others refer the above argument to the case of the lambs thus our Eliezer put this question to Rab what is the law if he slaughtered the lambs intending to eat an olive's bulk of the men of the bread on the morrow of course as to whether the lambs become pickle thereby I have no doubt at all that they do not for if where the intention was in respect of a whole olive's bulk of the bread the lambs do not become pickle can there be any question where the intention was in respect of an olive's bulk made up of the men of the bread. My question is as to whether the bread becomes pickle or not. Are the lambs to be reckoned with the bread so as to render the bread pickle or not? He answered in this case too the bread is pickle but the lambs are not. But why is this so surely one can apply here in a fortiori argument? Thus if what helps to make the other pickle does not itself become pickle then surely what cannot even help to make the other
The bread in which case the bread becomes pickle he answered you have learned it if he slaughtered one of the lambs intending to eat a part of it on the morrow that lamb is pickle and the other lamb is valid if he intended to eat of the other lamb on the morrow both are valid hence it is clear that the other means the other lamb perhaps however in that mission he expressly said the other lamb mission of the animal offering can render the drink offerings pickle after they have been hallowed in the vessel so are mayor but the drink offerings cannot render the animal offering pickle thus if he slaughtered an animal offering intending to eat thereof on the morrow both it and the drink offerings are pickle if he intended to offer the drink offerings on the morrow the drink offerings are pickle but the animal offering is not gemara or rabbis taught for the drink offerings of an animal sacrifice the penalty of pickle is incurred since the blood of the animal offering renders them Permissible to be offered upon the altar, so our mayor they said to our mayor, is it not the fact that a man may bring his animal offering today and the drink offerings thereof in ten days' time? You replied, I also only spoke of the case where they were brought together with the animal offering, but surely they may be transferred to another animal offering. Rabbi said, our mayor is of the opinion that with the slaughtering they became appropriated to this offering, like the cakes of the thank offering are. Rabbis taught for the lepers log of oil, the penalty of pickle is incurred since the blood of the guilt offering renders it permissible to be applied to the thumb and the great toe. So our mayor they said to our mayor, is it not the fact that a man may bring his guilt offering today and the log of oil in ten days' time? You replied, I also only spoke of the case where it was brought together with the guilt offering, but surely it may be transferred to another leper's guilt offering. Rabbi said, our mayor is. Of the opinion that with the slaughtering it became appropriated to this guilt offering like the cakes of the thank offering Talmud, Mas Menico the Mishnah if he expressed an intention which makes pickle in respect of the remainder during the burning of the handful and not during the burning of the frankincense or during the burning of the frankincense and not during the burning of the incense our Meir says it is pickle and the penalty of Kareth is incurred on account thereof but the sages say the penalty of Kareth is not incurred unless he expressed the intention which makes pickle during the service of the whole of the matter the sages however agree with our Meir that if it was a sinner's meal offering or a meal offering of jealousy and he expressed an intention which makes pickle during the burning of the handful it is pickle and the penalty of Kareth is incurred on account thereof since the handful is the entire matter if he slaughtered one of the lambs intending to Eat the two loaves on the morrow, or if he burnt one of the dishes of frankincense intending to eat the two rows of the shoe bread on the morrow, our mayor says it is pickle and the penalty of Kareth is incurred on account thereof, but the sages say the penalty of Kareth is not incurred unless he expressed the intention which makes pickle during the service of the whole of the matter. If he slaughtered one of the lambs intending to eat a part of it on the morrow, that lamb is pickle, but the other lamb is valid. If he intended to eat of the other lamb on the morrow, both are valid. Gamar Rab said the dispute is only where he offered the handful in silence and then the frankincense with the expressed intention, but where he offered the handful with the expressed intention and then the frankincense in silence, all agree that it is pickle for everything that a man does in silence, he does in accordance with his first resolve. But Samuel said there is still a dispute in that case to Rabba was. One sitting and reciting the statement of Rabban Arahabi Arhuma raised against Rabba the following objection this applies only to the service of taking the handful or of putting it in the vessel or of bringing it nigh but if he had already reached the service of burning and he offered the handful in silence and then the frankincense with the expressed intention or if he offered the handful with the expressed intention and then the frankincense in silence our mayor says it is pickle and it. Penalty of Kareth is incurred on account thereof the sages say the penalty of Kareth is not incurred unless he expressed an intention which makes pickle during the service of the whole of the matter now here is stated the clause or if he offered the handful with the expressed intention and then the frankincense in silence and yet they differ render or if he offered the handful with the expressed intention having already offered the frankincense in silence but there are two objections to this. In the first place it is identical with the first clause and secondly it has been taught in another very and then Arhana explained that here there were two minds come and here this applies only to offerings whose blood must be sprinkled upon the outer altar but in the case of offerings whose blood must be sprinkled upon the inner altar as for example the 43 sprinklings on the day of atonement or the 11 sprinklings of the bullock of the anointed high priest or the 11 sprinklings of the bullock offered for the error of the community of the priest expressed an intention which makes pickle either during the first sprinklings or the second or the third armayer says it is pickle and the penalty of Kareth is incurred on account thereof but the sages say the penalty of Kareth is not incurred unless he expressed the intention which makes pickle during the service of the whole matter now here it states if he expressed an intention which makes pickle either during the first sprinklings or the second or the third and yet they differ should you however reply that there too there were two minds I grant you that this is satisfactory according to him who holds that the expression with the bullock means also with the blood of the bullock but what can be said according to him who holds that the expression with the bullock excludes the blood of the bullock Rabba said we must suppose here that he expressed an intention which makes pickle during the first sprinklings was silent during the second and again expressed an intention which makes pickle during the third in which case we say if you accept the principle that whatsoever a man does in silence he does according to his first resolve why then did he express again an intention which makes pickle during the third sprinklings are ashi demurred saying does the very actually state he was silent rather said are ashi we must suppose here that he expressed an intention which makes pickle during the first sprinklings and also during the second in which case we say if you accept the principle that whatsoever a man does in silence he does according to his first resolve why then did he again express an intention which makes pickle during the second sprinklings Talmud, Mas Medikoth but does not the very the state either or this is a difficulty of Kareth is incurred on account thereof consider the penalty of Kareth is incurred only after all the Matiran have been offered. For a master has stated the expression accepted suggests as the acceptance of a valid offering so is the acceptance of an invalid offering that is to say as the acceptance of a valid offering is affected only after all the Matiran have been offered so the acceptance of an invalid offering is affected only after all the Matiran have been offered now in this case since he expressed a wrongful intention when sprinkling within he has thereby rendered it invalid consequently when he later Sprinkles in the sanctuary it is as though he were sprinkling water Rabbi said it can happen where four bullocks and four he goats were used Rabbi said you may even hold that there was only one bullock and one he goat but the sprinklings are acceptable in regard to the law of pickle 43 sprinklings but we have been taught 47 this is no difficulty one very that accepts the view that for the sprinklings upon the horns of the altar they mix together the blood of it bullock and the blood of the he goat whereas the other accepts the view that they do not mix them but we have been taught 48 this is no difficulty one very that accepts the view that the pouring out of the residue of the blood is an indispensable service whereas the other accepts the view that the pouring out of the residue is not indispensable the question was raised what is the law of he expressed an intention which makes pickle at the bringing nigh of the handful to the Alter Aryohan and said that the bringing nigh is like unto the taking of the handful, but Resh said that the bringing nigh is like unto the burning. Now Resh view is clear, for there is also the bringing nigh of the frankincense. But what is the reason for Aryohan's view? Rabbi said Aryohan is of the opinion that any service which is not an absolute matter is regarded as a service complete in itself with regard to pickle. Whereupon Abbe said to him, Behold, the slaughtering of one of the lambs on the feast of weeks is a service which is not an absolute matter, and yet they differ. For we have learned if he slaughtered one of the lambs intending to eat the two loaves on the morrow, or if he burnt one of the dishes of frankincense intending to eat the two rows of the shoe bread on the morrow, our mayor says it is pickle, and the penalty of Kareth is incurred on account thereof. But the sages say the penalty of Kareth is not incurred unless he expressed the intention which makes. Pickle during the service of the whole of the matter, he replied, Do you imagine that the loaves are hallowed already in the oven? It is the slaughtering of the lambs that hallows them, and whatsoever serves to hallow is on the same footing as whatsoever serves to render permissible. Our Shimai B. Ashi raised an objection and was taught others say, If he had in mind first the circumcised persons and then the uncircumcised, it is valid. If he had in mind first the uncircumcised persons and then it circumcised, it is invalid. And it was
Burnt up in this case are his daughter Hamna and Arshis hate for one holds that it is pickle, the other that it is invalid, and the third that it is valid. Now shall we say that he who holds that it is pickle is in agreement with our mayor, he who holds that it is invalid is in agreement with the rabbis, and he who holds that it is valid is in agreement with rabbi, but is this so perhaps our mayor is of that opinion only there where he expressed the intention which makes pickle during a complete service. But not here where he did not express such an intention during a complete service. Moreover, perhaps the rabbis are of their opinion only there where he did not express an intention which makes pickle during the service of the whole matter, but here where he actually expressed an intention which makes pickle during the service of the whole matter, they would agree that it is pickle, and again perhaps rabbi is of his opinion only there where he did not make up the minimum quantity later in. The same service, but here where he made up the quantity in the same service, he would agree that it is invalid. We must therefore say that he who holds that it is pickle holds us according to all views. He who holds that it is invalid holds us according to all views, and he who holds that it is valid holds us according to all views. He who holds that it is pickle holds us according to all views, for he maintains that that is a way of eating as well as a way of burning. He who holds that it is invalid holds us according to all views, for he maintains that that is a way of eating but not a way of burning. And it was as though the handful of the meal offering had not been burnt at all. And he who holds that it is valid holds us according to all views, for he maintains that that is a way of burning but not a way of eating. Talmud, Masmenico, the keen intellects of Pumadai, the said an intention which makes pickle expressed during one service of burning concerning another service. A burning renders the offering pickle, and this is so even according to the rabbis who ruled that an intention which makes pickle expressed during the service of half the matter does not render pickle for that is their ruling only in the case where he expressed an intention which makes pickle about the remainder of the meal offering the frankincense, however, remaining unaffected. But in this case where he expressed an intention which makes pickle about the frankincense, it is as though he had expressed the intention during the service of the whole matter. Rabbis said we have also learned to the same effect. This is the general rule if one took the handful or put it into the vessel or brought it nigh or burned it, intending to eat a thing that it is usual to eat or to burn a thing that it is usual to burn outside its proper place, the offering is invalid, but the penalty of karath is not incurred. But if he intended the like outside its proper time, the offering is pickle and the penalty. A karath is incurred now presumably the service of burning is similar to the other services and as with the others the intention which makes pickle may be either concerning the eating of the remainder or concerning the burning of the frankincense so with the service of burning the intention which makes pickle may be either concerning the eating of the remainder or concerning the burning of the frankincense no with the others the intention may be either concerning the eating or concerning the burning but with the service of burning the intention can be only concerning the eating but not concerning the burning Armin Asai Begato was once sitting before Abbe and recited the following in the name of Arhista an intention which makes pickle expressed during one service of burning concerning another service of burning does not render the offering pickle and this is so even according to our mayor who ruled that an intention which makes pickle expressed during the service of Half the matter renders pickle for that is his ruling only where the intention expressed was concerning the remainder since it is the handful that renders the remainder permissible in this case however since the handful does not render the frankincense permissible it cannot make the offering pickle thereupon Abbe said to him tell me sir was that statement in the name of Rab he replied yes and it has been so reported are his da said in the name of Rab an intention which makes pickle expressed during one service of burning concerning another service of burning does not render the offering pickle are Jacob B Abba said in the name of Abbe we have also learned the same if he slaughtered one of the lambs intending to eat a part of it on the morrow that lamb is pickle but the other lamb is valid if he intended to eat of the other lamb on the morrow both are valid now what is the reason it is is it not because the one lamb not being the matter of the other cannot make the offering Pickle by reason of an intention concerning that other know there the reason is because they are not joined in one vessel here however since they are joined in the one vessel they are considered as one our Hamna said the following was taught me by our Hannah and is equal in word to me to all my studies if he burnt the handful intending to burn the frankincense on the morrow and to eat the remainder on the morrow the offering is pickle what is it that he teaches us if he teaches us that an intention which makes pickle expressed during one service of burning concerning another service of burning renders the offering pickle then he should only have said if he burnt the handful intending to burn the frankincense on the morrow and if he teaches us that an intention which makes pickle expressed during the service of half the matter renders pickle then he should have only said if he burnt the handful intending to eat the remainder on the morrow and if he teaches us both these Rules then he should have said if he burnt the handful intending to burn the frankincense on the morrow and to eat the remainder on the morrow are at a Abba said actually he is of the opinion that an intention which makes pickle expressed during one service of burning concerning another service of burning does not render pickle and he holds also that an intention which makes pickle expressed during the service of half the matter does not render pickle yet in this case it is different since the wrongful intention has spread over the entire meal offering a tana once recited before our Isaac B Abba if he burnt the handful intending to eat the remainder on the morrow all hold it to be pickle but surely this is a matter of dispute rather render all hold it to be invalid but could he not have corrected himself thus it is pickle that is according to our mayor the tana evidently was taught the ruling all hold and he confused in his mind pickle with invalid but he would not confuse it is Pickle with all hold chapteriii mission if he took the handful from the meal offering intending to eat a thing that it is not usual to eat or to burn a thing that it is not usual to burn the offering is valid but our Eliezer declares it to be invalid if he intended to eat less than an olive's bulk of a thing that it is usual to eat or to burn less than an olive's bulk of a thing that it is usual to burn the offering is valid if he intended to eat a half olive's bulk and to burn a half olive's bulk the offering is valid for eating and burning cannot be reckoned together Gemara RC said in the name of our Yohanan what is the reason for our Eliezer S view because the verse reads and if any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings be at all eaten the verse here speaks of two eatings the eating by man and the eating by the altar to inform you that as there can be a wrongful intention concerning what is usually eaten by man so there can be a wrongful intention Concerning what is usually eaten by the altar and furthermore as there can be a wrongful intention concerning what is usually eaten by man in regard to man's eating thereof and concerning what is usually eaten by the altar in regard to the altar's eating thereof so there can be a wrongful intention concerning what is usually eaten by man in regard to the altar's eating thereof and concerning what is usually eaten by the altar in regard to man's eating thereof and why is this because the divine law expressed the burning upon the altar by the term eating and the rabbis what would they say to this the reason why the divine law expressed it by the term eating was to teach you Talmud, Mas Menikoth be that it makes no difference whether the wrongful intention for the altar was expressed by the use of the term eating or by use of the term burning or to teach you that as for eating the quantity of an olive's bulk is essential so for the burning the quantity of an olive's bulk is Essential the term eating however always means in the usual manner and our Eliezer if so he says the divine law should have stated either Yeakal Yakal or Yakal Yakal why does it say Yakal Yakal that you may infer two things there from our said to our see if this is the reason for our Eliezer's view then one should also incur the penalty of Karath and should you say that this is indeed so but you yourself have reported in the name of our Yohanan that our Eliezer admits that one is not thereby liable to Karath he replied Tanaim differ as to the real view of our Eliezer some say that it is invalid by biblical law others that it is invalid by rabbinical law only for it was taught if one slaughtered an animal offering intending to drink its blood on the morrow or to burn its flesh on the morrow or to eat of the sacrificial portions on the morrow the offering is valid but our Eliezer declares it to be invalid if he intended to leave some of its blood for the morrow our Judah declares it to be invalid our Eliezer said even in this case our Eliezer declares it to be invalid and the sages declare it to be valid now whose view does our Judah adopt do you say that of the rabbis but surely if in the case where the intention expressed is included under the term eating the rabbis declare the offering to be valid how much more so in this case it must therefore be that of our Eliezer and thereupon our Eliezer had said even in this case our Eliezer declares it to be invalid and the sages declare it to
This case our Eliezer declares it to be invalid and the sages declare it to be valid is then Arjuna of the opinion that in the case where there was an intention of leaving part of the blood for the morrow all agree that it is invalid but it has been taught Rabbi said when I went to our Eliezer B. Shamu to have my learning examined others say to sound the learning of our Eliezer B. Shamu I found there Joseph the Babylonian sitting before him now he Joseph was very dear to him he Joseph then said to him master what is the law if one slaughtered an offering intending to leave the blood for the morrow it is valid he replied in the evening he again replied it is valid on the next morning he again replied it is valid at midday he again replied it is valid in the afternoon he replied it is valid but our Eliezer declares it to be invalid thereupon Joseph's face lighted up said to him our Eliezer Joseph it seems to me that our traditions did not correspond until now quite so master he Reply quite so for Arjuna had taught me the view that it was invalid and when I sought out all his disciples so as to find a supporter of this view I could not find any but now that you have taught me the view that it is invalid you have thus restored to me what I had lost there upon the eyes of our Eliezer Bisham was streamed with tears and he exclaimed happy are ye scholars to whom the words of the Torah are so dear he then applied to him Joseph the following verse oh how I love thy law it is my meditation all the day for it was only because Arjuna was the son of our Eliezer and our Eliezer was the disciple of our Eliezer that he Arjuna taught you the view of our Eliezer now if it be assumed that Arjuna taught that all hold it is invalid then what did he Joseph mean when he said you have thus restored to me what I had lost here Eliezer Bisham had only told him in the end that there was a difference of opinion in the matter what then would you say that he Arjuna taught him it is valid, but our Eliezer declares it to be invalid. If so, why the expression for it was only because we also learned from our Eliezer B. Shamu that there was a difference of opinion in the matter. We must indeed say that he Arjuna taught him that all hold it is invalid. But what did he Joseph mean by saying you have thus restored to me what I had lost? He meant that he had brought the view it is invalid to light Mishnah if he did not pour in the oil or if he did not mingle it or if he did not break up the meal offering in pieces or if he did not salt it or wave it or bring it nigh or if he broke it up into large pieces or did not anoint it with oil. It is valid tomorrow. What is meant by he did not pour in the oil? Shall we say that he did not pour in any oil at all? But scripture has indicated that this is indispensable. We must say therefore that it means the priest did not pour in the oil, but a non priest did. If so, the next item he did not mingle it would also mean it. Priest did not mingle it, but a non priest did, from which it follows that if it was not mingled at all, it would be invalid. Talmud, Mas Medikothi, but we have learned sixty tenths can be mingled together, but not sixty one. And when we were considering this, and it was asked, What does it matter if they cannot be mingled together? Have we not learned if he did not mingle it, it is valid? Our Zara answered, Wherever proper mingling is possible, the mingling is not indispensable, but wherever proper mingling is not possible, the mingling is indispensable. Is this an argument? Surely this has its own meaning, and that has its own meaning. The item he did not pour in means the priest did not pour in the oil, but a non priest did, whereas the item he did not mingle it means it was not mingled at all, or if he broke it up into large pieces, but surely if where he did not break it up at all, it is valid. Is it then necessary to state that it is valid if he broke it up into large pieces? It Expression large pieces really means many pieces or if you will I may say that actually large pieces were meant nevertheless it had to be stated in our mission for you might have thought that only there is it valid since they retain the character of cakes but not here since they are neither cakes nor crumbs we are therefore taught that here too it is valid shall we say that our mission is not in agreement with our Simeon for it was taught our Simeon says a priest who does not believe in it. Service has no portion in the priesthood for it is written he among the sons of Aaron that offered the blood of the peace offerings and the fat shall have the right thigh for a portion that is to say if he believes in the service he has a portion in the priesthood and if he does not believe in the service he has no portion in the priesthood now I know it only of the service stated in the verse but once do I know it also of the fifteen services is pouring in the oil mingling breaking it. Absalting it, waving it, bringing it, night taking a handful, burning it, nipping off the head of a bird, offering, receiving the blood, sprinkling it, giving the water to a woman suspected of adultery, breaking the heifer's neck, purifying the leper, and raising the hands in blessing both within the temple and without the verse. Therefore, adds among the sons of Aaron that is all services that are entrusted to the sons of Aaron and the priest who does not believe in it has no portion in it. Priesthood, there is no difficulty, said Arnam, and there it deals with the meal offering of a priest here with the meal offering of an Israelite. In the case of the meal offering of an Israelite from which the handful must be taken, the duty of the priesthood begins with the taking out of the handful. We thus learn that the pouring in of the oil and the mingling are valid, even though performed by non priests. In the case of the meal offering of a priest from which the handful is not taken, it Services of the priesthood are required from the very beginning thereupon Rabbah said to him just see whence do we deduce that the right of pouring in the oil applies also to the meal offering of a priest from the meal offering of an Israelite do we not well as there the pouring in may be performed by a non-priest in this case too it may be performed by a non-priest others have the following version there is no difficulty said Arnaman here it deals with meal offerings from which the handful is taken there with meal offerings from which the handful is not taken thereupon Rabbah said to him just see whence do we deduce that the right of pouring in the oil applies also to meal offerings from which the handful is not taken from those meal offerings from which the handful is taken do we not well then they must be like unto those from which the handful is taken and as in the latter case the pouring in may be performed by a non-priest here too it may be performed by a non-priest obviously then our mission is not in agreement with our Simeon what is the reason of the rabbis it is written and he shall pour oil upon it and put frankincense thereon and he shall bring it to Aaron's sons of priests and he shall take thereout his handful from the taking of the handful and onwards is the function of the priesthood we thus learn that the pouring in of the oil and the mingling are valid even though performed by non-priests and our Simeon he says the scriptural expression Aaron's sons. Talmud, Mas Menachoth the priest is to be interpreted as referring to what precedes as well as to what follows and is our Simeon of the opinion that a scriptural expression is to be interpreted as referring to what precedes as well as to what follows but it has been taught it is written and the priest shall take of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar and shall take with his finger this teaches us that the taking of the blood shall be with the right hand only with his finger and put it this teaches us that the sprinkling shall be with the finger of the right hand only our Simeon said is the expression hand written in connection with the taking of the blood since the expression hand is not written in connection with the taking of the blood if he took the blood with the left hand it is still valid and Abbe said that they differ as to whether a scriptural expression is to be interpreted as referring to what precedes as well as to what follows or not this rather is the reason for our Simeon's view it is written and he shall bring it the term and indicates conjunction with the preceding subject but is our Simeon of the opinion that the term and indicates conjunction with the preceding subject then consider this it is written and he shall slaughter the bullet before the Lord and Aaron's sons the priest shall present the blood and sprinkle the blood from which it is clear that only from the act of receiving the blood and onwards is the function of the priesthood we thus learn that the slaughtering may be performed by a non-priest but according to our Simeon since the term and indicates conjunction with the preceding subject the slaughtering by a non-priest should not be permitted here it is different for it is written and he shall lay his hand and he shall slaughter and as the laying of the hands is performed by non-priests so the slaughtering may be performed by non-priests then should it not follow as it laying of the hands must be performed by the owner of the offering so the slaughtering too shall be performed by the owner you cannot say that as there is an a fortiori argument against it for if the sprinkling which is the chief service of atonement is not performed by the owner of fortiori the slaughtering which is not the chief service of atonement and should you retort but surely the possible is not to be inferred from the impossible then I say the fact that the divine long joined with Regard to the service on the day of atonement, and he shall slaughter the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, indicates that elsewhere the slaughtering need not be performed by the owners. Rab said, wherever the expressions law and statute occur in connection with any rites, their purpose is only to indicate the indispensability of those rites. Now it was assumed that both expressions were
Rights in each offering are not indispensable. We must therefore say that the expression law requires with it the expression statute in order to indicate indispensability, whereas statute does not require with it law, but did not rap say the expressions law and statute. He meant to say this even though the expression law is used only if there is also used the expression statute is indispensability implied otherwise it is not so, but in the case of the meal offering only the expression. Statute is used and yet Rab has stated every right of the meal offering which is repeated in another verse is indispensable which shows that only if it is repeated is it indispensable otherwise it is not that case is different for the expression statute relates only to the eating and is there not the shoe bread where undoubtedly the expression statute relates only to the eating yet we have learned of the two rows of the shoe bread the absence of one invalidates the other of the two dishes. A frankincense the absence of one invalidates the other of the rows and the dishes the absence of one invalidates the other therefore we must say that even where the expression statute is used in connection with the eating of the offering it relates to all the rights of that offering in that case however it is different for since it is written of the bruised corn thereof and of the oil thereof it is clear that only Talmud, Mos Medicoth be the bruised corn and the oil are. Indispensable, but no other thing is indispensable. To turn to the main text, Rab said every right of the meal offering which is repeated in another verse is indispensable. Samuel, however, said the bruised corn and the oil are indispensable, but no other thing is indispensable. Is it then suggested that according to Samuel, even though the right is repeated in another verse, it is not indispensable? Rather, the position is this: wherever any right is repeated in another verse, it is certainly indispensable. They differ only as to the effect of the interpretation of the phrases his handful and with his hand, for it was taught the phrases his handful and with his hand signify that he shall not use a measure for the taking of the handful. Now, Rab maintains that this too has been stated in another verse as it is written, and he presented the meal offering and filled his hand therefrom. Samuel, however, says that we cannot derive a permanent law from a temporary enactment. Is Samuel then of the opinion that we cannot derive a permanent law from a temporary enactment, but we have learned the vessels for liquids, hallow liquids, and the measuring vessels for dry stuffs, hallow dry stuffs, the vessels for liquids cannot hallow dry stuffs, neither can the measuring vessels for dry stuffs, hallow liquids, and thereupon Samuel had said this applies only to the measuring vessels for liquids, but the sprinkling bowls hallow also dry stuffs, for it is written both of them full of fine flour. This case is different since the verse is repeated twelve times, Arkahana and R.C. said to Rab, but is not the bringing nigh of the meal offering to the altar repeated in scripture, nevertheless it is not indispensable where is it repeated because it is written, and this is the law of the meal offering, the sons of Aaron shall bring it nigh before the Lord to the front of the altar, but surely that verse merely determines the place whether it shall be brought as it has been taught if the verse had only stated before the Lord I might have thought that it meant on the west side of the altar the verse therefore added to the front of the altar and if the verse had only stated to the front of the altar I might have thought that it meant on the south side the verse therefore stated before the Lord so what was the procedure he brought it nigh onto the southwest corner opposite the point of the altar's horn and that suffice our Eliezer says it is possible to think that the meaning is he can bring it nigh either to the west corner or to the south corner but you can answer wherever you find two texts one self-confirmatory and confirming the words of the other whereas the second is self-confirmatory but in all the words of the other we abandon the latter and accept the former thus when you emphasize before the Lord i.e. on the west side of the altar you annul to the front of the altar which is on the south side but when you emphasize to the front of the altar i.e. on the south Side you confirm before the Lord which is on the west side, but how do you confirm it? Or as she said, this Tana holds that the whole of the altar stood in the north are who not emerged, but the salting of the meal offering is not repeated in scripture. Nevertheless, it is indispensable for it has been taught the verse it is a covenant of salt forever signifies that there is Talmud, Mos Menachoth, a covenant declared in regard to salt. So our Judah, our Simeon says here it is said it is a covenant of salt forever, and there it is said the covenant of an everlasting priesthood as it is impossible to conceive of sacrifices without the priesthood. So it is impossible to conceive of sacrifices without salt. Our Joseph answered Rab agrees with the Tana of our Mishnah who said if he did not salt it, it is valid. Thereupon Abbe said to him, Are you then suggesting that he did not pour means he did not pour in any oil at all? It surely means that the priest did not pour in the oil, but a non priest. Did it then here too? It must be explained that the priest did not salt it, but a non priest did it. He replied, How can it even enter your mind that a non priest shall draw near to the altar? Alternatively, I can say, since with regard to the salting, the expression covenant is used, it is as though it were repeated in a verse, and is not the salting actually repeated in a verse, but it is written, and every offering of thy meal offering shalt thou season with salt. This verse is required for the following which had been taught. If the verse had stated, and every offering shalt thou season with salt, I would have concluded that it also applied to the wood and the blood, since these are also termed offering the verse. Therefore, as meal offering, thus as the meal offering is distinguished in that other things are requisite for it, so everything for which other things are requisite must be seasoned with salt, but I can argue as the meal offering is distinguished in that it renders something. Permissible, so everything which renders something permissible must be seasoned with salt. I would thus include the blood since it renders something permissible. The verse therefore states, Neither shalt thou suffer the salt to be lacking from thy meal offering, but not from thy blood. I might conclude then that the whole meal offering requires salting. The verse therefore states, Offering signifying that only what is offered requires salting, but the whole meal offering does not require salting. I know now that the handful requires salting, but whence do I know to include the frankincense? I include the frankincense since it is offered with the handful in the same vessel, and whence do I know to include the frankincense that is offered by itself? The frankincense that is offered in the dishes, the incense offering, the meal offering of priests, the meal offering of the anointed high priest, the meal offering that is offered together with the drink offerings, the sacrificial parts. Of the most holy and the lesser holy sacrifices, the limbs of the burnt offering of an animal and the burnt offering of a bird. The verse therefore states, With all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. The master stated, I know now that the handful requires salting, but whence do I know to include the frankincense? I include the frankincense since it is offered with the handful in the same vessel, but have you not stated previously as the meal offering is distinguished in that other things are requisite for it? This is what he meant. I might argue that the expression offering is a general proposition and meal offering a particular item, so that we would have here a general proposition followed by a particular item, in which case the scope of the proposition is limited to the particular item specified, hence only the meal offering would require salting, but no other thing. The verse therefore added with all thine offerings, which is another general proposition, so that we have now to. General proposition separated from each other by a particular item in which case they include only such things as are similar to the particular item specified as the item specified is clearly something for which other things are requisite so everything for which other things are requisite requires salting and what are the other things that are requisite for it it is the wood so that everything which requires wood must be seasoned with salt but perhaps it is the frankincense so that I would include the blood since there go with it the drink offerings the drink offerings go rather with the burning of the sacrificial parts for eating and drinking go together on the contrary atonement and joy go well together this is what was meant the frankincense goes together with the handful in the same vessel whereas the drink offerings do not go together with the blood in the same vessel the wood on the other hand just as it is essential for the meal offering so it is essential for all offerings, but I could argue thus as the item specified is clearly something for which other things are requisite and also renders aught permissible, so everything for which other things are requisite and which renders aught permissible requires salting, and in this way only the frankincense that is in the dishes would be included since it renders the shoe bread permissible, but no other offering since the expression from the meal offering was necessary to exclude the blood, it follows. That everything else is included by its similarity with the meal offering in one respect, the master stated, Neither shalt thou suffer the salt to be lacking from the meal offering, but not from thy blood, but perhaps it is to be interpreted from the meal offering, but not from thy sacrificial limbs. It is more reasonable to include the limbs since Nemonic ASHB and TMA other things are requisite for them as for the meal offering, they are burnt by fire like it, they are treated outside. Like it, they are subject to the law of Nahar, like it to the law of uncleanness, like it and to the law of sacrilege, like it
The author of this parita, if rabbi, then the inclusion of the wood is a difficulty, and if the rabbis, then the inclusion of the incense is a difficulty, it is the following tenet, for it was taught our Ishmael, the son of our Yohan, and Bibaraka says, just as the particular item specified is clearly something which can contract uncleanness is consumed by fire and is offered upon the other altar, so everything which can contract uncleanness is consumed by fire and is offered upon the other altar. Requires salting, hence the wood is excluded since it cannot contract uncleanness, the blood and the wine are excluded since they are not consumed by fire, and the incense is excluded since it is not offered upon the other altar. Now this is so clearly because the verse excluded the blood, but otherwise I should have said that the blood must be salted, surely by salting it, it loses the character of blood for Zeir I said in the name of our Hanani, blood was cooked and then one ate of it one does. Not thereby committed transgression, and Rab Judah said in the name of Zeiri, if blood was salted and one ate of it, one does not thereby committed transgression. Moreover, Rab Judah on his own authority said, if the sacrificial limbs were roasted and then brought up on the altar, they are no longer under the denomination of a sweet savor. One might have thought that in compliance with the precept, a little salt should be sprinkled there, and we are therefore taught that it is excluded from this. Law, the text above stated, Zeiri said in the name of Arhanan, if blood was cooked and then one ate of it, one does not thereby committed transgression. Rabba was sitting reciting the statement when Abbe raised against him the following objection: if a man coagulated blood and ate it, or if he dissolved forbidden fat and gulped it down, he is culpable. This is no difficulty. In the one case, he coagulated it by the fire, in the other, he coagulated it in the sun. If by the fire, it will not resolve. Into its former state, if in the sun it will do so, but even though it was coagulated in the sun, should we not say that once it has been set aside, it must remain so? For did not Armani inquire of our Yohan and what is the law if one ate congealed blood? And he replied, Once it has been set aside, it must remain so. He remained silent and said, Abbe to him, perhaps the one case deals with the blood of external sin offerings and the other with the blood of internal sin offerings you have now. He exclaimed, Reminded me of the law for Rabbi said in the name of our his If one ate the congealed blood of an external sin offering, one is culpable for the divine law says, and he shall take and put it, and such is fit for taking and putting upon the horn of the altar. If one ate the congealed blood of an internal sin offering, one is not culpable for the divine law says, and he shall dip and sprinkle, and such is not fit for dipping and sprinkling. And Rabbi on his own authority said, Even. If one ate the congealed blood of an internal sin offering, one is culpable since with external sin offerings blood in such a condition is fit for the ritual purpose. Therefore said our Papa, if one ate the congealed blood of an ass, one is culpable since with external sin offerings blood in such a condition is fit for the ritual purpose. Our Giddle said in the name of Zeir, blood is regarded as an interposition whether it be moist or dry. An objection was raised, blood in honey and milk if dry. Constitute an interposition if moist they do not constitute an interposition. This is no difficulty in one case the blood was visited in the other. It was not for what purpose does scripture state thou shalt salt for the following which was taught if the verse had only stated with salt I might have thought that it meant even to the verse therefore stated thou shalt salt and if the verse had only stated thou shalt salt I might have thought that it meant even with salt water the verse. Therefore stated with salt neither shalt thou suffer the salt to be lacking that is bring that salt which has no sabbath and that is the salt of Sodom and whence do we know that if one cannot obtain the salt of Sodom one may bring salt of Israel because the verse states thou shalt offer thou shalt offer whatever salt it is thou shalt offer from whatever place it comes thou shalt offer even on the sabbath thou shalt offer even in conditions of uncleanness what is the meaning of Tibonu? Rabbi Biola said this is what was meant I might have thought that one should heat the salt upon it as strong clay if so said to him Abbe it should have said yet have men rather said Abbe I might have thought that one should pile up the salt like a building if so said Rabbi to him it should have said yet men rather said Rabbi I might have thought that it meant Tibonu and what does Tibonu mean Arashi explained I might have thought that one should apply to it salt only to give it a taste. Just as the understanding the verse therefore stated thou shalt season how should one do it one takes the limb spread salt over it turns it over and again spread salt over it and then offers it Abbe said and so too it should be done for cooking meat in the pot Talmud. Mos Menikoth B. Our rabbis taught the salt which is upon the sacrificial limb is subject to the law of sacrilege but that which is upon the ascent or upon the head of the altar is not subject to the law of sacrilege R. Matana said there is scriptural authority for this for it is written and thou shalt present them before the Lord and the priests shall cast salt upon them and they shall offer them up for a burnt offering unto the Lord we have learned elsewhere the Beth ordained concerning the salt and the wood of the temple stores that the priests may use them freely Samuel said they allowed this use of salt only for their offerings but not for eating now it was thought that for their offerings. Meant for salting their own offerings and for eating meant the eating of consecrated meat, but surely if we provide them with salt from the temple stores in order to salt the hides of the animal offerings, shall we not provide them with salt to eat the consecrated meat? For it was taught, and so you find that salt was used in three places in the salt chamber on the ascent and at the head of the altar in the salt chamber where they used to salt the hides of animal offerings on the ascent where they used to salt the sacrificial limbs at the head of the altar where they used to salt the handful of the frankincense, the incense offering, the meal offering of the priests, the anointed high priest, meal offering, the meal offering that is offered with the drink offerings and the burnt offering of the bird. We must therefore say that for their offerings means for the eating of consecrated meat and for eating means the eating of unconsecrated food, unconsecrated food. You say surely this is. Obvious for how does it come to be there although the master stated they shall eat signifies that if the remainder of the meal offering is insufficient they should eat with it unconsecrated food and terima so that it should be eaten after the appetite is satisfied nevertheless we do not provide them with salt from the temple Rabbanah said to our ashi this indeed is most logical for should you say that for their offerings meant for salting their own offerings so that they are entitled to this. Only because the Beth Din granted them this concession but had not the Beth Din granted them this concession they would not be entitled to it but surely if we provide the Israelites with salt for their offerings shall we not provide the priests too for it was taught I might have thought that if a man said I take upon myself to offer a meal offering he must provide the salt himself just as he must provide the frankincense himself and the following argument supports the contention it is. Enjoined that with a meal offering there must be salt, and it is also enjoined that with a meal offering there must be frankincense. Therefore, just as the frankincense he must provide himself, so the salt too he must provide himself. Or perhaps argue this way: it is enjoined that with a meal offering there must be salt, and it is also enjoined that with a meal offering there must be wood. Therefore, just as the wood is taken from the communal store, so the salt too is taken from the communal store. Let us then see to which it is most similar. We derive the law concerning a matter that is essential to all offerings from another matter which is essential to all offerings, and let not the frankincense prove against this, since it is not a matter which is essential to all offerings. Or perhaps argue this way: we derive the law concerning a matter which is offered with the meal offering in one vessel from another matter which is also offered with the meal offering in one vessel, and let not the wood. Prove against this since it is not a matter which is offered with the meal offering in one vessel scripture therefore states concerning the salt it is a covenant of salt forever and elsewhere concerning the shoe bread it says it is on behalf of the children of Israel a covenant forever as the one was taken out of the supplies of the community so the other was also taken out of the supplies of the community thereupon our Mordecai said to our Ashi thus said our Shisha the son of our Edi it was necessary to be stated only according to Ben Bakri's view for we have learned our Judah said Ben Bakri testified at Jabna that a priest who paid the shekel has committed no sin Rabban Yohanan Bizakai said to him not so but rather a priest who did not pay the shekel has committed a sin the priest however used to expound the following verse to their advantage and every meal offering of the priest shall be holy burnt it shall not be eaten since the Omer offering and the two loaves and it Shoe bread are ours, how can they be eaten? But according to Ben Bakri, since they are not in the first instance liable to pay the shekel when they do pay it, they have surely committed a sin, for they have brought unconsecrated matter into the temple, they bring it and deliver it
Handful of another or with the priest's meal offering or with the meal offering of the anointed high priest or with the meal offering offered with the drink offerings it is valid our Judah says if it was mixed with the meal offering of the anointed high priest or with the meal offering offered with the drink offerings it is invalid for since the consistency of the one is thick and the consistency of the other is then each absorbs from the other tomorrow we have learned elsewhere if the blood of a sacrifice was mixed with water and it still has the appearance of blood it is valid if it was mixed with wine it must be regarded as though it was water if it was mixed with the blood of unconsecrated cattle or of a wild animal it must be regarded as though it was water our Judah says blood cannot neutralize blood our Johan and said both derive their views by expounding the same verses and he shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat now it is well known that the Blood of a bullock is more than the blood of a goat. The rabbis therefore conclude Talmud, Mas Menachoth be from this that in a mixture of things which are offered up one element cannot neutralize the other. Arjuda, however, concludes from this that in a mixture of like kinds neutralization does not take place. The rabbis conclude from this that in a mixture of things which are offered up one element cannot neutralize the other. But perhaps the reason why one does not neutralize the other is because here is a mixture of like kinds. Had this been merely a mixture of like kinds and not of things which are offered up, it would be as you say. But since it is here a mixture of things which are offered up, it is clear that the reason is that it is a mixture of things which are offered up. Perhaps then we can conclude from this that only in a mixture of like kinds of things which are offered up one element cannot neutralize the other. This is a difficulty. Arjuda concludes from this that. In a mixture of like kinds neutralization does not take place but perhaps the reason why one does not neutralize the other is because here is a mixture of things which are offered up had this been merely a mixture of unlike kinds of things which are offered up it would be as you say but since it is a mixture of like kinds it is clear that the reason is that here it is a mixture of like kinds perhaps then we can conclude from this that only in a mixture of like kinds of things offered up one element cannot neutralize the other this is a difficulty an objection was raised we have learned our Judah says if it was mixed with the meal offering of the anointed high priest or with the meal offering offered with the drink offerings it is invalid for since the consistency of the one is thick and the consistency of the other is then each absorbs from the other but what does it matter if one does absorb from the other the mixture here is of like kinds Talmud, Mas Menico, the Rabbah. Answered Arjuda is of the opinion that where an element is mixed with like kind and also with another kind you must disregard the like kind as if it were not there and the other kind if more in quantity will neutralize the element it was reported if the priest poured oil on the handful taken from the sinner's meal offering our Yohan and maintains it is invalid but Reshalakish says he should in the first instance wipe up with it the remains of the log of oil and then offer it but is it not written he shall put no oil upon it neither shall he put any frankincense thereon that verse means that one should not apportion for it a quantity of oil as for the other meal offerings our Yohan and raised an objection against Reshalakish it was taught if a dry meal offering was mixed with one mingled with oil it may be offered up Arjuda says it may not be offered up presumably the handful of a sinner's meal offering was mixed with the handful of a free will meal offering no the meal offering that is offered with a bullock or with a ram was mixed with the meal offering that is offered with a lamb but this is expressly stated visit the meal offering that is offered with a bullock or with a ram was mixed with the meal offering that is offered with a lamb or if a dry meal offering was mixed with one mingled with oil it may be offered up our Judah says it may not be offered up one clause merely illustrates the other robber raised the question what is the law of oil was squeezed out of the handful onto would do we say that whatsoever is joined to the thing offered is like the offering itself or not robin is said to our ashi is not this question similar to the case disputed by our Yohanan and Reshlakish for it was reported if a man offered up outside the temple court a limb which was not as large as an olive but the bone brought it up to an olive's bulk our Yohanan says he is liable to the penalty of Kareth but Reshlakish says he is not liable our Yohanan says he is liable because what is joined to the thing offered is like the offering itself. Reshlakish says he is not liable because what is joined to the thing offered is not like the offering. The question can indeed be asked both according to our Yohanan and according to Reshlakish. It can be asked according to our Yohanan for it may be that our Yohanan held that view only in regard to the bone since it is of the same kind as the flesh but not in regard to the wood for it is not of the same kind as the handful and resh. Lakish too perhaps he held that view only in regard to the bone since it can become separated and if separated there is no obligation to put it back but not in regard to the oil for it cannot be separated or perhaps these differences do not count. The question remains unanswered. Mission if two meal offerings from which the handfuls had not yet been taken were mixed together but it is still possible to take the handful from each separately they are valid otherwise they are invalid if the handful of a meal offering was mixed with a meal offering from which the handful had not yet been taken it must not be offered if however it was offered then the meal offering from which the handful had been taken discharges the owner's obligation whilst the other from which the handful had not been taken does not discharge the owner's obligation if the handful was mixed with the remainder of the meal offering or with the remainder of another meal offering it must not be offered but if it was offered it discharges the owner's obligation Gamar Arhisda said nibble meat is neutralized in ritually slaughtered meat since slaughtered meat cannot assume the character of nibble meat ritually slaughtered meat is not neutralized in nibble meat since nibble meat can assume the character of slaughtered meat for when it has petrified the uncleanness thereof has gone but Arhanan said whatsoever can become like the other is not neutralized and whatsoever cannot become like the other is neutralized According to whose view do they differ it cannot be according to the view of the rabbis for they have said that only things which are offered up do not neutralize one another but in a mixture of like kinds neutralization takes effect neither can it be according to Arjuda for Talmud, Mas Menachoth B. Arjuda adopts the criterion of appearance and by that criterion in either case it would be a mixture of like kinds rather it is according to Arhai's view for Arhai taught in a mixture of Nibble meat and ritually slaughtered meat neutralization takes place and whose view does Arhai follow it cannot be that of the rabbis for they have said that only things which are offered up do not neutralize one another but in a mixture of like kinds neutralization takes effect neither can it be that of Arjuda for according to Arjuda in any mixture of like kinds neutralization does not take effect in fact he follows the opinion of Arjuda for Arjuda laid down the rule that in a mixture of like kinds neutralization does not take effect only in that case where it is possible for one kind to become like the other but where it is not possible for one kind to become like the other their neutralization does take effect and they differ in this point Arhista holds that we must consider the neutralizer but Arhanna holds that we must consider what is to be neutralized we have learned if two meal offerings from which the handfuls had not yet been taken were mixed together but it is still possible to take the handful from each separately they are valid otherwise they are invalid now in this case we see that when the handful is taken from one whereby the rest becomes the remainder this remainder does not neutralize the other meal offering from which the handful has not yet been taken whose view is represented here it cannot be that of the rabbis for they have said that only things which are offered up do not neutralize one another but in a mixture of like kinds Neutralization takes effect obviously it is the view of Arjuna now this is well according to him who holds that we must consider what is to be neutralized for here what is to be neutralized can become like the neutralizer seeing that when the handful will have been taken from the other meal offering there will be a remainder like that of the first meal offering but according to him who holds that we must consider the neutralizer it will be asked here can the remainder ever become like that from which the handful has not yet been taken are we to say then that our mission is not in accordance with our high as interpreted by our it is to be explained there according to our Zara's dictum for our Zara said burning is stated with regard to the handful and burning is also stated with regard to the remainder therefore as in the case of the handful concerning which the expression burning is used it is established that one handful cannot neutralize the other so too in the case of it Remainder concerning which the expression burning is also used the remainder cannot neutralize the handful come and here if the handful of a meal offering was mixed with a meal offering from which the handful had not been taken it must not be offered if however it was offered then the meal offering from which the handful had been taken discharges the owner's obligation whilst the other from which the handful had not been taken does not discharge the
or with the remainder of another meal offering it must not be offered but if it was offered it discharges the owner's obligation now here the neutralizer cannot become like that which is to be neutralized nor can what is to be neutralized become like the neutralizer nevertheless the remainder does not neutralize the handful whose view is this it cannot be that of the rabbis for etc our zera answered burning is stated with regard to the handful and burning is also stated with regard to the remainder as in the case of the handful concerning which the expression burning is used it is established that one handful cannot neutralize the other so too in the case of the remainder concerning which the expression burning is also used the remainder cannot neutralize the handful come and here if one seasoned it with cumin or with sesame seed or with any other kind of spice it is fit for it is unleavened bread only that it is called seasoned unleavened bread now it was assumed that there were more spices than unleavened dough according to him and who holds that we must consider what is to be neutralized it is well for what is to be neutralized can become like the neutralizer seeing that when it becomes moldy it is like the spices but according to him who holds that we must consider the neutralizer it will be asked can the spices become like the unleavened bread we are dealing here with the case where there was not so much spices indeed the larger part was the unleavened Bread and therefore it is not neutralized. This too is to be inferred from the words of the Beretha. For it reads, it is unleavened bread only that it is called seasoned unleavened bread. This is conclusive. When Arkahana went up to Palestine, he found the sons of Arhai sitting and discoursing as follows: If one divided a tenth Talmud, Masmenek of and put the two halves into the mixing vessel, and then a Tibalyon touched one of them, what would be the law? Does the rule which we learned that with consecrated things a vessel unites all that is therein apply only when they are touching one another, but not when they do not touch one another? Or perhaps this makes no difference. Said he to them, Did we learn a vessel joins? We learned a vessel unites. That is in all circumstances. If one placed another half tent between them, what is the law? You replied to them, The rule is what stands in need of a vessel. The vessel unites what does not stand in need of a vessel. The vessel does not. Unite and what if a T. Bolyam inserted his finger between them? You replied, There is nothing other than earth and where vessels that can convey uncleanness through its airspace. He then put to them this question, May the handful be taken from one half in respect of the other? Is the principle of the vessel uniting its contents biblical or only rabbinical? They answered him, We have not heard of that, but we have heard of a similar case, for we have learned if two meal offerings from which the handfuls had not yet been taken were mixed together, but it is still possible to take the handful from each separately, they are valid, otherwise they are invalid. Now, where it is possible to take the handful from each separately, it states that they are valid, but why the rest that is mixed together surely does not touch the handful. Rabbah, however, suggested that perhaps the masses were spread in the shape of a comb. What is then the ruling said, Rabbah, come and here, for it has been taught, and he shall take up there from that is from the whole one may not therefore bring the tent divided in two vessels and have the handful taken it follows however that from one vessel which is like two vessels the handful may be taken said abe to him perhaps by two vessels is meant e.g. a cup is a measure fixed in a cap measure for although on top the contents are united since the sides of the cup is a measure form a partition below one may not bring the meal offering therein and by one vessel which is like two vessels is meant e.g. a hand trough in which the contents although separated by a partition are nevertheless in contact but in this case where they are not in contact the question still remains our jeremiah raised this question how is it where the vessel unites the two half tents within and there is a connection by water with another half tent lying outside does the rule which we learned that with consecrated things a vessel unites all that is therein apply to what is inside but not to what is outside or perhaps since there is a connection it is united thereby and if you were to decide that since there is a connection it is united thereby this further question will arise how is it where there is a connection by water with one of the halves inside the vessel and the vessel unites the halves that are therein and then a tea bullion touch the part that was outside does the rule which tackle since the sides of the inner receptacle separate the contents of the one we have learned that with consecrated things a vessel unites all that is therein apply only to the case where the uncleanness came into contact with what was inside but not where it came into contact with what was outside or perhaps this makes no difference these questions remain undecided robber raised the following question what is the position if a tent was divided into halves and one of the halves became unclean afterwards these two halves were placed in the mixing vessel and a tea bullion touched that half which was already unclean, do we say that it is sated with uncleanness or not said to him? Do we then say that a thing can be sated with uncleanness? Surely we have learned if a sheet which had contracted Madras uncleanness Talmud, Mos Menachoth B was used as a curtain, it becomes free of Madras uncleanness but remains unclean by reason of contact with Madras uncleanness. Our Jose said what Madras uncleanness has it touched if however one that had an issue had touched it, it would be unclean by reason of contact with one that had an issue. At any rate, it says if one that had an issue had touched it, it would be unclean, presumably even though this contact was subsequent to the Madras uncleanness, that is to say it first had contracted Madras uncleanness and then further uncleanness by reason of contact with one that had an issue. Now why is this? Should we not say it was sated with uncleanness? He replied, once do you know to say that this contact by one that had an issue? Was subsequent to the Madras uncleanness, perhaps it was prior to the Madras uncleanness, so that it was a case of a graver uncleanness being imposed upon a lighter uncleanness here. However, since at each contact there is only a light uncleanness, it is not so one might prove it. However, from the subsequent mission which reads our Jose agrees that where two sheets lay folded one above the other and one that had an issue sat upon them, the upper has contracted Madras uncleanness and the lower has contracted Madras uncleanness and also uncleanness by reason of contact with Madras uncleanness. Now, why is this? Should we not say it was sated with uncleanness there? They come simultaneously whilst here they come one after another. Rabbi said where a tent was divided into halves and one half was lost, so that another was brought as a substitute and then it was found again, and now all three half tents are in the mixing vessel. If that which had been lost became unclean, then it is united. With the first half tent, but not with the substituted half tent. If the substituted half tent became unclean, then it is united with the first half tent, but not with the lost half tent. If the first half tent became unclean, then it is united with each of the others. Abe said, even if any one of the half tents became unclean, it is united with each of the others, since they all belong together. And so it is with regard to the taking of the handful. If the handful was taken from the half tent, which had been lost, then what was left of it, and the first half tent may be eaten, but not the substituted half tent. If it was taken from the substituted half tent, then what was left of it, and the first half tent may be eaten, but not the half tent which had been lost. If it was taken from the first half tent, then what was left of it may be eaten, but the others may not be eaten. Abe said, even though the handful was taken from any one half tent, the other two may not be eaten, since they. All belong together. Our Papa demurred. You say that what was left of it may be eaten, but one third of the handful has not been offered. Our Isaac, the son of our Meshur, she also demurred. How may the handful be offered? Is not one third thereof unhallowed? Our Ashi answered, The taking of the handful rests with the mind of the priest, and clearly, when the priest takes the handful, he does so only in respect of the tenth Talmud. Mos Menachoth, the Mishnah, if the handful had become unclean and yet was offered, the plate renders it acceptable, but if it had been taken out of the temple court and was afterwards offered, the plate does not render it acceptable, for the plate only renders acceptable the offering which was unclean, but not that which was taken out. Gemara, our rabbis taught it is written, and Aaron shall bear the iniquity of the holy things. What iniquity is it that it atones for? Should you say it is the iniquity of pickle, but it has already been said it shall not be accepted? Should you say it? Is the iniquity of Nahar, but it has already been said, neither shall it be imputed unto him, hence it atones for nothing other than the iniquity of uncleanness, since an exception to the general rule has been made for the community. Arzara demurred, perhaps it is the iniquity of an offering having been taken outside that the plate atones for, since an exception to the general rule had been made in the case of the high places. Abbe answered, It is written that they may be accepted before the Lord. That is the iniquity committed before the Lord is atoned for by the plate, but not the iniquity of an offering having been taken outside. Arla demurred, perhaps it is the iniquity of a service being performed with the left hand that is atoned for by the plate, since an exception to the general rule has been made on the day of atonement. Abbe answered him, The verse states iniquity that
is whether inadvertently or deliberately, whether accidentally or intentionally Talmud, Mas Menikoth B. It is not acceptable. A contradiction was pointed out for it was taught for what guilt does a plate atone for the blood or the flesh or the fat of an offering which became unclean, whether inadvertently or deliberately, whether accidentally or intentionally, whether in a private offering or in an offering of the community set are Joseph. There is no contradiction for one very the states it. View of our Jose, the other, the view of the rabbis, for it has been taught one must not set aside unclean produce as teramah for clean produce if one did so inadvertently the teramah is valid, but if deliberately the teramah is not valid, our Jose says whether one did it inadvertently or deliberately the teramah is valid, but perhaps all that our Jose said was that we do not penalize him. Have you heard him say that the plate atones for the uncleanness of the eatable portions of the offering has it not? Been taught our Eliezer says the plate atones for the uncleanness of the eatable portions, but our Jose says the plate does not atone for the uncleanness of the eatable portions. You must reverse the authorities and read us. Our Eliezer says the plate does not atone for the uncleanness of the eatable portions, but our Jose says the plate does atone for the uncleanness of the eatable portions, but how can you reverse the authorities? Behold, it has been taught I might have thought that an Unclean person who ate of the flesh of a sacrifice which had become unclean before the sprinkling of the blood would be culpable on the ground of uncleanness. It is therefore written, Everyone that is clean shall eat the flesh, but the soul that eats of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings that pertain unto the Lord having his uncleanness upon him, that soul shall be cut off from his people, signifying that the unclean person who eats of what has been rendered permitted to those that are clean is culpable on account of uncleanness, but the unclean person who eats of what has not been rendered permitted to those that are clean is not culpable on account of uncleanness, but perhaps it is not so, but rather it signifies that the unclean person who eats of what may now be eaten by those that are clean is culpable on account of uncleanness, but the unclean person who eats of what may not now be eaten by those that are clean is not culpable on account of uncleanness, and so on. Would exclude those parts of the offering which had been left overnight and which had been taken out of the temple court since they may not be eaten by those that are clean. The verse therefore states that pertain unto the Lord an inclusive expression. I might then include the flesh that was pickled and that which was left over, but is not that which was left over identical with that which had been left overnight. Read therefore I might then include the flesh that was pickled that it shall be. Like that which was left over the verse therefore states of the sacrifice of peace offerings an exclusive expression. And why do you prefer to include the one class and exclude the other since the verse uses an inclusive and also an exclusive expression? I include those which were at one time permitted, but I exclude those which were at no time permitted. If you now ask why is an unclean person culpable on the ground of uncleanness for eating after the sprinkling of the blood flesh which had Become unclean before the sprinkling. I reply, it is because the plate atones for it. Now one is culpable only for that which became unclean, but not for that which was taken out. And whom have you heard say that where the offering had been taken out of the temple court, the sprinkling is of no effect? It is our Eliezer, and yet it states in the Berith that the plate atones for the uncleanness of the eatable portions are his dot, and said there is no difficulty at all for one Berith states. The view of our Eliezer, the other, the view of the rabbis, but perhaps all that our Eliezer said was that the plate atones for the uncleanness of the eatable portions. Have you heard him say that we do not impose any penalty? Indeed, we have, for just as we assume that to be our Jose's view, so we may assume it to be our Eliezer's view too. For it has been taught our Eliezer says whether one set apart unclean produce as teramah for clean produce inadvertently or deliberately, the teramah is valid, but Perhaps our Eliezer said so only in the case of Teramah which is less grave have you heard him say so in the case of holy things which are more grave than to whom will you attribute that very the Rabbana said as to its uncleanness whether it was rendered unclean inadvertently or deliberately the offering is acceptable but as to its sprinkling if it was sprinkled inadvertently it is acceptable but if deliberately it is not acceptable our Sheila said as to its sprinkling whether it was sprinkled inadvertently or deliberately it is acceptable but as to its uncleanness if it was rendered unclean inadvertently it is acceptable but if deliberately it is not acceptable and how does our Sheila explain the very which reads which became unclean whether inadvertently or deliberately it means it was rendered unclean inadvertently and it was sprinkled either inadvertently or deliberately Talmud, Mas Menico, the here it was taught if the blood became unclean and it was Sprinkled inadvertently it is acceptable if deliberately it is not acceptable it means if the blood became unclean and it was sprinkled whether it was sprinkled inadvertently or deliberately if it was rendered unclean inadvertently it is acceptable but if deliberately it is not acceptable mission if the remainder of the meal offering became unclean or was burnt or lost according to the rule of our Eliza it is lawful to burn the handful but according to the rule of our Joshua it is unlawful. Gemara Rab said that is so provided the whole of the remainder became unclean but not if only a part of it became unclean now it was assumed that this provision applied only to the case where it became unclean but not to the case where it was burnt or lost but what could be Rab's view if he holds that what is left thereof is something of consequence then the same should be the case where it was burnt or lost and if he holds that what is left thereof is of no consequence but that in the case. Where it became unclean, the reason is that the plate atones for the uncleanness of the eatable portions, and the same should be the case even where the whole of the remainder became unclean. Indeed, he holds that what is left thereof is something of consequence, and as it is in the case where it became unclean, so it is where it was burnt or lost. The only reason, however, why Rab dealt with the case where it became unclean was that it was the first mentioned in our mission, and so it was taught in the following Barry. The Joshua says, if of any animal offering mentioned in the Torah there remained an olive's bulk of the flesh or an olive's bulk of the fat, the priest may sprinkle the blood. If there remained a half olive's bulk of the flesh and a half olive's bulk of the fat, he may not sprinkle the blood in the case of a burnt offering. However, even if there remained a half olive's bulk of the flesh and a half olive's bulk of the fat, he may sprinkle the blood since it is holy. Burnt and in the case of a meal offering, even if all of it still remains, he may not sprinkle the blood. How does the meal offering come in here? Our Papa explained that it referred to the meal offering offered with the drink offerings. For one might have thought that since it accompanies the animal offering, it is deemed to be part of the animal offering. We are therefore taught that it is not so. Whence do we know this? Our Yohanan said in the name of our Ishmael, while some trace the tradition further. Back to our Joshua B. Hanani, the verse says, And he shall burn the fat for a sweet savor unto the Lord. Hence the blood is sprinkled on account of the fat. Even if there is no flesh, we thus know it of the fat. But whence do we know it of the call of the liver and of the two kidneys? For it has been stated in the above mentioned burial. And in the case of a meal offering, even if all of it still remains, he may not sprinkle the blood that is on account of the meal offering. He may not sprinkle it. Blood, but it is to be inferred that he may sprinkle on account of the call of the liver or of the two kidneys. Whence do we know it? Or Yohanan explained on his own authority, it is written for a sweet savor, signifying that the blood may be sprinkled on account of everything that is offered up for a sweet savor, and it was absolutely necessary for the verse to have written the fat as well as for a sweet savor. For if only the fat were written, I should have said that only on account of the fat may the blood be sprinkled, but not on account of the call of the liver or the two kidneys. The divine law therefore stated for a sweet savor, and if only for a sweet savor were written, I should have said that even on account of the meal offering, may the blood be sprinkled. The divine law therefore stated the fat mission. If he did not put the handful into a vessel of ministry, it is invalid. But our Simeon declares it valid. If he burnt the handful twice, it is valid. Gemara Arjuna, the son of Ar. I said what is the reason for our Simeon's view it is written it is most holy as the sin offering and as the guilt offering that is to say if he is about to perform the service with his hand he must do so with his right hand as the sin offering but if he is about to offer it in a vessel he may do so with his left hand as the guilt offering our Jane said since he took the handful from a vessel of ministry he may offer it up and burn it even in his girdle and even in the pots heard Arnam and B. Isaac said all agree that the handful must be sanctified an objection was raised if the fat the limbs and the wood were brought up to be burnt upon the altar with the hand or with the vessel with the right hand or with the left they are
Remainder outside the prescribed place it is invalid but there is no penalty of Karath but if he intended to eat it outside the prescribed time it is pickle and there is also the penalty of Karath this is the opinion of our Eliezer and our Simeon but the sages say as soon as he transferred it into his left hand the transfer rendered it invalid the reason being that it still required sanctification in a vessel and since it has been transferred into the left hand it is on the same footing as when the blood of an offering had poured out from the throat onto the ground and had been gathered up in which case it is invalid hence it is clear that according to our Eliezer and our Simeon the putting into the vessel of ministry is not essential this surely refutes our Naman's view and supports the view of our Judah the son of our high is it also a refutation of our Jane's view our Jane can answer I am in agreement with the Tana who taught the Beritha concerning the burning of the fat etc and it Terms thereof are not to be taken as separate cases if he burnt the handful twice it is valid our Joshua B. Levi said twice but not more than twice but our Yohanan said twice and even more than twice what is the issue between them our Zerah answered the issue between them is as to whether the handful may be less than the quantity of two olives bulk and whether the burning of a quantity less than an olives bulk counts as an offering our Joshua B. Levi is of the opinion that the handful may not be less than two olives bulk and also that the burning of a quantity less than an olives bulk does not count as an offering but our Yohanan maintains that the handful may be less than the quantity of two olives bulk and that the burning of a quantity less than an olives bulk counts as an offering and was stated from what time does the handful render the remainder permissible to be eaten our Hanan says as soon as the fire has taken hold of it and our Yohanan says only when the fire has burnt the greater Part of it Rab Judah said to Rabbi B. R. Isaac I will explain to you the reason for our Yohanan's view for it is written and lo the smoke of the land went up as the smoke of a furnace and a furnace does not send up smoke until the fire has burnt up the greater part Rabbi B. R. Adda said to Rabbi your people's report that Aram Rome pointed out the following difficulty it was taught I only know that things that are usually offered by night e.g. the limbs and the fat parts of the offering may be offered up and burnt after sunset and are allowed to continue burning throughout the night but whence do I know that things that are usually offered by day e.g. the handful the frankincense the incense offering the meal offering of the priests anointed high priest meal offering and the meal offering offered with the drink offerings may also be offered up and burnt after sunset but have you not said things that are usually offered by day say rather at sunset whence then do I know that these also are Allowed to continue burning throughout the night from the verse this is a law of the burnt offering an inclusive expression now if it is offered up at sunset it can hardly be possible that the fire will have burnt the greater portion of it by sunset this is no difficulty for here in the latter case it deals with the handful being taken up and there with it rendering the remainder permissible our Eliezer reads in the above after sunset and explains it as referring to the pieces that have burst off the altar and so too when Ardini came from Palestine he explained it in the name of Arjane as referring to the pieces that had burst off the altar but could Arjane have said so surely Arjane has said any part of the incense which had burst off the altar even if it was a whole grain may not be put back moreover our hand of Beman, you might taught at the school of our Eliezer B. Jacob it is written where to the fire hath consumed the burnt offering on the altar that is you may put back Unconsumed parts of the burnt offering if they had burst off the altar but you must not put back unconsumed parts of the incense omit incense or as he said when our Eliezer was studying the laws of the meal offering he raised the following question how is it if he placed the handful upon the altar and then put the wood pile on top of it is this regarded as a way of burning or not this question remains undecided Hezekiah raised the question how is it if he placed the limbs of an offering upon the altar and then put the wood pile above them shall we say since the divine law says upon the wood then they must actually be upon the wood or since there is another verse which reads where to the fire hath consumed the burnt offering on the altar he may do it either the one way or the other this too remains undecided our Isaac Napaha raised the question how is it if he placed the limbs by the side of the wood pile of course according to him who maintains that upon must be taken in its Literal meaning there can be no question here Talmud, Mas Medico the for here is written upon the wood the question arises only according to him who maintains that upon may mean near to how is it then do we also explain upon here as near to or perhaps since the phrases upon the wood and upon the altar are in juxtaposition as in the latter phrase upon is taken in its literal meaning so in the former upon is to be taken in its literal meaning this too remains undecided mission of the handful. The absence of the smallest part invalidates the whole of the tent the absence of the smallest part invalidates the whole of the wine the absence of the smallest part invalidates the whole of the oil the absence of the smallest part invalidates the whole of the fine flour and the oil the absence of one invalidates the other of the handful and the frankincense the absence of one invalidates the other Gemara of the handful the absence of the smallest part invalidates the whole wine. Is it so because scripture stated his handful twice of the tent the absence of the smallest part invalidates the whole why because it is written of the fine flour thereof signifying that if any part thereof was lacking it is invalid of the wine the absence of the smallest part invalidates the whole because it is written thus of the oil the absence of the smallest part invalidates the whole as to the oil of the drink offerings because it is written thus and of the free will meal offering because it is written and of the oil thereof signifying that if any part thereof was lacking it is invalid of the fine flour and the oil the absence of one invalidates the other because it is written of the fine flour thereof and of the oil thereof and further of the bruised corn thereof and of the oil thereof of the handful and the frankincense the absence of one invalidates the other because it is written with all the frankincense thereof and further and all the Frankincense which is upon the meal offering mission of the two he goats of the day of atonement the absence of one invalidates the other of the two lambs of the feast of weeks the absence of one invalidates the other of the two loaves the absence of one invalidates the other of the two rows of the shoe bread the absence of one invalidates the other of the two dishes of frankincense the absence of one invalidates the other of the rows and the dishes the absence of one invalidates the other of the two kinds of cakes used in the offering of the Nazirite of the three kinds used for the red cow of the four kinds of cakes used in the thank offering of the four kinds of plants used for the lulab and of the four kinds used for the purification of the leper the absence of one invalidates the others of the seven sprinklings of the blood of the red cow the omission of one invalidates the others of the seven sprinklings between the staves of the ark and of those Towards the veil and upon the golden altar the omission of one invalidates the others Gemara of the two he goats of the day of atonement the absence of one invalidates the other for the term statute is used there with of the two lambs of the feast of weeks the absence of one invalidates the other for the expression shall be is used there with the two loaves for the expression shall be is used there with the two rows for the term statute is used there with the two dishes for the term statute is used there with the rows and the dishes for the term statute is used there with the two kinds of cakes used in the offering of the Nazi right for it is written so he must do the three kinds used for the red cow for the term statute is used there with the four kinds of cakes used in the thank offering for the thank offering has been placed side by side with the offering of the Nazi right in the verse with the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving and the master said of his peace offerings includes the peace offering of the Nazi right the four kinds used for the leper for it is written this shall be the law of the leper the four kinds used for the lulab for it is written and ye shall take signifying the taking of them all our hand and be Abba said this was taught only in the case where he did not have them at all but where he had them all one does not invalidate the other an objection was raised against him it was taught of the four kinds used for the lulab two are fruit bearing and two are not those which bear fruits must be joined to those which bear no fruits and those which bear no fruits must be joined to those which bear fruits and a man does not fulfill his obligation unless they are all bound in one band and so it is with Israel's conciliation with God it is achieved only when they are all in one band as it is said that buildeth his chambers in the heaven and hath founded his band upon the earth this is a matter of dispute between Tanaim for it was taught the lulab is valid whether it be bound with the others or not but our Judah says if it is bound with the others it is valid and if it is not so bound it is not valid what is the reason for our Judah's view he draws an analogy by means of the expression taking use both here and also in connection with the bunch of hyssop as there the kinds must be bound in one bunch so here they must be bound in one band the rabbis however do not draw this analogy by means of the expression taking
Directed rightly they are invalid but as for those sprinklings which must be performed inside or the sprinklings in the purification rites of a leper if they were made under the name of some other offering they are invalid but if they were not rightly directed they are valid but has it not also been taught with regard to the sprinklings of the blood of the red cow that if they were sprinkled under the name of another they are invalid whilst if they were not rightly directed they are still valid said Arista this is no difficulty for one very the states the view of Arjuna and the other that of the rabbis for it was taught if a man that lacked atonement unwittingly entered the temple court he is liable to bring a sin offering but if he entered deliberately he has incurred the penalty of Karat and needless to say this is so of a Tibul Yom and others that were unclean if a man that was clean overstepped the boundary and entered the temple he has thereby incurred forty stripes. And if he entered within the veil or towards the front of the mercy seat, he has thereby incurred death at the hands of heaven. Arjuna says, if he entered into the temple or within the veil, he has thereby incurred forty stripes. And if he entered towards the front of the mercy seat, he has thereby incurred death. Wherein do they differ in the interpretation of the following verse? And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil towards the front of the mercy seat, which is upon the ark that he die not. The rabbis maintain that against entering into the holy place there is a prohibition that he come not, and against entering within the veil or towards the front of the mercy seat there is a warning that he die not. Whereas Arjuna maintains that against entering into the holy place or within the veil there is a prohibition that he come not, and against entering towards the front of the mercy seat there. Is a warning that he die not. What is the reason for this view of the rabbis? If the law is as Arjuna maintains, the divine law should only have stated into the holy place and towards the front of the mercy seat, but not within the veil. For I should have said, if for entering the holy place one incurs stripes, how much more so for entering within the veil? Why then did the divine law also state within the veil that you might infer that there is a penalty of death for it? And Arjuna, how does he reply to this? Had the divine law only stated into the holy place and not within the veil, I might have thought that by the expression into the holy place only within the veil was meant so that against entering into the temple there is not even a prohibition. And the rabbis, you could not possibly have thought so, since the entire temple is referred to as the holy place as it is written, and the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. And what is the reason for our Judas view if the law is as the rabbis maintain the divine law should only have stated into the holy place within the veil but not towards the front of the mercy seat for I should have said if for entering within the veil one incurs death how much more so for entering towards the front of the mercy seat why then did the divine law also state towards the front of the mercy seat that you might infer that only for entering towards the front of the mercy seat is there the penalty of death. Whereas for entering within the veil there is only a prohibition and the rabbis how do they reply to this indeed it was unnecessary and the only reason why the divine law stated towards the front of the mercy seat in this verse was in order to exclude from the prohibition entering by the side as it was taught by Atana in the school of our Eliezer B. Jacob the verse towards the front of the mercy seat on the east establishes the principle that wherever scripture says the front it means it. East side and Arjuna he says the verse should then have only stated here the front why does it also state towards to teach that towards must be interpreted with exactness and the rabbis they say towards need not be interpreted exactly now since Arjuna maintains that the expression towards the front of the mercy seat must be interpreted with exactness similarly he would hold that the expression and he shall sprinkle towards the front must also be interpreted exactly whilst the rabbis hold that just as the one need not be interpreted exactly so the other need not be interpreted exactly Arjuna however demurred saying that according to Arjuna if towards must be interpreted exactly upon would also have to be interpreted exactly would it not and it would follow therefore that during the second temple inasmuch as there was no ark nor mercy seat no sprinklings were to be made on the day of atonement Rabbi Bila answered it is written and he shall make atonement for the Holy sanctuary that is for the place that is sanctified for the holy sanctuary Rabbah said both state the view of the rabbis yet here is no contradiction Talmud, Mas Menekotha for in the one case the priest stood facing the west with his back to the east and sprinkled whereas in the other he stood facing the south with his back to the north and sprinkled the master said but as for those sprinklings which must be performed inside or the sprinklings in the purification rites of a leper. If they were made under the name of some other offering they are invalid but if they were not rightly directed they are valid but it has been taught whether they were made under the name of some other offering or were not rightly directed they are valid said our Joseph this is no contradiction one very the states of view of our Eliezer the other that of the rabbis our Eliezer who likens the guilt offering to the sin offering likens also the log of oil of the leper to the guilt offering it. Rabbis, however, do not liken one with the other, but according to our Eliezer, is it permitted to deduce a law by analogy from another law which has itself been deduced by analogy? Rabbi, therefore, answered both teachings state the view of the rabbis. One deals with the validity of the offering, whereas the other deals with the acceptance of the offering in fulfillment of the owner's obligation. Mission of the seven branches of the candlestick, the absence of one invalidates the others of the seven. Lamps thereof, the absence of one invalidates the others of the two portions of scripture in the mezuzah, the absence of one invalidates the other. Indeed, even one imperfect letter can invalidate the whole of the four portions of scripture in the tefillin, the absence of one invalidates the others. Indeed, even one imperfect letter can invalidate the whole of the four fringes, the absence of one invalidates the others, since the four together form one precept. Our Ishmael says the four are. Four separate precepts Gemara of the seven branches of the candlestick etc. Why is it so because the expression shall be as used there with our rabbis taught the candlestick had to be made from one mass and of gold if it was made from scraps of gold it is invalid but if made from any other metal it is valid now why is it invalid if made from scraps it is presumably because scripture says beaten work and also shall be then when made from other metals too it should be invalid should it not. Since scripture says of gold and also shall be the verse also says shall the candlestick be made to include other metals perhaps it is to include scraps you cannot think so for the expression shall be refers to beaten work but does not the expression shall the candlestick be made also refer to beaten work scripture stated of beaten work of beaten work twice signifying that this condition is indispensable but is it not also written gold gold twice so that this too is indispensable what is. This that you say it is well if you hold that if made out of scraps it is invalid and if out of other metal it is valid for then the repetition of the terms gold and beaten work is made use of in the exposition which follows but if you hold that if made out of scraps it is valid and if out of other metals it is invalid what use then will you make of the repetition of the terms gold and beaten work what is the exposition referred to it was taught of a talent of pure gold shall it be made. With all these vessels if made of gold it must be a talent in weight if not of gold it need not be a talent its cups its knops and its flowers if made of gold there must then be cups knops and flowers if not of gold there need be neither cups nor knops nor flowers perhaps I ought also to say if made of gold there must then be branches if not of gold there need be no branches that would be called a lamp and this was the work of the candlestick beaten work of gold if of gold it must be beaten. Work if not of gold it need not be beaten work and what use is made of the second expression beaten work in this last verse it serves to exclude the trumpets for it was taught the trumpets had to be made each from one mass and of silver if made from scraps of silver they are valid if from other metals they are invalid now why are they invalid if made from other metals presumably because it is written of silver and also shall be then when made from scraps they should also be invalid. Should they not since it is written beaten work and shall be scripture therefore stated in connection with the candlestick it was beaten work it was beaten work but not the trumpets our rabbis taught all the vessels Talmud, Mos Menikothi which Moses had made were valid for him and valid also for future generations the trumpets however were valid for him but invalid for future generations what is the reason for the trumpets should you say because it is written make thee that is for thyself. Only but not for future generations then the verse and make thee an ark of wood would also signify for thyself only but not for future generations but in fact the expression thee in the latter verse means according to one opinion of thine own or according to another opinion I would have preferred it to come from thine own rather than from theirs then here too it means the same thing here it is different since thee is stated twice make thee and they shall be unto thee or Papa the son of Ar. Hanin recited the following teaching before our Joseph the candlestick had to be made from one
Similar to the thing specified and as the thing specified is clearly a metal so all metals are included are Jose B. Judah on the other hand interprets the verse by amplification and limitation thus and thou shalt make a candlestick is an amplifying proposition of pure gold is a limitation of beaten work shall the candlestick be made is another amplifying proposition we thus have two amplifying propositions separated by a limitation in which case they include well nigh everything what do they? Include everything and what do they exclude earth and where on the contrary set aside your teaching because of mine you cannot say so for it was taught if there was no gold available for it it may be made of silver of copper of iron of tin or of lead our Jose B. Judah allows it even of wood and another very also taught a man may not make a house after the design of the temple or a porch after the design of the temple porch or a courtyard after the design of the temple court or a table after the Design of the table in the temple or a candlestick after the design of the candlestick in the temple he may however make one with five six or eight branches but with seven he may not make one even though it be of other metal our Jose B. Judah says he should not make one even of wood for thus did the Hasmonean kings make it but the rabbi said to him is any proof to be deduced from that in fact it was made of iron bars which they overlaid with tin when they the Hasmoneans grew richer they made one of silver and when they grew still richer they made one of gold Samuel said in the name of an old scholar the height of the candlestick was eighteen handbreadths three handbreadths for the base and the flower upon it two handbreadths plain one handbreadth for cup knob and flower again two handbreadths plain one handbreadth for a knob out of which two branches come forth one on each side extending and rising to the same height as the candlestick then one handbreadth plain one Hand breadth for a knob out of which two branches come forth one on each side extending and rising to the same height as the candlestick then again one hand breadth plain and one hand breadth for a knob out of which two branches come forth one on each side extending and rising to the same height as the candlestick and then two hand breadths plain there now remain three hand breadths in which space were three cups a knob and a flower the cups were like Alexandrian goblets the knobs like Cretan apples and the flowers like the blossoms around the capitals of columns it will be found therefore that there were twenty two cups eleven knobs and nine flowers of the cups the omission of one invalidates the others of the knobs the omission of one invalidates the others and of the flowers the omission of one invalidates the others moreover of the cups the knobs and the flowers the omission of one kind invalidates the others it is quite clear that there were twenty two cups for it is Written and in the candlestick were four cups and it is also written three cups like almond blossoms in one branch a knob and a flower so that its own four Talmud, Mos and the eighteen of the six branches make twenty-two it is also clear that there were eleven knobs for the knobs thereof implies two and six of the six branches and the knob from which the first pair of branches rose and the knob from which the second pair rose and the knob from which the third pair rose. Thus making a total of eleven but how do we arrive at nine flowers its own two and the six of the six branches make only eight our salmon said it is written unto the base thereof and unto the flowers thereof it was beaten work Rab said the height of the candlestick was nine handbreadths thereupon our Shimei Bihai raised the following objection to Rab we have learned there was a stone before the candlestick in which were three steps on this the priest stood to trim the lamps he answered you Shimei. I meant only from the point where the branches begin to rise and upwards it is written and the flowers and the lamps and the tongues of gold of finished gold what is meant by finished gold are am I said they finished up all Solomon's fine gold for Rab Judah said in Rab's name Solomon had made ten candlesticks and for each one he had used one thousand talents of gold each had been cast in the furnace one thousand times so that it was reduced to one talent but surely it is not so for it is written. And all King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold none were of silver it was nothing accounted of in the days of Solomon we said Solomon's fine gold was finished up and would it lose so much surely it has been taught our Jose B. Judah said it once happened that the candlestick which was used in the temple was found to be larger than that made by Moses by Gordian gold and thereupon it was cast eighty times into. The furnace so that it was brought down to a talent since it had been made long ago it would remain in that condition our Samuel B. Naman he said in the name of our Jonathan what is the meaning of the expression upon the pure candlestick it signifies that its pattern came down from the place of purity will you then say that the expression upon the pure table also signifies that its pattern came down from the place of purity one would rather say that pure in the latter case implies that it can contract uncleanness than in the former case too pure implies that it can contract uncleanness this does not follow at all for it is right to say so there in regard to the table because of Reshlakish exposition for Reshlakish said what is the meaning of the expression upon the pure table it signifies that it can contract uncleanness but is not the table an article of wood made to rest and an article of wood made to rest cannot contract uncleanness this proofs that they used to lift. It up and exhibit the shoe bread on it to those who came up for the festival saying to them behold God's love for you wherein is seen God's love for you it is as our Joshua B. Levi had stated for our Joshua B. Levi had stated a great miracle was wrought in regard to the shoe bread for at its removal it was as fresh as when it was set as it is written to put hot bread in the day that it was taken away but in this case of the candlestick to say that the term pure implies that it can contract. Uncleanness is too obvious and unnecessary for it is a metal vessel and metal vessel certainly contract uncleanness we must therefore say that its pattern came down from the place of purity it was taught our Jose B. Judas says an ark of fire and a table of fire and a candlestick of fire came down from heaven and these Moses saw and reproduced as it is written and see that thou make them after their pattern which is being shown thee in the mount will you then say the same of the tabernacle for it is written and thou shalt rear up the tabernacle according to the fashion thereof which hath been shown thee in the mount here it is written according to the fashion thereof whilst there after their pattern our high be Abba said in the name of our Yohan and the angel Gabriel had girded himself with a kind of belt and demonstrated unto Moses the work of the candlestick for it is written and this was the work of the candlestick a of the school of our Ishmael stated three things presented difficulties to Moses until the holy one blessed be he showed Moses with his finger and these are they the candlestick the new moon and the creeping things the candlestick as it is written and this was the work of the candlestick the new moon as it is written this month shall be unto you the beginning of months the creeping things as it is written and these are they which are unclean others add also the rules for slaughtering beasts as it is written now this is that which thou shalt offer Upon the altar of the two portions of scripture in the Mazuza, the absence of one invalidates the other, indeed even one imperfect letter can invalidate the whole is not this obvious Rab Judah answered in the name of Rab the law had to be taught in respect of the title of the letter Yah and is not this too obvious it had to be taught in regard to the other statement of Rab Judah in the name of Rab for Rab Judah said in the name of Rab any letter that is not surrounded on all four sides by a margin of parchment is invalid Ashi and Binid back said in the name of Rab Judah if the inner leg of the letter he was perforated it is still valid if the right leg was perforated it is invalid Arzara said this was explained to me by Arhuna and Ar Jacob said this too was explained to me by Rab Judah as follows if the inner leg of the he was perforated it is still valid if the right leg was perforated and there still remained thereof the size of a small letter it is valid otherwise it is Invalid it once happened to Agur the father-in-law of our Abba Talmud, Mos Menachoth be that the right leg of the letter he and the word Hayam had been severed by a perforation whereupon he came to our Abba who ruled that if there still remained thereof the size of a small letter it is valid otherwise it is invalid it once happened to Rami B. Tamra also known as Rami B. Dikal that the leg of the letter Wow in the word W. A. Yahirog had been severed by a perforation whereupon he came to our Zerah who said Go fetch a child that is neither too clever nor too foolish if he is able to read the word as W. A. Yahirog it is valid otherwise the word is Yahirog and it is invalid Rab Judah said in the name of Rab when Moses ascended on high he found the Holy One blessed be he engaged in affixing coronets to the letter said Moses Lord of the universe who stays thy hand he answered there will arise a man at the end of many generations Akiba be Joseph by name who will expound upon each tittle heaps and heaps of Laws Lord of the universe said Moses permit me to see him he replied turned around Moses went and sat down behind eight rows and listened to the discourses upon the law not being able to follow their arguments he was ill at ease but when they came
Pouring out the Lord is an everlasting rock, he replied, it implies that if one puts his trust in the Holy One, blessed be he, behold, he is unto him as a refuge in this world and in the world to come, is retorted, the other was my difficulty, why does the verse say in Yah and not Yah, the reason is as was expounded by Arjuna Brilaya, he said, refers to the two worlds which the Holy One, blessed be he, created one with the letter he and the other with the letter Yah, yet I do not know whether the future world was created with the Yah and this world with the he, or this world with the Yah and the future world with the he, but since it is written, these are the generations of the heaven and of the earth when they were created, read not be Hibram when they were created, but be he, Baram, he created them with the he, hence I may say that this world was created with the he and the future world with the Yah, and wherefore was this world created with the he, because it is like an extra and Whosoever wishes to go astray may do so, and wherefore is the left leg of the he suspended to indicate that whosoever repents is permitted to re-enter, and why should he not re-enter by the same way as he went out? Such an opportunity would not arise, and this is consistent with Reshlakish's view. For Reshlakish said, What is the meaning of the verse? If it concerneth the scorners, he scorneth them, but unto the humble he giveth grace. If a man comes to purify himself, they assist him, but if he comes to defile himself, they open the door for him, and wherefore has the letter he accorded, because the Holy One blessed be he says, If a man repents, I will set a crown upon him, and why was the future world created with the letter Yod? Because the righteous men therein are but few, and why is its head bent low? Because the righteous men therein hang their heads low, for the good deeds of one are not like the good deeds of the other. Our Joseph said, Rab gave two rulings in connection with. Scrolls of the law, but to each there is a refutation. The first is this rap said, if a scroll of the law has two mistakes in every column, it may be corrected, but if three, it must be hidden away. And the refutation is from the following, it was taught, if three, it may be corrected, but if four, it must be hidden away. Atana taught, if there was one column free from mistakes, it saves the whole scroll. Our Isaac B. Samuel B. Martha said, in the name of rap, provided only the scroll was for the most part written correctly. Abay asked our Joseph, how is it if in that column there were three mistakes? He replied, since it is permitted to correct them, they are regarded as already corrected. This rule applies only when letters are missing, but when there are too many letters, it does not matter. And why is it not so when letters are missing? Our Kahana answered, because it would look speckled. Agar, the father in law of our Abba had a scroll in which there were additional letters, so he came to our Abba who told him. The law this rule applies only when letters are missing Talmud, Mas Medikotha, but when there are additional letters it does not matter the other ruling of Rab is this Rab said he who is writing a scroll of the law and has reached the end may finish off even in the middle of the column and an objection is raised from the following he who is writing a scroll of the law and has reached the end may not finish off in the middle of the column as one does with other books but he should reduce each line as he goes on until he reaches the end of the column Rab was referring to other books but he says a scroll of the law he meant the books of the law but this cannot be so for our Joshua B. Abba cited Argyle who said it in the name of Rab the words in the sight of all Israel are to be written in the middle of the column he means the middle of the line it was stated the Rabbi say one may finish even in the middle of the line but Arashi says one may finish only in the middle of the line. And the law is only in the middle of the line. Our Joshua B. Abbasided Argyle, who said it in the name of Rab, the last eight verses of the Torah must be read in the synagogue service by one person alone whose view is followed here. It surely is not our Simeon's, for it was taught it is written, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there. Now is it possible that Moses, whilst still alive, would have written, So Moses died there? The truth is, however, that up to this point Moses wrote from this point. Joshua, the son of Nun, wrote, This is the opinion of our Judah, or according to others of our Nehemiah, said our Simeon to him, Can we imagine the scroll of the law being short of one letter? Is it not written, Take this book of the law and put it, etc.? We must say that up to this point the Holy One, blessed be he, dictated, and Moses repeated and wrote, And from this point the Holy One, blessed be he, dictated, and Moses wrote with tears in his eyes, as it says of another occasion, and Barak answered them, He pronounced all these words to me with his mouth and I wrote them with ink in the book must we then say that the view stated is not in accordance with our Simeon you may even say that it follows the view of our Simeon for since they differ from the rest of the Torah in one way they differ in another our Joshua B. Abba again cited Argyle who said in the name of Rabbi who buys a scroll of the law in the market is regarded as one that has seized the precept in the market but he who writes it him it scripture regards as if he had received it at Mount Sinai our she's hate said even if he corrected but one letter he is regarded as if he had written it Nehemiah GLM our rabbis taught a man should use sheets of parchment which contain from three to eight columns he should not use one which contains less columns or more and he should not put in too many columns for it would look like an epistle nor too few columns for the eyes would wonder but the width of the column should equal the word Lemish Pothicum written three times if a man happened to possess a sheet with nine columns he should not divide it into two sheets of three and six columns but into sheets of four and five columns these rules apply only to sheets at the beginning or in the middle of the scroll but at the end of the scroll even one verse or one column may take up the whole sheet one verse surely you cannot mean that say rather one verse in one column the width of the margin below shall be one hand breadth above three finger breadths and between one column and the other the space of two finger breadths in books of the law the margin below shall be three finger breadths above two finger breadths and between one column and the other the space of a thumb breadth between each line there must be the space of a line between each word the width of a letter and between each letter a hair breadth a man should not reduce the size of the script on account of the margin above or below or on account of the space between one line and another or the requisite space between one section and another if when almost at the end of a line he has to write a word of five letters he must not write two letters in the column and three outside Talmud, Mas Menikoth B but three in the column and two outside if when he has come to the end of the line he has to write a word of two letters he may not insert it between the columns but must write the word at the beginning of the next line if the scribe omitted the name of God and had already written the next word he should erase the word that was written and insert it above the line and should write the name upon the erasure this is the opinion of our Judah our Jose says he may even insert the name above the line our Isaac says he may even wipe away the word that was written and write the name in its place our Simeon of Shizur says he may write the whole name above the line but not a part of it our Simeon B. Eliezer says in the name of our Mayor he May write the name neither upon an erasure nor upon a word that has been wiped away, neither may he insert it above the line. What must he do then? He must remove the whole sheet and hide it away. It was stated our Hananel said in the name of Rab the Halachah is that he may insert the name above the line. Rabbi Barhana said in the name of our Isaac B. Samuel the Halachah is that he may wipe away the written word and write the name in its place. Why does not our Hananel say that the Halachah follows? This master and Rabbi Barhana say that it follows the other master because there is another reading which reverses the names Rabbi Behind and said in the name of Ola who had it from our Hananel the Halachah is in accordance with our Simeon of Shizur. Moreover, wherever our Simeon of Shizur stated his view, the Halachah is in accordance with it. In what connection was this ruling of our Hananel stated? Should you say in connection with the above, our Simeon of Shizur says he may write the whole name above. The line, but not a part of it. But since it has been reported in that connection that our Hananel said in the name of Rab the Halachah is that he may insert the name above the line, and that Rabbi Barhana said in the name of our Isaac B. Samuel the Halachah is that he may wipe away the written word and write the name in its place. If then our Hananel's ruling was stated in connection with the above, he should have also stated his view together with the others. Rather, it was stated in connection with the following. Our Simeon of Shizur says, even if it is five years old and is plowing in the field, it is still rendered clean by reason of the slaughtering of its dam. But since it was reported in that connection that Z E I R I said in the name of our Hananel the Halachah follows our Simeon of Shizur. If this were so, then he also should have said it there. Rather, it was stated in connection with the following. At first, it was held if a man whilst being led out in chains to execution said. Write out a bill of divorce for my wife, it was to be written and also to be delivered to her later. They laid down that the same rule applied to one who was leaving on a sea journey or setting out with a caravan. Our Simeon of Chizur says it also applies to a man who was dangerously ill, or it was stated in connection with the following if the terramah which had been
Medicoth in connection with the chest for we have learned the chest say Beth Shammai should be measured on the inside but Beth Hillel say on the outside they agree however that the thickness of the legs and the thickness of the room should not be included in the measurement our Jose says they agree that the thickness of the legs and the thickness of the room should be included but that the space between them should not be included our Simeon of Chizur says if the legs were a hand breadth high the space between them should not be included but if less it should be included in the measurement our Naman B Isaac said in connection with wine for we have learned our Meir says oil when rendered unclean is always unclean in the first degree the sages say honey also our Simeon of Chizur says wine also are we to infer that the first Tana holds that it is not so with wine rendered our Simeon of Chizur says only wine it was taught our Simeon of Chizur related once my untithed produce got mixed up with Tithe produce so I went and asked Artarfan about it and he advised me go and buy some he may produce in the market and separate the tithes from it on behalf of the mixture too he evidently was of the opinion that the majority of Amhara separate the tithes so that in this case he would be taking the tithe from what is exempt from the tithe by the law of the Torah in respect of what is also exempt by the Torah but why did he not advise him go and buy produce from a Gentile because he holds that a Gentile cannot own land in the land of Israel so fully as to release it from the obligation of tithe so that he would be taking the tithe from what was subject to tithe by the Torah in respect of what was exempt another version states he advised him go and buy produce from a Gentile evidently he was of the opinion that a Gentile can own land so fully in the land of Israel as to release it from the obligation of tithe so that in this case he would be taking the tithe from what is Exempt by the Torah in respect of what is exempt to and why did he not advise him God and by he may produce in the market because he holds that the majority of Amhiras do not separate the tithes or Yamar Bishalim I sent the following question to our Papa does the ruling of Rabin behind who cited Ola in the name of Arhanan namely that the Halacha was in accordance with our Simeon of Shizur and moreover that wherever our Simeon of Shizur stated his view the Halacha was in accordance. With it include that case where untithed produce got mixed up with tithe produce he replied it does Arashi said Marzitra told me that Arhanan of Surah was puzzled at the question it is obvious at he Talmud, Mas Menakoth for does it say wherever he stated his view in the mission it simply says wherever he stated his view Rzeira said in the name of Arhanan who said it in the name of Rabbi Varent in a scroll of the law extended into two lines of the script it may be sewn together. But if into three lines it may not be sewn together, rather the younger said to our Ashi, the said our Jeremiah of Dipti in the name of Rabbi, the rule that we have laid down, namely that if it extended into three lines it may not be sewn together, applies only to old scrolls. But in the case of new scrolls it would not matter. Moreover, old does not mean actually old nor new, actually new, but the one means prepared with gallnut juice, and the other means not so prepared it is permitted to sew it only with sinews, but not with thread. Our Judah B. Abba raised the question, how is it if the rent extended between the columns or between one line and another? This remains unanswered. Our Zeiri said in the name of our Hanael, who cited it in the name of Rabbi, the Mezuzah was written in lines consisting of two words each. It is valid. The question was raised, how is it if the first line consisted of two words, the second of three, and the third of one word? Our Naman B. Isaac answered, certainly it is valid for. It has merely been written like the song an objection was raised if you wrote it like the song or the song like it it is invalid that was taught in connection with the scroll of the law it has also been reported Rabbi Barhana said in the name of our Yohanan others say Arahabi Barhana said in the name of our Yohanan if the Mezuzah was written in lines of unequal length consisting of two words three words and one word it is valid provided it was not in the form of a tent nor tail like Arhista said the words above the earth must be alone in the last line some say they must be written at the end of the line others say at the beginning some say at the end of the line for it is written as the heaven is high above the earth others say at the beginning as the heaven is far from the earth our Helbo said I have seen Arhuna rolling up the Mezuzah beginning at one and finishing at here moreover he left the space between the sections closed an objection was raised our Simeon B. Eliezer said R. Meir used to write the mezuzah on Tuxistus in the form of a column Talmud, Mas Menakoth leaving a space above and a space below and leaving the space between the sections open and I said to him Master what is the reason for this and he answered because the portions are not close to each other in the Torah and Arhanan said in the name of Rab that the Halacha follows our Simeon B. Eliezer now presumably the Halacha referred to the ruling of leaving the space between the sections. Open no it referred to the ruling of leaving a space above and below and how much space must there be Arminish be Jacob others say our Samuel B. Jacob said the space taken up by the class of the scribes said Abbe to our Joseph and do you not hold that Rab's statement of the Halacha referred to the leaving of the space above and below but is it not the fact that Rab usually relies upon the practice of people and the general practice is to leave the space between the sections closed for? Rabbi said in the name of our Kahana who had it from Rabbi Elijah were to come and say that Eliza may be performed with a covered shoe he would be obeyed were he however to say that Eliza may not be performed with a sandal he would not be obeyed for the people have long ago adopted the practice of performing it with a sandal our Joseph however reported in the name of our Kahana who had it from Rabbi Elijah were to come and say that Eliza may not be performed with a covered shoe he would be obeyed were he however to say that Eliza may not be performed with a sandal he would not be obeyed for the people have long ago adopted the practice of performing it with a sandal and it was asked what is the difference between them and it was suggested that the practical difference between them was as to whether a covered shoe may be used in the first instance we must say therefore that Rab's statement of the Halacha referred to the leaving of the space this proves it our Naman B. Isaac said the precept is to leave the space between the sections closed nevertheless if it was left open it is valid for what our Simeon B. Eliezer spoke of leaving the space between the sections open he meant even open shall we say that the following supports his view for it was taught similarly if scrolls of the law or tefillin had worn out one may not make out of them a mezuzah for one may not bring down what is of a higher sanctity to a lower sanctity now it follows that if it were permitted to bring down to a lower sanctity one would be allowed to make a mezuzah out of tefillin or a scroll of the law but how is this possible here the portions are closed but there they are open perhaps it would have been permitted only to complete the mezuzah and if it were permitted to bring down what is of a higher sanctity to a lower sanctity you say that one would be allowed to make a mezuzah out of tefillin but it has been taught it is a law handed to Moses at Sinai that the scriptural portions in the Tefillin must be written on Kalaf and the Mezuzah on Tuxistis. Kalaf is the side of the skin next to the flesh and Tuxistis is the side next to the hair. This is only a recommendation but it was taught if one did otherwise it is invalid that refers only to the Tefillin but it was taught that if one did otherwise in either case it is invalid. The two cases refer to the Tefillin only but in the one case he wrote the portions on that side of Kalaf nearest to the hair and in the other case Talmud, Mas Menakoth B. He wrote them on that side of Tuxistis nearest to the flesh. Alternatively I can say that the ruling if one did otherwise in either case it is invalid is dependent upon Tanaim for it was taught if one did otherwise in either case it is invalid. Araha declares it valid on the authority of Araha B. Arhanan. Others say on the authority of Ar Jacob B. Arhanan. Again if it were permitted to bring down what is of a higher sanctity to a lower. Sanctity, you say that one would be allowed to make a mezuzah out of Tefillin, but it must be written on ruled lines for Arminyamai Bihilkia said in the name of Arhamma Bigoria, who said it in the name of Rabbi Mezuzah that is not written on ruled lines is invalid. Moreover, Arminyamai Bihilkia on his own authority said that the rule for writing the mezuzah on ruled lines is a law handed to Moses at Sinai. Tanaim differ on this point, for it was taught our Jeremiah said in the name of our master. Tefillin and Mezuzah may be written from memory and need not be written on ruled lines. The Halacha is Tefillin need not be written on ruled lines. The mezuzah must be written on ruled lines and both may be written from memory. What is the reason they are well known by heart? Our Helbo said, I once saw Arhuna when he wished to sit down on a couch upon which lay a scroll of the long bird vessel on the ground, place the scroll upon it and then sit on the couch, for he was of the opinion that it was. Forbidden to sit on a couch upon which lay a
performance of the precept is to fix a Talmud, Mas Menikoth in the handbreadth nearest to the street the further it is from the house the better he therefore teaches us that it is not so Rab Judah further said in the name of Samuel if one wrote it on two sheets it is invalid an objection was raised it was taught if one wrote it on two sheets and fixed it on the two doorposts it is invalid it follows however that if it was placed on one doorpost it is valid the very meant that it could be placed on two doorposts Rab Judah further said in the name of Samuel in the law of Mezuzah one must be guided by the conclusiveness of the hinge what is meant by the hinge are added said the sockets for the pin of the hinge in what circumstances for example where there is a door between two houses one house being for men and the other for women the eggs a large ones build a house and said to Arnaman fix the Mezuzah for me whereupon Arnaman replied first put the doorpost in there Places Rab Judah said in the name of Rab if one fixed it in the manner of a bolt it is invalid but this cannot be for when our Isaac B. Joseph came from Palestine he reported that all the mezuzah in Rabbi's house were fixed in the manner of a bolt and also that the door through which Rabbi used to enter the house of study had no mezuzah this is no contradiction for in the one case it was attached horizontally in the other it was bent at a right angle but this too cannot be for the door through which Arhuna used to enter the house of study had a mezuzah that door was used more frequently than the others and Rab Judah has said in the name of Rab that in the law of mezuzah one must decide upon the door most frequently used Arzara said in the name of Armatina who said it in the name of Samuel the proper performance of the precept is to fix it at the beginning of the upper third of the doorpost but Arhuna said it must be raised one hand breadth from the ground and it must be one Hand breadth away from the lintel, otherwise the whole of the doorpost is valid for the mezuzah. An objection was raised, it must be raised one hand breadth from the ground, and it must be one hand breadth away from the lintel, otherwise the whole of the doorpost is valid for the mezuzah. So Arjuna Ar Jose says it is written, and thou shalt bind them, and thou shalt write them as the binding of the tefillin is high up, so the writing must be placed high up. Now, according to Arjuna, this is well for. He agrees with Arjuna, but with whom does Samuel agree? Neither with Arjuna nor with Ar Jose. Arjuna, the son of Arnathan, answered, Indeed, he agrees with Ar Jose Talmud. Mas Menikoth be for by the beginning of the upper third, he meant that as the furthest point for one should not fix it lower than a third of the doorpost away from the lintel. Rabbi said the proper performance of the precept is to fix it in the hand breadth nearest to the street. Why the rabbi say so that one should encounter it? Precept immediately on one's return home Arhanan of Surah says so that it should protect the entire house Arhanan said come and see how the character of the Holy One blessed be he differs from that of men of flesh and blood according to human standards the king dwells within and his servants keep guard on him from without but with the Holy One blessed be he it is not so for it is his servants that dwell within and he keeps guard over them from without as it is said the Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand Ar Joseph the son of Rabbah stated in his discourse in the name of Rabbah if one set it deep in the doorpost to the depth of a handbreadth that is invalid shall we say that the following barrier supports him for it was taught if one set it in the post of the door or if one added another frame and there was a depth of a handbreadth another mezuzah is necessary but if less no other mezuzah is necessary that first clause of the barrier refers to a door. Behind a door, but this is expressly stated further on. Thus, if there was a door behind a door and there was a depth of a handbreadth, another mezuzah is necessary. But if less, no other mezuzah is necessary. This is merely stated as illustrating the cases mentioned. Attended taught if a man set up a door frame of hollow reeds, he may cut away a length of reed and place the mezuzah in the hollow. Araha, the son of Rabbah said this was taught only if he first set up the door frame and then cut away a length of reed and place the mezuzah therein. But if he first cut away a length of the reed and place therein the mezuzah and then set up the hole as a door frame, it is invalid because of the principle thou shalt make but not use what is ready made. Rabbah also said faulty doors are exempt from mezuzah. What is meant by faulty doors in this are Rehumay and Abba Jose differ. One says those that have no upper beam and the other says those that have no side posts are his dasset and extra is. Exempt from mezuzah since it has no doorpost it follows however that if it had doorpost it would require a mezuzah but surely the posts were made only as supports for the ceiling he meant to say this even though it has doorpost it is exempt for they were made only as supports for the ceiling of a said I have seen that the halls in the master's house although they have posts have no mezuzah obviously he was of the opinion that they serve only as supports for the ceiling and objection was raised a lodge in Exeter and a balcony each requires a mezuzah the reference here is to the Exeter of a schoolhouse but the Exeter of a schoolhouse is a proper room is it not we must say that the reference is to a Roman Exeter Reuba said in the name of Rab Judah an entrance lodge requires two mezuzah what is meant by an entrance lodge our Papa the elder said in the name of Rab it is a lodge with one door opening onto the courtyard and another leading to the dwelling houses are rabbis. Taught a lodge which leads into a garden and thence into an outhouse is according to our Jose considered as the outhouse but the sages say it is considered as the airspace of the garden Rab and Samuel both said if the door opens from the garden into the house there is no dispute at all that it requires a mezuzah since it clearly admits into the house they differ only where the door opens from the house into the garden the one maintaining that the outhouse is the main thing the other that the garden is the main thing but Rab and our Joseph both said if the door opens from the house into the garden there is no dispute at all that it is exempt since it is clearly the door for the garden they differ only where the door opens from the garden into the house the one maintaining that it serves for entering into the house the other that it was entirely Talmud Mas Menikoth made for the sake of the garden of A and Rabbah decided in accordance with the views of Rab and our Joseph whilst are actually decided in accordance with the views of Rab and Samuel adopting the stricter ruling and the law is in accordance with the views of Rab and Samuel adopting the stricter ruling it was stated as for a staircase which leads from one room to an upper room Arhuna said if it has but one door it requires one mezuzah only but if it has two doors it requires two mezuzah our papa said one can learn from Arhuna's dictum that a room that has four doors requires four mezuzah is not this obvious it was necessary to be stated even though one door was mostly used to Mimar said a door which is in the corner requires a mezuzah thereupon Arashi said to Mimar but it has no post he replied here are its posts our papa once came to Mar Samuel's house and saw there a door which had only one door post and that on the left side to which was affixed a mezuzah he said apparently this is in accord with our mayor but might not our mayor have said so only when the post was on the right side did he say so when it was on the left side, what is your authority for this? It was taught upon the doorposts of thy house that is upon the right side. As you enter, you say the right side, but perhaps it is not that, but the left side. The verse therefore says thy house. How is this derived from the verse? Rabbi explained, as you enter implies the right side. For when a man steps into his house, he steps in with his right foot. First, our Samuel Biaha quoting Rabbi Biola derived it in the presence of our Papa from the following verse. And Jehoiada the priest took a chest and bored a hole in the lid of it and set it beside the altar on the right side. As one cometh into the house of the Lord and the priest that kept the threshold put therein all the money that was brought into the house of the Lord. What is this view of our Mayor? It was taught a house that has only one doorpost requires a mezuzah according to our Mayor, but the sages exempted. What is the reason for the sages' view? Because it is written the door. Post and what is the reason for our mayor's view? It was taught it is written the doorpost and I know that the minimum of doorpost is two cents. However, in the second portion the verse also says the doorpost which is unnecessary. We have then an inclusive term following another inclusive term, and whenever an inclusive term follows another inclusive term, its effect is to restrict scripture has thus brought down the law to one doorpost. This is the argument of our Ishmael our Akiva says this is unnecessary for it is written upon the lintel and on the two side posts. Now there was no need for scripture to say to what then does it mean by two? It lays down the principle that wherever doorposts are mentioned, only one is meant unless the verse expressly says to our rabbis taught it is written and thou shalt write them. It is possible to think that this means that one should write the portion upon the stones of the house, therefore it uses the expression writing here and the expression. Writing there and as in the latter case it means upon a scroll so here it means upon a scroll or perhaps argue
Invalidate the whole is not this obvious. Rav Judah answered in the name of Rav. The law had to be taught in respect of the title of the letter Yod and is not this too obvious. It was necessary to be taught in respect of the other statement of Rav Judah. For Rav Judah said in the name of Rav, any letter that is not surrounded on all four sides by a margin of parchment is invalid. Talmud, Mas Menachot B. Our rabbis taught it is written Letat Hefet, Letat Hefet, and Letat Hefet, making four and also R. Ishmael R. says there is no need of that interpretation for Tot means two and Kat B and Foth means two in Afriki. Our rabbis taught I might have said that one should write the scriptural portions upon four pieces of parchment and put them in four compartments made out of four pieces of letter. The verse therefore says and for a memorial between thine eyes one memorial I commanded you but not two or three memorials how then should one do one should write them upon four pieces of parchment. And put them in four compartments made out of one piece of leather. If however one wrote them upon one parchment and put them in the four compartments that is sufficient, there must be a blank space between each portion. So rabbi, but the sages say this is not necessary. They agree, however, that between each there must be a line or a thread. And if the divisions between the compartments were not noticeable, they are invalid. Our rabbis taught how must one write them the portions for the hand. Tefila one should write upon one piece of parchment. If one wrote them upon four pieces of parchment and put them in one compartment that is still valid, they must however be fastened together. For it is written, and it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thy hand. And as outside it is one sign, so inside too it must be one sign. This is the opinion of our Judah. But our Jose says this is not necessary. Moreover, said our Jose, our Judah Birabai concedes to me that if a man has no hand, Tefila but has two head. Tefilas he may cover up one of them with a skin and place it on his arm concede you say but that is the very issue between them Rabbi answered our Jose's statement proves that our Judah withdrew his opinion surely this cannot be for our hand and I sent from Palestine the following ruling in the name of our Yohan and the hand Tefila may be converted for use on the head but the head Tefila may not be converted for use on the arm for one may not bring down what is of a higher sanctity to a lower. Sanctity this is no difficulty for one ruling refers to an old one and the other to a new one and according to him who maintains that the mere designation of a thing for a certain purpose has a certain force we must say that the owner had made a reservation with regard to it from the very outset our rabbis taught what is the order of the four scriptural portions in the head Tefila sanctify unto me and, and it shall be when the Lord shall bring the ear on the right while here and end. It shall come to pass if ye shall hearken diligently are on the left, but there has been taught just the reverse. Have they said this is no contradiction, for in the one case the reference is to the right of the reader, whereas in the other it is to the right of the one that wears them. The reader thus reads them according to their order. Our Hananel said in the name of Rabbi, if a man reverse the order of the scriptural portions, it is invalid. Have they said this is so Talmud, Mas Menachot, only if he put a portion that should be inside outside, or what should be outside inside, but if he put what should be inside also inside, or what should be outside also outside, it does not matter. Thereupon Rabbi said to him, Why is it that the placing of an inside portion outside, or of an outside portion inside, is not valid? It is, is it not because that which should look out into the open does not do so, whilst that which should not look out into the open actually does so, then likewise the placing of an outside. Portion also outside or an inside portion also inside should also be invalid since what should look out into the open on the right looks out on the left and what should look out into the open on the left looks out on the right we must rather say that there is no such distinction our handing also said in the name of Rav the underside of the Tefillin is a law given to Moses at Sinai they said the duct of the Tefillin is also a law given to Moses at Sinai they also said the shin of the Tefillin is a law given to Moses at Sinai the division between the compartments must reach as far as the stitches but our Dini of Nihardia said as long as it is noticeable it need not reach as far as the stitches they also said the parchment for the scriptural portions of the Tefillin must be examined against the flaw since we require the writing to be perfect and it would not be so if it had a flaw but our Dini of Nihardia said this is not necessary for the pen would detect any flaw or Isaac said that the straps of the tefillin must be black is a law given to Moses at Sinai. An objection was raised. The tefillin must be tied with straps of the same material as the tefillin themselves. The straps may be either green or black or white, but they should not be red because it is repellent. And also for another reason, our Judah said it is related of one of our Akiba's disciples that he used to tie his tefillin with strips of blue wool. And our Akiba made no comment. But is it possible that that righteous man actually saw his disciple do so, and he did not prevent him? They said to him, he certainly did not see him do so. For had he seen him, he would not have allowed him. It is related further of Harkonos, the son of our Elizur, be Harkonos, that he used to tie his tefillin with strips of purple wool. And your Elizur made no comment. But is it possible that that righteous man actually saw his son do so, and he did not prevent him? They said to him, he certainly did not see him do so. For had he Seen him, you would not have allowed him. Now it is stated here at all events that the straps may be either green or black or white. This is no contradiction, for here it speaks of the outside of the strap and there of the inside. But if of the inside, how can it be repellent or give any ground for suspicion? It might sometimes become twisted. Attended taught that the tefillin must be square is a law given to Moses at Sinai. Our Papa said this refers to the stitching and the diagonal. Shall we say that? The following Mishnah supports this view, for we have learned if a man made his tefillin round, it is a danger and it is no fulfillment of the precept. Our Papa said that Mishnah deals with the case where they were made round like a nut. Our Huna said, as long as the surface of the sides of the tefillin is whole, they are valid. Our Hista said, if two sides were split, they are still valid. But if three, they are invalid. Said to him, Rabbi, your ruling that if two sides were split, they are still valid is. True only if the rents were not facing each other but if they were facing each other they are invalid and even if they were facing each other they are invalid only if they were new tefillin but if they were old it would not matter Abbe asked our Joseph what is meant by new and what by old he replied if when one stretches the leather it rebounds it is old otherwise it is new Talmud, Mas Menachot B or else if when one holds up the strap the box hangs onto it it is new otherwise it is. Old Abbe was once sitting before our Joseph when the strap of his tefillin suddenly snapped he thereupon asked our Joseph may one tie it together he answered the verse says and thou shalt bind them signifying that the binding shall be perfect Araha the son of our Joseph asked our Ashi may one sew it together turning the seam on the inside he answered go and see how the people act our Papa said curtailed straps are still valid but this is not correct for since our highest son stated curtailed blue threads. Are valid and curtailed hyssop twigs are valid. It is clear that only there are they valid since they are only accessories of precepts, but it is not so here as the straps are accessories of holy things. Apparently, there is a fixed length for the strap. What then is the minimum length? Rami Bihama said in the name of Rush Lakish to the middle finger. Our Kahana explained it to the middle finger when bent, but Arashi explained it to the middle finger when extended. Rabbi used to tie the knot at the back of his head and allow the straps to fall straight down over his shoulders. Our Ahabi Jacob used to tie the knot and then plate the straps together. Mar the son of Rabbi used to do according to our custom. Our Judah the son of our Samuel Bishalaf said in the name of Rabbi the knot of the tefillin is a law given to Moses at Sinai. Our Naman said their ornamentation should be on the outside once as Arashi was sitting before Mar the strap of his tefillin twisted round whereupon Mar. Zutra said to him is not the master of the opinion that their ornamentation should be on the outside he replied yes but I did not notice it it is written and all the peoples of the earth shall see that the name of the Lord is called upon thee and they shall be afraid of thee it was taught our Eliezer the great says this refers to the tefillah of the head and I will take away my hand and thou shalt see my back said our hand of Ebizna in the name of our Simeon the pious this teaches that the holy one blessed be he showed Moses the knot of the tefillin Rab Judah said the knot of the tefillin should be placed high up so that Israel be high up and not low down moreover it should face the front so that Israel be in front and not behind our Samuel be bitter said in the name of Rab according to some Ara Hierarchus said it in the name of Arhuna whilst according to others Arminish said it in the name of Samuel when must one recite the blessing over the tefillin as soon as they have been put on but this Cannot be for has not
It is right that when he puts them on he should put on first the one on the hand and then the one on the head since it is written and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand and then it says and they shall be for frontlets between thine eyes but whence do we know that on taking them off he should first take off the one from the head and then the one from the hand Rabbi said Arhuna explained it to me the verse says and they shall be for frontlets between thine eyes that is to say so long. As they are between thine eyes both shall be there are rabbis taught when must one recite the blessing over the tefillin at the time when it is proper to put them on thus if a man rises early to go out on a journey and is afraid his tefillin might get lost he should put them on and as soon as the proper time arrives he should touch them and recite the blessing over them and until when must one keep them on until sunset our Jacob said until every foot has left the market but the sages say until the time when people go to sleep the sages and our Jacob however admit that if a man took them off in order to enter a privy or a bathhouse and in the meantime the sun had set he has not to put them on again our said the Halacha agrees with our Jacob since our Hista and Rabbi are who now used to say the evening prayer while still wearing them another version reads our said the Halacha does not agree with our Jacob Talmud Mas Medikothi but did not our Hista and Rabbi are who say that Evening prayer while still wearing them they certainly differ from the above ruling and could Rabbi Arhu not have said so did not Rabbi Arhu not say that if it was doubtful whether darkness had already fallen or not one should not take them off nor put them on now it follows from this that if it were certain that darkness had fallen one would have to take them off this was stated with regard to the eve of Sabbath but what can be his view if he holds that the night is a time for Tefillin? Then the Sabbath is also a time for Tefillin and if on the other hand he holds that the night is not a time for Tefillin then the Sabbath too is not a time for Tefillin since the same passage which excludes the Sabbath from the wearing of Tefillin also excludes the night for it was taught it is written and thou shalt observe this ordinance in its season from day to day day but not night from day but not all days hence the Sabbaths and the festivals are excluded so are Jose the Galilean but are. Akiba says this ordinance refers only to the Passover offering he derives it from the text from which our Akiba derives it for it was taught one might have thought that a man should put on the Tefillin on Sabbaths and on festival scripture therefore says and it shall be for a sign upon thy hand and for frontlets between thine eyes that is only on those days which stand in need of a sign or Tefillin to be worn but Sabbaths and festivals are excluded since they themselves are a sign are. Eliezer said whosoever puts on the Tefillin after sunset transgresses a positive precept are Yohan and said he transgresses a negative precept shall we say that they differ in the principle stated by Arabin in the name of Arabin for Arabin said in the name of Arabin wherever the expression observed lest or do not is used it indicates a negative precept one therefore accepts Arabin's principle while the other does not know all except the principle stated by Arabin in the name of Arabin but they differ in this point one maintains that the expression observed when used in connection with the prohibition has the force of a negative precept and when used in connection with the command has the force of a positive precept but the other maintains that the expression observed even when used in connection with the command has the force of a negative precept our Eliezer also said if one's purpose is to guard them it is allowed Robin related I was once sitting before Arashi when darkness had already fallen and he put on his tefillin so I said to him is it my master's purpose to guard them yes he replied I saw however that his purpose was not to guard them he was of the opinion that that was the law but one should not rule so in actual practice Rabbi Arhuna said a man must from time to time touch his tefillin this may be inferred by an aforciori argument from the plate of the plate which contains the divine name only once the Torah says and it shall be always upon his forehead. Implying that his mind must not be diverted from it, how much more is this to apply to the Tefillin which contain the divine name? So many times our rabbis taught thy hand that is the left hand, you say it is the left hand, but perhaps it is the right, it is written, yeah, my hand hath laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand hath spread out the heavens, and it is also written, her hand she put to the tent pin, and her right hand to the workman's hammer, and it is also written, why withdrawest? Thou thy hand, even thy right hand, draw it out of thy bosom, and consume them, Talmud. Mas Medico they are Jose Haram says, but we also find the right hand referred to as hand, for it is written, and when Joseph saw that his father was laying his hand, the right one, and the other, it is referred to as the hand, the right one, but never as the hand, our Nathan says, all this is unnecessary, for since it is written, and thou shalt bind them, and thou shalt write them as writing is with the right hand, so that Binding shall be with the right hand and if the binding is to be with the right hand then obviously the hand tefillah must be put on the left hand whence does our Jose Haram learn that it must be put on the left hand he derives it from that same passage from which our Nathan derives it or as she said he derives it from the hand which being written with the letter he at the end indicates the weaker hand thereupon our Abba said to our Ashi perhaps it means the stronger hand he replied is it written with the letter hate this is further disputed by Tanaim it was taught the hand written with the he indicates the left hand others say the hand includes a man that has but the stump of the arm another very the taught one that has no left arm is exempt from tefillin others say the hand includes a man that has but the stump of the arm our rabbis taught a left-handed man puts his tefillin on his right hand for that is his left but it has also been taught that he must put it on his left hand which is also the left of all people the letter was taught of a person who is ambidextrous atana in the school of Manasseh taught upon the hand that is on the biceps muscle between thine eyes that is on the skull on what part it was said in the school of Arjane where the skull of a babe is still tender Palemo inquired of rabbi if a man has two heads on which one must he put the tefillin you must either leave you reply or regard yourself under the band in the meantime there came a man to the school saying I have begotten the firstborn child with two heads how much must I give the priest an old man came forward and ruled that he must give the priest ten cellars but this is not so for Rami Bihamel learned from the verse the firstborn of man thou shalt surely redeem I might conclude that this would apply even when the firstborn was rendered trivial within thirty days of his birth scripture therefore added Talmud Mas Medikoth be limiting thereby the general application in this case it is different since the divine law declared the law of redemption to be governed by the expression for head the master said upon the hand that is on the biceps muscle whence is this derived our rabbis taught upon the hand that is the upper part of the hand you say it is the upper part of the hand but perhaps it means actually upon the hand since the Torah ordains that one must put tefillin upon the hand and also upon the head as in the latter case it is to be upon the upper part of the head so in the former it is to be upon the upper part of the hand our Eliezer says this is unnecessary for the verse says and it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thy hand implying that the sign shall be unto thee but not unto others our Isaac says this too is unnecessary for it is written and ye shall lay up these my words in your heart and ye shall bind them implying that it must be placed over against the heart our high and our the son of Arabia used to place it exactly over Against the heart Arashi was once sitting before Mimar the latter had an injury on his arm and his tefillin were exposed whereupon Arashi said to him does not the master hold it shall be for a sign unto thee but not unto others that he replied was stated only to indicate the place namely where it is a sign unto thee only whence is it derived that it must be upon the upper part of the head or rabbis taught between thine eyes that is the upper part of the head you say it is the upper part of the head but perhaps it means actually between the eyes it is written here between thine eyes and it is written there nor make any baldness between your eyes for the dead as in the latter case it means the upper part of the head where baldness can be made so in the former case too it means the upper part of the head where baldness can be made our Judah says this is unnecessary for since the Torah ordains that one must put tefillin on the hand and also on the head as in the former case it is put on a place which can be declared unclean as a leper spot by one symptom only so in the former case it must be put on a place which can be declared unclean as a leper spot by one symptom only one must therefore rule out the place between the eyes where flesh and hair are to be found and so can be declared unclean by two symptoms either by the appearance of white hair or yellow hair of the four fringes the absence of one invalidates the other since the four together form one precept are Ishmael says the four are four separate precepts what is the practical difference between the two are Joseph said they differ in respect of a linen garment with woolen fringes Rabbi Abinah said they differ in respect of a five-cornered garment Rabbinah said they differ in respect of Arhuna's dictum for Arhuna said if a
told him that it had torn away there in the street. He said, had you told me of it, I should then and there have cast it off, but has not a master said, great is the dignity of man since it overrides a negative precept of the Torah. Rabbi Shabbat explained it before Arkahana Talmud. Mas Menachot is referring to the prohibition, thou shalt not turn aside. Another version states that Rabban had told him of it there in the street, whereupon Mar said to him, do you think that I am going to cast it? Off here has not a master said great is the dignity of man since it overrides a negative precept of the Torah but has not Rabbi Shabbat explained it before Arkahana as referring to the prohibition thou shalt not turn aside here also it is only a Carmelite so that the prohibition is only Rabbi Nixi H-A-P-T-E-R-I-V mission the absence of the blue in the fringes does not invalidate the white neither does the absence of the white invalidate the blue the absence of the hand tefila does not invalidate the head tefila neither does the absence of the head tefila invalidate the hand tefila Gemara must we say that our mission is not in accordance with Rabbi for it was taught that Yemi look upon it implies that the absence of one invalidates the other so Rabbi but the sages say the absence of one does not invalidate the other what is the reason for Rabbi's view because the text says the corner which implies that the fringes must be of the same color as that of it. Corner and it also says a blue thread and then the divine law says that you may look upon it that is both must be there together as one but the rabbis say that you may look upon it signifies each one by itself must we then say that our mission is not in accordance with rabbi rab judah answered in the name of rab you may even say that it follows rabbis before our mission deals here only with the question of precedence as it was taught the proper performance of the precept is to insert the white threads before the blue but if a man inserted the blue before the white it is indeed valid but he has not fulfilled the precept what is meant by has not fulfilled the precept talmud mas menikoth should you say it means that he has not fulfilled the precept of the white threads but has fulfilled the precept of the blue but according to rabbi the absence of one invalidates the other rab judah said in the name of rab it means that he has not fulfilled the precept and yet has Perform the precept for has not fulfilled the precept only means that he has not performed the precept in the best way. This then explains the clause. Neither does the white invalidate the blue, but how can one explain the other clause? The blue does not invalidate the white. Moreover, it has been reported. Levi once said to Samuel, Arik, you are not to sit down until you explain to me the following. The blue does not invalidate the white. Neither does the white invalidate the blue. What does it mean? He answered, This refers to the fringes in a white linen garment, for it is proper to insert the white threads first, since holy writ says the corner, signifying that the fringes of the same color as the corner must be inserted first. Nevertheless, if one inserted the blue first, it does not matter. Well, this explains neither does the white invalidate the blue, but how can one explain the blue does not invalidate the white? Rami Biham answered, The latter rule refers to a garment that is. Entirely blue, in which case it is proper to insert the blue threads first, since holy writ says the corner signifying that the fringes of the same color as the corner must be inserted first. Nevertheless, if one inserted the white threads first, it does not matter. Rob objected, does then the color affect the law? Rob therefore explained that our mission refers to the curtailment of the threads, thus whether the blue threads were curtailed and the white remained or the white were curtailed and the blue remained, it does not matter as the sons of our high said curtailed blue threads are valid, curtailed hits of twigs are valid. What is the minimum length of a curtailed thread? Bar Hamjury stated in the name of Samuel, there must be sufficient to make a loop there with the question was raised, does sufficient to make a loop mean to make a loop of all the threads together or of each thread separately? This remains undecided. Our Ashi raised the question, how is it if the curtailed? Threads are so thick that one cannot make a loop with them, although had they been thinner, one could have made a loop with them. Or aha, the son of Rabbi answered, Arashi, they are most certainly valid since the precept is all the more noticeable thereby who is the tana that disagrees with Rabbi. It is the tana of the following Beretha, for it was taught, our Isaac says in the name of our Nathan, who said it in the name of our Jose the Galilean, and who in turn said it in the name of our Yohanan bin Riv. A man has no blue threads, he should insert all white threads. Rabbi said, You can infer from this that one must make a knot after each joint, for should you hold that this is not necessary, then how could the sons of our high have said curtailed blue threads are valid? Also, curtailed hits of twigs are valid as soon as the upper knot becomes loose, it would all become undone. Talmud, Mas Menico, the Talmud, Mas Menico, the perhaps they said so only where there were knots after each joint. Rabbi also. Said you can infer from this that the upper knot is an ordinance of the Torah for should you say it is a rabbinic ordinance then why was it necessary for the Torah to permit the insertion of woolen fringes in a linen garment one would have no doubt about it for if one merely fastens together two pieces with one fastening no connection is thereby formed you can therefore infer from this that it is an ordinance of the Torah Rabbi son of Arata said in the name of Arata who said it in the name of Rabbi the thread had snapped at the top it is invalid Arnaman was sitting and repeating the above rule when Rabbi raised the following objection against him this applies only at the outset but later on the remnants thereof and the curtailed threads thereof may be of any length whatsoever now what is meant by remnants and what by curtailed threads presumably remnant means that a part of the thread had broken off and a part had remained and curtailed means that the thread had entirely Broken away, no both terms must be taken together, thus the remnants of the curtailed threads may be of any length whatsoever, then it should have mentioned only the curtailed threads. Why does it add the remnants? It teaches us that there must be left a remnant of the curtailed thread sufficient to make a loop there with Rabbi was sitting and reciting the following in the name of Rab the thread that is used for winding is included in the number of threads whereupon our Joseph said to him it was Samuel who said it and not Rabbi has also been reported Rabbi B. Barhana said our Josiah Abishah told me that the thread used for winding is included in the number of threads Rabbi again was sitting and reciting the following in the name of Samuel if the greater part of the fringe was wound around it is still valid whereupon our Joseph said to him it was Rab who said it and not Samuel indeed it has been reported our Hunabi Judah said in the name of our Shishate who said it in the name of our Jeremiah. B. Abba, who in turn said it in the name of Rabbi, the greater part of the fringe was wound around it is still valid. Arhai, the son of Arnathan, reports it as follows Arhuna said in the name of Arshis, who said it in the name of our Jeremiah. B. Abba, who said it in the name of Rabbi, the greater part of the fringe was wound around it is still valid, and even if only one joint was made, it is valid. It is most becoming, however, for the fringe to be wound around for a third of its length and it remaining two thirds to hang loose as locks. What is the minimum length of a joint? It was taught, Rabbi says, in a joint the thread must be wound once, twice, and a third time. It was taught, if a man wishes to make few, he should not make less than seven, and if many, he should not make more than thirteen. If few, he should not make less than seven to correspond to the seven heavens, and if many, he should not make more than thirteen to correspond to the seven heavens plus the six intervening spaces. A. Tana taught at the start one begins to wind with the white thread since holy writ says the corner signifying that the thread of the same color as the corner must be used first and at the end one finishes the winding with the white thread since what is holy we may raise to a higher degree of sanctity but not bring down once Rab and Rabbi Barhana were sitting together when a man passed by wearing a garment entirely blue to which were attached fringes Talmud, Mas Menikoth which were entirely wound around whereupon Rab remarked a fine garment but the fringes are not fine but Rabbi Barhana said a fine garment and fine fringes were and do they differ Rabbi Barhana maintains since holy writ says twisted cords and also thread the fringe may be either entirely a twisted cord or entirely in loose threads Rab however maintains that there must always be loose threads but the expression twisted cords is required only for the determination of the number of threads. For the expression twisted cord would imply two threads but twisted cords implies for one must therefore twist them into a cord but from the middle they must hang down in separate threads Samuel said in the name of Levi white woolen threads fulfill the precept of fringes in a linen garment the question was raised would white linen threads fulfill the precept of fringes in a woolen garment do we hold that only white woolen threads fulfill the precept in a linen garment for since blue woolen threads fulfill the precept in any garment white woolen threads also fulfill the precept but white linen threads cannot fulfill the precept in a woolen garment or we can argue since it is written thou shalt not wear a mingled stuff wool
implies that the fringes are to be of the same kind of material as that of the corner but it is also written wool and linen how are the texts to be reconciled wool and linen fulfill the precept of ksitsis both in garments of their own kind of material as well as in garments of a different kind whereas other kinds of threads fulfill the precept only in a garment of their own kind of material but not in a garment of a different kind of material our naman however agrees with the view of the Tana of the school of our Ishmael for a Tana of the school of our Ishmael taught since in the Torah the word garments is used without being specified but in one particular case holy writ specified wool and linen the inference is that all garments are understood as being of wool or of linen Abay said this teaching of a Tana of the school of our Ishmael differs from that of another Tana of the same school for a Tana of the school of our Ishmael taught by garment I understand only a garment of sheep's wool whence can I include garments of camel hair of hair's hair of goat's hair or of raw silk or floss silk or fine silk scripture therefore says or a garment Talmud Mas Menachot our rabbis taught a linen garment is according to Beth Shammai exempt from Ksitsis but Beth Hillel declared liable the Halachot is in accordance with Beth Hillel our Elizer son of Arzadik said is it not a fact that anyone in Jerusalem who attaches blue threads to his linen garment causes amazement. Rabbi said, if that is so, why did they forbid it? Because people are not versed in the law of the son of Arhan and said to Rabbi, then let ten people insert it and let them go about in the marketplace, and so the law will be made known to all people will wonder at it. All the more then let it be announced at the public lecture. It is to be feared that people will use imitation blue, but it is no worse than if it were white, since one could use threads of the same material as the garment. It is not allowed to do otherwise. This being in accordance with Resh Lakish's view, for Resh Lakish said, wherever you find a positive precept and a negative precept in opposition, if you can possibly observe both well and good, otherwise let the positive precept come and override the negative one, but it can be examined. Can it not? Rather, we apprehend that it may have been used for testing, but it can be announced on public notices. Can it not? And are we to rely upon public notices? Whereupon Rabbi said, if Talmud, Mas Menachot B. In respect of Levin on the Passover festival or in respect of the Day of Atonement which involved the penalty of Kareth we rely upon public notices how much more so may we rely upon them here where only the transgression of a positive precept can be involved rather said Rabbi I suggested the following explanation and in the West it was similarly reported in the name of Arzera the apprehension is that the linen garment may have been torn within three finger breadths distance from the hem and it had been sewn together with linen threads and the threads were left hanging for the fringe and the Torah has said thou shalt make and not use what is ready made Arzera it was reported remove the fringes from his linen garment Rabzera said it is also to be feared that one will use it as a night wrap Rabbi also said I stated the following and in the West it was similarly reported in the name of Arzera if the garment is made of cloth and the corners thereof of Leather it is subject to tzitzis if the garment is made of leather and the corners thereof of cloth it is exempt what is the reason because we consider the main part of the garment araha however always decided according to the material of the corner Rabbah said in the name of Arsira who said it in the name of Arhuna if a man inserted fringes in the corners of a three-cornered garment and then added a fourth corner and inserted a fringe therein it is invalid because of the rule thou shalt make and not use what is ready made an objection was raised the pious men of old used to insert the tzitzis as soon as three finger breadths of the garment had been woven rendered they used to insert the fringes as soon as the last three finger breadths had been reached do we then always apply the rule thou shalt make and not use what is ready made surely Arzera has said that if a man inserted fringes in a garment that was already provided with fringes it is valid Rabbah replied since one thereby Transgresses the law of thou shalt not add thereto the act done is not considered at all our papa demurred how do you know that this man's intention was to add to the other fringes perhaps it was to cancel the other so that there was no transgression of thou shalt not add thereto accordingly the act done is considered an act our said in the name of our Matina who said it in the name of Samuel a garment that is provided with fringes does not come within the prohibition of the first kinds and it is the same even though the garment was exempt from Ksitsis what is meant by garment exempt from Ksitsis does it mean a garment smaller than the prescribed measure but it has been taught a garment with which a child can cover his head and most of his body Talmud, Mas Menachot and in which a grown-up person would walk out for a moment is subject to Ksitsis but if a child cannot cover with it his head and most of his body even though a grown-up person might walk out in it for a moment it is exempt and so it is too in regard to diverse kinds now we pondered over this what does the ruling and so it is too in regard to diverse kinds signify can it mean and so it is too in regard to the applicability of the prohibition of diverse kinds surely we have learned diverse kinds may not be worn even for a moment our nomin b isaac however explained it means and so it is too in regard to the insertion of fringes in a linen garment we must say that a garment exempt from fringes means a garment already provided with fringes in which one inserted another set of fringes but has not our zera taught this once one was stated as an inference from the other our rabbis taught a garment that was folded over is subject to tzitzis but our simeon declares it to be exempt they are agreed however that if it was folded over and sewn down it is subject to the law is not this obvious it is necessary to be stated where it was only fastened down with pins rabbis son of Arhuna once visited it. House of Rabbi Arnaman and saw that the latter was wearing a garment that was folded over the fringes being inserted in the folded corners it happened to become unfolded and the fringes were found to be above in the middle of the garment whereupon Rabbi said to him surely this is not the corner prescribed by the all-merciful in the Torah he had once cast off this garment and put on another thereupon Rabbi said to him do you think that the law of tzitzis is an obligation incumbent upon it? Person it is an obligation attaching to the garment go therefore and insert the fringes in it in the proper manner shall we say that the following supports his view for it was taught the pious men of old used to insert the fringes as soon as three finger breadths of the garment had been woven it is different with those pious men for they imposed upon themselves additional obligations his view is at variance with the angel's view for an angel once found Arkatna wearing a linen wrap and he Exclaimed Katna Katna wrap in summer and a cloak in winter and what is to happen to the law of Ksitsis and do you punish ask our Katna a person who omits to perform a positive precept in a time of wrath replied the angel we do now if you hold that the law of Ksitsis is an obligation incumbent upon the person then that is why one would incur guilt for not wearing a garment with fringes but if you hold that it is an obligation attaching to the garment then why is any guilt incurred? Seeing that these garments are exempt what then do you hold that it is an obligation incumbent upon the person I grant you that the all merciful would punish one who wears without fringes a garment that is subject to fringes but would the all merciful punish one who wears without fringes a garment that is not subject to it this is what the angel implied you find every excuse to free yourself from the law of Ksitsis or Toby said in the name of Samuel the garments put away in a Chest are subject to Ksitsis. Samuel, however, admits that where an old man made it for his shroud, it is exempt for the divine law says, wherewith thou coverest thyself, and this is not intended for an ordinary covering. Nevertheless, when the time comes for its use, we should insert fringes in it on account of the injunction, whoso mocketh the poor blasphemeth his maker. Reuba said in the name of Rab Judah, if a garment was torn more than three finger breadths distance from the corner, it may be sewn up. But if torn within three finger breadths distance from the corner, it may not be sewn up. It has been taught in a very to the same effect as if a garment was torn more than three finger breadths distance from the corner, it may be sewn up. But if torn within three finger breadths distance from the corner, our mayor says it may not be sewn up. But the sages say it may be sewn up, and they are agreed that one may not fetch a piece of cloth, even a cubit square, which has fringes to it from. Another garment and tack it onto this garment and they are also agreed that the fringes may be taken out of another garment and put into this garment Talmud, Mas Menachoth be provided they are not cut you may well infer from this may you not that one may detach the fringes from one garment for insertion into another garment perhaps it is permitted only when the first garment was worn out or rabbis taught in a garment that is entirely blue threads of any color fulfill the precept of Ksitsis except imitation blue an objection was raised only threads of the same color as the garment fulfill the precept but in a garment that is entirely blue one should insert blue threads and threads of some other
On the Sabbath provided he has no intention of making a groove. Rab Judah used to send his garment with the fringes to the fuller. Our Hanada used to roll up the fringes into a ball. Rabbi used to sew them up. Our rabbis taught how many threads must one insert. Beth Shammai say four, but Beth say three, and how far must they hang down. Beth Shammai say four finger breadths, but Beth say three, and as for the three finger breadths stated by Beth each must measure one fourth part of the hand breadth of an ordinary person. Our Papa said the hand breadth of the Torah is equal to four times the width of the thumb or six times the width of the little finger or five times the width of the middle finger. Our said four threads must be inserted in the garment within the distance of four finger breadths from the corner and they must hang down for four finger breadths. Rab Judah said three threads must be inserted within three finger breadths from the corner and they must. Hang down for three finger breadths. Our Papa said the law is four threads must be inserted within three finger breadths from the corner and they must hang down for four finger breadths. Do we then hold that the fringes have a prescribed length? But I can point out a contradiction. It was taught tzitzis. The word tzitzis means nothing else than something which hangs over. Moreover, tzitzis signifies any length whatsoever. And this was established long ago when the elders of Beth Shammai and of Beth Hillel went up into the upper chamber of Yohanan and Bibathira and decided that there was no prescribed length for the tzitzis and so too that there was no prescribed length for the lulab. Now this means does it not that there is no prescribed length at all for it? No Talmud. Mas Menico, that there is no prescribed maximum length but there is a prescribed minimum length for if you will not say so the ruling and so too that there was no prescribed length for the lulab would also have to mean that. There is no prescribed length at all for it, but we have learned the lulab which is three hand breadths in length long enough to shake is valid. We must therefore say that it means there is no prescribed maximum length for it, but there is a prescribed minimum length. So here too, with regard to the tzitzis, it means there is no prescribed maximum length for it, but there is a prescribed minimum length. Our rabbis taught tzitzis. The word tzitzis means nothing else than something which hangs loose for so it says and took me by a lock tzitzis of mine head. Abe said one must keep the thread separate like the forelock of the Gentiles. Our rabbis taught if one attach the fringes to the tip of the corner or to the selvage of the garment, it is valid. Our Eliezer B. Jacob declares it invalid in both cases whose view is adopted in the following statement of Argidal in the name of Rab. The fringes must hang over the corner for it is written upon the corners of their garments. It is the view of our Eliezer B. Jacob R. Jacob said in the name of our Yohanan it must be removed from the corner the distance of the first joint of the thumb now both our Papa's teaching and this teaching of our Jacob are necessary for from our Papa's teaching I only know that it must be within three finger breadths distance from the corner and not farther away than that but the nearer it is to the corner the better therefore our Jacob's teaching was necessary and from our Jacob's teaching I only know that it must be away from the corner the distance of the first joint of the thumb and not nearer than that but the farther away it is from the corner the better therefore both teachings are necessary Rubin and Arsama were once sitting before our Ashi when Arsama noticed that the edges around the hole in the corner of Rubin's garment had frayed and the fringe was now less than the distance of the first joint of the thumb away from the corner and he said to him does not my master accept our Jacob's teaching he Replied that rule was intended to apply only at the time when it was first made. Our Samba became embarrassed, whereupon Arashi said to him, Do not be upset, for one of them is equal to two of us. Our Ahabi Jacob used to take four threads, double them over, insert them through the garment, and then make them into a loop. He was of the opinion that there must be eight threads in the whole of the garment, the same number as the threads which hang loose. Our Jeremiah of Dipti used to insert eight threads, which, when hanging down, made sixteen loose threads, but he did not make them into a loop. Mar the son of Rabbi used to do it as we do now. Our Naman once found our Adabi Ahab inserting the threads in the garment and reciting the blessing, Blessed art thou and hast commanded us to make the tzitzis, whereupon he said, What is the that I hear? Thus said Rab, when making the tzitzis, no blessing is to be pronounced after the death of Arhun. Our Hista came in as head of the school and pointed out the Following contradictory teachings of Rab, did Rab really say that when making the tzitzis no blessing was to be pronounced? Surely Rab Judah has stated in the name of Rab once do we know that the tzitzis made by a Gentile are invalid because it is said speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes. The children of Israel shall make the fringes but not Gentiles. But where is the contradiction here? Our Joseph said our his is of the opinion that a precept which may be performed by a Gentile does not require a blessing when performed by an Israelite but a precept which may not be performed by a Gentile requires a blessing when performed by an Israelite is this a general principle but take the case of circumcision this is permitted to be performed by a Gentile for it has been taught in a town where there is no Israelite physician but there is a Kutian physician as well as a Gentile one circumcision should be performed by the Gentile but not by the Kutian. This is the opinion of our Meir, but our Judah said it should be performed by the Kutian, but not by the Gentile. And yet, when performed by an Israelite, a blessing must be pronounced. For a master has said he that performs the circumcision must say, "Blessed who has sanctified us by thy commandments and has given us command concerning the circumcision." This question by our Hista concerns Rab. Does it not surely Rab declares it invalid? For it has been stated once. Do we know that circumcision performed by a Gentile is invalid? There be Papa said in the name of Rab from the verse, "And as for thee, thou shalt keep my covenant." Our Yohanan said from the words, "Must needs be circumcised." That is, he who is circumcised shall circumcise the law concerning the Sukkah. Add support to our Hista's principle, while that concerning the Tefillin refutes it. Thus, the Sukkah is valid when made by a Gentile. For it has been taught a booth of Gentiles, women, cattle, or Kutians, or any manner of booth is valid as a. Sukkah provided it was roofed according to law and when made by an Israelite no blessing is necessary for it has been taught when a man makes a sukkah for himself he must say blessed art thou O Lord our God King of the universe who has kept us in life and has preserved us and enabled us to reach the season and when he enters to sit in it he must say blessed art thou O Lord our God King of the universe who has sanctified us by thy commandments and has commanded us to dwell in the sukkah. But one never says blessed and has commanded us to make the sukkah on the other hand the law of Tefillin is a refutation for the Tefillin are invalid when made by a Gentile for our Hina the son of Rabbi Talmud, Mas Menikoth B of Pashronia taught a scroll of the law of Tefillin and Mazuzoth written by a minute a Kuti and a Gentile a slave a woman a minor or an apostate Jew are invalid since it says and thou shalt bind them and thou shalt write them which indicates that those who bind me. Right, but those who do not bind may not write, and yet when made by an Israelite, no blessing is pronounced for our high the son of Arhunah sent the following decision in the name of Arhunah over the head Tefila one must say blessed who has sanctified us by thy commandments and has commanded us to put on the Tefila over the head Tefila one must say blessed who has sanctified us by thy commandments and has given us command concerning the precept of the Tefila, but one never says blessed and has commanded us to make the Tefila. Indeed, this is the true principle wherever a precept is completed by a single act, e.g. circumcision, although it may be performed by a Gentile when an Israelite performs it, he must pronounce a blessing, and wherever a precept is not completed by a single act, e.g. the Tefila, although it may be made by a Gentile when an Israelite makes it, he does not pronounce a blessing, and as regards the they differ in this one holds that the law of Tzitzis is an obligation resting upon the garment whilst the other holds that it is an obligation incumbent upon the person. Our Mordecai said to our Ashi, you have had it reported so, but we had it reported thus. Rab Judah said in the name of Rab once, do we know that the tzitzis made by a Gentile is valid because it is said speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes. Others may make the fringes for them. Rab Judah said in the name of Rab, if a man made the tzitzis from the fringes of the cloth or from sewing threads or from tufts of the cloth, they are invalid. But if he made them from a ball of thread, they are valid. When I repeated this before Samuel, he said that even if he made them from a ball of thread, they are invalid because it is necessary that the weaving of the thread be done for this purpose. This, however, is a matter of dispute between Tanaim, for it has been taught if a man overlaid the tefillin with gold or covered them
Bought only from an expert the Tefillin can be tested nevertheless they should only be bought from an expert scrolls of the law and Mezuzoth can be tested and may be bought from anyone is there then no matter of testing the blue thread but our Isaac the son of our Judah used to test it mnemonic sign with GE Shem thus he used to mix together liquid alum juice of fenugreek and urine Talmud, Mas Menekotha of a 40 day old child and soaked the blue thread in it overnight until the morning if it color faded it is invalid but if not it is valid moreover our Adda stated the following test before Rabbah in the name of our Avira one should take a piece of hard leavened dough of barley meal and bake it with the blue thread inside if the color improved it is valid but if it deteriorated it is invalid and in order to remember this think of the phrase a false change a true change the statement there is no matter of testing the blue thread refers to the test quantity Mar of Moshka once obtained. In the time of Arahasam blue thread on testing it by the test submitted by Arahasam the son of Arjuna its color faded but on testing it by Arahasam test its color improved he was about to declare it invalid when Arahasam said to him this is neither genuine blue nor imitation blue we must therefore say that one test supplements the other thus if the test of Arahasam the son of Arjuna had been applied and the color had not faded it is certainly valid but if its color had faded we should then test it by Arahasam test by baking it in a hard piece of leavened dough if its color improved it is valid but if it deteriorated it is invalid a message was sent from their Palestine saying the test supplement each other our money was most particular when buying the blue thread in accordance with the restrictions of the above buried the whereupon a certain old man said to him those who long preceded you acted so and they were successful in their business our rabbis taught if a man bought it. Garment furnished with scissors from an Israelite in the market. The presumption is that it is valid if he bought it from a Gentile who was a merchant. It is valid, but if he was a private individual, it is invalid. And this is so, notwithstanding that they said a man may not sell a garment furnished with scissors to a Gentile unless he removed the scissors. What is the reason for this? Here it was explained on account of a harlot. Rab Judah said it is to be feared that an Israelite might join him on the road and he might kill him. Rab Judah attached fringes to the aprons of the women of his household. Moreover, he used to say every morning the blessing and has commanded us to unwrap ourselves with the fringes. But since he attached the fringes to the women's garments, obviously he is of the opinion that it is a precept not dependent on a fixed time. Why then did he say the blessing every morning? He follows Rabbi's view for it was taught whenever a man puts on the tefillin, he should. Make a blessing over them, says Rabbi. But if so, at any time of the day, whenever he puts on the garment, he should say the blessing. Rabbi Judah was a most decorous person and would not take off his cloak the whole day long. Then why did he say the blessing in the morning? That was when he changed from night clothes into day clothes. Our rabbis taught all must observe the law of tzitzis, priests, levites, and Israelites, proselytes, women, and slaves. Our Simeon declares women exempt since it is a positive precept dependent on a fixed time, and women are exempt from all positive precepts that are dependent on a fixed time. The master said all must observe the law of tzitzis, priests, levites, and Israelites. Is not this obvious for a priest and levites and Israelites were exempt and who would observe it? It was stated particularly on account of priests. For I might have argued since it is written, Thou shalt not wear a mingled stuff wool and linen together, and it is followed by Thou shalt make thee. Twisted cords that only those who are forbidden to wear mingled stuff must observe the law of tzitzis and as priests are permitted to wear mingled stuff they need not observe the law of tzitzis we are therefore taught that they too are bound for although while performing the service in the temple they may wear mingled stuff they certainly may not wear it when not performing the service our simeon declares women except what is our simeon's reason it was taught that ye may look upon it this excludes a night garment you say it excludes a night garment but perhaps it is not so but it excludes rather a blind man's garment the verse when it says wherewith thou coverest thyself clearly includes a blind man's garment how then must i explain the verse that ye may look upon it as excluding a night garment and why do you choose to include a blind man's garment and to exclude a night garment include a blind man's garment since it is looked upon by others whilst i exclude a night garment since it cannot be looked upon by others and the rabbis Talmud, Mas Menekoth be for what purpose do they use the expression wherewith thou coverest thyself they require it for the following very that was taught upon the four corners of thy covering four but not three you say four but not three but perhaps it is not so but rather four but not five the verse when it says wherewith thou coverest thyself clearly includes a five-cornered garment how then must I explain the verse upon the four corners four but not three and why do you choose to include a five-cornered garment and to exclude a three-cornered one I include a five-cornered garment since five contains four whilst I exclude a three-cornered garment since three does not contain four and whence does our Simeon know this he derives it from the word wherewith and the rabbis the word wherewith they say does not convey any teaching and for what purpose do the rabbis use the expression that you may look upon it they require it for the following teaching that ye may look upon it and remember that is look upon this precept and remember another precept that is dependent upon it namely the reading of the Shema as we have learned from what time in the morning may the Shema be read from the time that one can distinguish between blue and white another very the taught that ye may look upon it and remember that is look upon this precept and remember another precept that is next to it namely the law concerning mingled stuffs. For it is written thou shalt not wear a mingled stuff wool and linen together thou shalt make the twisted cords and another very the taught that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord as soon as a person is bound to observe this precept he must observe all the precepts this is in accordance with our Simeon's view that the Tzitzis is a precept dependent on time and another very the taught that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord this. Precept is equal to all the precepts together and another very the taught that ye may look upon it and remember and do them looking upon it leads to remembering the commandments and remembering leads to doing them our Simeon he says whosoever is scrupulous in the observance of this precept is worthy to receive the divine presence for it is written here that ye may look upon it and there it is written thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and him shalt thou serve our rabbis taught beloved. Our Israel for the Holy One blessed be he surrounded them with precepts tefillin on their heads tefillin on their arms sits on their garments and mezuzah on their doorposts concerning these David said seven times a day do I praise thee because of thy righteous ordinances and as David entered the bath and saw himself standing naked he exclaimed woe is me that I stand naked without any precepts about me but when he reminded himself of the circumcision in his flesh his mind was set at ease and when he came out he sang a hymn of praise concerning it as it is written for the leader with string music on the eighth day psalm of David that is concerning circumcision which was given eighth our Eliezer B. Jacob said whosoever has the tefillin on his head the tefillin on his arm that sits on his garment and the mezuzah on his doorpost is in absolute security against sinning for it is written and a threefold cord is not quickly broken and it is also written the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them it was taught our Meir used to say why is blue specified from all the other colors for this precept because blue resembles the color of the sea and the sea resembles the color of the sky and the sky resembles the color of a sapphire and a sapphire resembles the color of the throne of glory as it is said and there was under his feet as it were a paved work of sapphire stone and it is also written the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a Sapphire stone it was taught our mayor used to say greater is the punishment for the non-observance of the white threads and for the non-observance of the blue threads of the fringes this is to be illustrated by a parable a king of flesh and blood gave orders to two servants to one he said bring me a seal of clay but to the other he said bring me a seal of gold and they both failed in their duty and did not bring them now who is deserving of the greater punishment surely it is the one to whom the king said bring me a seal of clay and who did not do so it was taught our mayor used to say a man is bound to say one hundred blessings daily as it is written and now Israel what doth the Lord thy God require of thee on Sabbaths and on festivals are high the son of our we endeavor to make up this number by the use of spices and delicacies it was taught our Judah used to say a man is bound to say the following three blessings daily blessed art thou who hast not made me a heathen. Who has not made me a woman and who has not made me a brutish man or a hobby Jacob once overhead his son saying blessed art thou who has not made me a brutish man whereupon he said to him and this too said the other then what blessing should I say instead he
lay down upon it naked he too went up after her in his desire to sit naked with her when all of a sudden the four fringes of his garment struck him across the face whereupon he slipped off and sat upon the ground she also slipped off and sat upon the ground and said by the roman capital i will not leave you alone until you tell me what blemish you saw in me by the temple he replied never have i seen a woman as beautiful as you are but there is one precept which the lord our god has commanded us it is called tzitzis and with regard to it the expression i am the lord your god is twice written signifying i am he who will exact punishment in the future and i am he who will give reward in the future now that tzitzis appeared to me as four witnesses testifying against me she said i will not leave you until you tell me your name the name of your town the name of your teacher the name of your school in which you study the torah he wrote all this down and handed it to her there upon she arose and divided her estate into three parts one third for the government one third to be distributed among the poor and one third she took with her in her hand the bed clothes however she retained she then came to the beth hamid rasha Arhai and said to him master give instructions about me that they make me a proselyte my daughter he replied perhaps you have set your eyes on one of the disciples she thereupon took out the script and handed it to him go said he and enjoy your acquisition those very bed clothes which she had spread for him for an illicit purpose she now spread out for him lawfully this is the reward of the precept in this world and as for its reward in the future world I know not how great it is Rab Judah said a borrowed garment is exempt from sitsis for the first thirty days thereafter it is subject to it so too it was taught in the very day he who stays at an inn in the land of Israel or who rents a house outside the land of Israel is for the first thirty days exempt from mezuzah thereafter he is subject to it but he who rents a house within the land of Israel is bound to affix a mezuzah forthwith in order to maintain the settlement in the land of Israel the absence of the hand tefila does not invalidate the head tefila Aris da said this was taught only when he has both but if he has not both the absence of one will certainly invalidate the other they asked him do you still say this no he replied for can it be said that one who has not the wherewithal to perform two precepts should not even perform one what was his opinion before it was only a precaution lest he become negligent in the precept Arshis hate said whosoever does not put on the tefillin transgresses eight precepts and whosoever has not sits attached to his garment transgresses five precepts and every priest who does not go up to the platform transgresses three precepts and whosoever has not a mezuzah on his door transgresses two precepts namely and thou shalt write them and thou shalt write them Rashlakish said he who puts on the tefillin will live long for it is written Talmud Mas Menachoth be the Lord upon them they shall live and altogether therein is the life of my spirit wherefore recover thou me and make me to live Mishnah the absence of the fine flour and the oil does not invalidate the wine neither does the absence of the wine invalidate them the omission of one of the sprinklings of the blood on the outer altar does not invalidate the rest Gemara our rabbis taught it is written and their meal offering and their drink offerings that is you must first offer the meal offering and then the drink offering rabbi says it is written a sacrifice and drink offerings that is you must first offer the sacrifice and then the drink offering but against rabbi it will be asked is it not written and their meal offering and their drink offerings that verse he requires for the teaching that their meal offering and their drink offerings may be offered at night and that their meal offering and their drink offerings may be offered even on the following day and against the rabbis it will be asked is it not written a sacrifice and drink offerings that verse they require for zeiris teaching for zeiris said the drink offerings become hallowed only by the slaughtering of the animal offering and does not rabbi also require that verse for zeiris teaching and do not the rabbis also require the other verse for the teaching that their meal offering and their drink offerings may be offered at night and that their meal offering and their drink offerings may be offered even on the following day in truth this is the reason for the rabbi's view it is written a burnt offering and a meal offering and against rabbi then it will be asked is it not written a burnt offering and a meal offering rather this is the true position when the drink offerings accompany the sacrifice all are agreed that the meal offering is offered first and it is followed by the drink offering for it is written a burnt offering and a meal offering they only differ where they are offered as an offering by themselves the rabbis are of the opinion that just as when they accompany the sacrifice the meal offering is offered first and then the drink offering so it is too when they are offered by themselves namely the meal offering is offered first and then the drink offering rabbi however distinguishes us only there where they accompany the Sacrifice does the meal offering precede the drink offering for since the offering began with what is eaten one should continue with what is eaten but where they are offered as an offering by themselves the drink offering takes the first place since the psalm is sung by the levites over it the omission of one of the sprinklings of the blood on the outer altar does not invalidate the rest our rabbis taught whence do we know that any offering whose blood must be sprinkled on the outer altar affects atonement even if it is sprinkled with but one act of sprinkling from the verse and the blood of thy sacrifices shall be poured out against the altar of the lord thy god mission the absence of either the bullocks or the rams or the lambs does not invalidate the others are simian said if they had means enough for the many bullocks but had not means enough for the drink offerings they should bring one bullock and its drink offerings and should not offer them all without drink Offerings tomorrow which bullocks and lambs are meant will you say those of the Feast of Tabernacles but there is written of them after the ordinance after the ordinance we must therefore say that those of the new moon and of Pentecost are meant which are ordained in the book of Numbers Talmud, Mas Menachoth and which rams are meant will you say those of the above occasions but only one ram is spoken of there or will you say those of Pentecost which are ordained in the book of Leviticus but the expression shall be as used with regard to them in truth those of Pentecost which are ordained in the book of Leviticus are meant and the Mishnah teaches that neither the absence of the rams which are ordained in Leviticus will invalidate the ram ordained in Numbers nor will the absence of the ram ordained in Numbers invalidate the rams ordained in Leviticus then the position is this is it not that in regard to the bullocks even though they are ordained in one passage the absence of one does not invalidate the other whereas in regard to the rams the absence of what is ordained in one passage does not invalidate what is ordained in another passage but of what is ordained in one passage the absence of one invalidates the other the tana dealt with different conditions in each case and in the day of the new moon it shall be a young bullock without blemish and six lambs and a ram they shall be without blemish why does the text say a bullock it is because in the Torah it says two bullocks but once do I know that if two are not to be found one must be brought the text therefore says a bullock again why does the text say six lambs it is because in the Torah it says seven lambs but once do I know that if seven are not to be found six must be brought the text therefore says six lambs and once do I know that if six are not to be found five are to be brought and if not five four and if not four three and if not three two or even one the text therefore says and lambs according as his means suffice but since this is so why does the text say six lambs to indicate that we must make every effort to obtain as many as possible and whence do I know that the absence of one invalidates the others because the text says they shall be thus set the Lord God in the first month in the first day of the month thou shalt take a young bullock without blemish and thou shalt offer it as a sin offering in the sanctuary a sin offering but surely it is a burnt offering are you had and said this passage will be interpreted by Elijah in the future Arashi said it refers to the special consecration offering to be offered in the time of Ezra just as it was offered in the time of Moses there has also been taught a very to the same effect our Judah says this passage will be interpreted by Elijah in the future but our Jose said to him it refers to the consecration offering to be offered in the time of Ezra just as it was offered in the time of Moses he Replied, May your mind be at ease, for you have set mine at ease. The priests shall not eat of anything that dieth of itself, nibbleth or is torn for whether it be fowl or beast. Is it only the priests that may not eat such? But the Israelites may are Yohanan said this passage will be interpreted by Elijah in the future. Rabbanah said it was necessary to repeat this prohibition for the priests, for I might have thought that since they are permitted to eat a burnt offering of which the head had been nipped off at the neck, they are also permitted to eat nibbleth and trophy. We are therefore told that it is not so, and so thou shalt do on the seventh day of the month for every one that earth and for him that is simple. So shall you make atonement for the house. Seven says are Yohanan refers to a sin committed by seven tribes, even though they do not constitute the majority of the community. New moon that is they decided a new law saying, e.g., that fat is permitted for every one that earth. And for him that is simple this tea
Does the absence of the bread offering invalidate them? The absence of the bread offering invalidates the lambs, but the absence of the lambs does not invalidate the bread offering. So our Akiva or Simeon Binata said it is not so, but rather the absence of the lambs invalidates the bread offering, whilst the absence of the bread offering does not invalidate the lambs. For so we find it was the case that when the Israelites were in the wilderness for forty years, they offered the lambs without the bread offering. Therefore now too they may offer the lambs without the bread offering. Our Simeon said the Halachah is according to the words of Ben Nadis, but the reason is not as he stated it. For every offering stated in the book of Numbers was offered in the wilderness, but not every offering stated in the book of Leviticus was offered in the wilderness. However, when they came into the land of Israel, they offered both kinds. Why then do I say that the lambs may be offered without the bread? Offering because the lambs render themselves permissible, and why do I say that the bread offering may not be offered without the lambs? Because there is nothing that renders it permissible. Gemara, our rabbis taught, and yet shall present with the bread that is as an obligation with the bread offering seven lambs without blemish. That is, even though there is no bread offering, then why does the verse say with the bread to teach that there was no obligation to bring the lambs before there was a obligation to bring the bread offering? This is the view of our Tarfan. You might think that the lambs stated here are the identical ones which are stated in the book of Numbers, but you must say that this is not the case. For when you come to the bullocks and the rams, it is evident that they are not the identical ones, but these are brought on their own account. Whilst those are brought on account of the bread offering, it will thus be seen that those offerings stated in the book of Numbers were offered in the wilderness but those stated in the book of Leviticus were not offered in the wilderness perhaps the bullocks and the rams of the two books are not the identical ones but the lambs are the identical ones since those the former are certainly different ones these the latter two are not the identical ones and why must one say that the bullocks and the rams are different ones perhaps the divine law meant to say if it is so desired one bullock and two rams are to be offered or if preferred two bullocks and one ram since the order is different they must be other sacrifices the absence of the bread offering invalidates the lambs what is the reason for our Akiva's view he infers the expression they shall be from the other expression they shall be tie in the latter case it refers to the bread offering so in the former it refers to the bread offering Ben is however infers the expression they shall be from the other expression they shall the Yahweh is in the latter case it refers to the lambs so in the former it refers to the lambs and why does not Ben Nadison for Yahweh from Tihina and say as in the latter case it refers to the bread offering so in the former it refers to the bread offering one may infer Yahweh from Yahweh but one may not infer Yahweh from Tihina but what does this variation matter was it not taught in the school of Arishmael that in the verses and the priest shall come again and, and the priest shall come and coming again and coming and have the same import for purposes of inference that is permissible only where there is no identical expression on which to base the inference but where an identical expression exists the inference must be drawn from the identical expression and why does not our Akiva infer Yahweh from Yahweh one should infer that offering which provides a gift to the priest from that which provides a gift to the priest but the others are burnt offerings. Alternatively, I can say that they differ on the interpretation of this very verse. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. Our Akiva maintains what is it that is entirely for the priest? I should say it is the bread offering and Ben Nadis. What does he say? Does the verse say they shall be holy to the priest? It says they shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. What is it that is partly to the Lord and partly for the priest? I should say it is the lambs and our Akiva. What does he say to this? Does the verse say they shall be holy to the Lord and for the priest? It says to the Lord for the priest. It is as stated by Arhuna for Arhuna said God acquired it and granted it to the priest. Our Yohanan said all agree Talmud, Mos Medico, that if they were attached to each other, the absence of one invalidates the other, and what creates this attachment? It is the slaughtering. Will reported that in the West Palestine the following question was raised: Does the waving create any attachment or? Not but surely this can be solved from the foregoing statement of our Yohanan for since our Yohanan said that the slaughtering creates the attachment it follows that the waving does not that very statement of our Yohanan gave rise to doubts is was our Yohanan certain that the slaughtering creates an attachment and that the waving does not or was he certain only about the slaughtering but about the waving he was in doubt this remains undecided our Judah Behanada said to Arhuna the son of our Joshua. Behold the verse they shall be holy to the Lord for the priest is written after the rite of waving nevertheless Ben Nadis and our differ but according to your view too the same argument can be put forward for is the verse written only after the rite of waving and not after the slaughtering you have therefore no alternative but to say that the rule contained in this verse applies to the early stage of the offering and that the verse they shall be holy to the Lord for the priest is to be understood in the sense that later on they will be for the priest and one can say the same here too that only later on they will be for the priest and does the slaughtering create any attachment but the following contradicts it for it was taught if a cake broke before the thank offering had been slaughtered he should bring another cake and then the offering may be slaughtered if the cake broke after the thank offering had been slaughtered the blood should be sprinkled and the flesh may be eaten but he has not fulfilled his vow moreover the bread is invalid if the blood had already been sprinkled and then the cake broke he must give as the priestly offering a whole cake in place of the broken one if a cake had been taken outside before the thank offering had been slaughtered it should be brought in again and then the offering may be slaughtered if the cake had been taken outside after the thank offering had been slaughtered the blood should be sprinkled and the flesh may be eaten, but he has not thereby fulfilled his vow. Moreover, the bread is invalid if the blood had already been sprinkled and then the cake had been taken outside. He must give as the priestly offering a cake which had remained inside in place of that which had been taken outside. If a cake had become unclean before the thank offering had been slaughtered, he should bring another cake and then the offering may be slaughtered. If the cake had become unclean after the thank offering had been slaughtered, the blood should be sprinkled and the flesh may be eaten. And he has also fulfilled his vow for the high priest's plate renders acceptable the offering which became unclean. But the bread is invalid if the blood had already been sprinkled and then the cake became unclean. He must give as the priestly offering a clean cake in place of that which had become unclean. Now, if one were to hold that the slaughtering creates an attachment between the animal offering and the cakes, then. Surely when this attachment has already been created by the slaughtering and thereafter the cakes become invalid the thank offering should also be invalid should it not the thank offering is a special case for holy writ refers to it as a peace offering and as peace offerings are offered without any bread offering so the thank offering too may be offered without the bread offering our Jeremiah said if you were to say that the waving creates an attachment then it is clear that if the bread offering was lost Talmud, Mos Medikoth be Talmud, Mos Medikoth be the lambs must be destroyed and if the lambs were lost the bread must be destroyed but if you were to say that the waving does not create an attachment then in the case where the bread offering and the lambs had been brought into the sanctuary and after they had been waved together the bread was lost and other bread was brought in its place the question would arise must the second bread be waved or not of course if it was the lambs. That were lost and other lambs were brought in their place. There is no question at all that the second pair of lambs must be waived. The question can only arise when it was the bread that was lost. And again, according to Ben Nadis, who said that the lambs constitute the main part of the offering, this question cannot arise, but it can only arise according to our Akiva, who maintains that the bread constitutes the main part of the offering. And the question is, shall we say that since the bread constitutes the main part of the offering, it requires to be waived, or perhaps since it is the lambs which render the bread permissible, it does not require to be waived. This must remain undecided. Abbe said to Rabbah, why is it that the two lambs hallow the bread and their absence renders the bread invalid, whereas the seven lambs and the bullock and the rams do not hallow the bread and their absence does not render the bread invalid? He replied, it is because they have become attached to each. Other by the waving, but take the case of the thank offering where the animal offering and the bread are not attached to each other by any waving, and yet the one hallows the other, and the absence of one invalidates the other. Let us indeed compare it with the thank offering as the thank offering is a peace offering, and that alone hallows the bread. So here too it is a peace offering alone which hallows the bread, but can we make this comparison in that case there are no other offerings with it? But here, since there is another kind of offering that goes with it, both kinds should hallow the bread. We should, however, compare this case with the ram of the
themselves permissible because there were no lambs, but now that there are lambs, it is the lambs that render them permissible. Rabbi said, Whence do I arrive at this view? Because we have learned our Judah said, Ben Bakri testified at Jabna that a priest who paid the shekel has committed no sin. Rabbi Yohanan Bizakai said to him, Not so, but rather a priest who did not pay the shekel has committed a sin. The priest, however, used to expound the following verse to their advantage, and every meal offering of the priest shall be holy burnt, it shall not be eaten, since the Omer offering and the two loaves and the shoe bread are ours. How can they be eaten now? What are the circumstances with regard to the two loaves referred to? If they are offered with the sacrifice, then the question will at once be asked, Do not the priest make a free will offering of the thank offering and its loaves and also eat them? It must be that they are offered by themselves, yet it says above, How can they be eaten with us? See. That when brought alone they are brought to be eaten, but Abbe said to him, I maintain that it is a case when they are offered with the sacrifice, and as to your difficulty raised from the thank offering and its loaves, it is no difficulty at all for the loaves of the thank offering are nowhere referred to as a meal offering, whereas the two loaves are referred to as a meal offering, for it is written when you bring a new meal offering unto the Lord our Joseph said, In fact, they are brought to be burnt, but the reason why we do not burn them immediately is that we must not burn holy things on a festival. But Abbe said to him, Where is the comparison there? The precept is not to do so, but here since it is the precept to do so, they should be burnt on the festival, as is the case with the bullock and the he goat offered on the day of atonement. Rather said our Joseph, it is to be feared that later on during the day they might obtain lamb, said Abbe to him, This is very well to delay the Burning as long as the time for the offering thereof continues, but after that time they should be burnt, should they not the expression their appearance must be spoiled indeed means that they must be kept as long as the time for the offering thereof continues. Rabbi said, I maintain that they are brought to be eaten, yet they are not eaten because of the precautionary measure stated by Rabbi, but the law is not derived from the passage by him, but from a scriptural verse for I derive it. Said Rabbi from the following verse, Ye shall bring out of your dwellings two wave loaves for first fruits unto the Lord, as first fruits are offered by themselves, so the two loaves may also be offered by themselves, and it follows also as the first fruits are offered to be eaten, so the two loaves also are offered to be eaten. Talmud, Mos Menachoth, our rabbis taught the lambs of Pentecost hallow the bread only by their slaughtering, thus if they were slaughtered under their own name and their Blood was sprinkled under their own name, the bread is hallowed thereby. If they were slaughtered under another name, and their blood was sprinkled under another name, the bread is not hallowed. If they were slaughtered under their own name, but their blood was sprinkled under another name, the bread is hallowed and not hallowed. So Rabbi R. Eliezer, son of Arsimian, says the bread always remains unhallowed unless the lambs were slaughtered under their own name, and their blood was sprinkled under their own name. What is the reason for Rabbi's view? Because it is written, and the ram he shall offer by slaughtering it as a peace offering unto the Lord with the basket of unleavened bread. That is to say, the slaughtering hallows the bread, and R. Eliezer, son of Arsimian, the expression he shall offer implies that he must perform all the rites of the offering, and Rabbi is not the expression he shall offer used. Had the term slaughtering been followed by he shall offer, I agree that the meaning. Would be as you say, but now that it is written, he shall offer, and then slaughtering it clearly means he shall offer it by the act of slaughtering. And our Eliezer, son of our Simeon, is not the expression slaughtering used that is necessary for our Yohanan's teaching. For our Yohanan said, All agree that the bread must be there at the time of the slaughtering. What is meant by hallowed and not hallowed? Abbe said, It is hallowed, but not completely. So Rabbi said, It is hallowed, but not permitted to be eaten. What is the practical difference between them? There is a difference between them as to whether redemption is effective according to Abbe. The redemption is effective according to Rabbi. It is not now according to Rabbi. There is clearly a difference of opinion between Rabbi and our Eliezer, son of our Simeon. But according to Abbe, what difference is there between Rabbi and our Eliezer, son of our Simeon? There is a difference between them as to whether it would become invalid if taken out of the sanctuary. Our Samuel B. R. Isaac inquired of our high B. Abba if the lambs of Pentecost were slaughtered under their own name but their blood was sprinkled under another name may the bread be eaten or not according to whose view does this question arise if you say according to our Eliezer son of our Simeon then there is no question at all for he holds that it is the sprinkling that hallows the bread and if you say according to Rabbi then there is also no question about it for whether one accepts it. Interpretation of Abbe or of Rabbi the bread is hallowed but not permitted to be eaten the question can arise only according to the view of the following tenet for the father of our Jeremiah B. Abba taught if the two loaves were taken out of the sanctuary between the slaughtering of the two lambs and the sprinkling of their blood and subsequently the priest sprinkled the blood of the lambs and expressed at the time the intention of eating the flesh outside the prescribed time our Eliezer. Says the bread is not subject to the law of pickle, but our Akiva says the bread is subject to the law of pickle, and our Shishate said both these ten agree with Rabbi that the slaughtering hallows the bread, but our Eliezer maintains his view that the sprinkling has no effect upon what was taken out, and our Akiva is that the sprinkling has an effect upon what was taken out. Talmud, Mos Menachoth, before we have learned if the sacrificial portions of the less holy offerings were taken out of the sanctuary before the sprinkling of the blood of the offering, our Eliezer says they are not subject to the law of sacrilege, and one is not liable on account of them for any transgression of the laws of pickle, nuthar, and uncleanness. Our Akiva says they are subject to the law of sacrilege, and one is also liable on account of them for any transgression of the laws of pickle, nuthar, and uncleanness. Now, what is the position in the aforementioned case according to our Akiva? Shall we say that is it? Sprinkling performed with a pickle intention renders the bread pickle like the flesh of the offering so too the sprinkling performed under another name will render the bread permissible or do we say so only where the result tends to stringency but not where it tends to leniency our papa however demurred saying why do you assume that they differ in the case where the loaves were still outside the sanctuary perhaps in the case where they were still outside all agree that the sprinkling can have no effect upon what is outside but they differ only in the case where they were brought in again our Eliezer adopting rabbis view that the slaughtering hallows them consequently they have become invalid by their having been taken outside whereas our Akiva adopts the view of our Eliezer son of our Simeon that the slaughtering does not hallow them consequently they have not become invalid by their having been taken outside how can this be it is well if you say that our Akiva adopts rabbis view that the slaughtering hallows the loaves for then the slaughtering hallows them and having been hallowed by the slaughtering they are rendered pickled by the sprinkling but if you say that he adopts the view of our Eliezer son of our Simeon that the slaughtering does not hallow them then it will be asked can the sprinkling performed with the pickle intention hallow them has not argued said in the name of Rabbi sprinkling performed with the pickle intention does not bring within the law of sacrilege nor does it take out of the law of sacrilege it does not bring within the law of sacrilege that refers to the sacrificial parts of less holy offerings nor does it take out of the law of sacrilege that refers to the flesh of most holy offerings was not argued statement refuted our Jeremiah inquired of our Zerah if the lambs of Pentecost were slaughtered under their own name and then the two loaves were lost may the blood be sprinkled now under another name so that the flesh be permitted to be Eden he replied, Do you know of any offering which if offered under its own name is invalid, but under another name is valid? But is there not what of a Passover offering offered before midday which if offered under its own name is invalid, but under another name is valid? He replied, This is what I mean. Do you know of any offering which was at one time fit to be offered under its own name, but was rejected from being offered under its own name, and now if offered under its own name it is invalid? But under another name it is valid, but what of the Passover offering after midday? This is what I mean. Do you know of any offering which at one time was fit to be offered under its own name, and indeed was slaughtered under its own name, but was rejected from being offered under its own name, and now if offered under its own name it is invalid, but under another name it is valid, but what of the thank offering it is different with the thank offering for the divine law referred to it as a piece. Offering our rabbis taught if the two lambs were slaughtered accompanied by four loaves, two of them should be selected and waved Talmud, Mos Menachoth and the other two may be eaten after redemption. The rabbis who
You'll had said to him, Should we bid a man arise and sin so that you may thereby obtain a benefit? Surely we have learned if the limbs of a sin offering were mixed with the limbs of a burnt offering. Our Eliezer says, Let them all be put above upon the altar, for I regard the flesh of the sin offering that is above as wood. But the sages say their appearance must first be spoiled and they must all be taken away to the place of burning. But why should we not say, Arise and sin so that you may thereby obtain a benefit? We would say, Arise and sin with the sin offering so that you may thereby obtain some benefit in regard to the sin offering itself. But we would not say, Arise and sin with the sin offering so that you may thereby obtain a benefit in regard to the burnt offering. And do we say it of one subject? But it was taught if the lambs of Pentecost were slaughtered under another name, or if they were slaughtered either before or after the proper time, the blood is to be sprinkled and the flesh may be. Even if the festival was on the Sabbath, the blood must not be sprinkled if, however, is valid and may be eaten. Vzeba and the second pair of lambs will serve for the Pentecost offering together with the two loaves and was sprinkled. The sacrifice is acceptable, but the sacrificial portions must be burnt after dark. But why should we not say arise and sin so that you may gain an advantage? We would say arise and sin on the Sabbath so that you may gain an advantage on the Sabbath, but we would not say arise and sin on the Sabbath so that you may gain an advantage on a weekday. And do we not say it of two subjects? But we have learned if a barrel of wine of Terima was broken in the upper part of the wine press and in the lower part there was unclean ordinary wine. Our Eliza and our Joshua agree that if a man can save a quarter log of it in cleanness, he must save it. But if not, our Eliza says Talmud, Mos Menakoth be let it run down and become unclean, but he must not render it unclean with. His own hands and our Joshua says he may even render it unclean with his own hands in that case it is different since in any event it will become unclean when our Isaac came from Palestine he recited if the lambs of Pentecost were slaughtered not according to the prescribed right they are invalid their appearance must be spoiled and they must be taken away to the place of burning our and said to him you master who compare the lambs of Pentecost with the sin offering recite that they are invalid. But a tana of the school of Levi who infers obligatory peace offerings from free will peace offerings recites that they are valid for Levi taught and so with the peace offerings of a Nazi right if they were slaughtered not according to the prescribed right they are valid but they do not count in fulfillment of their owner's obligation they may be eaten the same day and evening until midnight and they do not require any cakes nor the offering of the shoulder to the priest an objection was raised. If for the guilt offering that requires a lamb of the first year a sheep of the second year was offered or for that which requires a sheep of the second year a lamb of the first year was offered and it is invalid its appearance must be spoiled and it must be taken away to the place of burning but if the burnt offering of the Nazi right or of a woman after childbirth or of a leper was a sheep of the second year and it was slaughtered it is valid this is the general principle whatsoever is valid for a free will burnt offering is also valid for an obligatory burnt offering and whatsoever is invalid for a sin offering is also invalid for a guilt offering except when the offering was slaughtered under another name the author of this paritha is the tana of the school of Levi come and hear from the following which Levi taught if the guilt offering of the Nazi right and the guilt offering of the leper were slaughtered under another name they are valid but they do not count in fulfillment of it Owner's obligation if they were slaughtered before the time had arrived for the owner to offer them or if they were of the second year they are invalid now if this were so he should then draw an inference from the peace offering he infers peace offering from peace offering but he does not infer guilt offering from peace offering but then if he infers peace offering from peace offering he should also infer guilt offering from guilt offering this is a guilt offering of the Nazi right and of it. Leper from the guilt offering for robbery and for sacrilege and then the guilt offering for robbery and for sacrilege from the guilt offering of the Nazi right and of the leper Arshai be as she answered we infer what is offered not according to the prescribed right from what is similarly offered not according to the prescribed right but we do not infer what is offered not according to the prescribed right from what is offered according to the prescribed right do we not surely it has been taught whence? Do we know that if what had been taken out of its proper place was later brought up upon the altar it must not come down again from the fact that with regard to the high places what was taken out was still valid to be offered Talmud, Mos Menico the Tana in fact relies upon the verse this is the law of the burnt offering which includes all things that were brought up Rabbi Barhanna recited before Rabbi the lambs of Pentecost were slaughtered as rams they are valid but they do not count to the owners in fulfillment of their obligation whereupon Rab said to him they certainly count as such said our Histor Rab's view is reasonable in the case where the slaughter of believing them to be rams slaughtered them as lambs for then lambs were in fact slaughtered as lambs but not where he believed them to be rams and slaughtered them as rams for even a mistaken variation is considered a variation Rabbi however says a mistaken variation is no variation Rabbi said I raised Objection against my own statement from the following priests who rendered the flesh in the sanctuary pickle if they did so deliberately are liable to pay compensation it follows that if they did so unwittingly they are exempt and in connection therewith it was taught what they rendered pickle although unwittingly is nevertheless pickle now what were the circumstances where the priest acted unwittingly if the priest knew that the offering was a sin offering and treated it as a peace offering then surely he was not acting unwittingly but deliberately we must say therefore that he believed that it was a peace offering and treated it as though it were a peace offering and yet it has been taught what they rendered pickle though unwittingly is nevertheless pickle thus proving that a mistaken variation is considered a variation of a answered I can still say that the priest knew that it was a sin offering and treated it as a peace offering and yet he was acting unwittingly for he believed that it was permitted to change the character of the sacrifice. Our Zara raised an objection from the following. Our Simeon says all meal offerings from which the handful was taken under some other name are valid and also discharge the owner's obligation since meal offerings are unlike animal offerings. For when the priest takes a handful from a meal offering prepared on a griddle and refers to it as one prepared in a pan, his intention is of no consequence for the preparation. There are clearly indicates that it is a meal offering prepared on a griddle or if he is dealing with a dry meal offering and refers to it as one mixed with oil, his intention is of no consequence for the preparation. There are clearly indicates that it is a dry meal offering but it is not so with animal offerings. The same slaughtering is for all offerings, the same manner of receiving the blood for all and the same manner of sprinkling for all. Now what are the circumstances if the priest knows that? It is in fact a meal offering prepared on a griddle and yet when taking a handful refers to it as one prepared in a pan then what does it matter that the preparation thereof clearly indicates the true nature of the offering he has deliberately varied the offering has he not we must say therefore that he believes it to be a meal offering prepared in a pan and when taking a handful refers to it as such but he is mistaken now in this case only is his intention of no consequence since the preparation thereof clearly indicates the true nature of the offering but in all other cases we say that a mistaken variation is considered a variation of a answered him I can still say that the priest knows that it is in fact a meal offering prepared on a griddle yet when taking a handful refers to it as one prepared in a pan and as for the question what does it matter that the preparation thereof clearly indicates the true nature of the offering I answer that Rabbi is consistent with his view for Rabbi has said only a wrongful intention which is not manifestly absurd does the divine law declare capable of rendering an offering invalid but a wrongful intention which is manifestly absurd the divine law declares incapable of rendering invalid mission of the absence of the daily offerings does not invalidate the additional offerings neither does the absence of the additional offerings invalidate the daily offerings moreover of the additional offerings the absence of one does not invalidate the other even though they did not offer the lamb in the morning they must offer the lamb towards evening our Simeon said when is this only when they had acted under constraint or in error but if they acted deliberately and did not offer the lamb in the morning they may not offer the lamb towards evening if they did not burn the incense in the morning they burned it towards evening our Simeon said the whole of it was burnt towards evening for the golden altar was dedicated only by the incense of spices the altar for the burnt offering only by the daily offering of the morning the table only by the shoe bread on the Sabbath and the candlestick only by the kindling of seven lamps towards evening tomorrow our high Abin inquired of our if the community had not means enough for the daily offerings as well as
Proving that they are out of PAR thereupon Abbe said to him I can still say that both kinds of offerings are available and it is only a question of precedence and as for your objection that nothing should be offered prior to the daily offering I say that that is only a recommendation come and here we have learned there must never be less than six inspected lambs in the chamber of lambs sufficient for a Sabbath and the two festival days of the new year now what are the circumstances shall I say that lambs are available then surely many more are required for the daily offerings and the additional offerings obviously there are not sufficient lambs we thus see that the daily offerings take precedence this is not so for actually lambs are available for all the offerings but this is what that Mishnah says there must never be less than six lambs inspected four days before the slaughtering in the chamber of lambs and the author of that Mishnah is Ben Bag Bag for Ben Bag Bag says. Whence do we know that the lamb for the daily offering must be inspected four days before the slaughtering because it is written here ye shall observe to offer unto me in its due season and there it is written and ye shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month as in the latter case the lamb was inspected four days before the slaughtering so in the former case the lamb must be inspected four days before the slaughtering Robin is said to our ashi why six surely seven are necessary for one must reckon also the lamb for the morning daily offering on Tuesday and according to your argument retorted the other are not eight necessary for one must also reckon the lamb for the evening daily offering on Friday this is no difficulty for the ten assumed that the Friday evening daily offering had been offered Talmud, Mas Menikoth at all events seven are necessary we must say that the ten of that mission speaks in general and the expression sufficient for a Sabbath. And the two festival days of the new year serves merely as a mnemonic. This can indeed be proved from the wording, for it reads sufficient for a Sabbath and not for the Sabbath. And the two festival days of the new year, this is conclusive, even though they did not offer the lamb in the morning. Our Simeon said the whole of it was burnt towards evening, for the golden altar was dedicated only by the incense of spices. Who speaks of dedication here? A clause has been omitted, and it really should read as follows: even though they did not offer the lamb in the morning, they must not offer the lamb towards evening. This is the rule only if the altar had not been dedicated, but if the altar had once been dedicated, they must offer the lamb towards evening. Our Simeon said, when is this only when they had acted under constraint or in error? But if they acted deliberately and did not offer the lamb in the morning, they may not offer the lamb towards evening. If they did not burn the incense in the Morning they burn it towards evening whence is this derived from the following which our rabbis taught it is written and the second lamb thou shalt offer towards evening the second is to be offered towards evening but the first may not be offered towards evening this is so only if the altar had not been dedicated but if the altar had once been dedicated even the first lamb may be offered towards evening our Simeon said when is this only when they had acted under constraint or in error but if they acted deliberately and did not offer the lamb in the morning they must not offer the lamb towards evening if they did not burn the incense in the morning they burn it towards evening if they did not offer the lamb in the morning they must not offer the lamb towards evening is the altar to be idle because the priests have been remiss Rabbi explained it means they must not offer it but other priests should offer it if they did not burn the incense in the morning they burn it towards evening for since it is not so frequent and moreover it enriches it is therefore most dear to them and they would not be remiss about it our Simeon said the whole of it was burnt towards evening for the golden altar was dedicated only by the incense of spices offered towards evening etc but it has been taught only by the incense of spices offered in the morning Tanaim differ on this point Abbe said it is more logical to accept the view of him who says only by the incense of spices offered towards evening for it is written every morning when he dress the lamps he shall burn it and how can he dress the lamps in the morning if they were not kindled the previous evening but he who says only by the incense of spices offered in the morning infers it from the altar for burnt offering as that was dedicated by the morning daily offering so the golden altar was dedicated by the incense of spices offered in the morning the table only by the shoe bread on the sabbath does this mean to say that the Table was not dedicated thereby, but that it nevertheless hallowed it. It really teaches us that the dedication of the table and the hallowing of the bread was only on the Sabbath, as it reads in the last clause, and the candlestick only by the kindling of its seven lamps towards evening. Our rabbis taught that was the only case of an offering of incense which was offered by an individual upon the outer altar, and it was a special ruling to what does it refer our Papa said to incense. Offering by the princes of the tribes does this mean then that an individual may not offer incense upon the outer altar, but he may upon the inner altar, and furthermore that an individual may not offer incense upon the outer altar, but the community may behold it was taught one might think that an individual may make a free will offering of incense in the same manner and offer it, for I would apply the verse that which is gone out of thy lips thou shalt observe and do holy writ therefore. Says ye shall not offer strange incense thereon one might further think that an individual may not offer it since he does not offer the like as an obligation Talmud, Mas Menikoth be but the community may offer incense as a free will offering since it offers the like as an obligation holy writ therefore says ye shall not offer one might further think that the community may not offer it upon the inner altar but it may offer it upon the outer altar holy writ therefore states and it anointing oil and the incense of sweet spices for the holy place according to all that I have commanded thee shall they do thus there is only offered that which is stated in the context our Papa said it is a case of it goes without saying thus it goes without saying that a community may not offer incense upon the outer altar for we find no such case similarly that an individual may not offer incense upon the inner altar for we find no such case but even an individual may not offer incense. Upon the outer altar, although we find that this was the case with the princes, for that was a special ruling mission, the high priest's griddle cakes must not be brought in two separate halves, but he must bring a whole tenth and then divide it, offering a half in the morning and a half towards evening. If the high priest that offered the half in the morning died and they appointed another priest in his stead, the successor may not bring a half tenth from his house, neither may he use the remaining half tenth of the first high priest, but he must bring a whole tenth and divide it, offering one half and leaving the other half to perish. Thus the result is that two halves are offered and two halves are left to perish. Kamara our rabbis taught had scripture stated for a meal offering a half. I should then have thought that he must bring a half tenth from his house in the morning and offer it and a half tenth from his house in the evening and offer it, but scripture states half of it in. The morning that is he must offer a half of the whole tenth thus he must bring a whole tenth and divide it offering a half in the morning and a half towards evening where the half that was to be offered towards evening became unclean or was lost I might say that he should bring a half tenth from his house and offer it scriptures therefore states and half thereof in the evening that is he must offer a half of the whole tenth thus he must bring another whole tenth and divide it offering one half and leaving the other half to perish and so the result is that two halves are offered and two halves are left to perish where the high priest that offered the half in the morning died and they appointed another high priest in his place I might say that he may bring a half tenth from his house or that he may use the remaining half tenth of the first high priest scripture therefore states and half thereof in the evening he must offer a half of the whole tenth thus he must bring another Whole tenth and divided offering one half and leaving the other half to perish and so the result is that two halves are offered and two halves are left to perish a tenor recited before our nomin as for the half left by the first high priest and the half left by the second their appearance must first be spoiled and they are then taken away to the place of burning whereupon our nomin said to him I grant you that the first should be treated so since it was once valid for offering but as for the second why must its appearance first be spoiled from the very outset it was intended for destruction was it not he who told you this rule must be a tenor of the school of Rabbi Biabo who has said that even pickle must have its appearance spoiled before it is destroyed our ashi said this rule may be even in accordance with the view of the rabbis for each half was valid for offering inasmuch as at the time when it was divided either the one half or the other half could have been offered it was stated how did they prepare the high priest's griddle cakes our high Abba said in the name of our Yohanan they were first to be baked in an oven and then fried our said in the name of our Hanan they were first to be fried and then baked our high Abba said my view is more probable for to find signifies to be baked whilst still attractive but our said my view is more probable for to find signifies to be baked when already half done indeed tanaim differ with regard to it for it was taught to find signifies to be baked whilst still attractive rabbi says it signifies to be baked when already half done Ardosa says it
Lambs of the daily offering it is also written oil as there it has three logs of oil to the tent so here it must have three logs to the tent or perhaps I should argue thus here it is written oil and there in connection with the free will meal offering it is also written oil as there it has only one log so here it should have only one log let us then see to which of the two is this case most similar we may infer a meal offering which is characterized by TBSHT it is offered daily is an obligation and overrides the Sabbath and uncleanness from another meal offering which is also characterized by TBSHT but we may not infer a meal offering which is TBSHT from another which is not TBSHT or perhaps I should argue thus we may infer a meal offering which is characterized by YGL it is an individual offering brought on its own account and requires frankincense from another which is also characterized by YGL but we may not infer a meal offering which is YGL from another which is not YGL or Ishmael the son of Aryohan and Biberica therefore said it is written of fine flour for a meal offering daily it is to be similar to the meal offering which accompanies the daily offering as that meal offering has three logs of oil to the tent this too must have three logs to the tent our Simeon says here much oil is required and there also in connection with the meal offering accompanying the lambs of the daily offering much oil is required as there it has three logs to the tent so here too it must have three logs to the tent or perhaps I should argue thus here much oil is required and there also in connection with the meal offering accompanying the offering of bullocks and rams much oil is required as there it has two logs of oil to the tent so here too it must have two logs to the tent let us then see to which of the two is this case most similar we may infer a meal offering consisting of one tent from another meal offering also consisting of one tent but we May not infer a meal offering consisting of one tenth from a meal offering consisting of two or three tenths is not the above passage self contradictory. It states at first with oil signifies that it must have much oil, and then it states here it is written oil, and there in connection with the free will meal offering it is also written oil. Have they answered the tenth of the clause with oil signifies that it must have much oil is our Simeon, whilst he that argues otherwise by inference from it. Free will meal offering is our Ishmael, Arhuna, the son of our Joshua said the whole of the anonymous part of the Beritha is by our Ishmael, the son of our Yohan, and Biberica, and he argues thus with oil signifies that it must have much oil, for to establish merely that it requires oil, no verse would be necessary since the expression on a griddle indicates that it shall be like any meal offering prepared on a griddle, but perhaps it is not so, but that with oil signifies merely that it requires oil for head. Not wholly red stated with oil I might have said that it shall be like the sinner's meal offering and then he said be it even so that it signifies merely that it requires oil but surely it can be argued by an inference that three logs are required he then argued by the inference but could not prove his case whereupon he had to resort to the verse of fine flour for a meal offering daily as is expressly stated by our Ishmael in his concluding remarks Rabbi said the whole of the anonymous part of the Beritha is by our Simeon and he argues thus with oil signifies that it must have much oil for to establish merely that it requires oil no verse would be necessary since the expression on a griddle indicates that it shall be like any meal offering prepared on a griddle but even without the expression with oil I can arrive at the same conclusion by means of an inference he thereupon argued by the inference but could not prove his case so that he had to resort to the expression with oil he then said let it be similar to the meal offering accompanying the offering of bullocks or of rams but he rebutted this by saying we may infer Talmud, Mosmanikov be a meal offering consisting of one tent etc. Mishnah if they did not appoint another priest in his stead at whose expense was it offered our Simeon says at the expense of the community but our Judah says at the expense of the heirs moreover a whole tent was offered Gemara our rabbis taught if the high priest died and they had not appointed another in his stead whence do we know that his meal offering must be offered at the expense of his heirs because it is written and the anointed priest that shall be in his stead from among his sons shall offer it I might think that they offer it a half dash tent at a time scripture therefore stated it implying the whole tent but not half of it so our Judah our Simeon says it is a statute forever this implies that it is offered at the expense of the community it shall be wholly burnt. That is the whole of it shall be burnt as then the verse and the anointed priest etc. serve the above purpose surely it is required for the teaching of the following very it is written this is the offering of Aaron and of his sons which they shall offer unto the Lord in the day when he is anointed now I might think that Aaron and his sons shall together offer one offering the text therefore states which they shall offer unto the Lord Aaron shall offer his separately and his sons theirs. Separately the expression his sons refers to the ordinary priests you say the ordinary priests but perhaps it refers only to the high priest when it says and the anointed priest that shall be in his stead from among his sons it has already spoken of the high priest how then must I interpret his sons it must refer to the ordinary priest if so the verse should read and if the anointed priest died his sons in his stead shall offer why does the verse read from among his sons you may thus in for both teachings for what purpose does our Simeon utilize the expression that he requires it for the following teaching if the high priest died and they appointed another in his stead the successor may not bring a half tenth from his house neither may he use the remaining half tenth of the first high priest but was not this rule derived from the expression and half thereof he bases no exposition upon the letter of Bob and, and for what purpose does our Judah utilize the expression a statute. Forever it means a statute binding for all time and what is the purpose of the expression that shall be wholly burnt he requires it for the following which was taught I only know that the former namely the high priest's meal offering must be wholly burnt and that the latter namely the ordinary priest's meal offering must not be eaten but once do I know that what is said of the former applies also to the latter and what is said of the latter applies also to the former the text therefore. Stated holy in each case for the purposes of analogy thus it is written here holy and it is written there holy as the former must be holy burnt so the latter must be holy burnt and as in the latter case there is a prohibition against eating it so in the former case there is a prohibition against eating it is then our Simeon of the opinion that by the law of the Torah it must be offered at the expense of the community surely we have learned the Beth did ordain seven things and this was one of them they also ordained that if a Gentile sent his burnt offering from a land beyond the sea and also sent with it the drink offerings that the drink offerings are to be offered of his own means but if he did not send the drink offerings they are to be offered at the expense of the community similarly if a proselyte died and left animal offerings if he also left the drink offerings they are offered of his own means but if he did not send the drink offerings they are to be Offered at the expense of the community, it was also a condition laid down by the Beth in that if the high priest died and they had not appointed another in his stead, his meal offering shall be offered at the expense of the community. Our Abbau explained there were two ordinances by the law of the Torah, it should be offered at the expense of the community, but when they saw that the funds in the chamber were being depleted, they ordained that it should be a charge upon the ears when they saw. However, that the ears were neglectful about it, they reverted to the law of the Torah, and concerning the red cow, they ordained that the law of sacrilege does not apply to its ashes, is not this the law of the Torah, for it was taught it is a sin offering. This teaches that it is subject to the law of sacrilege, and it implies that only if the cow is subject to the law of sacrilege, Talmud, Mos Manikoth, but its ashes are not subject to the law of sacrilege, said our ashi, there were two. Ordinances by the law of the Torah only if the cow is subject to the law of sacrilege but not its ashes but when they saw that people treated the ashes lightly and applied them to wounds they ordained they should be subject to the law of sacrilege when they saw however that people in doubtful cases of uncleanness would avoid the sprinkling they reverted to the law of the Torah our rabbis taught the money for the bullock offered when the whole community sent in error or for the he goats offered on account of the sin of idolatry must be collected for the purpose so our Judah our Simeon says it must be taken from the funds of the shekel chamber but the reverse has been taught which of these was taught last now the scholars argued before our ashi surely the former version was taught last for we already know that our Simeon is concerned about possible neglect whereupon our ashi said to them you may even say that the latter version was taught last because our Simeon is concerned about Possible neglect only in that case where they themselves receive no atonement by it, but where they themselves receive atonement thereby our Simeon is not apprehensive about neglect. What is the decision? Rather, the younger said to our Ashi, Come and hear the following teaching the verse My food which is presented unto me for offerings made by fire of a sweet savor unto me shall ye yeah, observe to offer unto me in its due season includes the b
Surely it has been taught their meal offering and their drink offerings even at night their meal offering and their drink offerings even on the following day we must say that the tana of that Mishnah is not concerned with the exception so here too he is not concerned with the exception when this was reported back again to Rabbah he remarked they always report to them any indiscreet saying of ours are wise sayings they never report to them later Rabbah said this too is one of our wise sayings for the verse says of fine flour for a meal offering daily it is like the meal offering which accompanies the daily offering what is the decision then Arnam and B. Isaac said come and here for it was taught a whole tent was offered in the morning and a whole tent in the evening our Yohanan said there is a difference of opinion between Abba Jose B. Dostai and the rabbis Abba Jose B. Dostai says he must set aside for his meal offering two handfuls of frankincense one handful to be offered in the morning and the other in the evening but the rabbis say he must set aside for it one handful have to be offered in the morning and the other half in the evening on what principle do they differ Abba Jose B. Dostai maintains that we know of no case when half a handful was offered but the rabbis maintain that we know of no case when a tenth required two handfuls or Yohanan raised the following question if the high priest died and they had not appointed another in his Talmud, Mas Menikoth. B must the quantity of frankincense according to the view of the rabbis be doubled or not should we say that since the quantity of flour has been doubled the quantity of frankincense must also be doubled or perhaps this is so only where it has been expressly stated and not where it has not been expressly stated and this question is also to be asked with regard to the quantity of oil both according to the view of the rabbis and of Abba Jose B. Dostai come and here for we have learned the handful is specified in five cases now if that were so there would sometimes be seven the tenna is not concerned with the exception our papa was sitting and reciting the above when our Joseph B. Shime said to him is not the case of a man offering the handful outside the sanctuary an exceptional case and yet he reckoned it what is the decision then Arnam and B. Isaac said come and here for it has been taught if the high priest died and they did not appoint another in his stead a whole tent must be Offered in the morning and a whole tenth in the evening two handfuls of frankincense must be set aside one to be offered in the morning and one in the evening and three logs of oil must be set aside one log and a half to be offered in the morning and one log and a half in the evening now who is the author of this very thing if you say it is the rabbis then it will be asked why is it that the quantity of frankincense is doubled and the quantity of oil is not it must therefore be Abba Jose B. Tostai who maintains that at all times the high priest's meal offering requires two handfuls of frankincense so that neither the quantity of frankincense nor the quantity of oil has been doubled and since according to Abba Jose B. Dostai the quantity of oil is not doubled likewise according to the rabbis the quantities of frankincense and of oil are not doubled Aryohanan said the halacha follows Abba Jose B. Dostai but could Aryohanan have said so did not Aryohanan say that the halacha Always follows the anonymous opinion of a mission and we have learned the handful is specified in five cases different Amram report our Yohanan's opinion differently C-H-A-P-T-E-R-V mission all meal offerings must be offered unleavened with the exception of the leavened cakes of the thank offering and the two loaves of Pentecost which are offered leavened our mayor says the leaven must be taken from the meal offerings themselves and with this they are leavened our Judah says that is not the best way but first of all leaven must be brought and put into the measuring vessel and then the measuring vessel is filled up with flour but they said to him even so it is not satisfactory for it would be sometimes too little and sometimes too much Gemara our parrot inquired of RMI whence is it derived that all meal offerings must be offered unleavened once you ask RMI replied but surely where this is expressly stated it is expressly stated and where it is not expressly stated there is the general statement Talmud, Mas Menikoth and this is the law of the meal offering the sons of Aaron shall offer it before the Lord in front of the altar and that which is left thereof shall Aaron and his sons eat it shall be eaten as unleavened bread he or Paradise said to him as to the proper performance of the precept I have no doubt at all I ask only whether it is indispensable but said the other even with regard to the question of indispensability there is written it shall not be baked leavened but only unleavened are his daughter perhaps it means it shall not be baked leavened but only as I or what as I or is meant if as defined by our Meir it is absolutely unleavened according to our Judah if as defined by our Judah it is absolutely leavened according to our Meir if as defined by our Meir and following our Meir's ruling it is absolutely leavened since one incurs stripes for eating it on the Passover what is meant is that as I or as defined by our Judah and following our Judas. Ruling Arnam and B. Isaac demurred perhaps it means it shall not be baked leavened but only halal what does halal mean soaked in hot water but surely if the meal offering must be offered soaked it is expressly stated so and this is not prescribed to be soaked perhaps the meaning is whatsoever is prescribed to be soaked must be offered soaked but whatsoever is not prescribed to be soaked may be offered either soaked or unleavened Robin demurred perhaps the verse it shall not be baked. Leavened merely imposes a prohibition upon the person but the meal offering does not become invalid thereby once then is it derived from the following teaching one might think that unleavened was only a recommendation holy writ therefore stated it shall be the verse thus laid it down as an obligation our parrot inquired of RMI once is it derived that all meal offering seeing that they were needed in lukewarm water must be specially washed lest they become leavened shall we infer it. From the Passover concerning which it is written and ye shall watch the unleavened bread he replied in that very passage it is written it shall be unleavened that is keep it so but have you not utilized this verse to indicate indispensability if for that alone scripture would have used the expression it is to be unleavened why it shall be you may thus infer two things the rabbi said to our parent our Ezra the grandson of our Abdullah who is the tenth generation from our Eliezer B. Ezra who is the tenth generation from Ezra is standing at the door said he to them why all this pedigree if he is a learned man it is well if he is a learned man and also a scion of noble ancestors it is all the better but if he is a scion of noble ancestors and not a learned man may fire consume him they told him that he was a learned man whereupon he said let him come and he at once saw that his our Ezra's mind was troubled so he began his discourse and said I said unto the Lord thou art my Lord my Gratefulness is not with thee the congregation of Israel said to the Holy One Blessed be he Lord of the universe show thy gratefulness unto me for making me known in the world he replied my gratefulness is not with thee but with Abraham Isaac and Jacob who first made me known in the world as it is said with the holy that are in the earth they are the mighty ones in whom is all my delight as soon as he or Ezra heard the expression mighty he began his discourse saying let the mighty one come and take vengeance for the sake of the mighty from the mighty by means of the mighty let the mighty one come that is the Holy One Blessed be he as it is written the Lord on high is mighty and take vengeance for the sake of the mighty that is Israel as it is written they are the mighty ones in whom is all my delight from the mighty that is the Egyptians as it is written the mighty sank like lead in the waters by means of the mighty that is the water as it is written above the voices of many Waters mighty waters breakers of the sea let the beloved the son of the beloved come and build the beloved for the beloved in the portion of the beloved that the beloved may receive atonement therein let the beloved come that is king Solomon as it is written and he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet and he called his name Jedidai beloved of the Lord for the Lord's sake Talmud Mas Menikoth be the son of the beloved that is the son of Abraham as it is written what hath my beloved to do in my house and build the beloved that is the temple as it is written how lovely are thy tabernacles for the beloved that is the holy one blessed be he as it is written let me sing of my beloved in the portion of the beloved that is Benjamin as it is said of Benjamin he said the beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him that the beloved may receive atonement therein that is Israel as it is written I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies let the good Come and receive the good from the good for the good let the good come that is Moses as it is written and she saw that he was good and receive the good that is the Torah as it is written for I give you good doctrine from the good that is the Holy One blessed be he as it is written the Lord is good to all for the good that is Israel as it is written do good O Lord unto the good let this come and receive this from this for this people let this come that is Moses as it is written for as for this Moses the man and receive this that is the Torah as it is written and this is the Torah which Moses said from this that is the Holy One blessed be he as it is written this is my God and I will glorify him for this people that is Israel as it is written this people that thou hast
branches of Israel were broken for our Hainanabi Papa said a grievous statement did the spies make at that moment when they said for they were stronger than we read not than we but than he as it were even the master of the house cannot remove his furniture from their archive behind and demurred then why does the verse read because of the noise of the great tumult it should read because of the noise of the great word rather it must be interpreted thus the Holy One blessed be he said to Abraham I heard thy voice and will have compassion upon them I had said that they shall be subjected to four successive empires each to endure the length of time that the four empires together actually lasted but now each shall endure only the time allot to it another version I had said that they shall be subjected to the four empires in succession but now they shall be subjected to the four concurrently are Joshua believe I said why is Israel likened to an olive tree to tell you that as the olive Tree loses not its leaves either in summer or in winter so Israel shall never be lost either in this world or in the world to come. Our Yohanan said why is Israel likened to an olive tree to tell you that just as the olive produces its oil only after pounding so Israel returns to the right way only after suffering. Our Meir says eleven must be taken from the meal offerings themselves and with this they are leavened etc. What is meant by sometimes too little and sometimes too much are his dot. Explained if the yeast use was of a thick consistency then there would be too much flour in the meal offering and if it was thin there would be too little but in any event only a tenth is measured. Rabbi and our Joseph both said that we must measure it according to its former state but one can surely take a little of the flour and have it leavened outside and then it can be brought back and kneaded with the rest of the flour it is to be feared that one might bring leaven from elsewhere. Our rabbis taught one may not leaven the meal offering Talmud, Mas Medikothe with apples in the name of our Hanabi Gamaliel they said one may do so our Kahana reports this in the name of our Hanabi Teradion with whom will the following agree for we have learned if an apple of Teradion was chopped up and put into dough so that it leavened it the dough is forbidden now with whom does this agree shall we say with our Hanabi Gamaliel and not with the rabbis you may even say that this agrees. With the rabbis too for although it is not the finest leaven it is however an inferior leaven our Ella said from no meal offering is it more difficult to take out the handful than from the sinner's meal offering our Isaac B of Dimi said the sinner's meal offering may be mixed with water and it is valid shall we say that they differ in this one holds that we must measure the handful according to its present state and the other holds that we must measure it according to its former state no both. Agree that we must measure it according to its present state, but they differ in this one holds that dry means dry without oil, and the other holds that dry means dry without any kind of liquid. We have learned their calves' flesh that had swelled and the flesh of an old beast that had shriveled must be measured according to their present state. Rabbi and our Yohanan read according to their present state, whereas Samuel, our Simeon, be Rabbi and Reshlakish read according to their former state. And objection was raised if a piece of calves' flesh which was not of the prescribed size swelled so that it is now of the prescribed size until now it has been clean, but from now onwards it is unclean, it is only so rabbinically if so consider the next clause, and so it is too with regard to the flesh of an offering that was pickle or not. Or now if you hold that this rule is scriptural, then it can well apply to pickle and to nuthar, but if you hold that it is only rabbinical, it will be asked as one. Liable to correct for eating what is regarded as pickle or nuthar rabbinically render and so it is too with regard to the uncleanness of what is pickle or nuthar for I might have said that since the uncleanness attaching to what is pickle or nuthar is only a rabbinic ordinance the rabbis would certainly not apply this rule to that which is only a rabbinic ordinance we are therefore taught otherwise come and hear it the flesh of an old beast which was of the prescribed size had shriveled up so that it is now less than the prescribed size until now it could have been unclean but from now onwards it remains clean rabbi explained the position thus if a forbidden thing was of the prescribed size but now it is not so then it is not so and if at first it was not of the prescribed size and now it is then it is so rabbinically talmud mas medikoth be they differ only in the case where it was at first of the prescribed size but it shriveled up and then it swelled up again one is of the opinion that with forbidden things there can be an absolute rejection of the prohibition but the other maintains that there can be no such absolute rejection is there anyone who maintains that with forbidden things there can be an absolute rejection of the prohibition but we have learned if an egg's bulk of foodstuff was left in the sun and shrank likewise if an olive's bulk of a corpse an olive's bulk of nibble a lentil's bulk of a dead reptile an olive's bulk of consecrated flesh that was pickle or nuthar and an olive's bulk of forbidden fat shrank they are now clean and one is not liable thereby to the penalties for eating pickle or nuthar or forbidden fat if later they were left in the rain and swelled they become unclean and one is liable thereby to the penalties for eating pickle or nuthar or forbidden fat this clearly refutes the view of him who says that with forbidden things there can be an absolute rejection of the prohibition it is indeed a Refutation come and here one may give by number fresh fix as tithe in respect of pressed fix now if you hold that we measure a thing in the condition in which it was before it is well but if you hold that we measure in the condition in which it is now then too much is given as tithe and it has been taught if one gave too much tithe the produce is duly tithe but the tithe is unfit what then shall we say that we measure in the condition in which it was before but read the next clause and one may give pressed fix by measure as tithe in respect of fresh fix now if you hold that we measure in the condition in which it is now then it is well but if you hold that we measure in the condition in which it was before then too much is given as tithe we are dealing here with the great terima in the first clause as well as the second deals with the case of a man that is liberal if so read the final clause our Eliezer son of our Jose said my father used to take ten pressed fix from it Take in respect of the ninety fresh figs in the basket now if we are dealing with the great terima why is ten mentioned we are really dealing here with the terima of the tithe and it is in accordance with the teaching of Abba Eliezer B. Gomel for it was taught Abba Eliezer B. Gomel says it is written and your heave offering shall be reckoned unto you scripture speaks of two heave offerings one the great terima and the other the terima from the tithe just as the great terima is set aside by estimate and by intention so the terima of the tithe is set aside by estimate Talmud, Mas Medikothe and by intention and just as the great terima should be given generously so the terima of the tithe should be given generously but there is yet a difficulty from here for our Eliezer son of our Jose said my father used to take ten pressed figs from the cake in respect of the ninety fresh figs in the basket now if you hold that we measure in the condition in which it was before it is well. But if you hold that we measure in the condition in which it is now then too little is given as tithe when our Dimi came from Palestine he reported in the name of our Eliezer that the case of the pressed fix is different since they can be boiled and so restored to their former condition our rabbis taught one may give fresh fix as terima in respect of pressed fix in that place where it is the custom for fix to be pressed but one may not give pressed fix as terima in respect of fresh fix. Even in the place where it is the custom for fix to be pressed the master stated one may give fresh fix as terima in respect of pressed fix in that place where it is the custom for fix to be pressed this is so then only where there is this custom but not where there is no such custom but what are the facts of the case if there is a priest present then why is this not allowed even where there is no such custom have we not learned that wherever there is a priest present one must give it. Terima from the choicest kind obviously then there is no priest present now read the next clause but one may not give pressed fix as terima in respect of fresh fix even in the place where it is the custom for fix to be pressed but if there is no priest present why is one not allowed to do so have we not learned that where there is no priest one must give the terima from that which is most durable obviously then there is a priest present must we then say that in the case of the first clause there is no priest present whilst in the case of the second clause there is a priest present yes in the case of the first clause there is no priest present but in the case of the second clause there is a priest present said our papa you may infer from this that we endeavor to interpret two clauses of a passage by suggesting two sets of facts rather than suggest that they represent the views of two tanning mission all meal offerings must be needed with lukewarm water and must be washed less. They become leavened if one allowed the remainder to become leavened one transgresses a prohibition for it is written no meal offering which ye shall bring unto the Lord shall be made leavened one is liable for the kneading as well as for the shaping and for the baking tomorrow whence is this derived rush like said it is written it shall not be baked leavened their position that is even their portion must not be
But to teach that the same affects the whole general proposition, but perhaps I should say that the verse it shall not be made leavened is a general prohibition, and the verse it shall not be baked leavened is a particular prohibition. We thus have a general rule followed by a specific particular, in which case the general rule is limited to the particular specified, so that only the baking is prohibited, but no other work are after a key explained here. The general rule and the specific particular are far away from each other, and in every case where the general rule and the specific particular are far away from each other, the principle relating to a general rule followed by a specific particular does not apply. Our Abiyah of some say, Kadi objected, do you say that where the general rule and the specific particular are far away from each other, the principle relating to a general rule followed by a specific particular does not apply? Surely it has been taught, it is written, and he shall. Slaughter it in the place where they slaughter the burnt offering before the Lord. It is a sin offering. Now where is the burnt offering slaughtered on the north side? This too is slaughtered on the north side. But do we derive it from here? Is it not written in the place where the burnt offering is slaughtered? Shall the sin offering be slaughtered? Why then is the former verse necessary? It serves to make the rule absolute, namely that if it was not slaughtered on the north side, it is invalid. You say that it serves to make this rule absolute, but perhaps it is not so. But teaches rather that the sin offering must be slaughtered on the north side. But no other requires the north side. The text therefore states, and he shall slaughter the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering. This establishes the rule that all sin offerings must be slaughtered on the north side. Now this is the conclusion because the divine law has also written, and he shall slaughter the sin offering. But without this. Verse I would have held that only the sin offering requires the north side but no other requires the north side and why is it not because this would be a case of a general rule followed by a specific particular which would be governed by the principle relating to a general rule followed by a specific particular notwithstanding that the two are far away from each other thereupon our ashi demurred is this an instance of a general rule followed by a specific particular it is an instance of a specific particular followed by a general rule in which case the general rule extends beyond the scope of the specific particular and includes every sin offering rather the fact is that the tannis counter argument was based upon the expression it and he argued thus perhaps it is not so but teaches rather that the sin offering must be slaughtered on the north side but no other requires the north side since the divine law stated it now that the general rule is derived from the verse and he shall slaughter the sin offering. What does the term it exclude? Nemonic Nash on the slaughter of bird. The Passover offering it teaches that it must be on the north side, but Nashon's he goat was not slaughtered on the north side. For I might have thought that since the latter was included under the law of laying on of hands, it was also included under the law requiring the north side. We are therefore taught that it was not so. And whence do we know that this was so concerning the laying on of hands? For it was taught the verse, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of the he goat includes also Nashon's he goat for the requirement of the laying on of hands. So our Judah, but our Simeon says Talmud, Mos Menachoth, it includes the he goats offered for the sin of idolatry for the requirement of the laying on of hands. Rabbin Adamert saying it is well according to our Judah's view, but what is to be said if our Simeon's view is followed there upon Mars, the son of Armari said to Rabbinah, but even according to our Judah, should we not say that that which is expressly included is included, and that which is not included is not included? And if you retort that without a verse to exclude it, you would have included it by virtue of the general principle. Then, with regard to the requirement of laying on of hands, Scripture should have been silent concerning it, since it would have been included by virtue of the general principle. But you would answer that we may not derive it. Regulations applicable to a temporary enactment from a permanent law. Then, with regard to this too, we may not derive a temporary enactment from a permanent law. This then is the interpretation: it must be slaughtered on the north side, but the slaughterer need not stand at the north side. But is not this to be derived from Arahia's teaching? For it was taught Arahia says, wherefore does the text state, and he shall slaughter it on the side of the altar northward? It is because concerning the Receiving of the blood, we know that the priest must stand on the north side and receive the blood on the north side. And if he stood on the south side and received the blood on the north side, the offering is invalid. Now I might have thought that it is the same here with regard to the slaughtering scripture. Therefore, stated it, signifying that it must be on the north side, but the slaughterer need not stand on the north side rather than interpret it. Thus, it must be on the north side. But the killing of a bird offering need not be on the north side. For I might have argued that this was essential by an fortiori argument from a lamb offering. Thus, if the slaughtering of a lamb offering which does not require the services of a priest must be performed on the north side, is it not right that the killing of a bird offering which requires the services of a priest shall be performed on the north side? But surely one can retort this is so with a lamb offering because it requires an instrument for the slaughtering rather than we must interpret it as follows it must be on the north side but the slaughtering of the Passover offering need not be on the north side but is not the exclusion of the Passover offering derived from the teaching of our Eliezer B. Jacob for it was taught our Eliezer B. Jacob said one might think that the Passover offering requires slaughtering on the north side by reason of this a fortiori argument if the slaughtering of a burnt offering which has no fixed time for the slaughtering must be performed on the north side is it not right that the slaughtering of the Passover offering which has a fixed time for the slaughtering thereof shall be performed on the north side but surely one can retort this is so with the burnt offering because it is wholly burnt one can argue the case from the sin offering but surely one can retort that this is so with the sin offering because it affects atonement for those that are liable to it. Penalty of Kareth one can argue the case from the guilt offering but surely this is so with the guilt offering because it is a most holy offering and if one were to argue the case from all these offerings one could retort that this is so with all these mentioned because they are almost holy offerings rather we must say that the interpretation is indeed as stated previously it must be on the north side but the slaughterer need not be on the north side and as for your objection is not this to be derived from our Ahiah's teaching I say that our Ahiah comes not to teach that the slaughterer need not be on the north side he teaches rather that in contradistinction from the slaughterer who need not be on the north side the receiver of the blood must be on the north side but is not this rule regarding the receiver of the blood derived from the fact that scripture states and he shall take and not he shall take your Ahiah does not base any exposition on the fact that Scripture states, and he shall take and not he shall take one is liable for the kneading as well as for the shaping and for the baking. Our Papa said, if a man bake the meal offering leavened, he has incurred stripes on two counts once for shaping it while leavened and again for baking it. But have you not said above as the baking is described as a specific work and one is liable solely on account of it? This is no difficulty for in the one case he shaped it and also baked it, but in the other case another shaped it and he baked it. Our rabbis taught if a firstling was attacked with congestion, it may be bled in a place where no blemish would result, but it may not be bled in a place where a blemish would result. So our mayor the sages say it may be bled even in a place where a blemish would result, provided that it is not slaughtered by reason of that blemish. Our Simeon says, Talmud, Mos Menachoth, it may even be slaughtered by reason of that blemish. Our Judah says it may not be bled even. Though it would otherwise die, our high Abba said in the name of our Yohanan, all agree that whosoever leavens the meal offering after it was already leavened is liable for it is written it shall not be made leavened, and it is also written it shall not be baked leavened, and that whosoever castrates a beast after it was already castrated is liable for it is written that which hath its stones bruised or crushed or torn off or cut neither shall ye do thus in your land now if one is liable for cutting how much more so for tearing off wherefore is the latter mentioned to teach that one is also liable if one tears them away after they were already cut they only differ as to whether one may blemish a blemished animal our Mayor says it is written there shall be no blemish at all therein but the rabbis say it is written it shall be perfect to be accepted against our Mayor it will be objected is there not written it shall be perfect to be accepted that would only exclude what was born Blemish, but what was born blemished is no better than a tree, it excludes rather consecrated animals that have been rendered unfit by reason of a blemish and have been redeemed. For I might have argued that since these may not be sheared of their wool nor put to any labor, it is also forbidden to inflict any further blemish upon them. We are therefore taught that it is not so, and against the rabbis it will be objected. Is it not written there shall be no blemish at all therein? That verse is necessary for the following teaching. It is written there shall be no blemish at all therein. I
Liable where he did not turn it over it is necessary to be stated only for the circumstance where had he not turned it over it would have been roasted on one side only to the extent of that which was eaten by Bandrusai but with turning it over it would have been roasted on both sides to that extent now we are here taught that whatsoever is done on one side only to the extent of that which was eaten by Bandrusai is insignificant Rabba said if it had been well roasted in one place the size of a dry fig one would be liable Rabba said to our ashi is it then that only if roasted in one place to the size of a dry fig one is liable but not if roasted in two or three places but we have learned he who bores a hole however small is liable now what can this mean will you say it means a hole in one place but of what use can a tiny hole be obviously that it means holes in two or three places no matter how small since they can be joined together no I still say it means a Hole in one place where it can serve as a keyhole. Another version states Rabba said even if it had been roasted in two or three places together making up the size of a dry fig one would be liable. Rabba said to our ashi we have learned in a mission to the same effect he who bores a hole however small is liable. Now what can this mean will you say it means a hole in one place but of what use can a tiny hole be it must mean holes in two or three places no matter how small since they can be. Joined together no I still say it means a hole in one place where it can serve as a keyhole. Our rabbis taught had scripture only stated which ye shall bring unto the Lord shall not be made leavened. I should have said that only the handful shall not be made leavened. But once would I know that this prohibition applies to the whole meal offering the text therefore added meal offering and once would I know that this applies to other meal offerings to the text therefore stated every meal. Offering which ye shall bring unto the Lord signifies what is valid but not what is invalid. Hence they said he who leavens a valid meal offering is liable, but he who leavens what is invalid is not liable. Our Papa inquired what is the law of a man leavened the meal offering and it was then taken out of the sanctuary and afterwards he again leavened it. Shall I say since it has been taken out it has thereby become invalid and consequently by leavening it thereafter he cannot be held liable for leavening what was already leavened or perhaps I should say since it has been leavened it cannot be affected by being taken out and consequently by leavening it again he would be liable for leavening what was already leavened. This question remains undecided. Our Mari inquired what is the law if he leavened a handful at the head of the altar does not the divine law say which ye shall bring and this has already been brought up or perhaps I should say since it still requires to be burnt it is as Though the act of bringing has not been completed, this question remains undecided. And now that the general prohibition has been derived from every meal offering, wherefore is the expression which ye shall bring stated? It is required for the following which was taught, which ye shall bring includes the meal offering which is offered with the drink offering, so that it too comes within the prohibition of leavening. So our Jose the Galilean, our Akiba says it includes the shoe bread, so that it too comes within the prohibition of leavening, but is not the meal offering which is offered with the drink offerings prepared with fruit juice. Talmud, Mas Menakoth B and fruit juice cannot render odd leaven. Rashlakish answered that our Jose the Galilean was of the opinion that it was permitted to mix the meal offering which is offered with the drink offerings with water, but was not the flour for the shoe bread put into a measuring vessel for dry goods. And we know that our Akiba is of the opinion that. The measuring vessel for dry goods was not consecrated. Rabin sent the following answer in the name of our Yohanan that is indeed the proper construction of the teaching, but the authorities must be reversed, which ye shall bring includes the shoe bread so that it too comes within the prohibition of leavening. So our Jose the Galilean our Akiba says it includes the meal offering which is offered with the drink offering so that it too comes within the prohibition of leavening. Our Yohanan is indeed consistent in his view for our Yohanan has said that our Jose the Galilean and one of the disciples of our Ishmael, namely our Josai, both hold the same view for it was taught it is written and had anointed them and sanctified them. Our Josai says the liquid measures were anointed both inside and outside while the dry measures were anointed inside but not outside. Our Jonathan says the liquid measures were anointed inside but not outside while the dry measures were not anointed and all this can be proved. From the fact that they do not hallow what was put into them, for it is written, Ye shall bring out of your dwellings two wave loaves of two tenth parts of an ephah, they shall be of fine flour, they shall be baked with leaven for first fruits unto the Lord. When are they appointed unto the Lord only after they have been baked? Wherein do they differ in the interpretation of the word? The Marjosai maintains that the word them excludes the outside of the dry measure, but our Jonathan holds that the dry measure was not holy at all, and no verse is necessary to exclude it. The word them can thus serve to exclude only the outside of the liquid measure. And why did not our Yohanan say that our Akiba and one of the disciples of our Ishmael, namely our Jonathan, both said the same thing because they do not agree entirely about the liquid measures? Our Papa said to Abe was not a bowl used for the kneading of the shoe bread, and that was a measuring vessel for liquids. He replied, It might have been needed. On a slab, but if so, when our Jonathan said this can be proved from the fact that they do not hallow what was put into them, his colleague could have retorted that it might have been measured out in an unconsecrated tent measure. The two cases cannot be compared for with regard to the bowl, since the divine law did not expressly prescribe a bowl for the kneading. If it was needed on a slab, it did not matter in the least. But with regard to the tent measure, since the divine law directed that a tent measure be made wherewith the flour might be measured, would one reject the consecrated tent measure and measure with an unconsecrated tent measure? Our rabbis taught once is it derived that whosoever offers of the flesh of a sin offering or of a guilt offering of the flesh of a most holy or of a less holy offering of the residue of the omer offering of the residue of the two loaves of the shoe bread or of the remainder of meal offerings transgresses a negative precept because the text. States for any leaven or any honey ye shall not burn of it as an offering made by fire unto the Lord, signifying that any offering, if only a portion of it is offered upon the fire, comes under the prohibition of ye shall not burn, but is any part of the two loaves or of the shoe bread offered upon the fire. Surely it has been taught us the two loaves and the shoe bread are excluded since no part of them is offered upon the fire. Our hate answered it meant there that no part of them is actually offered upon the fire. It was reported if a person brought up any of the above mentioned parts upon the ascent, our Yohanan said he is liable, but our Eliezer said he is not liable, our Yohanan said he is liable, for it was taught the verse says the altar I know this only of the altar once do I know it of the ascent to the text states, but they shall not come up for a sweet savor on the altar. Our Eliezer said he is not liable because the verse says leaven and honey as an offering of first fruits may. Bring them unto the Lord only with regard to these is it implied that the ascent is on a par with the altar but with no other offering is it so Talmud, Mas Menachoth and to what purpose does our Yohanan employ the term them he requires it for the following which was taught one might think that an individual may make a free will offering of two loaves in the same manner and offer it for I would apply the verse that which is gone out of thy lips thou shalt observe and do the text therefore. States as an offering of first fruits ye may bring meaning only the community may bring them but not an individual one might further think that an individual may not offer them since he does not offer the like as an obligation but the community may offer them as a free will offering since it must offer the like as an obligation the text therefore states them only these are to be offered namely the two loaves which are with leaven and the offering of first fruits which includes honey but was it. Then not permissible to offer the two loaves as a free will offering. Surely it has been taught since scripture has stated any leaven. Why has it also stated any honey? Or since it has stated any honey, why has it also stated any leaven? It is because there is a condition which applies to leaven but not to honey, and there is also a condition which applies to honey but not to leaven. Leaven admits of an exception in that it is permitted in the temple, but honey does not admit of any exception in the temple. Honey is permitted to be used in the remainder of a meal offering, but leaven is not permitted to be used in the remainder of a meal offering. Therefore, since there is a condition which applies to leaven but not to honey, and there is a condition which applies to honey but not to leaven, scripture had to state any leaven and also any honey. Now to what did it refer when it said leaven admits of an exception in that it is permitted in the temple? No doubt to the two loaves which may be offered. As a free will offering, no said Aram it referred to what was offered with them, but then it is the same with the first fruits, is it not? For we have learned the pigeons that were upon the baskets of first fruits were sacrificed as burnt offerings, but those which the people carried in their hands they gave to the priests, those were
Because the text states any leaven and whence do I know it for the mixture because the text states for any leaven wherein do they differ Abbe maintains that the handful may be less than two olives bulk Talmud, Mas Menachof B Talmud, Mas Menachof B and that the burning of a quantity less than an olives bulk counts as an offering whereas Rabba maintains that the handful may not be less than two olives bulk and that the burning of a quantity less than an olives bulk does not count as an offering it was stated if a man offered leaven and honey upon the altar he has incurred stripes said Rabba once for offering leaven again for offering honey again for offering leaven in a mixture and yet again for offering honey in a mixture but Abbe said he does not suffer stripes for the breach of a negative precept which includes a number of prohibitions some say that he suffers stripes but once but others say that he does not suffer stripes at all since the negative precept is not as Specific is that of Muslim Talmud, Mas Menico the mission is some meal offerings require oil and frankincense, some require oil but not frankincense, some frankincense but not oil and some neither oil nor frankincense. These require oil and frankincense, the meal offering of fine flour that prepared on a griddle that prepared in a pan, the cakes and the wafers, the meal offering of the priests, the meal offering of the anointed high priest, the meal offering of the Gentile, the meal offering of women. And the meal offering of the Omer, the meal offering offered with the drink offerings requires oil but not frankincense, the shoe bread requires frankincense but not oil, the two loaves, the sinner's meal offering and the meal offering of jealousy require neither oil nor frankincense. Gemara, our Papa said all the meal offerings enumerated in the mission must consist of ten cakes, he thus rejects our Simeon's view who said he may offer half in cakes and half in wafers, and so he teaches us that it is. Not so our rabbis taught it is written and thou shalt put oil upon it upon it but not upon the shoe bread for without the verse I would have argued by an aforciori argument thus if the meal offering that is offered with the drink offerings which does not require frankincense nevertheless requires oil how much more does the shoe bread which requires frankincense require oil the text therefore stated upon it upon it shall be oil but not upon the shoe bread it is further written and thou shalt lay frankincense upon it upon it shall be frankincense but not upon the meal offering offered with the drink offerings for without the verse I would have argued by an aforciori argument thus if the shoe bread which does not require oil nevertheless requires frankincense how much more does the meal offering offered with the drink offerings which requires oil require frankincense the text therefore stated upon it upon it shall be frankincense but not upon the meal offering offered with the drink offerings meal offering this includes a meal offering offered on the eighth day of consecration so that it too required frankincense it is this excludes the two loaves so that they require neither oil nor frankincense the master said upon it shall be oil but not upon the shoe bread might I not say upon it shall be oil but not upon the meal offering of the priest it is more reasonable to include the meal offering of the priest since like the meal offering of the omer it consists of a tenth of an ephah requires a vessel of ministry is prepared outside becomes unfit when its appearance is spoiled requires bringing near to the altar and is burnt upon the fire of the altar on the contrary it is more reasonable to include the shoe bread since like the meal offering of the omer it is an offering on behalf of the community is obligatory may be offered in uncleanness is eaten is subject to pickle and is offered on the sabbath the former is the more plausible since there is written anyone the master said upon it shall be frankincense but not upon the meal offering offered with the drink offerings might I not say upon it shall be frankincense but not upon the meal offering of the priest it is more reasonable to include the meal offering of the priest since like the meal offering of the omer it consists of a tent is mixed with a log of oil is brought near the altar and is offered by itself on the contrary it is more reasonable to include the meal offering offered with the drink offering since like the meal offering of the omer it is an offering on behalf of the community is obligatory and may be offered in uncleanness and on the sabbath the former is the more plausible since there is written anyone meal offering this includes the meal offering offered on the eighth day of consecration so that it too required frankincense perhaps it excludes it it is out of the question if you say that it Includes it as well, but if you say that it excludes it, the expression is then superfluous. For surely we would not infer a temporary enactment from a permanent law. It is this excludes the two loaves, so that they require neither oil nor frankincense. Might I not say that it excludes a meal offering of priests? It is more reasonable to include the meal offering of priests, since like the meal offering of the omer, it consists of a tenth requires a vessel of ministry is unleavened is offered by itself must be brought near to the altar and is burnt upon the fire of the altar. On the contrary, Talmud, Mas Menachot B. It is more reasonable to include the two loaves, since like the meal offering of the omer, they are offered on behalf of the community. Are obligatory may be offered in uncleanness or eaten are subject to pickle may be offered on the Sabbath. Render permissible require waving must be from the produce of the land of Israel are offered on. A fixed date and must be offered from the new produce and here we have more points in common the former is the more plausible since there is written any one mission a man is liable because of the oil by itself and because of the frankincense by itself if he put in oil he has rendered it invalid but if frankincense he must pick it off again if he put oil on the remainder he has not thereby transgressed a negative precept if he put one vessel above the other vessel he has not thereby rendered it invalid Gemara our rabbis taught he shall put no oil upon it but if he put oil thereon he has made it invalid I might also say neither shall he put any frankincense thereon but if he did he has made it invalid the text therefore states for a sin offering I might then say that this is so with the oil too the text therefore states it is but why do you declare it invalid if oil was put thereon invalid if frankincense was put thereon I declare it invalid if oil was put thereon since it cannot be picked off again, but I declare it valid if frankincense was put thereon since it can be picked off again. Rabbi son of Arhunah inquired of Aryohanan, how is it if he put upon it fine frankincense? Is it valid if frankincense was put thereon because it can be picked off again? But in this case, it cannot be picked off again, or is it because it does not become absorbed and this too does not become absorbed? Come in here and if frankincense he must pick it off again. Perhaps there are two reasons for it. Firstly, that it does not become absorbed, and another reason is that it can be picked off again. Come in here, I declare it valid if frankincense was put thereon since it can be picked off here again. We can reply that there are two reasons for it. How is it then? Arnam and B. Isaac answered, It was taught if a man put frankincense upon the sinner's meal offering or upon the meal offering of jealousy, he must pick it off again, and the meal offering is valid if before he had picked off. The frankincense he expressed an intention concerning an act to be performed outside its proper time or place it is invalid but the penalty of Kareth is not incurred but if after he had picked off the frankincense he expressed an intention concerning an act to be performed outside its proper place it is invalid and the penalty of Kareth is not incurred but if outside its proper time it is pickle and the penalty of Kareth is incurred surely it should be regarded as rejected Abbe answered. Scripture still refers to it as a sin offering Rabbah said this represents the view of Hain and the Egyptian who does not consider anything as absolutely rejected for it was taught Hain and the Egyptian says even though the blood is still in the bowl he may without casting lots bring another goat and pair it with the other Arashi said whatsoever still remains in his power to rectify is never regarded as rejected Arata said that Arashi's view is the more probable for who is it that regards a matter. As absolutely rejected it is Arjuna as we have learned moreover said Arjuna if the blood was poured out the scapegoat must be left to die and if the scapegoat died the blood must be poured out nevertheless in regard to a matter which is still in his power to rectify it has been taught Arjuna says a cup was filled with the mingled blood that was spilled on the ground and it was sprinkled in one action towards the base of the altar our Isaac B. Joseph said in the name of Arjuna and if a man put the minutest quantity of oil upon an olive's bulk of the sinner's meal offering he has thereby rendered it invalid what is the reason for he shall not put implies the putting of any quantity however little whilst upon it implies at least the minimum quantity our Isaac B. Joseph also said in the name of Arjuna and if a man put an olive's bulk of frankincense upon the minutest quantity of the sinner's meal offering he has thereby rendered it invalid what is the reason because it is written he Shall not give any frankincense which signifies that there must be a quantity thereof worthy to be given and as for the term upon the Talmud, Mas Menachoth it is an amplification following an amplification and whenever an amplification follows another amplification it signifies
Cakes and a wafers, the meal offering of the priests, the meal offering of the anointed high priest, the meal offering of the Gentile, the meal offering of women and the sinners, meal offering our Simeon says the meal offering of the priests and the meal offering of the anointed high priest do not require bringing near since no handful is taken out of them and where no handful is taken out bringing near is not necessary. Gamara our Papa said all the meal offerings enumerated in the Mishnah must consist of ten cakes. What does he teach us? He wishes to exclude thereby our Simeon's view who said he may offer half in cakes and half in wafers and so he teaches us that it is not so whence is it derived. Our rabbis taught had scripture stated and thou shalt bring that which is made of these things unto the Lord and he shall present it unto the priest and he shall bring it unto the altar. I would have said that I learned from this that the handful alone required bringing near but once would. I know this of the whole meal offering the text therefore states meal offering and whence would I know this of the sinner's meal offering the text therefore states the meal offering but surely this could be derived by the following argument scripture speaks of the offering of Talmud, Mas Menachot be a meal offering is an obligation and it also speaks of the offering of a meal offering as a free will just as the free will meal offering requires bringing near so the obligatory meal offering requires bringing near and if it be objected that this is so of the free will meal offering since it requires both oil and frankincense then the meal offering of a suspected adulteress can prove the contrary and if it be objected that this is so of the meal offering of the suspected adulteress since it requires waving then the free will meal offering can prove the contrary the argument thus goes around the distinguishing feature of this meal offering is not that of the other meal. Offering and the distinguishing feature of the other meal offering is not that of this one. Their common features, however, are that they are alike with regard to the taking of the handful and also with regard to bringing near. I will then also include the sinner's meal offering that since it is like unto them with regard to the taking of the handful, it shall be like unto them also with regard to the bringing near. But it will be objected that there is yet another common feature, namely that the same offering is valid for the rich as for the poor. Whereas in the case of the sinner's meal offering, the same offering is not valid for the rich as for the poor. The text therefore must state the meal offering. Our Simeon says, and thou shalt bring this includes the meal offering of the omer, so that it too requires bringing near. As it is said, ye shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest, and he shall present it. This includes the meal offering of a suspected. Adulterous so that it too requires bringing near as it is said and he shall present it unto the altar but surely this could be derived by the following argument if the sinner's meal offering which does not require waving nevertheless requires bringing near how much more does the meal offering of a suspected adulteress which requires waving require bringing near but if it be objected that this is so of the sinner's meal offering since it is offered from within the meal offering of the omer can prove the contrary and if it be objected that this is so of the meal offering of the omer since it requires both oil and frankincense then the sinner's meal offering can prove the contrary the argument thus goes around the distinguishing feature of this meal offering is not that of the other and the distinguishing feature of that meal offering is not that of this one their common features however are that they are alike with regard to the taking of the handful and also with regard to bringing near I will then also include the meal offering of a suspected adulteress that since it is like unto them with regard to the taking of the handful it shall be like unto them also with regard to the bringing near but it will be objected that there is yet another common feature namely that coarse flour is not valid in either case whereas in the case of the meal offering of the suspected adulteress only coarse flour is valid the text must therefore state and he shall present it R. Judah says and thou shalt bring includes the meal offering of a suspected adulteress so that it too requires bringing near as it is said and he shall bring her offering for her for the meal offering of the omer however no verse is necessary since it can be inferred from the following argument if the sinner's meal offering which does not require waving requires bringing near how much more does the meal offering of the omer which requires waving require bringing near but if it be objected that this is so of the sinner's meal offering since it is offered of wheat, then the meal offering of the suspected adulteress can prove the contrary, and if it be objected that, that this is so of the meal offering of the suspected adulteress since it is brought to discover guilt, then the sinner's meal offering can prove the contrary. The argument thus goes around the distinguishing feature of this meal offering is not that of the other, and the distinguishing feature of the other meal offering is not that of this one. Their common features, however, are that they are alike with regard to the taking of the handful, and also with regard to bringing near. I will then include the meal offering of the omer too, that since it is like unto them in respect of the taking of the handful, it shall be like unto them in respect of bringing near. And what objection can you now raise against this Arsimian, however, objects to it on this ground? There is yet another common feature, namely that those may happen. Frequently, but Arjuna maintains that on the contrary, this is more frequent, whereas the others may never happen at all. But perhaps the expression and thou shalt bring serves rather to intimate that an individual may of his free will bring a meal offering other than those mentioned in the context, and this can even be supported by the following argument the community brings a meal offering of wheat as an obligation, and it also brings a meal offering of barley as an obligation, then likewise an individual, since he brings a meal offering of wheat of his free will, may also bring a meal offering of barley of his free will. The text therefore states these only these that are mentioned in the context, but perhaps the expression these serves only to signify that a person who says, I take upon myself to offer a meal offering must bring the five kinds. The text therefore states of these implying that if he so wishes, he may bring one only, and if he so wishes, he may bring the five kinds are simian. Says the expression the meal offering includes other meal offerings so that they do require bringing near but I might say that it includes also the two loaves and the shoe bread the text therefore states of these and why do you prefer to include other meal offerings and to exclude the two loaves and the shoe bread rather than the reverse include other meal offerings since part thereof is put upon the fire of the altar but I exclude the two loaves and the shoe bread since no part thereof is put upon the fire of the altar but the meal offering offered with the drink offerings is put entirely upon the fire is it not then I would say that it requires bringing near the text therefore states and he shall present it but have you not employed this expression for another purpose for that alone scripture could have stated and he shall present but it says and he shall present it and why do you prefer to include other meal offerings and to exclude the meal offering offered with the drink Offerings rather than the reverse Talmud, Mas Menachote I include other meal offerings since they may be offered by themselves but I exclude the meal offering offered with the drink offering since it may not be offered by itself but the meal offering of the priest and the meal offering of the anointed high priest are offered by themselves are they not then I would say that they require bringing near the text therefore states and he shall bring it near but surely this expression is required for its own sake namely that the meal offerings mentioned in the context require bringing near for that alone scripture could have stated and he shall bring near but it says and he shall bring it near and why do you prefer to include other meal offerings and to exclude the meal offering of the priest and the meal offering of the anointed high priest rather than the reverse I include the other meal offerings since like the meal offering stated in the context part thereof is Put upon the fire of the altar they are offered by themselves and part thereof is eaten by the priests but I exclude the two loaves and the shoe bread since no part thereof is put upon the fire of the altar I exclude the meal offering offered with the drink offering since it is not offered by itself and I exclude the meal offering of the priest and the meal offering of the anointed high priest since no part thereof is eaten by the priest and he shall take out I might think with a vessel. The text therefore states elsewhere and he shall take out therefrom with his handful as the taking out in the latter case is with his handful so the taking out in the former is with his handful mission of these require waving but not bringing near the log of oil of the leper and his guilt offering the first fruits according to our Eliezer be Jacob the sacrificial portions of an individual's peace offerings and the breast and thigh thereof whether they are the offerings of men or of women but Israelites but not by others the two loaves and the two lambs of Pentecost how is it performed he places the two loaves upon the two lambs and puts his two hands beneath them and waves them forward and backward and upward and downward for it is written which is waved and which is heaped up the waving was performed on the east side of the altar and the bringing near on the west side the ceremony of waving comes before that of bringing near the meal offering of the omer and the meal offering of jealousy require bringing near and waving the shoe bread and the meal offering with the drink offerings require neither bringing near nor waving our Simeon says there are three kinds of offering which between
the altar but has it not been said before the Lord perhaps this means on the west side I answer that was said only of the meal offering for it is designated a sin offering and a sin offering requires the base of the altar whereas at the southeast corner there was no base here however we certainly can speak of the east side as before the Lord the first fruits according to our Elizer B. Jacob what is the teaching of our Elizer B. Jacob it was taught and the priest shall take the basket out of thy and this indicates that the first fruits require waving so our Elizer B. Jacob what is the reason of our Elizer B. Jacob it is derived from the occurrence of the word hand both here and in connection with the peace offerings here it is written and the priest shall take the basket out of thy hand and there it is written his own hands shall bring the offerings Talmud Mos Menikoth be just as here the priest is stated so there too the priest is meant and just as there the owner is referred to so here too the owner is required how is it to be done the priest places his hand under the hands of the owner and waves and why does not the mission say the first fruits also according to our Judah for it was taught our Judah says and thou shalt set it down this refers to the right of waving you say that it refers to the waving but perhaps it means literally setting it down as it has already said and set it down setting down in the literal sense has already been indicated what then is the meaning of and thou shalt set it down it can only refer to the waving Rob answered it is only because his verses stated earlier in the chapter are not and B. Isaac answered it is because his knowledge was exceptional the sacrificial portions of an individual's peace offerings and the breast and the thigh thereof whether they are the offerings of men or of women by Israelites but not by others what does this mean said Rab Judah it means this whether they are the offerings of men or of women these offerings require waving, but the right of waving shall be performed by Israelites and not by women. Our rabbis taught the children of Israel may perform the right of waving, but not Gentiles. The children of Israel may perform the right of waving, but not women. Our Jose said, since we find that Scripture has distinguished between the offering of an Israelite and the offering of a Gentile or of a woman with regard to the laying on of hands, should we not also make this distinction with regard to the right of waving? No, for whereas there is good reason to make such a distinction with regard to the laying on of hands by virtue of the fact that the laying on of hands must be performed by the owner of the offering, is there any reason to make such a distinction with regard to the right of waving, seeing that the priests also perform the waving? Why then does the text expressly state the children of Israel to teach that the children of Israel may perform the waving, but not Gentiles? The children of Israel may perform the waving, but not women. Another very the taught it is written, the children of Israel. I know from this that the children of Israel perform the waving once do I know to include also proselytes and freed slaves. The text therefore states he that offered, perhaps he that offered refers only to the priest, but since the verse states subsequently his own hands shall bring the offerings, the owners are already indicated. How is it then to be explained? The priest places his hand under the hands of the owner and waves Talmud. Mos Menikotha, how was it arranged? The sacrificial portions were put upon the palm of the hand and the breast and thigh above them, and whenever there were cakes to be waved, the cakes were always on top. Where is the scene? Our Papa said at the consecration of the priests, why is it so? Shall I say it is because it is written the thigh of heaving and the breast of waving, they shall put upon the fat of the fire offering to wave it for a wave. Offering, but is it not also written he shall bring the fat upon the breast? Abay answered the latter refers to the manner in which the priest brings them from the slaughtering place and turns them over into the hands of the priest that is about to wave them, but is it not also written and they put the fat upon the breast? This refers to the handing over of these to the priest that is about to burn them. These verses incidentally teach us that three priests are required for this part of it. Service as it is said in the multitude of people is the king's glory, the two loaves and the two lambs of Pentecost are rabbis taught it is written, and the priest shall wave then upon all the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before the Lord upon all the two lambs. I might think that he should put the lambs upon the bread. The text therefore states upon the two lambs, if I had only the expression upon the two lambs to go by, I might think that he should put the bread upon it. Lambs the text therefore states upon the bread of the first fruits now the verse is equally balanced and I know not whether the bread shall be upon the lambs or the lambs upon the bread since however we find that in all cases the bread is on top and here too the bread shall be on top where was it so our papa said at the consecration of the priests our Jose B. Hameshalem says the lambs shall be on top and how can I explain upon the two lambs to exclude the seven lambs Hanabi Hakane I says he must put the two loaves between the thighs of the lambs and wave them thus fulfilling both verses the bread upon the lambs and the lambs upon the bread said Rabbi surely before a king of flesh and blood one would not do so how much less before the king of kings the holy one blessed be he therefore he should put one beside the other and wave them but we have to conform with the expression Allah Hisda said to our Hamnan other say our Hamnan said to our Hisda Rabbi follows his general view that Al means near to as it was taught it is written and thou shalt put pure frankincense a row rabbi says al means near to you say that al means near to but perhaps it is not so but rather it signifies literally upon since it states and thou shalt put a veil al the ark conclude that al means near to and waves them forward and backward and upward and downward are high be abba said in the name of our yohan and forward and backward that is to him unto whom the four directions belong upward and downward that is to him unto whom heaven and earth belong in the west it was taught as follows our hamba be said in the name of our jose be our hand forward and backward in order to keep off violent winds upward and downward in order to keep off harmful dues our jose son of Arab and said this proves that even the dispensable rights of a precept when performed ward off punishment for the right of waving is dispensable in the precept and yet it keeps off violent winds and harmful dues rabbi said likewise with the Lulab or Ahabi Jacob used to swing it forward and backward and hold it out and say an arrow in the eyes of Satan but it is not proper to do so for it is a challenge to Satan to contend with him. Our rabbis taught the peace offerings of the community require waving also after they are slaughtered and the waving must be of them as they are so rabbi but the sages say only of the breast and thigh wherein do they differ our hisda said to our hamna other say our hamna said to our hisda they differ as to whether we say deduce from it and again from it or deduce from it and establish it in its own place the rabbis maintain the principle deduce from it and again from it deduce from it as the individual's peace offering requires waving after it is slaughtered so the peace offerings of the community also require waving after they are slaughtered and again from it just as the waving there is of the breast and thigh so here it is also of the breast and thigh rabbi however maintains it Principle deduce from it and establish it in its own place deduce from it as the individual's peace offering requires waving after it is slaughtered so the peace offerings of the community also require waving after they are slaughtered and establish it in its own place whereas there the waving is of the breast and thigh only here it is of them as they are that is as they are when alive Talmud, Mos Menikoth B. Our Papa said all except the principle deduce from it and again from it but this is Rabbi's reason namely it must be analogous with the rule there and as in that case all that which is given as a gift to the priest must be waved so here also all that which is given as a gift to the priest must be waved Rabbi said all except the principle deduce from it and establish it in its own place but this is the reason of the Rabbis it is written their peace offerings which is an inclusive term our Simeon says there are three kinds of offering which between them require three rights. Two of the three rights apply to each kind of offering, but the three are with none, and these are they the peace offering of the individual, the peace offering of the community, and the guilt offering of the leper. The peace offering of the individual requires the laying on of hands for the living animal and waving after it is slaughtered, but it does not require waving for the living animal. The peace offering of the community requires waving for the living animal and also after it is slaughtered. But it does not require the laying on of hands. The guilt offering of the leper requires the laying on of hands and also waving for the living animal, but it does not require waving after it is slaughtered. But surely one could argue by the following a fortiori argument that the peace offering of the individual should require waving for the living animal, for if the peace offering of the community which does not require the laying on of hands for the living animal requires waving for the living. Animal, how much more does the peace offering of the individual which requires the laying on of hands for the living animal require waving for the living animal? The divine law stated in connection with the peace offering of the community, the exclusive term them in order to exclude the peace offering of the individual. Again, one could argue by the following a fortiori argument that the peace offering of the community should require the la
them performs the rite of waving on behalf of them all in the case of a woman the priest waves the offering on her behalf and so too if a person sent his offerings from across the seas the priest waves them on his behalf Talmud, Mas Menico the Talmud, Mas Menico the Mishnah if a man said I take upon myself to offer a meal offering prepared on a griddle he must not bring one prepared in a pan if in a pan he must not bring one prepared on a griddle what is the difference between the griddle? Mahabath and a pan marashit the pan has a lid to it but the griddle has no lid so our Jose the Galilean our Hannah Begamaliel says a pan is deep and what is prepared therein is spongy a griddle is flat and what is prepared thereon is hard tomorrow what is our Jose's reason shall I say that Mars hate is so called because it is offered for the stirrings of the heart as it is written my heart is stirred rehash by a goodly matter and Mahabath because it is offered for the prattings of the mouth as people remark he is pratting Manabana but the reverse might just as well be said namely Mahabath is so called because it is offered for the secrets of the heart as it is written wherefore didst thou flee secretly Mahabath and Mars hate because it is offered for the whispering of the lips as people remark his lips were whispering merchant we must say that it is established so by tradition our Hannah Begamaliel says etc the pan is a deep vessel for so it is written and all that is Prepared in the pan the griddle is flat for so it is written and on the griddle our rabbis taught Batsham I say if a man said I take upon myself to offer a Mars hate the vow must stand over until Elijah comes there in doubt as to whether these terms refer to the vessel or to the pastry prepared therein but Beth Hillel say there was a vessel in the temple called Mars hate resembling a deep mold which gave the dough that was put into it the shape of Cretan apples and Grecian nuts. Furthermore it is written and all that is prepared in the pan and on the griddle we thus see that these terms refer to the vessels and not to the pastry prepared therein mission if a man said I take upon myself to offer a meal offering baked in an oven he must not bring what is baked in a stove or on tiles or in the fireplace of the Arabs our Judah says if he so wishes he may bring what is baked in a stove if he said I take upon myself to offer a baked meal offering he may not bring half. In cakes and half in wafers our Simeon permits it since both kinds belong to the same offering Gemara our rabbis taught baked in the oven but not baked in a stove or on tiles or in the fireplaces of the Arabs our Judah says oven is stated twice in order to permit even what is baked in a stove our Simeon says oven is stated twice once to teach that it must be baked in an oven and once that it is hallowed by the oven but is our Simeon of its view surely we have learned our Simeon says act you stomp thyself too. Say the two loaves and the shoe bread were valid whether made in the temple court or in Beth page Rabbah answered say rather it should be consecrated for the oven if he said I take upon myself to offer a baked meal offering he may not bring half in cakes etc our rabbis taught and when thou bringest that is when thou bringest doing so as a matter of free choice and offering of a meal offering our Judah said once do I know that if a man said I take upon myself to offer a baked meal offering he May not bring half in cakes and half in wafers because the text states an offering of a meal offering I spoke to thee of one offering but not of two or three offerings said to him our Simeon Talmud. Mas Menikoth B is the term offering stated twice in the verse offering is stated only once and concerning it are mentioned cakes and wafers so that if he so desires he may bring cakes or he may bring wafers or he may bring half in cakes and half in wafers he must mingle them with oil and it. Handful must be taken from the two kinds if when taking a handful there came into his hand only one of the two kinds it is valid our Jose son of our Judah says whence do I know that if a man said I take upon myself to offer a big meal offering he may not bring half in cakes and half in wafers because it is written and every meal offering that is baked in the oven and every meal offering that is prepared in the pan and on the griddle shall be the priests that offered it and every meal. Offering mingled with oil or dry shall all the sons of Aaron have just as the term every in the latter cases refers to two distinct kinds so the term every in the former case refers to two distinct kinds and what can our Judah say our Simeon is quite right in his argument our Judah can reply since the expression with oil is stated twice in the verse it is as though the expression offering had been repeated and our Simeon what would he say to this had not the expression with oil been repeated I would have said that the offering must consist half of cakes and half of wafers but not of cakes alone or of wafers alone we are therefore taught otherwise is not the view of our Jose son of our Judah identical with that of his father there would be a difference between them in the case where one actually did so chapter I mission our Ishmael says on the Sabbath the Omer was taken out of three seahs of barley and on a weekday out of five but the sages say whether on the Sabbath or on a Weekday it was taken out of three seahs our Hannah the vice high priest says on the Sabbath it was reaped by one man with one sickle into one basket and on a weekday it was reaped by three men into three baskets and with three sickles but the sages say whether on the Sabbath or on a weekday it was reaped by three men into three baskets and with three sickles Gemara the opinion of the rabbis is quite clear for they hold that a tenth of the finest flour can be obtained out of three seahs and therefore it is all one whether it was a Sabbath or a weekday but what can be the opinion of our Ishmael if he holds that a tenth of the finest flour can be obtained only out of five seahs then on a Sabbath two five should be necessary and if it can be obtained out of three seahs then on a weekday two three should be sufficient Rabbis said our Ishmael is of the opinion that a tenth of the finest flour can be obtained out of five seahs without much labor but with much labor out of three. On a weekday therefore it is taken out of five seahs as this would give the best results but on the Sabbath it is better that the Sabbath be profaned by one work namely sifting being repeated many times rather than by many works being performed once only Rabbi said our Ishmael and our Ishmael the son of our Yohanan be Baraka both hold the same view for it was taught if the fourteenth of Nisan fell on a Sabbath one should play the Passover offering only as far as the breast such is the opinion of our Ishmael the son of our Yohanan be Baraka but the sages say one should play the whole of it now did not our Ishmael the son of our Yohanan be Baraka say there that where it is possible to manage with a little we must not trouble to do more on the Sabbath here too since it is possible to manage with less we must not trouble to do more on the Sabbath once do you know this perhaps our Ishmael only said so here since there is no disrespect to the offering but there since there is actual Disrespect to the offering Talmud, Mas Menikoth I would say that he is in agreement with the sages and on the other hand perhaps our Ishmael the son of our Yohanan Biberica only said so there since the requirements for the Most High have been fulfilled so that there is no further need to profane the Sabbath but here since the requirements for the Most High have not yet been fulfilled so that there is a need to profane the Sabbath I would say that he is in agreement with the sages said Rabbah. Our Ishmael and our Hannah the vice high priest both hold the same view for we have learned our Hannah the vice high priest says on the Sabbath it was reaped by one man with one sickle into one basket and on a weekday it was reaped by three men into three baskets and with three sickles but the sages say whether on the Sabbath or on a weekday it was reaped by three men into three baskets and with three sickles now did not our Hannah the vice high priest say there that where it is possible to manage with. One we must not trouble more to work on the Sabbath here too since it is possible to manage with less we must not trouble to do more on the Sabbath once do you know this perhaps our Ishmael only said so here since there is no opportunity for making the matter public but there since there is an opportunity for making the matter public I would say that he is in agreement with the rabbis and on the other hand perhaps our hand of the vice high priest only said so therefore after all whether one man or three are employed the service to the most high is performed according to its prescribed rights but here since the service to the most high is not performed according to its prescribed rights I would say that he is in agreement with the sages rather said our Ashi our Ishmael and our Jose both hold the same view for we have learned whether the new moon was clearly visible or not they may profane the Sabbath because of it but our Jose says if it was clearly visible they may not profane it. Sabbath because of it now did not our Jose say there that wherever it is possible to manage without them we do not trouble them to profane the Sabbath here too since it is possible to manage with less we must not trouble to do more on the Sabbath whence do you know this perhaps our Ishmael only said so here since the reason it will result that you will prevent them from coming in the future does not apply but there since the reason it will result that you will prevent them from coming in the future applies I would say that he is in agreement with the rabbis
And trolls are we to decide the issue by his intention and this man certainly intended to do what was forbidden or by his actual deed he replied is this not the case agreed upon by Rabbah and Rabbah for it was stated if a man heard that a child had fallen into the sea and he spread nets on the Sabbath to catch fish and he caught fish he is liable if he spread nets to catch fish and he caught fish and also the child Rabbah says he is not liable but Rabbah says he is liable now only in that case. Says Rabbah that he is not liable for since he heard of this accident we say that his intention was also concerning the child but where he did not hear of it Rabbah would not say that he was not liable others say that he answered him as follows this is a matter of dispute between Rabbah and Rabbah for it was stated if a man had not heard that a child had fallen into the sea and he spread a net on the Sabbath to catch fish and he caught fish he is liable if he spread the net to catch fish. And he caught fish and also the child Rabbah says he is not liable but Rabbah says he is liable Rabbah says he is not liable because we decide the matter by his actual deed Rabbah says he is liable because we decide the matter by his intention Rabbah said if one fig was prescribed for a sick person and ten men ran and returned together bringing ten figs they are all not liable and it is the same even if they brought them one after the other and even if the sick person had recovered after he had taken the first one Rabbah raised this question if two figs were prescribed for a sick person and there happened to be two figs on two stocks and also three figs on one stock which are we to bring should we bring the two figs as they only are required or the three for then there is less plucking surely it is obvious that we should bring the three figs on the one stock Talmud Mas Manikoth for even our Ishmael only said so in that case since the less one uses the less one roots but in this Case where the less one uses the more one has to pluck we should certainly bring the three fix mission of the precept of the Omer is that it should be brought from what grows nearby if the crop near Jerusalem was not yet ripe it could be brought from any place it once happened that the Omer was brought from Gag of Zarephan and the two loaves from the plain of Ansukar Gemara why is this so if you wish I may say because it is written fresh corn shalt thou bring or if you wish I may say. Because of the rule one must not pass over the first occasion for performing the precept it once happened that the Omer was brought from Gag of Zarephan our rabbis taught when the kings of the Hasmonean house fought one another Harkonnes was outside and Aristobulus within the city while each day those that were within used to let down to the other party dinars in a basket and haul up in return animals for the daily offerings an old man there who was learned in Greek wisdom spoke with. Them in Greek wisdom saying as long as they carry on the temple service they will never be delivered into your hands on the morrow they let down dinars in a basket and hauled up a pig when it reached halfway up the wall it stuck its claws into the wall and the land of Israel was shaken over a distance of 400 parasangs by 400 parasangs at that time they declared curse be the man who rears pigs and curse be the man who teaches his son Greek wisdom it was concerning this time. Of siege that we learned it once happened that the Omer was brought from Gag of and the two loaves from the plain of Ansukar for when the time for the Omer arrived they did not know from whence they could take it they at once proclaimed the matter whereupon a deaf mute came forward and pointed with one hand to the roof and with the other to a cone shaped hut then spake Mordecai is there anywhere a place by name Gag of or Zarephan Gag of they searched and found it. Place when they should have brought the two loaves they did not know from whence they could take it they at once proclaimed the matter whereupon a deaf mute came forward and put one hand on his eye and the other hand on the socket of the bolt and spake Mordecai is there anywhere a place by name and soaker or soaker and thereupon they searched and found the place once three women brought three pairs of doves to the temple one said it is for Maziba the other said it is for Mayama and the third said it is for Myona now they the priests thought that by Ziba the woman actually meant her flux by Yama her stream and by Ona her period and therefore of each pair of doves one bird was to be offered for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering then spake Mordecai perhaps the one had been in danger by reason of her flux the other had been in danger by reason of a sea journey and the third had been in danger by an infection of the eye and therefore all the doves were to be Offered for burnt offerings thereupon they inquired into the matter and found that it was so Talmud, Mas Manikotha this is indeed what we have learned Petio was over the burnt offerings the same Petio was Mordecai why was his name called Petio because he was able to open matters and interpret them and he knew 70 languages but did not every member of the Sanhedrin know 70 languages for Aryohan and said none are to be appointed members of the Sanhedrin but men of wisdom of good. Appearance of fine stature of mature age men with the knowledge of sorcery and who know 70 languages in order that the court should have no need of an interpreter say rather that he used to mix together expressions and explain them and on that account it is written of Mordecai Bilshin Mishnah what was the procedure the messengers of the Bethden used to go out on the day before the festival and tie the unreaped corn in bunches to make it easier to reap all the inhabitants of the towns. Nearby assembled there so that it might be reaped with much display as soon as it became dark he called out as the sunset and they answered yes as the sunset and they answered yes with the sickle and they answered yes with the sickle and they answered yes into this basket and they answered yes into this basket and they answered yes on the Sabbath he called out further on the Sabbath and they answered yes on the Sabbath and they answered yes shall I reap and they answered reap shall I reap and they answered reap he repeated every matter three times and they answered yes 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 and why was all this because of the Boethusians who maintained that the reaping of the Omer was not to take place at the conclusion of the first day of the festival Gemara our rabbis taught on the following days fasting and on some of them also morning is forbidden from the first until the eighth day of the month of Nisan during which time the daily offering was established morning is forbidden. From the eighth of the same until the close of the festival during which time the date for the feast of weeks was re-established fasting is forbidden from the first until the eighth day of the month of Nisan during which time the daily offering was established morning is forbidden for the Sadducees used to say that an individual may of his own free will defray the cost of the daily offering what was their argument it is written said they the one lamb shalt thou offer in the morning and it other lamb shalt thou offer at dusk and what was the reply of the rabbis it is written my food which is presented unto me for offerings made by fire of a sweet savour unto me shall ye observe hence all sacrifices were to be taken out of the temple fund from the eighth of the same until the close of the festival of Passover during which time the date for the feast of weeks was re-established fasting is forbidden for the Boethusians held that the feast of weeks must always be on the day. After the Sabbath but our Yohanan Bizakai entered into discussion with them saying fools that you are whence do you derive it not one of them was able to answer him save one old man who commenced to babble and said Moses our teacher was a great lover of Israel and knowing full well that the feast of weeks lasted only one day he therefore fixed it on the day after the Sabbath so that Israel might enjoy themselves for two successive days our Yohanan Bizakai then quoted to him the following verse. It is eleven days journey from Horeb unto Kadesh Barnea by the way of Mount Seir Talmud. Mas Manikoth B if Moses was a great lover of Israel why then did he detain them in the wilderness for forty years master said the other is it thus that you would dismiss me fool he answered should not our perfect Torah be as convincing as your idle talk now one verse says yes shall number fifty days while the other verse says seven weeks shall there be complete how are they to be reconciled the letter. Verse refers to the time when the first day of the festival of Passover falls on the Sabbath, while the former to the time when the first day of the festival falls on a weekday. Nemotic, our Eliezer numbers are Joshua counts are Ishmael from the Omer, our Judah below. Our Eliezer says this is not necessary for Scripture says thou shalt number unto thee that is the numbering depends upon the decision of the Beth. accordingly the Sabbath of the creation cannot be intended as the numbering would then be in the hands of all men. Our Joshua says the Torah says count days and sanctify the new moon. Count days and sanctify the feast of weeks. Just as in regard to the new moon there is something distinctive at the commencement of the counting. So with the feast of weeks there is something distinctive at the commencement of the counting. Our Ishmael says the Torah says bring the Omer offering on the Passover and the two loaves on the feast of weeks. Just as the latter are offered on the festival end. Indeed at the beginning of the festival so the former two is offered on the festival and indeed at the beginning of the festival are Judah be but there it says there is written Sabbath below and also Sabbath above just as in the former case the festival and indeed the beginning of the festival is near to the
After the Sabbath of creation I will prove it to you. Does scripture say on the morrow after the Sabbath that is in the Passover week? It merely says on the morrow after the Sabbath and as the year is full of Sabbaths and go and find out which Sabbath is meant. Moreover Sabbath is written below and Sabbath is written above just as in the former case it refers to the festival and indeed to the beginning of the festival so in the latter case too it refers to the festival and indeed to the beginning. Of the festival are Simeon B. Eliezer says one verse says six days thou shalt eat unleavened bread whereas another verse says seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread how are they to be reconciled in this way you may not eat unleavened bread of the new produce the seven days but you may eat unleavened bread of the new produce six days from the day that ye brought the omer of the waving shall ye number now I might think that the omer must be reaped and offered on the day stated but the counting may begin whenever one wishes the text therefore also states from the time the sickle is first put to the standing corn thou shalt begin to number but from this verse from the time the sickle is first put to the standing corn thou shalt begin to number I might think that the omer must be reaped and then one begins to count but it is to be offered whenever one wishes the text therefore states from the day that ye brought the omer shall ye number but from this verse from the day that ye brought I might think that it must be reaped and offered and the counting begun all by day the text therefore states seven weeks shall there be complete and when do you find seven weeks complete only when you begin to count from the previous evening I might think then that it must be reaped and offered and the counting begun all by night the text therefore states from the day that ye brought how is it to be then the reaping and the counting must be on the previous night but the bringing on the following day said Rabbah all the above interpretations can be refuted excepting those of the last two tanaim of the first barrier and of the last two tanaim of the second barrier which cannot be refuted if it were to be derived from our Yohan and Bizakai's interpretation it can be refuted thus perhaps the explanation of the conflicting verses is as given by Abay for Abay said it is a precept to count the days and also the weeks if from our Elizers and our Joshua's Interpretations it can be refuted thus how do they know that it refers to the first day of the festival it may refer to the last day of the festival our Ishmaels and our Judah be but there is interpretations cannot be refuted if from our Jose son of our Judah's interpretation it can be refuted thus perhaps the fifty days excludes those six days if from our Judah be but there is interpretation it can be refuted thus how does he know that it means the first day of the festival perhaps it means the last day of it. Festival our Jose also realized the same difficulty and he therefore added the second interpretation moreover the above text stated Abay said it is a precept to count the days and also to count the weeks the rabbis of the school of our Ashi used to count the days as well as the weeks Amim are used to count the days but not the weeks saying it is only in commemoration of temple times Mishnah they reaped it put it into the baskets and brought it to the temple court then they parched it with Fire in order to fulfill the precept that it should be parched with fire so are mayor but the sages say they first beat it with reeds or stems of plants that the grains should not be crushed and then they put it into a pot that was perforated so that the fire might take hold of all of it they spread it out in the temple court so that the wind might blow over it then they put it into a grist mill and took out of it a tenth of an ephah of flour which was sifted through thirteen seeds what was left over was redeemed and might be eaten by anyone it was liable to the dough offering but exempt from tithes our Akiva declares it liable both to the dough offering and to tithes Gemara our rabbis taught Aviva signifies fresh ears of corn parched with fire this teaches us that Israel used to parch it with fire in order to fulfill the precept parched so are but the sages say Talmud Mas Menikoth be by Koli we do not mean what is parched over the fire but what is parched with Something intervening between the fire and the grain. Another version reads by Koli, we understand what is parched in a vessel. How was it done? Then there was there in the temple a pipe for parching corn, which was perforated like a sieve, so that the fire might take hold of it on all sides. Corn in the ear parched, crushed. Now I know not whether the fresh ears of corn must be parched or the crushed grain must be parched. But when the verse says parched with fire, it thus interrupts the subject. Caramel fresh corn means rack tender and mal easily crushed in like manner. We interpret the word in the following verse. And there came a man from Baal Shalisha and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, twenty loaves of barley and fresh corn. Baziklano and he said, Give unto the people that they may eat. Baziklano means he came and poured out for us and we ate and it was fine. And so too when it says, Let us solace ourselves. Nathalso with loves. Nathalso means let us talk. Together and then let us go up on the couch and rejoice and revel in caresses and so too when it says the wing of the ostrich and the lasso beat joyously and the lasso means it carries the egg flies upwards with it and deposits it in the nest and so too when it says because thy way is contrary yarat unto me yarat means she the ass feared when she saw the angel and she turned aside in the school of our Ishmael it was taught carmel means car rounded and male full our Akiba. Declares it liable both to the dough offering and to tithes our Kahana said our Akiba used to say that the smoothing of the pile of corn belonging at the time to the temple does not exempt it from tithes our she's hate raised the following objection what did they do with what remained of those three seahs it was redeemed and could be eaten by anyone it was liable to the dough offering but exempt from tithes our Akiba declares it liable both to the dough offering and to tithes but the sages said to him let what is redeemed from the hand of the temple treasurer prove the case for that is liable to the dough offering yet is exempt from tithes now if it is right to say our Akiva holds of you that the smoothing of the pile of corn belonging to the temple does not exempt from tithes then what was the point of their argument it is just the same case furthermore our Kahana B. Talifar raised an objection against our Kahana statement from the following very that our Akiva declares it liable. Both to the dough offering and tithes for temple money was only used for what was necessary rather said are you on ANIT is an accepted teaching in the mouth of our Akiva that temple money was only used for what was necessary Rabbah said I am quite certain that the smoothing of the pile of corn belonging at the time to the temple exempts it from tithes for even our Akiva only declares it liable to tithes in that case alone since temple money was only used for what was necessary but elsewhere all. Agree that the smoothing of the pile of corn belonging to the temple exempts from tithes with regard to the smoothing of the pile of corn belonging at the time to a Gentile. There is a difference of opinion between Tanaim for it was taught one may give Terimah from produce bought from an Israelite for other produce also bought from an Israelite and from produce bought from a Gentile for other produce also bought from a Gentile and from produce bought from a Kutian for other produce also bought from a Kutian and from produce bought from any one of these for other produce also bought from any one of these. So our Meir and our Judah but our Jose and our Simeon say one may give Terimah from produce bought from an Israelite for other produce also bought from an Israelite and from produce bought from a Gentile for other produce bought from a Kutian and from produce bought from a Kutian for other produce bought from a Gentile but one may not give Terimah from produce bought from an Israelite for other produce bought from a Gentile or a Kutian nor from produce bought from a Gentile or a Kutian for other produce bought from an Israelite Talmud, Mas Menikoth of the rolling out of dough belonging at the time to the temple exempts it from the dough offering for we learned if a woman dedicated her dough to the temple before she had rolled it out and redeemed it it is still liable to the dough offering if she dedicated it after she had rolled it out and then redeemed it it is still liable if she dedicated it before she had rolled it out and the temple treasurer rolled it out and afterwards she redeemed it it is exempt since at the time when dough becomes liable to the dough offering it was exempt Rabbah however raised the question what is the law of the dough when it was rolled out belonged to a Gentile we have indeed learned if a man became a proselyte and he had dough that was already rolled out before he became a proselyte he is exempt from the dough. Offering if the dough was rolled out after he became a proselyte he is liable if it is in doubt he is liable now whose opinion is represented in this mission is it the opinion of all for even our Meir and our Judah who in that other case declare it liable to the tithe in this case declare it exempt their argument being that in the other cases scripture stated that corn several times each expression serving to exclude the corn of a Gentile we thus have a limitation followed by a limitation. And wherever a limitation is followed by a limitation its purpose is nothing else but to include so that even the corn of a Gentile is liable to tithe whereas in this case since the expression your dough is stated twice only the one expression your dough excludes the dough of a Gentile and the other expression your dough
Follows, however, that the terima that he had set apart from his corn is forbidden. Accordingly, this tana is of the opinion that the smoothing of the pile of corn belonging to a gentile does not exempt it from tithes, and yet he holds that the rolling out of the dough belonging to a gentile exempts it from the dough offering. Furthermore, Rabbin raised the following objection against Rabbah as to the dough offering set apart by a gentile now a proselyte in the lands of Israel or his terima outside the land of Israel. He must be informed that he is exempt therefrom. His dough offering may therefore be eaten by non-priests, and his terima would not render the other produce into which it may fall subject to the laws of terima. It follows, however, that the terima he set apart in the land of Israel is forbidden to non-priests, and also renders the other produce into which it may fall subject to the laws of terima. Accordingly, this tana holds that the smoothing of it. Pile of corn belonging to a Gentile does not exempt it from tithes, and yet he holds that the rolling out of the dough belonging to a Gentile exempts it from the dough offering. It is only so rabbinically as a precautionary measure against men of wealth. Talmud, Mas Menachot, then the same should be said of the dough offering. Should it not, it is always possible to avoid the dough offering by baking quantities of dough, each less than five quarters of a cab and a little more of flour. Then with the terima too, it is always possible to avoid the terima by acting according to our Ashai's ruling. For our Ashai said a man can resort to a device with his produce and bring it into his house together with the chaff so that his cattle may eat of it, and it is exempt from the tithe, or he can bring it in by way of the roof or by way of the back enclosure. In the latter case, since it is done openly, he would be ashamed of it, but in the former case, it is done in private, and he would not. Be ashamed of it, Mishnah. He then came to the tent, put in oil and its frankincense, poured in the oil, mingled and waved it, brought it near to the altar, took from it the handful and burnt it, and the remainder was eaten by the priests. After the omer was offered, they used to go out and find the market of Jerusalem already full of meal and parched corn of the new produce. This, however, did not meet with the approval of the sages. So our Meir, our Judah, says they did so with the approval of the sages. Gemara and does not our Judah apprehend lest one might eat of it, but I can point out a contradiction to this, for we have learned Judah says one searches on the night preceding the fourteenth day of Nisan or on the morning of the fourteenth or at the time for its removal, but the sages say if a man has not searched, etc. Rabbi answered, it is different with the new produce Talmud. Mas Menachot, for since you have only permitted a man to pluck the corn with the hand, he would remember said. Abay to him this is satisfactory with regard to reaping but what about the grinding and the sifting this is really no difficulty for the grinding could be done in a handmill and the sifting on the back of the seed but what is to be said of irrigated fields where reaping is permitted for we have learned one may reap before the omer the corn in irrigated fields in the plain but one may not stack it Abay therefore answered thus from the new produce a man is accustomed to abstain but from Levin he is not accustomed to abstain said Rabbah is there only a contradiction between the views of Arjuna and not between the views of the rabbis Rabbah therefore answered there is no contradiction between the views of Arjuna as we have already answered and there is also no contradiction between the views of the rabbis for the sole purpose of his searching for Levin is in order to burn it would he then eat of it or as she said there is no contradiction between the views of Arjuna because our Mishnah speaks of meal and parched corn, but the statement of Arashi is beside the mark for this is very well when the corn has been parched. But what can be said for the time before the corn has been parched? Should you say that here too the corn will only be plucked as Rabbi suggested above? Then it will be asked what is to be said in the case of an irrigated field where reaping is permitted. We must therefore say that Arashi's statement is beside the mark. Mishnah after the Omer was offered, it. new corn was permitted forthwith, but for those that lived far off it was permitted only after midday after the temple was destroyed. Our Yohanan Bizakai ordained that it should be forbidden throughout the day of the waving. Arjuna said, Is it not so forbidden by the law of the Torah? For it is written until the self same day. Wherefore was it permitted for them that lived far off immediately after midday because they know that the Beth Din are not dilatory there with Gemara Rab and Samuel both stated. That when the temple stood, the offering of the Omer rendered the new corn permitted, and when the temple was no more, the daybreak of the sixteenth day rendered it permitted. What is the reason for this? Because two expressions are written, it is written until you have brought, and also until the self same day. How are they to be reconciled? The former refers to the time when the temple stood, the other to the time when the temple was no more. Are Yohanan and Reshlakish both stated that even when the temple stood, the daybreak of the sixteenth day rendered it permitted, but is it not written also until you have brought? This is only a recommendation, but have we not learned after the Omer was offered, the new corn was permitted forth with this too is only a recommendation, and have we not learned the Omer rendered the new corn permitted throughout the land, and the two loaves rendered it permitted in the temple? This too is only a recommendation, Talmud, Mas Menachoth, but we have learned. After the temple was destroyed, our Yohanan Bizakai ordained that it should be forbidden throughout the day of the waving. What is the reason the temple may speedily be rebuilt? And people would then say, Did we not eat last year of the new corn immediately at the daybreak of the sixteenth day this year too? We shall eat it from the same time, but they will not realize that last year when there was admits, however, that this was a law only after the destruction of the temple, but during temple times it was permitted immediately after the Omer was offered. No Omer offering the daybreak rendered it permitted, but now that there is an Omer offering, it is only the Omer offering that renders it permitted. Now, if it is only a recommendation to do so, would we impose a restriction on account of a recommendation? Only our Naman B. Isaac said that our Yohanan Bizakai ruled in accordance with the view enunciated by our Judah, who said that it is forbidden by the law of the Torah, for it is written until. This self same day that is until this very day itself, and he is also of the opinion that the expression until is inclusive, but does our Yohanan Bizakai concur with him, Arjuna? Do they not in fact disagree? For we have learned after the temple was destroyed, our Yohanan Bizakai ordained that it should be forbidden throughout the day of the waving. Arjuna said, Is it not so forbidden by the law of the Torah? For it is written until the self same day, Arjuna misunderstood the other's view. He thought that our Yohanan Bizakai regarded the prohibition as rabbinic, but in fact it was not so. He meant it as a prohibition by the law of the Torah, but does not our Mishnah say ordained? Ordained means he expounded the verse and established the law accordingly. Our Papa and our Huna, the son of our Joshua, used to eat the new corn on the night of the sixteenth day, which is really the beginning of the seventeenth day, for they hold the view that the prohibition of the new corn outside the land of Israel is only rabbinical and that the doubt need not be taken into account the rabbis of the school of Arashi used to eat it on the morning of the 17th for they hold that the prohibition of the new corn outside the land of Israel is biblical but that the ruling of our Yohanan Bizakai was only a rabbinic ordinance and this ordinance they maintain was intended to apply only to the actual day of the waving but not to the day of doubt. Rabbinah said my mother told me that your father did not eat of the new corn until the night of the 17th which is the beginning of the 18th for he is of the same opinion as Arjuna and also takes into account the day of doubt. Mishnah the Omer rendered the new corn permitted throughout the land and the two loaves rendered it permitted in the temple one may not offer meal offerings first fruits or meal offerings that accompany animal offerings before the Omer and if one did so it was invalid nor may one offer these before the two loaves. But if one did so, it was valid. Gemara Artarvan was sitting and asked this question: What is the reason for the difference in law between what is offered before the Omer and what is offered before the two loaves? Said Judah Ben before him, No, you can say that what is offered before the Omer is invalid, for the prohibition of the new corn does not admit of any exception to the private individual. But can you say so of what is offered before the two loaves, seeing that the prohibition does admit of an exception to the private individual? Artarvan remained silent, and at once the face of Judah Ben brightened with joy. Thereupon our Akiba said to him, Judah, your face has brightened with joy because you have refuted the sage. I wonder whether you will live long. Said our Judah Ben This happened a fortnight before the Passover, and when I came up for the Ezra festival, I inquired after Judah Ben and was told that he had passed away. Our Naman B. Isaac said. According to the view of Judah Benyamite, if drink offerings of wine made from the first fruits which ripened before the Omer were offered before the Omer, they are valid. Is not this obvious? No, for you
Two loaves would not be the first fruits now if it is right to say that the two loaves render permitted even when not in the usual order then why do you say that the two loaves would not be the first fruits it can happen that the omer is offered of that corn which had taken root before the offering of the two loaves but after last year's omer and the two loaves of that corn which had taken root before this year's omer but after of the omer and then the period of the two loaves the question here raised is whether the corn is always permitted for meal offerings after the passing of these two periods irrespective of their sequence or not last year's two loaves do you think Talmud, Mos Medico, that we require the two loaves to be the first fruits of any particular fruit no we require them to be the first fruits of the altar and in this case the altar has consumed of this year's produce Rami B. Hammer raised the question do the two loaves permit what is in but or only what is in distinct formation what is meant by in but and what by distinct formation shall I say that it means the budding of the fruit and the distinct formation of the fruit but surely if they permit corn which has only taken root they will certainly permit fruits which are in but or are distinctly formed rather we must say that it means the budding of the leaves and the distinct formation of the leaves and the question is which of these stages corresponds to the taking root of corn this remains unanswered before the two loaves and a second time after the two loaves now the wheat of the first sowing could be used for the next omer and thereafter all the wheat of that sowing would be permitted for it is now held that grain over which there have passed the two periods even though not in the usual sequence for here the two loaves passed by it first is permitted and the wheat of the second sowing would be used for the two loaves which would truly be first fruits as this crop of Wheat has not been used before the fact that Tana does not accept this position proves that the grain is not permitted unless the various periods pass by it in the proper sequence so that in the above case the grain of the first sowing would not be permitted until after the two loaves had been offered and as the wheat of the sowing was offered for the omer the offering of the two loaves would not be first fruits Rabbi son of Arhanan raised the question does the omer permit the wheat that is sown in the soil or not but what are the circumstances if it took root we have learned it and if not we have also learned it for we learned if they had taken root before the omer the omer permits them and if not they are forbidden until the next year's omer the case must be that one reaped the wheat and resowed the grains before the omer and then the omer came and went by and the question is may one take them out and eat them for they are regarded as though they were lying in a pitcher and it Omer has rendered them permitted or perhaps they have become assimilated to the soil does the law of overreaching apply to it or not but what are the circumstances shall we say that he said I cast therein six measures of grain and witnesses came forward and testified that he cast therein but five but Rabbah has said on account of any fraud in measure weight or number even though it is less than the standard of overreaching one can retract the case must be that he said I cast therein as much as was necessary but witnesses came forward and testified that he did not cast therein as much as was necessary now the question is this does the law of overreaching apply to it for it is as though it were lying in a pitcher or perhaps it has become assimilated to the soil is an oath taken concerning it or not is it as though it were lying in a pitcher so that it is regarded as movables and an oath must be taken on account of it or perhaps it has become assimilated to the soil so that it is Regarded as land and no oath may be taken on account of it, these questions remain unanswered. Rami Biham raised the question, what is the position with regard to the grains of wheat found in cattle dung or the grains of barley found in animal dung? In what connection does this question arise if you say in connection with their suffering food uncleanness? But we have learned that grains of wheat found in cattle dung or grains of barley found in animal dung, even though one intended them as food do. Not suffer food uncleanness if one intended them as food for a child, they do suffer food uncleanness. And if you say in connection with meal offerings, but it is obvious that they may not be used for this purpose presented now unto the governor, will he be pleased with thee or will he accept that person? The case can only arise where one gathered these grains and sowed them, and one now wishes to bring out of the new growth a meal offering. Is it on account of repulsiveness that they must not? Be used for meal offerings, but when they have been sown, their repulsiveness is gone, or is it on account of their leanness? And now, too, they are lean. The question remains undecided. Rami Bihama raised the question, What is the law if an elephant swallowed an osier basket and passed it out with its excrement? In what connection does the question arise if you say with regard to the annulment of its uncleanness? But we have learned that all articles are rendered susceptible to uncleanness through intention and divest themselves of their uncleanness only by an act which changes them. The case must be that it swallowed twigs, and the twigs, when passed out, were made into an osier basket. And the question is, Are the twigs regarded as digested so that now what is made from them is accounted Talmud? Moss Menikoth be as a vessel made from cattle dung or from earth which does not contract uncleanness, for the master has stated vessels made from stone from cattle dung or from earth do not. Contract uncleanness either by biblical or by rabbinical law, or perhaps they are not regarded as digested, but surely the question can be solved from the following statement of Ola, which he reported in the name of Arsimian B. Jehozadak. It once happened that wolves devoured two children beyond the Jordan and they discharged them through the excretory canal, and when the fact came before the sages, they declared the excreted flesh as clean flesh is different, for it is tender, then let it be solved. From the next line, and they declared the excreted bones as unclean bones are different, for they are exceptionally hard. Arzera raised the question, What is the law with regard to wheat which fell from the clouds, and what connection is the question raised if the question is raised as to its use for meal offerings, but why should it not be used? It is raised in connection with the two loaves, shall we say that the divine law stated out of your dwellings to exclude what comes from outside the Land of Israel, but what comes from the clouds would be permitted, or perhaps scripture restricted it exclusively to what comes out of your dwelling, so that what comes from the clouds would also not be permitted. But can it ever happen? So indeed, yes, for there once came down from the clouds to bar ADI the Arab layer of wheat, the height of a hand's breadth over an area of three parts. And Arsimian Bipas he raised the question, What is the law of an ear of corn which had reached a third of its growth before the Omer had been plucked out before the Omer and was replanted after the Omer when it increased its growth? Do we have regard to the stock of the corn and that was rendered permitted by the Omer, or do we have regard to the increase and that will be permitted only after next year's Omer? But surely the question can be solved from the following statement of Arab, which he said in the name of Aryohanan, if a young shoot laden with fruit was grafted onto an old tree even. If the fruit had as a result increased two hundredfold, it is still forbidden. Furthermore, our Samuel B. Naman, he said in the name of our Jonathan, if an onion was planted in a vineyard and the vineyard was later uprooted, even though the onion had thereafter increased two hundredfold, it is still forbidden. It was those very rulings which caused him to raise the question were those rabbis certain of the ruling that we have regard to the stock and they would apply it to all cases, whether it would lead to leniency or stringency, or perhaps they were in doubt about it so that they applied it only to those cases which lead to stringency but not to those which lead to leniency. This remains undecided. Robert raised the question, what is the position with regard to tithing in what circumstances where, for example, Talmud, Mos Menico, the ears of corn were tithed by conjectural estimate and the rest was resown and had increased in growth, and should you say that in this case we have no regard? To the stock so that the increase must be tithed the question will remain what about the stock itself said to him Abbe wherein does this differ from ordinary wheat and barley he replied in those cases where the seed decays I have no doubt at all my question only refers to the case where what was sown does not decay what is then the position with regard to this but surely this can be solved from the following statement of our Isaac which he said in the name of our Yohanan if a litter of onions was tithed and then replanted the tithe must again be taken from the whole of the growth in this case it is the usual manner of planting but in the former case that is not the usual manner of sowing our hand of beam and you might put the following to Abbe what is the law with regard to the growth in a plant pot that was not perforated but surely if it is not perforated it is not perforated perhaps you refer to an unperforated pot which was later perforated here there is but one sowing and it has now Become joined to the earth and is growing up, whereas in the other case there were two sowings. Arabah raised this question: What is the law of an ear of corn which had been in the pile when it was smoothed off had been replanted and designated as terima when attached to the soil? Do we say that since it was in the pile when it was smoothed off, it then became tebal, and therefore when it is later designated as terima, even though attached to the soil, it is consecrated as terima? Or perhaps since it was replanted
Unperforated pot for them which grew in a perforated pot what has been set aside is accounted as terima yet he must give the terima a fresh mishnah wheat barley spelt oats and rye are subject to the dough offering and they can be reckoned together they are forbidden to be eaten as new produce before the omer and they may not be reaped before the passover if they had taken root before the omer the omer renders them permitted otherwise they are forbidden until the next year's omer gemara. Tanda ta kuzmin spelt is a species of wheat shibboleth shual oats and shibboleth rye are species of barley kuzmin talmud. Mas menikoth b is gulba shibboleth is dishra shibboleth shual is foxtail only these are liable to the dough offering but not rice or millet once do we know it said our simian b lakish it is deduced from the occurrence of the word bread both here and in the law concerning unleavened bread for it is written here it shall be when ye eat of the bread of the land and it is written there the bread of affliction and whence do we know it there said rash lakish and so it was taught in the school of our Ishmael and also in the school of our Elizabeth Jacob scripture says thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread there with even the bread of affliction with such grain as can come to the state of leaven a man fulfills his obligation on the Passover thus these are excluded since they cannot come to the state of leaven but only to the state of decay and they can be reckoned together. Tanda taught grain flour and dough can be reckoned together. In what connection was this taught? Our Kahana said in connection with the new produce. Our Joseph said in connection with leaven on the Passover. Our Papa said in connection with the second tithe. Thus, if one were to eat it outside the wall of Jerusalem, one would incur stripes. Rabbah said in connection with food uncleanness and it teaches us that grain and flour in order to contract. Uncleanness must be like dough as the latter is every bit of foodstuff, so the former must be every bit of foodstuff. And indeed, it has been so taught the grain of wheat, whether it is peeled or not, is reckoned together with other foodstuffs. But the grain of barley is reckoned together with other foodstuffs only when peeled, but not when not peeled. But surely this is not so for a tana of the school of our Ishmael taught it is written upon any sowing seed which is to be sown that is seed such as men. Take out for sowing namely wheat in its husk barley in its husk and lentils in their husks this is no difficulty for the one speaks of fresh seeds whilst the other of dry seeds they are forbidden to be eaten as new produce before the omer once do we know it said resh lakish it is deduced from the occurrence of the word bread both here and in the law concerning unleavened bread and they may not be reaped before the passover once do we know it said are yohan and it is deduced from the occurrence of the word first both here and in the law concerning the dough offering what is meant by they are forbidden to be eaten as new produce before the omer our jonah said before the reaping of the omer our jose bizab said before the offering of the omer we have learned they are forbidden to be eaten as new produce before the omer and they may not be reaped before the passover now according to him who says before the offering of the omer it is evident why the two prohibitions are not Stated together and taught as one, but according to him who says before the reaping of the Omer, surely the two prohibitions should have been stated together and taught as one, thus they are forbidden to be eaten as new produce and they may not be reaped before the Omer. The fact is that if this dispute was reported, it must have been reported in connection with the final clause of our Mishnah, which states if they had taken root before the Omer, the Omer renders them permitted what is meant by. Before the Omer, our Jonah said before the reaping of the Omer, our Jose Bizabda said before the offering of the Omer, our Eliezer said Talmud, Mas Menikoth to our Josiah is contemporary, you are not to sit down until you have explained to me the following whence is it derived that the Omer renders permitted that which has only taken root. You ask whence surely it is derived from the expression corn in the ear from which it follows that there is that which is not yet in the ear which is permitted. By the Omer perhaps the inference is that there is that which is not yet in the ear but which has reached the third of its growth which is permitted by the Omer rather said Samuel it is derived from the expression from the time you begin to put the sickle from which it follows that there is that which is not yet fit for the sickle which is permitted by the Omer but perhaps the inference is that there is that which is not yet fit for the sickle but which is at least fit for fodder that is permitted by the Omer rather said our Isaac it is derived from the expression to the standing corn from which it follows that there is that which is not yet standing corn which is permitted by the Omer but perhaps the inference is that there is that which is not yet standing corn but which is at least in the grass stage which is permitted by the Omer rather said Rabbah it is derived from the expression which thou sowest that is from the time of sowing it is permitted by the Omer Said our Papa to Rabbah in that case even though it had not taken root it should be permitted by the Omer should it not he replied you wise man it is written in the field Mishnah one may reap before the Omer the corn in irrigated fields in the plain but one may not stack it the men of Jericho used to reap before the Omer with the approval of the sages and used to stack it without the approval of the sages but they did not forbid them one may reap the unripe corn and feed cattle therewith said. Our Judah when is this so only if one had begun to reap it before it had reached the third of its growth our Simeon said one may reap it and feed cattle therewith even after it has reached the third of its growth one may reap on account of the saplings or in order to make an open space for the mourners or that the Beth Hamid rash be not hindered one may not bind them in bundles but they must be left in small heaps the precept of the Omer is that it shall be brought from the standing corn if this cannot be found it may be brought from the sheep the precept is that it shall be brought from the fresh corn if this cannot be found it may be brought from the dry corn the precept is that it shall be reaped by night if it was reaped by day it is valid moreover it overrides the sabbath mar it was taught our benjamin says the verse says when ye shall reap the harvest thereof then shall ye bring the sheep and following that it says the first of your reaping unto the priest how is it to be explained thus the field from which you may bring the omer you may not reap before the omer but that field from which you may not bring the omer you may reap before the omer perhaps i ought to say this that kind of grain from which you may bring the omer you may not reap before the omer but that kind from which you may not bring the omer you may reap before the omer you cannot say so on account of our your hands teaching the men of jericho used to reap before the omer with it Approval of the sages and used to stack it without the approval of the sages etc. Whom have you heard say that in certain cases they the sages forbade them and in others they did not forbid them clearly it is our Judah is then our Judah of the opinion that with regard to reaping before the Omer the men of Jericho acted with the approval of the sages but it has been taught the men of Jericho did six things three with the approval of the sages and three without their approval these they did. With the approval of the sages they grafted palms the whole day they rolled up the Shema and they reaped before the Omer and these they did without the approval of the sages they stacked the corn before the Omer they permitted for use the branches of carob and sycamore trees which had been dedicated to the temple and they made breaches in their gardens and orchards so as to allow the poor to come in and eat the fallen fruit on Sabbaths and festivals in years of drought so our Meir then said are. Judah to him if they did them with the approval of the sages then all people could do so but they did both without the approval of the sages save that three they forbade them and three they did not forbid them to do these they did not forbid them they grafted palms the whole day they rolled up the shima and they reaped and stacked before the omer and these they forbade them talmud mas menikoth b they permitted for use the branches of carob and sycamore trees which had been dedicated to the temple they made breaches in their gardens and orchards so as to allow the poor to come in and eat the fallen fruit on sabbaths and festivals in years of drought and they gave pea from vegetables and the sages forbade them but according to your view too this passage is difficult for it says six things and it enumerates seven you must therefore delete reaping from here one may reap the unripe corn and feed cattle therewith we have learned elsewhere these are the things which divide a field into two with respect to PER river a pool a private or a public road a public or a private path that is in use both during the summer and the rainy season fallow land or newly broken land and a different kind of crop if one reap the unripe corn as fodder the part so reap divides the field so our mayor but the sages say this part does not divide the field unless it was also plowed up rabbi barhana said in the name of our yohan and our mayor based his ruling on the principle enunciated by our simian in our mission who said one may reap it and feed cattle there with even after it has reached the third of its growth for he is of the opinion that any cutting of unripe corn for fodder is no reaping rabbi was sitting and reciting the statement when our ahabi who raised against rabbi the following objection it was taught if locusts devoured the crop in the middle of the field or ants nibbled it or the wind broke it down all agree that only if it was
from each portion reaped, but the sages say from one for all, and Rab Judah has said that our Akiba declares him liable to give P.E.R. from each portion only where he reaps the field in stages for roasting, but not where he reaps it in stages for storing. But surely this is not so for when Rabin came from Palestine, he stated in the name of our Yohanan that our Akiba declares him liable to give P.E.R. from each portion even where he reaps it in stages for storing Talmud, Mas Medico, the Hiyar Medir. Agrees with him in the one case, but disagrees with him in the other one may reap on account of the saplings or in order to make an open space for the mourners, or that the Beth Hamid Rash be not hindered. What is the reason the divine law says the first of your reaping, but not the first of the reaping for a religious purpose? One may not find them in bundles, but they must be left in small heaps. What is the reason? Because so far as is possible, we must not work before the Omer the precept. Of the Omer is that it shall be brought from the standing corn. Our rabbis taught it is written, and when thou bringest a meal offering of first fruits, what does this teach us? Since the precept of the Omer is that it shall be brought from the standing corn, when should I know that if standing corn cannot be found, it may be brought from the sheaves? The text therefore states thou bringest another explanation is thou bringest, since the precept is that it shall be brought from the fresh corn, whence? Should I know that if fresh corn cannot be found, it may be brought from the dry corn? The text therefore states thou bringest another explanation is thou bringest, since the precept is that it shall be reaped by night, whence should I know that if it was reaped by day, it is valid, and also that it overrides the Sabbath? The text therefore states thou bringest, thou bringest whatever it is thou bringest from any place thou bringest, even on the Sabbath thou bringest, even in a state of uncleanness, if it was reaped by day it is valid but we have learned the whole night is valid for reaping the omer and for burning the fat and the limbs of sacrifices on the altar this is the general rule any commandment which is to be performed by day is valid during the whole of the day and any commandment which is to be performed by night is valid during the whole of the night now night and day are on the par and just as that which is to be performed by day is not valid by night so that which is to be performed by night is not valid by day rabbi said this is no difficulty for one represents rabbi's view the other the view of our Eliezer, son of our simeon for it was taught if the priest was standing and offering up the omer meal offering and it became unclean if there is another available he should be told bring the other in its place but if not he should be told be wise and keep silent so rabbi but our Eliezer, son of our simeon says in either case he is told be wise and keep silent for the Omer that was reaped not in accordance with its prescribed right is invalid. Rabbi Barhana said in the name of our Yohanan, the ruling of our Eliezer, son of our Simeon, is based upon the principle enunciated by our Akiva, his father's teacher. For we have learned our Akiva stated a general principle any work which can be done on the eve of the Sabbath does not override the Sabbath. Moreover, he, our Eliezer, son of our Simeon, is of the same opinion as our Ishmael, who holds that the reaping of the Omer is a religious duty. For we have learned our Ishmael says just as plowing is optional, so the harvest referred to in the verse is an optional one, excluding the harvesting of the Omer, which is a religious duty. Now, if we were to hold that if the Omer was reaped not in accordance with its prescribed right, it is valid. Wherefore does it override the Sabbath? Let it be reaped on the eve of the Sabbath. Since, however, it does override the Sabbath, one may infer that he holds that if it was reaped not in. Accordance with its prescribed right it is invalid but was not rabbi a disciple of our Simeon surely it has been taught rabbi said when we were studying Torah at our Simeon's academy in Tako we used to carry up to him on the Sabbath oil and a towel from the courtyard to the roof and from the roof to an enclosure and from one enclosure to another enclosure until we came to the fountain where we bathed the rabbi concurs with the other teaching of our Simeon for it was taught our Simeon said come and see how precious is a precept in its proper time for the burning of the fat and limbs is valid the whole night yet they did not wait until nightfall Talmud, Mas Medikoth B and did not our Eliezer son of our Simeon know of this teaching of his father he certainly knew of it but in that case it is different for the slaughtering has already overridden the Sabbath and rabbi is it not the fact that the slaughtering there has already overridden the Sabbath rather we must say that rabbi is of the opinion that the reaping of the Omer does not override the Sabbath, but does it not? But we have learned the sages say whether on the Sabbath or on a weekday it was taken out of three seahs that is not in accordance with Rabbi's view. But we have learned the sages say whether on the Sabbath or on a weekday it was reaped by three men into three baskets with three sickles that too is not in accordance with Rabbi's view. But we have learned on the Sabbath he called out further on the Sabbath that too is not in accordance with Rabbi's view. If it was reaped by day it is valid. Moreover it overrides the Sabbath. Whom have you heard say that if it was reaped by day it is valid? Clearly it is Rabbi. Yet it states moreover it overrides the Sabbath. Presumably it refers to the reaping of the Omer. Does it not know it refers to the offering of the Omer and the reaping does not override the Sabbath? Surely it has been taught. Rabbi says and Moses declared the appointed times of the Lord for. What purpose is this stated because we have learned only of the daily offering and the Passover offering that they override the Sabbath and uncleanness since in its anointed time is stated in connection with them in its appointed time even on the Sabbath in its anointed time even in uncleanness whence do we know it of the other offerings of the congregation the text therefore states these shall ye offer unto the Lord in your appointed times whence do we know to include the Omer and that which is offered with it and the two loaves and that which is offered with them the text therefore states and Moses declared the appointed times of the Lord this verse thus fixed the appointed time for all of them now for what service is the Sabbath overridden should you say for the offering but the two loaves are not offered at all obviously then it is for the grinding and the sifting of the corn and similarly in the case of the Omer for the reaping thus it overrides the Sabbath no the Omer Overrides the Sabbath for the act of offering and the two loaves for the baking for Rabbi is of the opinion that the oven of the sanctuary hallows them so that had they been baked on the previous day they would by being kept overnight be now invalid but does Rabbi hold that the oven hallows them surely it was taught the lambs of Pentecost hallow the bread only by their slaughtering thus if they were slaughtered under their own name and their blood was sprinkled under their own name the bread is hallowed if they were slaughtered under another name and their blood was sprinkled under another name the bread is not hallowed if they were slaughtered under their own name but their blood was sprinkled under another name the bread is hallowed and not hallowed this is the opinion of Rabbi our Eliezer son of our Simeon says it is by no means hallowed unless the lambs were slaughtered under their own name and their blood was sprinkled under their own name our and B. Isaac answered he means that they are either determined or not determined. Chapter 7 Mishnah from the following meal offerings the handful must be taken and the remainder is for the priests the meal offering of fine flour that prepared on a griddle that prepared in a pan the cakes and the wafers the meal offering of a gentile the meal offering of women the meal offering of the omer the sinner's meal offering and the meal offering of jealousy our Simeon says from the sinner's meal offering brought by priests the handful is taken and the handful is offered by itself and so also the remainder is offered by itself. Gemara our Papa said all the meal offerings enumerated in the Mishnah must consist of ten cakes what does he teach us he wishes to exclude thereby our Simeon's view who said he may offer half in cakes and half in wafers and so he teaches us that it is not so and the remainder is for the priests whence do we know this once you ask but surely where it is expressly stated it is expressly stated and where it is not expressly stated there is the verse and this is the law of the meal offering the sons of Aaron shall offer it and that which is left thereof shall Aaron and his sons eat with regard to those which are brought from wheat I have no doubt I only ask it with regard to those brought from barley but even with regard to those brought from barley surely it is obvious that the remainder is for the priests since the handful is taken from them according to the view of the rabbis I have no doubt I only ask it according to the view of our Simeon who maintains that there is a meal offering from which the handful must be taken and yet the remainder may not be eaten for we have learned our Simeon says from the sinner's meal offering brought by priests the handful is taken and the handful is offered by itself and so also the remainder is offered by itself whence then do we know it has Ezekiel said from the verse and every meal offering mingled with oil or dry shall all the sons of Aaron and if this verse serves no purpose for meal offerings of wheat mingled with oil it should be applied to meal offerings of barley mingled with oil and so too if this verse serves no
One that is prepared on a griddle I would say may be set off against another that is also prepared on a griddle and so too one that is prepared in a pan may be set off against another that is also prepared in a pan therefore the text states or dry shall all the sons of Aaron have I might think that sacrifices which are most holy may not be set off against each other but those which are less holy may therefore the text states shall all the sons of Aaron have a man as well as his brother and in proximity thereto if he offers it for a thanksgiving just as most holy sacrifices may not be set off against each other so also less holy sacrifices may not be set off against each other a man signifies that a man takes a share even though he has a physical blemish but not a minor even though he is without blemish this teaching is derived from the expression every but has not this expression been used for the teaching of our Jose son of our Judah the teaching of our Jose son of our Judah is derived from the expression and every rubbin has said it can be inferred from Levi's teaching for Levi taught it is written every offering of theirs even every meal offering of theirs and every sin offering of theirs and every guilt offering of theirs every offering of theirs includes a log of oil of the leper for I might have thought that it shall not be the priest since the divine law expressly stated reserved from the fire hence we are informed that it is not so every meal offering of theirs includes a meal offering of the omer and a meal offering of jealousy for I might have thought that these shall not be the priests since the divine law expressly stated and they shall eat those things wherewith atonement was made whereas the one serves to render permitted and the other to ascertain the truth hence we are informed that it is not so every sin offering of theirs includes a sin offering of a bird for I might have thought that it shall not be the priests since it is nibble hence we are informed that it is not so every guilt offering of theirs includes a guilt offering of the Nazirite and the guilt offering of the leper but with regard to the guilt offering of the leper is it not expressly stated for as the sin offering is the priest so is the guilt offering rather it includes a guilt offering of the Nazirite that it be like the guilt offering of the leper for I might have thought that it shall not be the priest since it but serves to Render permitted hence we are informed that it is not so which they may render unto me this is the restitution for the robbery committed on a proselyte shall be most holy for thee and for thy sons this teaches that it is thine own and thy sons own even to betroth the woman there with Arunah said Talmud, Mas Manikoth be the peace offerings of Gentiles are to be treated as burnt offerings this I can prove either by simple reasoning or by a verse from scripture either by simple reasoning. Because a Gentile in his heart devotes the offering entirely to heaven or by a verse from scripture which they will offer unto the Lord for a burnt offering whatever they offer shall be a burnt offering our Hamabi Giri raised an objection if a Gentile made a free will offering of peace offerings and he gave them to an Israelite the Israelite may eat them if he gave them to a priest the priest may eat them Rob answered it means this if he gave them to an Israelite that the Israelite shall Receive atonement thereby the Israelite may eat them if he gave them to a priest that the priest shall receive atonement thereby the priest may eat them Arshis by raised an objection from the following meal offerings the handful must be taken and the remainder is for the priest's meal offering of a Gentile or Yohan and answered this is no difficulty for one represents the view of our Jose the Galilee and the other our Akibah's view for it was taught it would have sufficed had scripture stated a man. Why does it state a man a man to include Gentiles that they may bring either votive or free will offerings like an Israelite which they will offer unto the Lord for a burnt offering I only know that they may offer burnt offerings but whence that they may offer peace offerings the text states their vows and whence thank offerings the text states their free will offerings and whence burnt offerings and meal offerings and offerings of wine and frankincense and with the text states any of their Vows and not merely their vows, so too any of their free will offerings and not merely their free will offerings. Why then does this text expressly state a burnt offering to exclude the Nazarite offering? This is the opinion of our Jose the Galilean our Akiba says which they will offer unto the Lord for a burnt offering, thus they may offer only burnt offerings, but is the law that a Gentile is excluded from offering a Nazarite offering derived from this teaching? Surely it is derived from the following. Teaching speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them when either man or woman shall clearly utter a vow the vow of a Nazirite to consecrate himself unto the Lord, hence only the children of Israel can vow the vow of a Nazirite, but Gentiles cannot vow the vow of a Nazirite. From the former teaching I should only have said that they may not offer the Nazirite offerings, but that the Nazirite vow does apply to them. The latter passage therefore teaches us that it is not so in accordance. With whose view is the following teaching which we have learned our Simeon said the Beth did ordain seven things and this was one of them if a Gentile sent his burnt offering from a land beyond the sea and he also sent with it the drink offerings for it those drink offerings of his are to be offered but if he did not they are to be offered at the expense of the community shall we say that this teaching agrees with our Jose the Galilean and not with our Akiba you may even say that it agrees with our Akiba for he meant to say they may offer burnt offerings and everything appertaining thereto who is the tanna of the following berry though which the rabbis taught homeborn the homeborn brings drink offerings but a Gentile may not bring drink offerings he might then think that his burnt offering does not require drink offerings to be offered with it the text therefore states after this matter now who is the tanna of this berry that it is neither our Jose the Galilean nor our Akiba it is not our Jose the Galilean for he says that the Gentile may offer even wine for a drink offering neither is it our Akiba for he says that he may offer only a burnt offering but nothing else if you wish I can say it is our Jose the Galilean and if you wish I can say it is our Akiba if you wish I can say it is our Jose the Galilean but you must strike out the word wine from that teaching and if you wish I can say it is our Akiba for he may offer burnt offerings and everything appertaining thereto our Simeon says. From the sinner's meal offering brought by priests etc. Whence is it derived our rabbis taught and it shall be the priest as a meal offering that is to say the service thereof may be performed by the priest himself you say it signifies that the service thereof may be performed by the priest himself but perhaps it is not so but rather it signifies that the remainder of the sinner's meal offering brought by a priest is permitted to be eaten and as for the verse and every meal offering. Of the priest shall be wholly burnt, it shall not be eaten, that refers to his free will meal offering, but his obligatory meal offering may indeed be eaten. The text therefore states, and it shall be the priest as a meal offering, thereby comparing his obligatory meal offering with his free will meal offering, thus as his free will meal offering may not be eaten, so his obligatory meal offering may not be eaten, but our Simeon said, Is it written, and it shall be the priest as his meal offering, it says. As a meal offering, thereby comparing Talmud, Mos Menico to the sinner's meal offering brought by a priest with the sinner's meal offering brought by an Israelite, thus as from the latter the handful is taken, so from the former the handful must be taken, but you might also say, just as the handful is taken from the sinner's meal offering brought by an Israelite, the remainder may be eaten, so when the handful is taken from the sinner's meal offering brought by a priest, the remainder may be. Eden the text therefore states the priest as a meal offering that is to say as regards what concerns the priest it is like the sinner's meal offering brought by an Israelite but as regards what concerns the altar fire it is not like that meal offering accordingly the handful must be offered by itself and the remainder too must be offered by itself but is the rule that the service thereof may be performed by the priest himself derived from this teaching surely it is derived from it. Following teaching whence can we learn that a priest is entitled to come and sacrifice his offerings at any time and on any occasion he desires because the text states and come with all the desire of his soul and shall minister from this latter teaching I would have said that it apply only to such offerings as are not brought on account of sin but not to such as are brought on account of sin but is this derived from here surely we know it from the following the verse and the priest shall. Make atonement for the soul that earth when he sinneth through error teaches us that the priest can make atonement for himself by his own service from this latter teaching I would have said that it applied only to such offerings as are brought for a sin committed in error but not to such as are brought for a sin committed willfully we are therefore taught that it applies to the latter too and is there any instance of an offering brought for a sin committed willfully yes for example willfully taking a false oath another bury the taught our Simeon says from the sinner's meal offering brought by a priest the handful is taken and the handful is offered by itself and so also the remainder is offered by itself our Eliezer son of our Simeon says the handful is offered by itself and the remainder is scattered over the ash heap our high B Abba said that our
Teaching I only know that the former must be wholly burnt and the latter shall not be eaten whence do I know to apply what is stated of the one to the other and vice versa the text therefore stated the word Khalil in each case for the purposes of analogy it says in the former passage Khalil and in the latter also Khalil as in the former it means wholly burnt so in the latter it means wholly burnt and as in the latter passage the eating thereof is expressly forbidden by prohibition so in the former the eating is forbidden by prohibition Rubin raised this question what is the law of the priest of the sacrificial portions of an offering as regards the prohibition concerning non priests Talmud Mosmanic B I have no doubt at all I ask the question only as regards the precept it shall be wholly burnt how is it then said our errand Rubin come and here for it was taught our Eliezer says the precept it shall be wholly burnt wherever it applies imports also a prohibition against Eating mission of the meal offering of the priests, the meal offering of the anointed high priest, and the meal offering that is offered with the drink offerings are holy for the altar, and the priests have no share in them with these. The altar is more privileged than the priests. The two loaves and the shoe bread are eaten by the priests, and the altar has no share in them with these. The priests are more privileged than the altar. Are there no other cases but what about the burnt offering? There is the hide thereof which belongs to the priests, and what about the burnt offering of a bird? There are the crop and the feathers thereof, and what about the drink offerings? They flow down into the pits. What then does with these signify it is to exclude Samuel's ruling for Samuel stated, if a man makes a free will offering of wine, he must bring it, and it is poured on the altar fire. Our mission therefore teaches us that it is poured into the pits. Our mission, however, supports it. Other ruling of Samuel for Samuel stated if a man makes a free will offering of oil the handful must be taken from it and burnt upon the altar and the remainder is eaten by the priests the two loaves and the shoe bread are there no other cases but what about the sin offering of a bird there is the blood thereof which was sprinkled upon the side of the altar and what about the log of oil of the leper there are the sprinklings what does with these signify it is to exclude the view of him who says that the two loaves it brought alone must be burnt our mission therefore teaches us that with these the priests are always privileged mission all meal offerings that are prepared in a vessel require three applications of oil before they are made ready this pouring mingling and putting in the baked cakes were mingled with oil so rabbi but the sages say the fine flour was mingled with oil the cakes required mingling and the wafers anointing how were they anointed in the form of G and the residue of the oil was consumed by the priest tomorrow. What does it exclude? Said our Papa, it excludes a meal offering baked in the oven. Our rabbis taught, and if thy offering be a meal offering prepared in the pan, it shall be made of fine flour with oil. This signifies that it requires the putting in of oil in the vessel at the outset. The expressions thy offering used here and thy offering used there establish an analogy. Talmud, Mos Menico, just as here there must be the putting in of oil in the vessel at the outset, so there there must also be the putting in of oil in the vessel at the outset. And just as there there must be mingling and pouring, so here there must also be mingling and pouring. The baked cakes were mingled with oil, so rabbi, but the sages say the fine flour was mingled with oil. Our rabbis taught the expression fine flour mingled with oil signifies that the fine flour was mingled with oil, but rabbi says the cakes were mingled, is it? He said cakes mingled with oil they said to him is it not written in connection with the loaves of the thank offering cakes mingled with oil nevertheless it was not possible to mingle the cakes with oil but only the flour how was it made ready he put in oil into the vessel at the outset put in the flour added oil to it and mingled them together he then kneaded it baked it broke it in pieces poured oil on it and then took the handful from it rabbi says the cakes were mingled as it is said cakes mingled with oil how was it made ready he put in oil into the vessel at the outset put in the flour kneaded it baked it broke it in pieces added oil to it and mingled them together again poured oil on it and then took the handful from it this was indeed a sound argument that the sages put to rabbi what is the argument said our Samuel son of our Isaac since there was only one quarter log of oil how could it be distributed among so many cakes the cakes required mingling with oil and it Wafers anointing our rabbis taught it is written cakes mingled with oil but not wafers mingled with oil for without the biblical direction I might have argued by an aforciori argument thus if cakes which do not require anointing require mingling wafers which require anointing should surely require mingling the text therefore states cakes mingled with oil but not wafers mingled with oil it is written wafers anointed with oil but not cakes anointed with oil for without the biblical direction I might have argued by an aforciori argument thus if wafers which do not require mingling require anointing cakes which require mingling should surely require anointing the text therefore states wafers anointed with oil but not cakes anointed with oil how is this implied rabbi explained because scripture should not have omitted to state at least once the expression cakes anointed with oil and wafers mingled with oil how were they anointed in the form of chi what is the meaning of in the form of chi said arkahana in the form of the Greek letter chi our rabbis taught if the meal offering baked in the oven is composed half of cakes and half of wafers one must bring for it one log of oil and divide it one half for the cakes and the other half for the wafers the cakes are to be mingled with oil and the wafers anointed one must anoint the wafer over the whole of its surface and the residue of the oil is to be put into the cakes our Simeon son of Judah says in the name of our Simeon one must anoint it in the form of the letter chi and the residue of the oil is consumed by the priest another very the taught if wafers are brought as an offering by themselves one must bring for them one log of oil and anoint them repeating this again and again until all the oil in the log has been used up our Simeon son of Judah says in the name of our Simeon one must anoint them in the form of the letter chi and the residue of the oil is consumed by the priest's mission all meal Offerings that are prepared in a vessel require to be broken in pieces. Gemara, what does it exclude? Said our Papa, it excludes the two loaves and the shoe bread. Our rabbis taught thou shalt break it in pieces. It is a meal offering. This includes all meal offerings that they require to be broken in pieces. I might then say that it includes also the two loaves and the shoe bread. The text therefore states it and pour oil thereon. It is a meal offering. This includes all meal offerings that they require oil to be poured on them. I might then say that it includes also the meal offering baked in the oven. The text therefore states oil thereon. Perhaps I must thus exclude the cakes, but not the wafers. The text therefore states it is how is this implied? Perhaps I should rather exclude the meal offering of the priest's Talmud. Mos Menico, the rabbi explained which meal offering is it that needs two expressions to exclude it. You must say it is a meal offering baked in the oven. Mission of the meal. Offering of an Israelite was folded into two and the two were folded into four and it was severed at each bend. The meal offering of priests was folded into two and the two were folded into four but it was not severed. The meal offering of the anointed high priest was not folded. Our Simeon says neither the meal offering of the priest nor the meal offering of the anointed high priest was broken in pieces since the handful was not taken from them and whenever the handful is not taken from it. Offering IT is not to be broken in pieces they must all be broken into pieces the size of an olive Gemara our rabbis taught it is written thou shalt break from this expression I would say that it must be broken into the text therefore states in pieces from the expression in pieces I would say that it should be broken into crumbs the text therefore states that it must be broken in pieces but not the pieces into further pieces how then must it be done the meal offering of an Israelite was folded into two and the two into four and it was severed at each bend the meal offering of priests and of the anointed high priest were folded etc but have we not learned the meal offering of the anointed high priest was not folded Rabbi said it means it was not folded into four but it was folded into two our Simeon says neither the meal offering of the priest nor the meal offering of the anointed high priest was broken in pieces our Joseph said over half is a which contains pieces of bread it Size of an olive the benediction is who bringeth forth bread from the earth if it does not contain pieces of bread the size of an olive the benediction is who createst various kinds of food our Joseph said once do I know this from the following teaching if he was standing and offering meal offerings in the temple in Jerusalem he says blessed art thou who hast kept us in life and hast preserved us and enabled us to reach the season if he took them to eat he says the benediction who bringeth forth bread from the earth and we have learned they must all be broken into pieces the size of an olive Abbe said to him then according to the tana of the school of our Ishmael who said he must crumble the meal offerings until they have been reduced to the fineness of the flour of which they had been made it would not be necessary to say the
is undecided. The rubbing and the beating apply to the grains of wheat. Our Jose says to the dough. The question was asked, does our Jose mean to the dough and not to the grains of wheat, or does he mean to the dough to come and here? For it was taught the rubbing and the beating apply to the grains of wheat. Our Jose says the rubbing and the beating apply to the dough. All meal offerings consist of ten cakes each, excepting the shoe bread and the griddle cakes of the high priest, which consist of twelve. Cakes each with regard to the shoe bread. This is expressly stated with regard to the griddle cakes of the high priest. This is inferred by the occurrence of the word statute both here and in connection with the shoe bread. But once do we know that all other meal offerings must consist of ten cakes each by inference from the cakes of the thank offering as these consist of ten cakes. So all meal offerings must consist of ten cakes. Perhaps the inference should be drawn from the shoe bread as this. Consists of twelve cakes. So all meal offerings must consist of twelve cakes. It is more reasonable to draw the inference from the cakes of the thank offering since they like the cakes of the thank offering are the offerings of an individual. Our free will offerings require oil are rendered invalid if left overnight and may not be offered on the Sabbath or in uncleanness. On the contrary, it is more reasonable to draw the inference from the shoe bread for they like the shoe bread are most holy. Require frankincense consist entirely of unleavened cakes and are brought on their own account. Those are more in number, but if we hold the view that what is derived by Azurishal may be set up as a basis for further inference, should we not then draw the inference from the griddle cakes of the high priest just as these consist of twelve cakes? So all meal offerings must consist of twelve cakes. It is more reasonable to draw the inference from the cakes of the thank offering for they like the cakes of the thank offering are the offerings of ordinary persons. Our free will offerings are not offered by abs are subject to the law of pickle and may not be offered on the Sabbath or in uncleanness. On the contrary, it is more reasonable to draw the inference from the griddle cakes of the high priest for they like the griddle cakes of the high priest consist of one tenth are hallowed by a vessel are most holy require frankincense consist entirely of unleavened cakes are brought. On their own account require bringing near and are offered in part on the altar fire. Moreover, these are more in number. It is preferable to infer an offering of ordinary persons from an offering of ordinary persons. Ramir says they all consist of twelve cakes each. If he holds a view that what is derived by his may be set up as a basis for further inference, then he infers other meal offerings from the griddle cakes of the high priest for these are more in number. And if he holds the view that what is derived by his may not be set up as a basis for further inference, then he infers other meal offerings from the shoe bread for he prefers to infer the most holy from the most holy, accepting the cakes of the thank offering and of the Nazarite offering, which consist of ten cakes each. With regard to the cakes of the thank offering, this is expressly stated, and with regard to the cakes of the Nazarite offering, this is so because the master has said his piece. Offerings includes the peace offerings of the Nazirite are Tobi is said in the name of Samuel for the cakes of the thank offering one baked only four cakes instead of forty it is sufficient but are not forty necessary that is only as a Marigorio's act but Teramah has to be taken therefrom and should you say that a piece is taken from each cake as Teramah but the divine law expressly says one meaning that he may not take what is broken the Teramah was taken therefrom during the needing an objection was raised all meal offerings which were made into too many or too few cakes are valid excepting the shoe bread the griddle cakes of the high priest the cakes of the thank offering and of the Nazirite offering he Talmud Mas B is in agreement with the view of the following tenet for it was taught all meal offerings which were made into too many or too few cakes are valid excepting the shoe bread and the griddle cakes of the high priest others say excepting also the cakes of the thank offering and of the Nazarite offering are who not said if for the meal offering baked in the oven one baked only one cake it is sufficient why because the word unleavened is written defectively in scripture our papa demurred is this so only because unleavened is written defectively but had unleavened not been written defectively it would not be so behold with regard to the cakes of the thank offering the word unleavened is not written defectively nevertheless our toby said in the name of Samuel that if for the cakes of the thank offering one baked only four cakes instead of forty it was sufficient that statement of our toby is at variance with this mission the omer consisted of one tenth of an ephah flour taken from three seahs the two loaves consisted of two tenths taken from three seahs and the shoe bread consisted of twenty four tenths taken from twenty four seahs gemara the omer etc why so since it was of the new produce and of Barley a tenth of the finest flour could only be obtained out of three seahs. The two loaves consisted of two tenths taken from three seahs. Since it was of wheat, even though it was of the new produce, two tenths of the finest flour could be obtained out of three seahs. The shoe bread consisted of twenty-four tenths taken from twenty-four seahs. Why so? Since it was of wheat and of the old produce, one tenth of the finest flour could be obtained out of one seah. Our rabbis taught in all meal offerings. If the number of tenths was increased or diminished, it is invalid. If the number of seahs was increased or diminished, it is valid. Mishnah the Omer was sifted through thirteen sieves, the two loaves through twelve, and the shoe bread through eleven. Our Simeon says there was no prescribed number for them, but they brought fine flour and sifted it as much as was necessary, as it is said. And thou shalt take fine flour and bake it. It may not be baked until it is sifted as much as is necessary. Gemara our rabbis taught it was sifted through a fine sieve and then of course one and again through a fine sieve and then of course one our Simeon son of Eliezer says there were thirteen sieves in the temple one on top of the other the uppermost retained the bread and the nethermost retained the fine flour our Simeon says there was no prescribed number for them our rabbis taught fine flour and bake it this teaches that fine flour was to be taken and how do we know that even grains of wheat may be brought the text therefore states and thou shalt take in any manner I might think that this is so even in regard to all other meal offerings therefore the text states that this is so here having regard to sparing expense what is meant by having regard to sparing set our Eliezer the Torah wish to spare Israel unnecessary expense where is this indicated for it is written and thou shalt give the congregation and their cattle drink chapter eight mission of the thank offering required five seahs of Flower Jerusalem measure which are six seahs wilderness measure this being equivalent to two ephahs for an ephah is three seahs or to twenty tenths of an ephah ten for the eleven cakes and ten for the unleavened Talmud. Mas Menico the ten for the eleven cakes one tenth for each cake and ten for the unleavened of unleavened cakes there were three kinds cakes wafers and soaked cakes thus there were three and a third tenths of flour for each kind three cakes to every tenth by Jerusalem. Measure they were thirty kbs fifteen for the eleven cakes and fifteen for the unleavened fifteen for the eleven cakes one cab and a half for each cake and fifteen for the unleavened of the unleavened cakes there were three kinds cakes wafers and soaked cakes thus there were five kbs for each kind two cakes to every cab gemara the thank offering required five seahs of flour Jerusalem measure etc once do we know this are his dasset from the verse the ephah and the bath shall be of one. Measure as the bath is three seahs, so the eva is three seahs. But once do we know this of the bath? Shall we say because it is written that the bath may contain the tenth part of a homer? Then the same is said of the eva two and the eva the tenth part of a homer. But you will say that the latter verse proves nothing, as we do not know how much the homer is. Then the same applies to the former verse, since we do not know how much the homer is. Rather, it is derived from the following verse. And the set portion of oil of the bath of oil shall be the tenth part of the bath out of the cor, which is ten baths. Even a homer for ten baths are a homer. Samuel said they may not increase the measures by more than a sixth, neither the coins by more than a sixth, and the profits on necessary foods must not exceed a sixth. What is the reason for his first statement? If it be said that the market prices will rise above due proportions on that account, then for the same reason it should not be. Permitted to increase even by a sixth, and if it be said that it is so on the score of overreaching, so that the transaction be not annulled, but surely rob is said on account of any fraud in measure weight or number, even though it is less than the standard of overreaching, one can retract, and if it be said that the reason why no more than a sixth may be added to weights is that the dealer may not incur any loss, it will be retorted, is then the whole purpose of the law that he be guarded. Against losses, he not entitled to make any profit by and sell at no profit, merely to be called a merchant, rather said our Hista Samuel found a scriptural text and expounded it, and the
Offering shall be equal and that he must not take the terima from the one kind of offering instead of from another as terima unto the Lord but I know not how much it must be I can however infer it by the following argument it is written here terima and it is written there in connection with the terima of the tithe terima is there it is one part in ten so here it is one part in ten or perhaps argue this way it is written here terima and it is written there in connection with it. First fruits terima is there there is no fixed measure so here there is no fixed measure let us then see to which of the two is this case most similar we may infer the terima which is not followed by any other offering from that terima which is not followed by any other offering but let not the first fruits enter the argument since they are followed by other offerings or perhaps argue this way we may infer the terima which must be eaten in a holy place from that terima which must also be eaten in a holy place but let not the terima of the tithe enter into the argument seeing that it may be eaten in any place the text therefore stated here of it as terima unto the Lord and also there in connection with the terima of the tithe of it as the terima of the Lord for the purpose of his while we have thus learned that the terima must be one part in ten but I know not of what measure shall the leaven cakes be I can however infer it by the following argument it is written here bread and it is also written in connection with the two loaves bread as there there was one tenth of an ephah for each loaf so here there must be one tenth for each cake or perhaps argue thus it is written here bread and also there in connection with the shoe bread it is written bread as there there were two tenths for each loaf so here there must be two tenths for each cake let us then see to which of the two is this case most similar we may infer a meal offering which is leavened and offered with an animal offering from another meal offering which is leavened and is offered with an animal offering but let not the shoe bread enter into the argument seeing that it is neither leavened nor offered with an animal offering perhaps argue this way we may infer a meal offering which may be offered either of the produce of the land of Israel or of that grown outside it from the new or the old produce from that meal offering which also may be offered either of the produce of the land or of that grown outside it from the new or the old produce but let not the two offering of the produce and it was followed by the great terima and the various tithes loaves enter into the argument seeing that it must be offered of the new produce and of that grown in the land the text therefore stated ye shall bring out of your dwellings two wave loaves now the text need not have stated ye shall bring why did it state ye shall bring to teach that every other offering that you make of a similar kind shall be like this as in this case there was one tenth for each loaf so in the other case there must be one tenth for each cake should we not rather say as in this case there were two tenths and also here there shall be two tenths in all the text therefore stated they shall be we have now learned that ten tenths are required for the leavened cakes but once do we know that ten tenths are required for the unleavened cakes the text therefore stated with cakes of Leaven bread thus one must bring unleavened cakes in the same measure as the leavened cakes it is thus established that there were twenty tenths for the cakes of the thank offering ten for the leavened cakes and ten for the unleavened I might think that the ten tenths for the unleavened cakes were all of one kind of cake the text therefore stated if he offer it for a thanksgiving then he shall offer with the sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened cakes mingled with oil and unleavened wafers anointed with oil and cakes mingled with oil of fine flour soaked thus there were three and a third tenths for each kind three cakes to every tenth and thus there were forty cakes for the thank offering four cakes were taken and given to the priest and the rest was consumed by the owner the master said and of it he shall present of all of them joined together consider then the verse and all the fat thereof shall he take off from it how can one apply here the ruling of all Joined together one must accept the ruling of Arhisda in the name of Abimi for Arhisda said in the name of Abimi the flesh may not be cut up before the sacrificial portions have been taken off the master said it is written here terima and it is written there in connection with the terima of the tithe terima perhaps we should infer it from the terima at Midian we may infer the terima that is binding for all times from that terima which is also binding for all times and let not the terima at Midian enter into the argument since it was not binding for all times perhaps we should infer it from the terima stated in connection with the dough offering a tana of the school of Arishmael taught we may infer that matter in connection with which there is written of it as terima unto the Lord from that matter in connection with which there is also written of it as the terima of the Lord hence the terima of the dough offering is excluded since there is not stated in connection. Therewith of it as terima unto the Lord Robert raised this question by eating the terima of the cakes of the thank offering does one incur the penalty of death at the hands of heaven or the liability of the added fifth or not since it has been compared with the terima of the tithe and in this respect too it is like the terima of the tithe or perhaps the divine law has excluded this terima by the expressions therein and the fifth part thereof does it render other cakes into which it may fall subject to the law of terima or not these questions remain undecided the master said the text therefore stated they shall be how is this intimated in the text Talmud Mas Menico they are Isaac B of Dimi said because it is written they shall be perhaps it means ten copies as Rabbah answered the verse speaks of tents we have now learned that ten tents are required for the leavened cakes but once do we know that ten tents are required for the unleavened cakes the text therefore Stated with cakes of leavened bread, thus one must bring unleavened cakes in the same measure as the leavened cakes, but may that which has itself been inferred by a hekish become the basis for another inference to be made from it again by a hekish dash. The original rule was derived from itself and from something else, and any rule derived from itself and from something of the terima of produce and the suffix in each case excludes every other terima else is not regarded as a hekish. This is well according to him who does not regard this as a hekish, but what can be said according to him who regards this as a hekish? The expression ye shall bring is an amplifying text mission of the consecration meal offering consisted of unleavened cakes like the unleavened cakes of the thank offering, namely cakes, wafers, and soaked cakes. The Nazi right meal offering consisted of two thirds of the unleavened cakes of the thank offering, namely cakes and wafers, but not soaked cakes thus there. Were ten kabs by Jerusalem measure which are six tenths and something over tomorrow whence is it derived said Arhistad in the name of Arhamabi Giri it is written and out of the basket of unleavened bread that was before the Lord he took one unleavened cake and one oil cake and one wafer now cake means cake and wafer means wafer but what is meant by oil cake surely it means a cake soaked in oil are we demurred perhaps it means a cake of oil rather it is derived from the exposition of our nominee. Arhistad in the name of our tabla it is written this is the offering of Aaron and of his sons which they shall offer unto the Lord in the day when he is anointed what do we learn in regard to his sons from the offering when he is anointed it is that the offering at the initiation of the ordinary priest shall be like the offering at the anointing of the high priest as at the anointing of the high priest there was an offering of soaked cake so at the initiation of the ordinary priest. There was an offering of soaked cakes Arhista said when the high priest is inaugurated into the service he requires two tenths of an ephah for offerings one on account of his anointing and the other on account of his initiation Mar son of Arashi said he requires three tenths but they do not in fact differ for the former refers to the case where he had already been serving in the temple as an ordinary priest and the latter to the case where he had not served in the temple as an ordinary priest. The Nazi right meal offering consisted of two thirds of the unleavened cakes of the thank offering our rabbis taught his peace offerings includes a peace offering of the Nazi right that it requires ten calves of flour Jerusalem measure and one quarter log of oil I might think that it includes the Nazarite offering in regard to all that is mentioned in the passage the text therefore stated unleavened how is this implied our papa answered it includes for the Nazarite offering only those kinds. Which are specified by the term unleavened, thus excluding the soaked cakes, which are not specified by the term unleavened. Atana of the school of Arishmael taught a basket of unleavened bread is a general statement. Cakes and wafers are particular instances. We thus have a general statement followed by the enumeration of particular instances, in which case the scope of the general statement is limited to the particular specified, thus only cakes and wafers, but nothing else. Talmud, Mas Menakoth. Be Mishnah if a man slaughtered the thank offering within the temple court and the bread thereof was outside the wall at the time the bread is not hallowed if he slaughtered it before the loaves had become crusted in the oven, or even if all except one had become crusted, the bread is not hallowed. Gemara, what does outside the wall mean? Our Yohanan says outside the wall of Beth Page, but Reshlakish says outside the wall of the temple court. Reshlakish says outside the wall of the temple. Court for we must interpret
There has been taught a very in accord with our Yohanan's view of a man slaughtered the thank offering within the temple court and the bread thereof was outside the wall of Beth page at the time the bread is not hallowed if he slaughtered it before the loaves had become crusted in the oven the bread is not hallowed whence is this derived from the following which our rabbis taught with cakes of leavened bread he shall present this teaches that the bread is hallowed only if the loaves had become crusted in the oven before the slaughtering of the sacrifice he shall present his offering with the slaughtering this teaches that the bread is hallowed only by the slaughtering of the sacrifice the slaughtering of the thank offering this teaches that if he slaughtered the thank offering under the name of another offering the bread is not hallowed our rabbis taught one fulfills one's obligation on the Passover with unleavened bread partially baked and with unleavened Bread prepared in a stewing pot. What is meant by unleavened bread partially baked? Rab Judah explained in the name of Samuel. It is any unleavened bread which, when broken, has no threads dragging from it. Rabbi said, and the same rule applies to the loaves of the thank offering. Surely this is obvious. For here the expression bread is used, and there too the expression bread is used. You might think that since the divine law stated one intimating that he may not take what is broken, such is regarded as broken. He therefore teaches us that it is not so. It was stated if the thank offering was slaughtered accompanied by eighty loaves, as he ruled forty out of the eighty are hallowed, and our Yohanan ruled not even forty out of the eighty are hallowed. Said our Zera, all agree that if he declared let forty out of the eighty be hallowed, they are hallowed. Likewise, if he declared the forty shall not be hallowed unless all the eighty are hallowed, they are not hallowed. They differ only where no. Specific statement was made. One master is of the opinion that his intention was to ensure the prescribed number, while the other master holds a view that his intention was to provide a large offering of a said they differ as to whether vessels of ministry hallow in the absence of the owner's intention. One master is of the opinion that vessels of ministry hallow even in the absence of the owner's intention, while the other master holds a view that vessels of ministry do not hallow in the absence of the owner's intention. Our papa said all agree that vessels of ministry hallow in the absence of the owner's intention, but they differ only as to the knife. One master is of the opinion that the knife hallows just as any vessel of ministry, while the other master holds a view that it does not hallow like any other vessel of ministry since it has no receptacle. Others quote our papa in this form. Our papa said all agree that vessels of ministry only hallow with the owner's intention, but they differ as to the knife. One master holds that the knife is more efficacious than any other vessel of ministry, seeing that it hallows even though it has no receptacle. Whilst the other master holds that the knife is no more efficacious than any other vessel of ministry. Mission: If he slaughtered the thank offering, intending to eat thereof outside its proper time or outside its proper place, the bread is nevertheless hallowed. If he slaughtered it and it was found to be true, for the bread is not hallowed. If he slaughtered it and it was found to have a blemish, our Eliezer says the bread is nevertheless hallowed. But the sages say it is not hallowed. If he slaughtered it under another name, and so too if the ram of the consecration offering or the two lambs offered at Pentecost were slaughtered under another name, the bread is not hallowed. Gemara, in accordance with whose view is the ruling in our mission, it is in accordance with the view of our Meir, for it was taught this is the general. Rule if the disqualifying defect befell the thank offering before the slaughtering the bread is not hallowed if after the slaughtering the bread is hallowed thus if he slaughtered it intending to eat thereof outside its proper time or outside its proper place the bread is hallowed if he slaughtered it and it was found to be true for the bread is not hallowed Talmud, Mos Menikoth, if he slaughtered it and it was found to have a blemish our Eliezer says the bread is hallowed but our Joshua says it is not hallowed so our Meir our Judah said our Eliezer and our Joshua do not dispute the ruling that if at the slaughtering there was an intention of eating thereof outside its proper time the bread is hallowed or that if it was found to have a blemish the bread is not hallowed they differ only where there was an intention of eating thereof outside its proper place in this case our Eliezer says the bread is hallowed and our Joshua says it is not hallowed our Eliezer argued since the intention to eat of the offering outside the proper time is a disqualifying defect and the intention to eat thereof outside the proper place is also a disqualifying defect as in the former case the bread is nevertheless hallowed so in the latter case too the bread is hallowed our Joshua argued since the intention to eat of the offering outside its proper place is a disqualifying defect and the blemish in the animal is also a disqualifying defect as in the latter case the bread is not hallowed so in the former to it is not hallowed our Eliza replied I likened it to the case where there was an intention to eat thereof outside its proper time but you likened it to the case of a blemish in the animal let us then see to which of the two is it more similar if it is more similar to the case where there was an intention to eat thereof outside its proper time then we must infer it from this and if it is more similar to the case of the blemish in the animal then we must infer it from this and so are Eliza began to argue as follows: We may infer that which is a defect by reason of the intention from that which is also a defect by reason of the intention, but we may not infer that which is a defect by reason of the intention from that which is a defect by reason of a physical blemish. Thereupon, our Joshua began to argue as follows: We may infer a defect which does not involve the penalty of kareth from a defect which also does not involve the penalty of kareth, and let not the intention to eat of the offering outside its proper time enter into the argument, since it is a defect which involves the penalty of kareth. Moreover, we should infer it from the slaughtering of the offering under another name, for this is a defect by reason of the intention and also does not involve the penalty of kareth. At this, our Eliza was silent. Why is it according to our Meir's view that where the thank offering was slaughtered and was found to be true for the bread is not hallowed for the defect is? Regarded as having befallen it before the slaughtering and that where it was slaughtered and was found to have a blemish the bread is according to the ruling of our Eliezer hallowed for the defect is not regarded as having befallen it before the slaughtering it refers only to such blemishes as a film over the eye and it agrees with our Akiva who said that in such cases if they were brought up on the altar they must not be taken down and the other he will reply it is only when the blemish affects the validity of the animal itself as a sacrifice that our Akiva says that if they were brought up they must not be taken down but he does not say so where it affects the hallowing of the bread it was stated if a sin offering was slaughtered with the intention of performing a service or of eating thereof outside its proper time and it was brought up on the altar it must not be taken down if it was slaughtered with the intention of performing a service or of eating thereof outside its proper place and it was taken up Rabbah said it must be taken down but Rabbah said it must not be taken down Rabbah evidently agrees with our Joshua and Rabbah with our Eliza but Rabbah retracted in favor of Rabbah's view seeing that our Eliza retracted in favor of our Joshua's view there are some however who say that although our Eliza retracted in favor of our Joshua's view Rabbah did not retract in favor of Rabbah's view for there our Joshua convinced our Eliza by his argument we should infer it from the slaughtering of the offering under another name here however if we derive it from the slaughtering of the offering under another name we obtain the ruling that if it was brought up it must not be taken down if he slaughtered it under another name etc our papa said Artana omits the ram of the Nazarite offering which is frequent and deals with the ram of the consecration offering and Artana he deals with the very first offering mission if the drink offerings had already been Hallowed in a vessel when the animal offering was found to be invalid. If there is another animal offering, they may be offered with it, but if not, they are left to become invalid by remaining overnight. Demar Zeiri said the drink offerings are hallowed only by the slaughtering of the animal offering. Why is this? Because the verse says animal offerings and drink offerings. We have learned if the drink offerings had already been hallowed in a vessel when the animal offering was found to be invalid. If there is another animal offering, they may be offered with it, but if not, they are left to become invalid by remaining overnight. Now, presumably, it became invalid in the act of slaughtering. No, it became invalid in the act of sprinkling. With whom would disagree? Shall I say only with Rabbi who ruled that where there are two acts which jointly render the offering permissible, one can promote to sanctity even without the other. You may even say that it agrees with our Eliezer, son of our Simeon. For we are dealing here with the case where the blood had been received in a bowl and was spilled Talmud, Mos Menikoth B and our Eliezer son of Arsimian holds the same view as his father who maintained that what was ready for sprinkling is regarded as sprinkled. The master stated if there is
Drink offerings are invalid for they are regarded as though they had remained overnight, but does our Simeon hold that the mental stipulation of the Beth Din is effective? Behold, our EDB Avin stated in the name of our Amram who cited our Isaac who cited our Yohan and the daily offerings which are not required for the community are according to our Simeon not redeemed unblemished, but according to the sages they are redeemed unblemished. In that case it is different for there is the remedy of putting them to pasture mission of the young of the thank offering its substitute and the animal which was set apart in the place of the thank offering which was set apart and was lost do not require the bread offering for it is written and he shall offer with the sacrifice of thank offering the thank offering requires the bread offering but its young what is brought in its place and its substitute do not require the bread offering tomorrow our rabbis taught why was it necessary for scripture to say he offers it for a thank offering whence is it derived that if a man had set apart a beast for a thank offering and it was lost and he set apart another in its place and then the first was found so that now both beasts are standing before him whence it is asked is it derived that he may offer whichever of them he pleases and with it the bread offering because the text states he offers for a thank offering i might think that the other animal also requires the bread offering therefore the text says he Offers it implying one only but not two thus the text has qualified it after including it once do I know that the young of the thank offering what was brought in its place and its substitute are also included that they too must be offered as thank offerings because the text states if for a thank offering I might think that they also require the bread offerings the text therefore says then he shall offer with the thank offering the thank offering alone requires the bread offering but it's young what was brought in its place and its substitute do not require the bread offering our hand sent the following ruling in the name of our Yohan and this is so only if it is offered after the atonement but if before the atonement it also needs the bread offering now our room pondered over this to what does the above ruling refer shall I say to the case of the animal that was brought in the place of an obligatory thank offering but we have already learned it regarding the case where it was Offered before the atonement and also regarding the case where it was offered after the atonement Talmud, Mos Medico the Shalai then say it refers to the case of what was brought in the place of a free will thank offering but surely whether it is offered before the atonement or after the atonement it certainly requires the bread offering for it is an additional thank offering Shalai then say it refers to the case of the young of the free will thank offering but surely whether it is offered before the atonement or after the atonement it certainly does not require the bread offering for it is a surplus of the thank offering I must say it refers to the case of the young of an obligatory thank offering thus if the young is offered before the atonement it requires the bread offering but if after the atonement it does not require the bread offering what does he teach us that our Yohanan is of the opinion that a man may obtain atonement with the increase of consecrated Things have they also pondered over it in like manner it has also been expressly stated our Isaac B. Joseph said in the name of our Yohan and the animal that was brought in the place of a free will thank offering whether it is offered before or after the atonement requires the bread offering for it is an additional thank offering the young of a free will thank offering whether it is offered before or after the atonement does not require the bread offering for it is only the surplus of the thank offering the young of an obligatory thank offering and what was brought in the place of an obligatory thank offering if offered before the atonement require the bread offering but if after the atonement do not require the bread offering Samuel said whatever in the case of a sin offering must be left to die in the case of a thank offering does not require the bread offering and whatever in the case of a sin offering must be left to pasture in the case of a thank offering requires the bread. Offering our room raised the following objection it was taught why was it necessary for the text to say he offers it for a thank offering whence is it derived that if a man set apart a beast for a thank offering and it was lost and he set apart another in its place and then the first was found so that now both beasts stand before him whence it is asked is it derived that he may offer whichever of them he pleases and with it the bread offering because the text states he offers for a thank offering I might think that the other animal also requires the bread offering therefore the text states he offers it implying one only but not two now a sin offering in such a case would certainly be left to pasture for we have learned if a man set apart an animal as his sin offering and it was lost and he set apart another in its stead and then the first was found so that now both stand before us one must be used for his atonement while the other must be left to die so rabbi but the Sages say no sin offering may be left to die save only that which is found after its owner had obtained atonement by another offering it follows however that if it is found before its owner had otherwise obtained atonement it must be left to pasture Samuel agrees with rabbi who maintains that the animal which was lost at the time that a second was set apart must be left to die then in what circumstances does it ever arise that the animal according to rabbi must be left to pasture in the case stated by Arashai for Arashai said if a man set apart two sin offerings as security he obtains atonement by whichever animal he pleases to offer while the second must be left to pasture but surely a thank offering in such a case would not require the bread offering rather Samuel agrees with our Simeon who maintains that the five sin offerings must be left to die but our Simeon holds that under no circumstances is a sin offering to be left to pasture Samuel two stated one rule only Whatever in the case of a sin offering must be left to die in the case of a thank offering does not require the bread offering then what does he teach us his purpose is to reject our Yohanan's before our Yohanan ruled that a man may obtain atonement from the increase of consecrated things and Samuel teaches us that it is not so Rabbi said where a man said this animal shall be a thank offering and these its loaves if the loaves were lost he may bring other loaves for this thank offering but if the thank offering was lost he may not bring another thank offering for these loaves what is the reason the loaves are pertinent to the thank offering but the thank offering is not pertinent to the loaves Rabbi said if a man set apart money to purchase an animal for a thank offering Talmud, Mos Medikoth B and some was left over he may bring with it the loaves if he set money apart for the loaves of a thank offering and some was left over he may not bring with it the Thank offering what is the reason shall I say it is our Kahana's teaching for our Kahana said whence is it known that the loaves of the thank offering are referred to as the thank offering from the verse and he shall offer with the thank offering unleavened cakes if so the reverse should also be true should it not dash no the loaves are referred to as the thank offering but the thank offering is never referred to as the loaves Rabbi also said if a man set apart an animal for his thank offering and it was lost and he set apart another in its stead and that too was lost and he then set apart a third in its stead and then the first animals were found so that now all three animals stand before us if he obtained atonement by the first animal the second does not require the bread offering but the third does if he obtained atonement by the third the second does not require the bread offering but the first does if by the second the other two do not require the bread offering of a said even Though he obtained atonement by any one of them the other two do not require the bread offering because each was replaced by the other our Zara said and so it is too with regard to the sin offering thus if a man set apart an animal for his sin offering and it was lost and he set apart a second animal in its stead and that two was lost and then he set apart a third in its stead and then the first animals were found so that now all three animals stand before us if he obtained atonement by the first animal the second must be left to die and the third must be left to pasture if he obtained atonement by the third animal the second must be left to die and the first must be left to pasture if he obtained atonement by the second animal the other two animals must be left to die of a said even though he obtained atonement by any one of them the other two animals must be left to die because each was replaced by the other what is the point of saying and so it is too is it not obvious you might think that it applies only there in the case of the thank offering for one might say that he is offering additional thank offerings but not here in the case of the sin offering for one cannot say that he is offering additional sin offerings we are therefore taught that so it is too with the sin offering our high taught if a thank offering was confused with its substitute and one of them died there is no remedy for the other for what is he the owner to do should he offer the bread offering with it perhaps it is a substitute should he not offer the bread offering with it perhaps it is the original thank offering but if he had said behold I take upon myself to offer a thank offering he cannot do otherwise than bring it then let him bring another animal and the bread offering of a thank offering with it and declare if the surviving animal is a substitute then let this be a thank offering and this its bread offering and if the surviving animal is the original Thank offering then let this be the bread offering for it and this animal be a security it must be that he had said let this be a thank offering Nemonic the arguers Martha Olishish Ashi Dem Heri Hulin S H Elamim surpl
Outset set apart an animal to be the surplus of an offering. Our Isaac B. Samuel B. Martha was sitting in the presence of our Naaman, and while sitting there, he said, Let him bring another animal and the bread offering and declare if the surviving animal is the substitute. Let this animal be a thank offering and this its bread offering. And if the surviving animal is the original thank offering, let this be the bread offering for it and this animal be the substitute of the thank offering. He replied, Tell me, sir, forty stripes on his shoulders, and yet you permit him to do so. Our Allah was once ill, and Abay and the other rabbis came to visit him while sitting there. They said, If the law is in accordance with our Yohan and who ruled that the bread is hallowed even though it was outside the wall of the sanctuary, then let him bring the bread offering and put it down outside the wall of the sanctuary and let him declare if the surviving animal is the original thank offering. Then here. Is its bread offering and if not let it be treated as unconsecrated bread this is no remedy for there are four cakes which must be waved and what should one do should he the priest wave them outside the sanctuary but it is written before the Lord should he wave them inside he is then bringing unconsecrated food into the sanctuary it is thus impossible to do so our shisha son of our ED demurred saying if the law is in accordance with Hezekiah who ruled that forty out of the eighty cakes are hallowed let him bring another animal and with it eighty cakes and let him declare if the surviving animal is the original thank offering let this animal also be a thank offering and here are eighty cakes for both thank offerings and if the surviving animal is a substitute then let this animal be a thank offering and this the bread offering for it and let forty out of the eighty cakes be hallowed this is no remedy for there would then be a curtailment of the eating of it. Forty cakes are as she said to Arkahana if the law is in accordance with our Yohanan who ruled that where a man set apart a pregnant beast as a sin offering and it then gave birth his atonement may be made if he so desires with the mother beast itself or if he prefers with her young let him bring here a pregnant beast and wait until it gives birth and let him also bring eighty cakes and declare if the surviving animal is a substitute let it the mother beast and its young be thank offerings. And here are the eighty cakes for both of them and if the surviving animal is the original thank offering let it the mother beast also be a thank offering and here are eighty cakes for both and this the young shall be the surplus of the thank offering he replied who can tell us for certain that the reason for our Yohanan's ruling is that he is of the opinion that if a man were to reserve it the young it is accounted a reservation perhaps he holds it is not accounted a reservation. And this is the reason for our Yohanan's ruling, namely that he is of the opinion that a man may obtain atonement with the increase of consecrated things. Rabbinah once happened to be in Damharia, and Ardini, son of Arhuna of Damharia, suggested the following to Rabbinah: Let him bring another animal, and say, Behold, I take upon myself to offer a thank offering, and let him also bring a third animal, and with it eighty cakes, and declare if the surviving animal is the substitute, let these two animals be thank offerings, and here are eighty cakes for both. And if the surviving animal is the thank offering, then let that animal, in respect of which I said, I take upon myself to offer a thank offering, also be a thank offering, and here are the eighty cakes for those two thank offerings, and let the third animal be a security. He replied, The Torah says, Better it is that thou shouldst not bow than that thou shouldst bow and not pay, and you say that he should proceed to bow in the first. Instance Mishnah, if a man said, Behold, I take upon myself to bring a thank offering, he must bring both it and its bread from what is unconsecrated Talmud, Mas Medikoth B, if he said the thank offering from what is unconsecrated and its bread from second tithe money, he must bring both it and its bread from what is unconsecrated, if he said the thank offering from second tithe and its bread from what is unconsecrated, he shall bring it so, if he said both the thank offering and its bread from second tithe, he shall bring it so, but he may not bring it from second tithe, we but only from second tithe money, Gamar Arhuna said, If a man said, Behold, I take upon myself to bring the bread of a thank offering, he must bring a thank offering and its bread, for what reason, since this man knows full well that bread alone cannot be offered, he obviously meant a thank offering together with its bread, and when he said the bread of a thank offering, he merely stated the final words of the vow. We have learned if he said the thank offering from second tithe and its bread from what is unconsecrated he shall bring it so now why is this so surely since he said its bread from what is unconsecrated he ought to bring both it the thank offering and its bread from what is unconsecrated there it is quite different for since he had already said the thank offering from second tithe when he next said bread from what is unconsecrated it is to be taken as though he had said behold I take upon myself to bring the bread for so and so's thank offering if that is so then in the first clause too which reads if he said the thank offering from what is unconsecrated and its bread from second tithe money he must bring both it and its bread from what is unconsecrated it should also be taken as though he had said behold I take upon myself to bring the thank offering for so and so's bread how can you compare the two bread might very well be brought for another's thank offering but is a Thank offering ever brought for another's bread come and here if a man said behold I take upon myself to offer a thank offering without the bread or an animal offering without the drink offerings they compel him to bring the thank offering with the bread or the animal offering with the drink offerings now this is so only where he said a thank offering but where he did not say a thank offering he would not have to bring anything at all no it is just the same even though he did not say a thank offering but since the Tana wished to state the case of an animal offering without the drink offerings when he could not have stated the reverse of his drink offerings without an animal offering he also stated the case of the thank offering why is it so surely this is a vow that carries with it its annulment the authority for this view of our mission said Hezekiah is Beth Shammai who maintained that one must always regard the first words of a man's statement as binding for we have Learned if a man said I will be a Nazi right and abstain from dry fix and press fix Beth Sham I say he becomes a Nazi right but Beth Hillel say he does not become a Nazi right are Yohanan said you may even say that this is in accordance with Beth Hillel only we must suppose that the man said had I but known that one cannot vow in this manner I should not have vowed in this manner but in that what then means they compel him that is if he wishes to change his mind now come and hear if a man said I take upon myself to bring a thank offering without bread or an animal offering without the drink offerings and when they said to him you must bring a thank offering with the bread or an animal offering with the drink offerings he replied had I but known this I would not have vowed at all they compel him nonetheless and say to him observe and hear now this is well according to Hezekiah but it surely presents a difficulty to our Yohanan our Yohanan will reply that very undoubtedly Represents Beth Shammai's view what is meant by observe and here Rabbi said observe bring the thank offering and here bring its bread offering Rabbi said observe bring the thank offering with its bread offering and here be not in the habit of doing so if he said both the thank offering and its bread from second tithe he shall bring it so he shall bring it so is he then bound to bring it so our nomin and our histah explained if he wishes he brings it as he vowed and if not he need not bring it as he vowed but he may not bring it from second tithe wheat but only from second tithe money our nomin and our histah both said they taught this only of second tithe wheat but he may bring it from we bought with second tithe money our Jeremiah was sitting before our Zara and recited as follows they taught this only of second tithe wheat but he may bring it from we bought with second tithe money our Zara said to him master you say so but I say that even from we bought with second tithe money he may not bring it and I will state my reason and I will state your reason I will state your reason whence do you know this of the thank offering from peace offerings Talmud, Mas Medikoth and in respect of peace offerings this is derived from the expression there stated in connection with peace offerings and also in connection with the second tithe and it follows as peace offerings are not brought from actual second tithe produce so the bread of the thank offering may not be brought from actual second tithe produce and we bought with second tithe money is not actual second tithe produce and I will state my reason whence do I know this of the thank offering from peace offerings and in respect of peace offerings this is derived from the expression there stated in connection with peace offerings and also in connection with the second tithe and it follows as peace offerings are not of the same kind as second tithe so the bread of the thank offering may not be from that which is the same kind as second tithe thus excluding we bought from second tithe money which is the same kind as second tithe rmi said if a man designated second tithe money for a peace offering the peace offering has not appropriated it why because the sanctity of the peace offering is not so potent that it can be imposed upon the sanctity of second tithe an objection was raised if a man bought a wild animal for a peace offering or catt
Thank offering, he may bring it only from what is unconsecrated because it is written, and thou shalt sacrifice the Passover offering unto the Lord thy God of the flock and the herd, but is not the Passover offering brought only from the lambs and from the goats. Why then is it written of the flock and the herd? It is to come here whatsoever is brought from the flock and the herd with the Passover offering as the Passover offering is obligatory and offered only from what is unconsecrated, so everything that is obligatory may be offered only from what is unconsecrated. Therefore, if a man says, I take upon myself to offer a thank offering, or I take upon myself to offer a peace offering, since these are obligatory, they may be offered only from what is unconsecrated. The drink offerings in every case may be offered only from what is unconsecrated. Tomorrow, and whence do we know it for the Passover offering itself? It was taught our Eliezer said a Passover offering was ordained to be brought in Egypt. And the Passover offering was ordained for later generations as the Passover offering that was ordained in Egypt could be brought only from what was unconsecrated. So the Passover offering that was ordained for later generations may be brought only from what is unconsecrated. Said to him, Our Akiba, is it right to infer the possible from the impossible? The other replied, Although it was impossible, otherwise it is nevertheless a striking argument, and we may make an inference from it. Then our Akiba put forward the following argument in refutation. This was so of the Passover offering ordained in Egypt, since it did not require the sprinkling of blood and the offering of the sacrificial portions upon the altar Talmud. Mos Menachoth, will you say the same of the Passover offering of later generations, which requires the sprinkling of the blood and the offering of the sacrificial portions upon the altar? The other replied, Behold, it is written, and thou shalt keep the service in this month. Signifying that all the services of this month should be like this now let us consider the view of our Akiba if he holds that it is not proper to infer the possible from the impossible then let him stand by that argument in refutation and if he retracted it and the only reason why he did not derive the law from the Passover offering in Egypt was that refutation which he raised but surely that can be countered by the Passover offering brought in the wilderness which proves the reverse. Here our Akiba was arguing with our Eliezer from his own standpoint as for me I hold that it is not proper to infer the possible from the impossible but even from your point of view that one may infer the possible from the impossible there is surely this refutation this was so of the Passover offering in Egypt since it did not require the sprinkling of blood and the offering of the sacrificial parts upon the altar will you say the same of the Passover offering of later generations which requires the sprinkling of blood and the offering of the sacrificial portions upon the altar to this however our Eliza replied it is written and thou shalt keep but should not our Eliza have replied that the Passover offering brought in the wilderness proves the reverse here Eliza was arguing with our Akiba from his own standpoint as for me I hold that it is quite proper to infer the possible from the impossible and as for that refutation of yours it can be countered by the Passover offering brought in the wilderness which proves the reverse but even from your point of view that it is not proper to infer the possible from the impossible I reply that there is written and thou shalt keep but even now let him raise this objection Arshis hate answered this proves that no objections can be entertained against a Hekish in the school garden it was asked may that which has itself been inferred by a become the basis for another inference to be made from it again by a it is Derived from the class for all the Passover offerings from one class and whence does our Akiba derive the law that the Passover offering may be brought only from what is unconsecrated he derives it from the following teaching of Samuel in the name of our Eliza it is written this is the law of the burnt offering of the meal offering and of the sin offering and of the guilt offering and of the consecration offering and of the sacrifice of peace offerings burnt offering is the burnt offering requires a vessel so all the other offerings require a vessel what vessel is it that is meant shall I say a basin but with regard to the peace offerings of the congregation it is also written and put it in basins rather it means a knife and how do we know this of the burnt offering itself because it is written and Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son and there it was a burnt offering as it is written and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his Sun meal offering is a meal offering may be eaten only by the males of the priesthood so all the other offerings may be eaten only by the males of the priesthood what other offerings are meant it cannot be the sin offering and the guilt offering Talmud, Mos Medicotha for this is expressly stated of them neither can it be the peace offerings of the congregation for this is already deduced from the amplification of the following verse in a most holy place shalt thou eat thereof every male. May eat thereof this teaches us that the peace offerings of the congregation may be eaten only by the males of the priesthood Tanaim hold different views about it some derive it from this passage and some from that sin offering is the sin offering renders holy like itself whatever has absorbed from it so all the other offerings render holy like themselves whatever has absorbed from them guilt offering is with the guilt offering neither the foetus nor the afterbirth is holy so with. All other offerings neither the foetus sac nor the afterbirth is holy he is of the opinion that the young of consecrated animals are themselves holy only when they come into being and also that it is quite proper to infer the possible from the impossible consecration offering as in the case of the consecration offering the remainder was burnt but the living animal that was left over was not burnt so in the case of all other offerings the remainder is to be burnt but the living animal that might be left over is not to be burnt peace offerings as peace offerings can make others pickle and can also become pickle themselves so all the other offerings can make others pickle and can also become pickle themselves in a very that it was taught in the name of our Akiva as follows this is a law etc a meal offering as a meal offering renders holy like itself whatever has absorbed from it so all the other offerings render holy like themselves whatever has absorbed from them and this was Necessary to be stated of the sin offering as well as of the meal offering for had the divine law stated it only of the meal offering I would have said that this was so only of the meal offering because on account of its softness it could be absorbed but I would not have said so of the sin offering and had the divine law only stated it of the sin offering I would have said that this was so only of the sin offering because on account of its fatness it could easily penetrate into the other matter but I would not have said so of the meal offering therefore both were necessary to be stated sin offering as the sin offering must be brought only from what is unconsecrated and must be sacrificed by day and all the services in connection therewith must be performed with the priest's right hand so all the other offerings must be brought only from what is unconsecrated and must be sacrificed by day and all the services in connection therewith must be performed with the priests. Right hand and whence do we know this of the sin offering itself are his answered because it is written and Aaron shall offer the bullock of the sin offering which is his that is to say it must come from his own means and not from the means of the community nor from the second tithe is not the rule that offerings must be sacrificed by day derived from the verse in the day that he commanded it was indeed stated above to no purpose is not the rule that all the services in connection there which shall be performed with the right hand derived from the following dictum of Rabbi Bar Hanna for Rabbi Bar Hanna said in the name of Reshlakish wherever the word finger or priest is used it signifies that the right hand only shall be used this too was stated above to no purpose guilt offering as the bones of the guilt offering are permitted for use so the bones of all other offerings are permitted for use for what purpose does our Akiba use the verse and thou shalt Sacrifice the Passover offering Talmud, Mos Menachoth B. He requires it for the following teaching of Arnaman for Arnaman said in the name of Rabbi Abba once do we know that the surplus of the Passover offering is brought as a peace offering because it is said and thou shalt sacrifice the Passover offering unto the Lord thy God of the flock and the herd but is not the Passover offering brought only from the lambs and the goats it means that the surplus of the Passover offering is to be utilized for something which comes from the flock and from the herd but is it derived from this verse surely it is derived from the following teaching of Samuel's father it is written and if his offering for a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord be of the flock and Samuel's father said this teaches that what comes only from the flock shall be offered as peace offerings and again is it derived from this latter verse surely it is derived from the following it was taught this. Includes the fat tail of the Passover offering when it says if he bring a lamb it is to include the Passover offering that has passed the age of one year and the peace offerings which are brought by virtue of the Passover offering for all the regulations of peace offerings is that they require the laying on of hands the drink offerings and the waving of the breast and the thigh again when it says and if his offering be a goat this interrupts the subject and thereby teaches that in the case of a goat the burning of the fat tail upon the altar is not required
The individual may be offered from produce grown in the land of Israel or outside the land from a new produce or from an old accepting the Omer offering and the two loaves which must be offered only from a new produce and from produce grown in the land. All offerings must be offered from the choicest produce and which is the choicest Mike Miss and Zana who rank first for the quality of their fine flour second to them is Hafarim and the value the produce of the whole land was valid. But they used to bring it from these places. Gemara our mission is not in accordance with the following tenet for it was taught if the Omer offering was offered from the old produce it is valid and so too if the two loaves were offered from the old produce they are valid save that the precept has not been duly performed the Omer offering for it is written thou shalt bring for the meal offering of thy first fruits that is even from the storeroom and the two loaves for it is written out of your Dwellings, but not from the produce grown outside the land, out of your dwellings, even from the storeroom, but has not a deduction already been drawn from that expression. The verse reads, Ye shall bring even from the storeroom, but is not this latter expression required to teach that every other offering that you make of a similar kind shall be like this? If for this only the verse should have read, Thou shalt bring, why does it say, Ye shall bring? You can therefore draw two deductions. Therefrom, but is it not written the first that is only a recommendation, but does it not say new that is required for the following Beritha, which was taught our Nathan and our Akiva said, If the two loaves were brought from the old produce, they are nonetheless valid. How then am I to interpret the expression new to signify that they shall be the first of all meal offerings? Now they differ only concerning the new produce Talmud, Mosmanico, the best of the land, they do not differ at all for. They both hold that the Omer offering and the two loaves must be offered from the produce of the land of Israel and not from that grown outside the land. This view is clearly not in accord with that of the following tenet. For it was taught our Jose son of Arjuna says the Omer offering may be offered from what is grown outside the land. How then am I to interpret the expression when ye are come into the land to signify that they were not bound to offer the Omer offering before they entered? The land furthermore he is of the opinion that the prohibition of the new corn outside the land of Israel is biblical that the expression your dwellings implies wherever you may be dwelling and that the expression when ye are come into the land implies that the prohibition comes into force only at the time when you come into the land. Now since the prohibition of the new corn outside the land of Israel is biblical we may surely offer the Omer offering therefrom we have learned. Elsewhere, those who kept guard over the aftergrowths in the sabbatical year received their payout of the Tremoth Halishka. Rami Bihamba pointed out the following contradiction to our Hista. We have learned those who kept guard over the aftergrowth in the sabbatical year received their payout of the Tremoth Halishka. But in contradiction to this, we have also learned for food, but it must not be burnt. He replied, The divine law says throughout your generations, and you are suggesting that it be dispensed with. Am I suggesting retorted the other that it be dispensed with? I say it can be offered of last year's produce, it must be fresh, and it is not so in that case, then it can be offered of the fresh corn of last year's produce. The text says, Thou shalt bring fresh, that is, it must be fresh at the time of offering, and it is not so in that case, it was stated, Are you had and said, It is written, Thou shalt bring fresh. Our Eliezer said, It is written, The first of your harvest, but not the End of your harvest rabbi raised the following objection the verse and if thou bring a meal offering of first fruits refers to the meal offering of the omer of what was it offered of barley you say of barley but perhaps it is not so but rather of wheat said our Eliezer, the expression in the year is stated in regard to the incidents in egypt and the expression in the year is also stated as an ordinance for generations just as in the year stated in regard to the incidents in egypt referred to the barley so in the year stated as an ordinance for generations refers to barley only our akiva said we find that an individual must offer wheat as an obligation and also barley as an obligation likewise we find that the community must offer wheat as an obligation and also barley as an obligation should you say then that the omer was offered of wheat we would not find a case when the community must offer barley as an obligation another explanation should you say that the omer was offered of wheat then the two loaves would not be first fruits, hence the reason for it is that it must be first fruits. This is indeed a refutation we have learned elsewhere. First fruits may be brought only from the seven species and not Talmud, Mosmanikoth be from the dates in the hill country nor from the produce in the valley. Sedula, if one brought these, they are not consecrated as first fruits. Rabbi was once sitting and reciting the statement of Ola when Arahabi Abba raised the following objection. Against Rabbi, it is written an offering of first fruits. This signifies that it is to be the first of all meal offerings, and so too it says also in the day of the first fruits when ye bring a new meal offering unto the Lord in your feast of weeks, I thus know that it is to be the first before all the meal offerings of wheat. Once do I know that it is to be the first before all meal offerings of barley because the text repeats the word new and as this word is not required twice for the Teaching that it is to be the first before all meal offerings of wheat, you may use it for the teaching that it is to be the first before all meal offerings of barley. And whence do I know that it shall be offered before the first fruits? Because the text states, and thou shalt observe the feast of weeks, even of the first fruits of wheat harvest. I thus know that it shall be offered before the first fruits of the wheat harvest. But whence do I know that it shall be offered before the first fruits of the barley harvest? Because the text states, and the feast of harvest, the first fruits of thy labors which thou sowest in the field. I thus know that it shall be before the harvest which thou sowest. Whence do I know that it shall be before that which grew of itself? Because the text states, in the field, I thus know that it shall be before that which grew in the field. But whence do I know that it shall also be before that which grew on the roof, or among ruins, or in a plant pot, or in a Ship because the text states the first fruits of all that is in their land, and whence do I know that it shall be before the drink offerings of the new fruits and the new fruits of the tree? Because it says here the first fruits of thy labors, and it says there when thou gatherest in thy labors out of the field, as there it includes the fruits for the drink offerings and the fruits of the tree. So here it includes the drink offerings and the fruits of the tree. Now it's stated above that which grew on the roof or among ruins or in a plant pot or in a ship. This last clause refers to meal offerings to this Arabi Ahab of the saying, but then it says in that same verse, everyone that is clean in thy house may eat thereof, so that it cannot refer to meal offerings, since meal offerings may be eaten only by the males of the priesthood. Our Meshachi replied, There are two ordinances in this verse shall be thine, and everyone that is clean in thy house may eat thereof. How are they? To be explained, the latter refers to the first fruits and the former to meal offerings. Are as she said, the entire verse speaks of meal offerings, but the latter part refers to the priestly portion of the cakes of the thank offering. There is also the following dispute on the matter. Are you had said if one brought these fruits, they are not consecrated as first fruits, but Rush Lakish said if he brought them, they are consecrated as first fruits, for they are considered in the same light as a lean beast that was offered for an offering. Now Rush Lakish's view is clear as he states his reason for it, but what is the reason for Are you view? Our Eliezer replied, I saw Are you in a dream, so I am sure that I will say an excellent thing. The verse says of the first, but not all the first fruits. It also says from thy land, but not from every part of thy land. And to what purpose does Rush Lakish apply this expression from thy land? He requires it for the exposition given in the following. Barith Argamaliel son of Rabbi says the word land is stated here and the word land is stated there as there it refers to the species for which the land was famed so here it refers to the species for which the land was famed and the other for that exposition the expression land is sufficient but there is also written from thy land and the other he does not accept as separate expositions land and from thy land one Barith taught a man may bring the produce grown on a roof or among ruins or in a plant pot or in a ship as first fruits and also make the recital but another Barith taught he may bring it but does not make the recital now according to Rush Lakish there is no contradiction between the rulings concerning the produce grown on a roof for one Barith speaks of the roof of a cave and the other of the roof of a house likewise there is no contradiction between the rulings concerning what is grown among ruins for one Barith speaks of ruins that have been tilled and the other of ruins that have not been tilled likewise there is no contradiction between the rulings concerning what is grown in a plant pot for one berry that speaks of a perforated pot and the other of an unperforated pot likewise there is no contradiction between the rulings concerning what is grown in a ship for one berry that speaks of a ship made of wood and the other of a ship made of clay talmud mosmanico that there is here however a difficulty for our yohanan t
Fields in the south and which had been broken up for the purpose for upon these fields the sun rises and upon these the sun sets how was the field prepared in the first year it was broken up and in the second year it was plowed twice and it was sown seventy days before the Passover so that it might be close upon the increasing strength of the sun thus it would bring forth stocks one span long and ears two spans long it was then reaped bound into sheep's threshed window cleansed ground and sifted and then brought to the temple treasurer the temple treasurer would thrust his hand into it if some dust came up in his hand he would say to him who brought it go and sift it a second time in the name of our Nathan it is said the temple treasurer used to smear his hand with oil and thrust it into the flour until he had brought up all the dust now it expressly stated above and in the second year it was plowed twice but even as you would have it is not this in conflict. With our mission for our mission does not say twice Talmud, Mas Menikoth B. Whilst this Beretha expressly says twice this is no difficulty for in the one case the field had been tilled in the first year and in the other it had not been tilled how is it then with regard to our original question come and here for it was taught half of the field was broken up and the other half sown and in the following year half of it was broken up and the other half sown are Yohanan said the Omer. Offering was brought only from the produce of fields in the south of the land of Israel upon which the sun rises and upon which the sun sets half of the field was broken up while the other half was sown it was taught Abbasal said the Omer offering was usually brought from the produce of the valley of Beth Makli which was an area that produced three seah as it lay in the south and the sun rose upon it and the sun set upon it half of it was broken up while the other half was sown and in. The following year half of it was broken up and the other half was sown. Arhil Kiabi Tobi had a piece of land one half he broke up and the other half he sowed and similarly in the following year one half he broke up and the other half he sowed it thus brought forth twofold and he sold the wheat for fine flour if it had become maggoty it is invalid. Our rabbis taught if the greater part of the fine flour became maggoty it is invalid if the greater part of the wheat became maggoty it is invalid. Our Jeremiah inquired does it mean the greater part of each grain of wheat or the greater part of the SEI of wheat the question remains undecided. Robber raised this question if a man consecrated maggoty flour for a meal offering does he incur stripes for consecrating a blemished thing or not since it is unfit for the offering it is like a blemished animal or shall we say that the prohibition of a blemished thing applies only to animals the question remains undecided we have learned. Elsewhere any wood in which was found a worm is unfit to be burnt upon the altar Samuel said this was taught only if found in damp wood but in dry wood it can be scraped away and the wood is valid robber raised the question if a man consecrated it does he incur stripes for consecrating a blemished thing or not since it is unfit it is like a blemished animal or shall we say that the prohibition of a blemished thing applies only to animals this too remains undecided Mishnah to co ranks. First for the quality of its oil Abbasal says second to it is Egypt beyond the Jordan the oil of the whole land was valid but they used to bring it only from these places one may not bring it from a manured field or from an irrigated field or from olive trees planted in a field sown with seeds but if one did bring it from these it was valid one may not bring and and yet if one did bring it it was valid one may not bring it from olive berries which had been soaked in water or preserved. Or stewed, and if one did bring it, it was invalid. Gemara and Job sent to Tako and fetched thence a wise woman. Why did Tako Aryohan and said, Because they were accustomed to olive oil, wisdom could be found among them. Our rabbis taught and let him dip his foot in oil. This refers to the territory of Asher, which flowed with oil like a fountain. It is related that once the people of Laodicea were in need of oil, they appointed an agent and instructed him, Go and purchase for us a hundred myriad manas. Worth of oil, he came first to Jerusalem and was told, Go to Tyre. He came to Tyre and was told, Go to Gushalab. When he came to Gushalab, he was told, Go to so and so in that field. He went there and found a man breaking up the earth around his olive trees. The agent said to him, Have you a hundred myriad manas worth of oil that I require? Yes, replied the other, But wait until I finish my work. He waited until the other had finished his work. After he had finished his work, he threw his tools on. His back and went on his way removing the stones from his path as he went the agent thought to himself has this man really got a hundred myriad manas worth of oil I see that the Jews have merely made game of me as soon as he reached his hometown that man's maidservant brought out to him a bowl of hot water and he washed his hands and his feet she then brought out to him a golden bowl of oil and he dipped in it his hands and his feet thus fulfilling the verse and let him dip his feet in oil. After they had eaten and drunk the man measured out to the agent a hundred myriad manas worth of oil and then asked do you perhaps need any more oil I do indeed replied the agent but I have no more money with me well if you wish to buy more take it and I will go back with you for the money said the man he then measured out for him another eighteen myriad manas worth of oil it is said that he hired every horse mule camel and asked that he could find in all the land of Israel when he reached. His hometown all the townspeople came out to meet him and applaud him do not applaud me he said to them but this man my companion who measured out for me a hundred myriad manas worth of oil and whom I still owe eighteen myriad manas this illustrates the verse there is that pretendeth himself rich yet hath nothing there is that pretendeth himself for yet hath great wealth one may not bring it from a manure field etc but has it not been taught that one may not bring and fake an Talmud. Mas Menikoth and if one did bring it it was invalid for it is only the sap of the olive our Joseph answered it is no difficulty one teaching represents the view of our high and the other represents the view of our Simeon son of Rabbi for our high used to throw it away while our Simeon son of Rabbi used to dip his food in it and in order to remember this think of the saying the rich are parsimonious six months with oil of myrrh what is oil of myrrh our high said it is stacky our Jeremiah be. Abba said it is oil from olives not if they're grown it was taught our Judah says and fakin is the oil of olives not if they're grown and why is it used for smearing because it removes the hair and softens the skin one may not bring it from olive berries which had been soaked in water our rabbis taught oil from olives which had been preserved or stewed or soaked in water or oil from the olive drakes or from foul smelling olives may not be brought and if it was brought it is invalid rabbi raised it. Question if a man consecrated it does he incur stripes for consecrating a blemished thing or not since it is unfit it is like a blemished animal or shall we say that the prohibition of a blemished thing applies only to animals this question remains undecided mission there are three periods of gathering in the olives and each crop gives three kinds of oil the first crop of olives is when the olives are picked from the top of the tree they are pounded and put into the basket our Judah says. Around the basket, this gives the first oil there, then pressed with the beam. Our Judah says with stones, this gives the second oil there, then ground and pressed again. This gives the third oil. The first oil I ask fit for the candlestick and the others for meal offerings. The second crop is when the olives at roof level are picked from the tree there, pounded and put into the basket. Our Judah says around the basket, this gives the first oil there, then pressed with the beam. Our Judah says with stones, this gives the second oil there, then ground and pressed again. This gives the third oil. The first oil I ask fit for the candlestick and the others for meal offerings. The third crop is when the last olives of the tree are packed in the vat until they become overripe there, then taken up and dried on the roof and then pounded and put into the basket. Our Judah says around the basket, this gives the first oil there, next pressed with the beam. Our Judah says with stones, this gives the second. Oil there then ground and pressed again this gives the third oil the first oil I asked fit for the candlestick and the others for meal offerings Gemara it was asked does a mission read Megadro or Megadro come in here for it was taught olive oil that is from the olive tree hence they said the first crop is when the fully ripe olives are picked from the top of the tree they are brought into the olive press or ground in a mill and put into baskets the oil which uses out is the first kind of oil there then pressed with the beam and the oil which uses out is the second kind and they are taken out of the olive press and ground and pressed again this gives the third kind the first kind is fit for the candlestick and the others for meal offerings the same procedure applies to the second crop of olives the third crop of olives is when the last olives of the tree are packed in the vat until they become overripe they are then taken up onto the roof and dried in the same Manner as dates until the juice has run off there then brought into the olive press or ground in a mill and put into baskets and the oil which uses out is the first kind of oil there then pressed with the beam and the oil which uses out is the second kind and they are taken out of the olive
Offerings by right it could be inferred by the following argument that meal offerings etc. are rabbis taught it is written pure and the expression pure means nothing else but clear our Judah says it is written beaten and the expression beaten means nothing else but pounded I might then think that this pounded oil is not valid for meal offerings therefore the text states and a tenth part of an ephah of fine flour mingled with the fourth part of a hen of beaten oil why then did the text state? For the light out of regard to the sparing of expense what is meant by out of regard to the sparing said our Eliezer the Torah wished to spare Israel unnecessary expense command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure olive oil beaten for the light our Samuel be he said unto thee but not unto me for I am not in need of light the table was on the north side and the candlestick on the south side our Zerika said in the name of our Eliezer I am not in need of food and I am not in need of light and for the house he made windows broad and narrow broad without and narrow within for I am not in need of light without the veil of the testimony in the tent of meeting it is a testimony to mankind that the divine presence rests in Israel for how can you say he is in need of light when the whole of the forty years that the Israelites traveled in the wilderness they traveled only by his light but it is a testimony to mankind that the divine presence rests in Israel what is it? Testimony Rab said it was the western lamp of the candlestick into which the same quantity of oil was poured as into the others yet he kindled the others from it and ended with it Mishnah from whence did they bring the wine Kirum and Adalim rank first for the quality of their wine second to them are Beth Rum of Beth Laban on the hill and Kfar Signa in the valley wine of the whole land was valid but they used to bring it only from these places one may not bring it from a manured field or from an irrigated field or from vines planted in a field sown with seeds but if one did bring it from these it was valid one may not bring wine from sun-dried grapes but if one did bring it it was valid one may not bring old wine so rabbi but the sages permitted one may not bring sweet wine or smoked wine or cooked wine and if one did bring it it was invalid one may not bring wine from the grapes of the espalier but only from the vines growing from the ground and from well cultivated vineyards one did not put the wine in large casks but in small barrels and one did not fill the barrels to the brim so that it scent might spread one may not take the wine at the mouth of the barrel because of talmud moss manicotha the scum nor that at the bottom because of the least but one should take it only from the middle third of the barrel how was it tested the temple treasurer used to sit nearby with his stick in his hand when the froth burst forth he would knock with his stick are Jose son of Arjuna says wine on which there is a scum is invalid for it is written they shall be unto you without blemish and their meal offering and they shall be unto you without blemish and their drink offerings tomorrow one may not bring sweet wine or smoked wine or cooked wine and if one did bring it it was invalid but does not the Mishnah state in an earlier clause one may not bring wine from sun-dried grapes but if one did bring it it was valid Robin answered combine them and learn them together are as she answered if the sweetness is by reason of the sun it is not nauseous but if the sweetness is in the fruit itself it is nauseous one may not bring old wine so rabbi but the sages permit it as said what is the reason for rabbi's view because the verse reads for a lamb wine as a lamb for an offering may be only one year old so wine may be only one year old and it should follow should it not that as a lamb that is two years old is invalid so wine that is two years old is invalid and should you say that it is indeed so but it has been taught one may not bring wine that is two years old but if one did bring it it was valid now who is it that rules that one may not bring old wine obviously rabbi yet it says but if one did bring it it was valid rather said rabbi this is the reason for rabbi's view it is written look not thou upon the wine when it is red one may not bring wine from the grapes of the espalier etc a tan taught it must come from vineyards that are cultivated twice in the year our joseph once had a garden plot which he used to give an extra hoeing and it produced wine that could take twice the usual amount of water one did not put the wine in large casks a tan taught by barrels are meant the medium-sized pitcher-shaped lydian vessels they should not be put away in twos but singly how was it tested the temple treasurer used to sit nearby with his stick in his hand when the froth burst forth he would knock with his stick a tana. Taught when the froth of the leaves burst forth the temple treasurer would knock with his stick and why did he not say so this supports Aryohan and for Aryohan and said in the same way as speech is beneficial to the spices so is speech injurious to wine our Jose son of our Judah says etc Aryohan and raised the question if a man consecrated it does he incur stripes for consecrating a blemished thing or not since it is unfit it is like a blemished animal or shall we say that the prohibition of a blemished thing applies only to animals this question remains undecided our rabbis taught rams were brought from Moab lambs from Hebron calves from Sharon and ducks from the royal mountain our Judah said one should bring lambs whose height was equal to their breadth Rabbi son of Arshila said what is the reason for our Judah's view for it is written in that day shall thy cattle feed the broad lambs it is written I have set watchmen upon thy walls O Jerusalem they shall never hold their peace day nor night Yet yeah, that are the Lord's remembrances take ye no rest what do they say Rabbi son of Arshila said they say thou wilt arise and have compassion upon Zion Arnam and B. Isaac said they say the Lord doth build up Jerusalem and what did they say before this Rabbi son of Arshila said they used to say for the Lord hath chosen Zion he hath desired it for his habitation chapter X mission there were two dry measures in the temple the tenth and the half tenth Armeir says a tenth another tenth and a half tenth for what purpose did the tenth measure serve by it one used to measure the meal offerings one did not measure with the three tenths measure the meal offering for a bullock or with the two tenths measure the meal offering for a ram but one measured them by so many tenths for what purpose did the half tenth measure serve by it one used to measure the griddle cakes of the high priest which was offered to half in the morning and the half towards evening tomorrow it was taught Armeir used to say wherefore does the text state a tenth a tenth for every lamb to teach you that there were two tenth measures in the temple one heaped and the other level with the heaped measure they used to measure all meal offerings Talmud, Mos Medicoth be with the level measure they used to measure the griddle cakes of the high priest but the sages said there was but one tenth measure there as it is said and one tenth for every lamb wherefore then does the text state a tenth a tenth in order to include the half tenth whence does our measure derive the half tenth measure he derives it from the expression and one tenth and the rabbis they base no exposition upon the letter Bob and, and for what purpose does our measure apply the verse and one tenth for every lamb to teach that one should not measure with the three tenths measure the meal offering for a bullock or with the two tenths measure the meal offering for a ram and the rabbis they derive it from the dot above the word for it has been taught our Jose said wherefore is there a dot above the bob in the middle of the first Israel stated in connection with the offerings for the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles to teach that one may not measure with the three tenths measure the meal offering for a bullock or with the two tenths measure the meal offering for a ram and our mayor he bases no exposition upon the dot above the word for what purpose did the half tenth measure serve by it one used to measure the griddle cakes of the high priest one used to measure but I can point out a contradiction for we have learned the griddle cakes of the high priest must not be brought in two separate halves but he must bring a whole tenth and then divide it our sheet answered the expression measure that is used is to be understood in the sense of divide Rami Biham inquired of our Hista was the half tenth according to our mayor heat measure or level measure Nimon half griddle cakes of the high priest table but you might ask the same question according to the rabbis indeed so and according to the rabbis the question is as regards the tent as well was it heap or level he replied from our Meir's statement in one case we can understand the view of our Meir in the other and also from our Meir's statement we can understand the view of the rabbis thus since our Meir stated that the tent measure used for measuring the meal offering of the high priest was level we know that the half tent measure was also level and since according to our Meir both measures were level according to the rabbis too they were both level Rami Bihama further inquired of our Hista how were the griddle cakes of the high priest divided into cakes by hand or by a utensil surely it is obvious that it was divided by hand for should you say by a utensil would one bring in scales into the temple but why not bring it in it is not proper to do so since it is stated in connection with the curses Rami Bihama further Inquired of Arhista with the table hallow the handfuls placed as a pile upon it or not shall we say since it hallows the shoe bread it would hallow the handfuls too or it only hallows what is prescribed for it but not what is not prescribed for it he replied it would not hallow them but this c
of a log and a half by which one used to measure the oil for the griddle cakes of the high priest a log and a half in the morning and a log and a half towards evening they said to him but there was there the half log measure and one could therefore measure it with the half log measure he replied in that case even according to your view there was no need for the half log measure for since there was there the quarter log measure it was possible to measure it with the quarter log but the following rule was established in the temple the vessel that served for one measure did not serve for another measure our Eliezer B. Arzotic says there were markings in the hidden measure indicating us far for a bullock thus far for a ram and thus far for a lamb what is the difference between our Meir and our Judah our Yohanan said there is a difference between them as regards the overflow of the measures he who counts the measures from below upwards is of the opinion that the overflow of the measures was also holy for the all-merciful gave unto Moses a quarter log measure and instructed him to calculate the larger measures by including the overflow of the smaller measure but he who counts the measures from the top downwards is of the opinion that the overflow of the measures was not holy for the all-merciful gave unto Moses a hidden measure and instructed him to calculate the smaller measures by excluding the overflow of the larger measure and they said all may be of the opinion that the overflow of the measures was either holy or not holy but they differ as to the meaning of the word full he who counts the measures from the top downwards maintains that the word full implies that it may be neither less than the prescribed measure nor more but he who counts the measures from below upwards maintains that the word full implies that it may not be less than the prescribed measure but if it is more it is still regarded as full the master said our Simeon says there was no hint. Measure there at all our Simeon is surely quite right in his argument with the rabbis what can the rabbis reply there was a hin measure used by Moses in the preparation of the anointing oil as it is written and of olive oil a hin now one is of the opinion that since it was not necessary for later generations it was only made for that occasion and thereafter hidden away but the other is of the opinion that once it was put to a use it remained as a measure the master said what then can I put in its place but is it absolutely essential to substitute another as Robin has said elsewhere there is a tradition that among the offerings of the congregation only to require the laying on of hands similarly here there is a tradition that there were seven liquid measures in the temple our Eliezer son of Arzotic says there were markings in the hin measure does he not then accept the tradition of seven liquid measures he does not alternatively I can say by seven measures he understood seven measurings Mishnah for what purpose did the quarter log serve to measure a quarter log of water for the leper and a quarter log of oil for the Nazi right for what purpose did the half log serve to measure a half log of water for the suspected woman and a half log of oil for the thank offering with the log one measured the oil for all the meal offerings even a meal offering of 60 tenths required 60 logs of oil our Eliezer B. Jacob says even a meal offering of 60 tenths required only one log of oil for it is written for a meal offering and a log of oil six logs were required for a bullet four for a ram and three for a lamb three logs and a half for the candlestick a half log for each lamp Gemara Rabbi was sitting and raised this difficulty wherefore was the quarter log measure anointed if it was in order to hallow the quarter log of water of the leper Talmud Mos Menachoth but that was outside the camp and if to hallow the quarter log of oil of the Nazi right but the bread Offering of the Nazi right was hallowed only by the slaughtering of the ram said to him our high by one measured the oil for the griddle cakes of the high priest a quarter log of oil for each cake rabbi then applied to him the verse the man of my council from a far country for what purpose did the half log serve rabbi was sitting and raised this difficulty wherefore was the half log measure anointed if it was in order to hallow the water used in the case of a suspected woman but was it unconsecrated water that was used is it not written holy water and if to hallow the half log of oil of the thank offering but the bread of the thank offering was hallowed only by the slaughtering of the thank offering said to him our Simeon rabbi son by it the priest divided the oil for the candlestick a half log for each lamp rabbi then exclaimed the lamp of Israel it was so indeed our Yohanan said in the name of rabbi if a lamp had gone out both the oil and the wick have become unfit what must he do he must clean it out put in a fresh oil and a fresh wick and relight it our Zerika was sitting and asked the following question when he puts in fresh oil does he put in the same quantity of oil as at first or only the quantity needed for the remainder of the night it is obvious said our Jeremiah that he puts in as much oil as at first for should you say only the quantity needed for the remainder of the night the question will be asked how do we know how much is needed but should you say that it can be measured then there must have been not only seven measures but numerous measures our Zerika thereupon applied to our Jeremiah the verse and in thy majesty prosper right on on behalf of truth and meekness and righteousness and so it has been stated our Abba said in the name of our Yohanan others say our Abba said it in the name of our Hanan who said it in the name of Rabbi of lamp had gone out both the oil and the wick have become unfit what must he do he must clean it out Put in fresh oil as much as at first put in a fresh wick and relight it. Our Hunah, the son of Rab Judah, said in the name of Arshis, hate the lamp at the top of each branch of the candlestick in the temple was flexible. He is of the opinion that the expressions of talent and beaten work apply to the candlestick and also to the lamps. And since the latter had to be cleaned out, were they not flexible? They could not very well be cleaned out. An objection was raised. How did he do it? He removed the lamps from the candlestick and put them in a cleansing mixture. He then dried them with a sponge, put oil in them, and lit them. He agrees with the following tenet: for it was taught the sages say they did not move it. The lamp from its place at all. Does this mean to imply that it could be moved if one wanted to do so? Say rather they could not move it from its place at all. Who are the sages? Our Eliezer, son of Arzotic, is meant for it was taught. Our Eliezer, son of Arzotic, says there was a kind of thin. Plate of gold over each lamp when cleaning out the lamp the priest used to press it down towards the mouth of the lamp and when putting oil in it he used to press it down towards the back of the lamp and this matter is the subject of dispute between the following ten aim for it was taught the candlestick and the lamps were made out of the talent but the tongs and the snuff dishes were not made out of the talent our Nehemiah said the candlestick only was made out of the talent but neither the lamps nor the tongs nor the snuff dishes were made out of the talent wherein do they differ in the exposition of the following verse for it was taught of a talent of pure gold shall it be made we thus learn that the candlestick was made out of the talent but once do I know that it included the lamps too because scripture says with all these vessels then I might think that it included even the tongs and the snuff dishes the text therefore states that this is the opinion of our Nehemiah but is there not here a contradiction between the two statements of our Nehemiah two tenaim differ as to our Nehemiah's view our Joshua B. Korha says the candlestick was made out of the talent but neither the lamps nor the tongs nor the snuff dishes were made out of the talent how then do I interpret the words with all these vessels that the vessels were of gold but that they were of gold is expressly stated in the verses and thou shalt make the lamps thereof seven and they shall light the lamps thereof too. Give light over against it and the tongs thereof and the snuff dishes thereof shall be of pure gold the former verse was stated only for the sake of the mouth of the lamp for I might have thought that since the mouth of the lamp becomes black the Torah has consideration for the money of Israel Talmud, Mos Menachoth and therefore it may be made of any kind of gold the verse therefore teaches us that it too must be of pure gold a half log of oil for the thank offering it was taught our Akiba says why is the expression with oil stated twice had the verse stated with oil once only I should have said that it was like all other meal offerings in respect of the log of oil but now that with oil is stated twice there is here an amplification following an amplification and whenever an amplification follows an amplification it implies limitation thus the verse has impliedly reduced the quantity of oil to a half log but is there here an amplification following another amplification there is only one amplification here rather the argument is this had not the verse stated with oil at all I should have said that it was like all other meal offerings in respect of the log of oil but now that with oil is stated twice there is here an amplification following an amplification and whenever an amplification follows another amplification it implies limitation thus the verse has reduced the quantity of oil to a half log I might think that this half log of oil was to be divided equally among the three kinds of cakes namely the cakes of wafers and the soaked cakes but since the verse stated with oil with the soaked cakes which was quite unnecessary it thereby increased the quantity of oil for the soaked cakes how then was it divided a half log of oil was to be brought and divided into halves one half to be used for the cakes and wafers and the other half for the soaked c
We do not find they say that he should be exempt entirely from the offering and for what exposition do the rabbis require the words for a meal offering and a log of oil in Edom to teach that whosoever makes a free will offering of a meal offering shall bring nothing less than the quantity for which one log of oil is prescribed and that is one tenth and the others both teachings they say can be derived from these words six logs were required for a bullock four for a ram and three for a lamb how do we know this because it is written and their drink offering shall be half a hin of wine for a bullock and a hin has twelve logs for it is written and of olive oil a hin and it is also written that say shall be a holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generations the numerical value of say being twelve three logs and a half for the candlestick a half log for each lamp whence is this derived our rabbis taught it is written to burn from evening to morning provide it with its requisite measure so that it may burn from evening to morning another interpretation from evening to morning you have no other service that is valid from evening to morning save this alone and the sages have calculated that a half log of oil will burn from evening to morning some say that they calculated it by reducing the original quantity of oil while others say that they calculated it by increasing it those who say that they calculated it by increasing the quantity of oil adopt the principle that the torah has consideration for the money of israel and those who say that they calculated it by reducing it adopt the principle that there is no poverty in the place of wealth mission one may mix the drink offerings of bullocks with the drink offerings of rams or the drink offerings of lambs with the drink offerings of other lambs or those of an individual offering with those of a communal offering talmud mosmenikov or those of an offering offered today with those of an offering offered yesterday but one may not mix the drink offerings of lambs with the drink offerings of bullocks or of rams if after each was mingled by itself they were mixed together they are valid but if before each was mingled by itself they were mixed together they are invalid although the meal offering of the lamb that was offered with the omer was doubled its drink offerings were not doubled tomorrow one may mix etc i can point out a contradiction to this for it has been taught and he shall burn it this intimates that he shall not mix the fat portions of one sacrifice with the fat portions of another are and answered the mission only speaks of the case where they had been mixed but one may not mix the drink offerings of lambs with the drink offerings of bullocks or of rams that is even though they had been mixed they are not valid but surely since it states in the next clause if after each was mingled by itself they were mixed together they are valid it follows that the first clause teaches that they may be mixed together in the first instance of a therefore answered the mission means to say this one may mix the one offerings together if the flour and oil had already been mixed together but may not one mix the one offerings in the first instance but it has been taught this rule applies only to the flour and oil but one may mix the one offerings rather said of a if the flour and oil of the two offerings have already been burnt upon the altar one may then mix the one offerings in the first instance if they have not yet been burnt but they have been mixed together one may mix the one offerings but if they have not been mixed together one may not mix the one offerings for this might lead to the mixing of the flour and oil in the first instance although the meal offering of the lamb that was offered with the omer etc are rabbis taught and the meal offering thereof shall be two tenth parts this Teaches us that the meal offering of the lamb that was offered with the omer was doubled. I might then think that as its meal offering was doubled, so its wine was also doubled. The text therefore stated, and the drink offering thereof shall be of wine. The fourth part of it, I might further think that its wine was not doubled since it was not mingled with the meal offering, but its oil I say was doubled, seeing that it was mingled with the meal offering. The text therefore stated, and the drink offering thereof, thus intimating that all the drink offerings thereof shall be the fourth part of it. How is this intimated in the verse? Our Eliezer said, because it is written, we misca and we read it, we misco. Now, what is the explanation thereof? The drink offering of the meal offering, namely the oil, shall be equal to the drink offering of the lamb, namely the wine, and as of wine there was the fourth part of it, so of oil there was the fourth part of it. Are you said, if the guilt? Offering of a leper was slaughtered under any name other than its own, it still requires the drink offerings, for should you not say so, you would render it invalid. Armin Ashia begat Adamert in that case, if the lamb that is offered with the omer was slaughtered under any name other than its own, its meal offering should nevertheless be doubled, for should you not say so, you would render it invalid. Furthermore, if the daily morning offering was slaughtered under any name other than its own, it should nevertheless require the offering of two logs of wood by a priest, for should you not say so, you would render it invalid. And furthermore, if the daily evening offering was slaughtered under any name other than its own, it should nevertheless require the offering of two logs of wood by two priests, for should you not say so, you would render it invalid. It is indeed so, for Abbe has said he stated, but one of several cases, Rabbi said it is not so, for in the latter cases the offerings are burnt. Offerings Talmud, Mos Menikothe, and if they are not admissible as the original obligatory burnt offerings, they are nevertheless admissible as free will burnt offerings. But here in the case of the guilt offering of a leper, if you do not regard it as the originally named offering, it cannot be offered at all, for there is no such thing as a free will guilt offering. There has been taught a very that is in accord with our Yohanan. If the guilt offering of a leper was slaughtered under any name other than its own, or if the priest did not apply some of the blood upon the thumb and great toe of a leper, it is nevertheless offered upon the altar, and it requires drink offerings. But the leper must bring another guilt offering to render him permitted mission. All the measures in the temple were heaped, excepting that used for the high priest's meal offering, which included in itself the heap measure. The overflow of the liquid measures was holy, but the overflow of the dry. Measures was not holy, our Akiba said the liquid measures were holy, therefore their overflow was holy too. The dry measures were not holy, therefore their overflow was not holy. Our Jose said it is not on that account, but because liquids are stirred up and dry stuffs are not Gemara, who is the author of our mission, should you say our measure, but according to him only one measure was heaped up, and should you say the rabbis, but according to them there was only one tenth measure, and that was leveled R. It's not answered indeed it is our measure, but the expression all the measures means all the measurings, the overflow of the liquid measures was holy. What is the point at issue between them? The first tenet is of the opinion that the liquid measures were anointed both inside and outside, but the dry measures were anointed inside only, but not outside. Our Akiba is of the opinion that the liquid measures were anointed both inside and outside, but the dry measures were not anointed at all. Our Jose is of it. Opinion that both the liquid measures and the dry measures were anointed inside only and not outside, but this is the reason for the ruling of our mission. Liquids are stirred up and therefore the overflow comes from the inside of the vessel, but dry stuffs are not stirred up at all. But even if liquids are stirred up, what does it matter? The man surely intends to hallow only that which he requires said Ardini Bishishan in the name of Rab. This proves that vessels of ministry can hallow even without the owner's intention. Rabbana, however, said I can still hold that vessels of ministry hallow only with the owner's intention. Nevertheless, the overflow is deemed to be holy, for otherwise it is to be feared that people will say that one may take out what has already been in a vessel of ministry for secular use. Our zero raised the following objection we have learned if he set the shoe bread and the dishes of frankincense on the day after the Sabbath and burnt the dishes of frankincense. On the next Sabbath it is not valid what should he do he should leave it until the following Sabbath for even if it remains many days on the table there is no harm but why is it allowed to be left for a longer period might not people say that one may allow holy things to remain in a vessel of ministry you surely cannot point out a contradiction between what is performed inside and what is performed outside what is performed inside not everybody is aware of but what is performed outside everybody is aware of we have learned elsewhere the surplus of the drink offerings was used for the altars dessert what is meant by the surplus of the drink offerings are high B. Joseph said it is the overflow of the measures are you and said it is as we have learned if a man had undertaken to supply fine flour at four seahs sella and the price subsequently stood at three seahs sella he must still supply it at four talmud mas B. if he had undertaken to supply it at Three and the price subsequently stood at four. He must apply it at four for the temple has always the upper hand. There has been taught a very though which agrees with our high B. Joseph, and there has also been taught a very though which agrees with our Yohan, and there has been taught a very though which agrees with our high B. Joseph. This what did they do with the overflow of the measures? If there was another animal offering, it may be offered with it, and if it had been kept overnight, it is thereby rendered invalid. Otherwise, it is offered as dessert for the
Guilt offering, but the text stated in fulfillment of a vow clearly uttered or as a free will offering that which is offered in fulfillment of a vow or as a free will offering requires drink offerings, but that which is not offered in fulfillment of a vow or as a free will offering does not require drink offerings. The implication being to exclude the above, I would then exclude also the obligatory offerings that are offered on account of the festival on the festival, namely the appearance burnt offerings. And the festival peace offerings, but the text stated or in your appointed seasons, whatever is offered on your appointed seasons requires drink offerings. The implication being to include the above, I would then include the goats for sin offerings since they are offered as an obligation on the festival, but the text stated and when thou preparest the bullock for a burnt offering, now the bullock was included in the general law, why then was it singled out to teach you that everything be compared? With it as the bullock is distinguished in that it may be offered either in fulfillment of a vow or as a free will offering, so everything that is offered either in fulfillment of a vow or as a free will offering requires drink offerings. Wherefore did the text state to make a sweet savor unto the Lord of the herd or of the flock? It is because it says a burnt offering, and that I would have said included the burnt offering of a bird. The text therefore stated of the herd or of the flock thereby. Excluding the burnt offering of a bird, so our Josiah our Jonathan says this is quite unnecessary for the text stated a sacrifice, and the burnt offering is no sacrifice. Wherefore then did the text state of the herd or of the flock? It is because it is said previously, when any man of you bringeth an offering unto the Lord, ye shall bring your offering of the cattle even of the herd and of the flock. Now I might have thought that if a man said I take upon myself to offer a burnt offering, he must bring. One animal from each of the two kinds the text therefore stated here of the herd or of the flock if he so desires he brings one animal or if he so desires two but why according to our Jonathan is any verse necessary to teach this has he not said unless the verse expressly states together it is necessary for I might have said that Talmud, Mos Menikotha since it is written there and of the flock it is as though the expression together had been used then according to our Josiah who says that even though the expression together is not expressly used it is interpreted as though together had been used the verse is surely necessary to teach that both need not be brought there is written if his offering be a burnt offering of the herd and there is also written and if his offering be of the flock and the other I might have thought that that was so only when a man expressly said so but when he did not say so expressly I would say that he must bring from each of the two kinds we are. Therefore taught otherwise the master stated and whence the thank offering because the text added or a sacrifice but is not the thank offering also a sacrifice I might have thought that since it is accompanied by a bread offering it does not require the drink offerings but wherein does it differ from the Nazi right ram which is accompanied by a bread offering and yet requires the drink offerings I might have thought that only there where the bread offering consists only of two kinds are drink offerings required but not here where it consists of four kinds we are therefore taught otherwise but the divine law should only have stated in fulfillment of a vow clearly uttered or as a free will offering and it need not have stated a burnt offering had not the divine law stated a burnt offering I should have said that the expression and yet will make an offering by fire unto the Lord was a general proposition in fulfillment of a vow clearly uttered or as a free will offering a Specification and to make a sweet savor another general proposition we would thus have two general propositions separated by a specification in which case everything that is similar to the matter specified would be included and as the matter specified is distinguished in that it is an offering not brought in atonement for any sin so every offering that is not brought in atonement for any sin would require drink offerings I would thus exclude from drink offerings the sin offering and the guilt offering as they are brought in atonement for a sin but I would include the firstling the tithe of cattle and the Passover offering as they are not brought in atonement for any sin the text therefore stated a burnt offering but now that scripture has stated a burnt offering what then is there left to be included by the general propositions and the specification the inference from the specification is made thus as the matter specified is an offering which one is under no Obligation to offer so every offering which one is under no obligation to offer requires drink offerings this includes for drink offerings the young of consecrated animals and their substitutes the burnt offering brought out of the surplus the guilt offering condemned to pasture and all offerings that were slaughtered under any name other than their own now that you have established that the term or was inserted for an exposition was there any need for the term or in the expression in fulfillment of a vow clearly uttered or as a free will offering to indicate disjunction it was necessary for without or I might have thought that unless one brought an offering in fulfillment of a vow and also a free will offering one would not have to bring drink offerings we are therefore taught that if one brings an offering in fulfillment of a vow alone one must bring drink offerings and so too if one brings a free will offering alone one must bring drink offerings this is quite in order According to our Josiah, but what need was there for that term? According to our Jonathan, it was necessary for without, or I might have thought that if one brought an offering in fulfillment of a vow alone, one must bring drink offerings, and if one brought a free will offering alone, one must bring drink offerings. But if one brought an offering in fulfillment of a vow and also a free will offering, it is sufficient if the drink offerings are brought for one only. We are therefore taught otherwise. And what need was there for the term, or in the expression, or in your appointed seasons? It was necessary for without it, I might have thought that that was so only where one brought a burnt offering in fulfillment of a vow and a free will peace offering, or vice versa. But where one brought a burnt offering and a peace offering, both in fulfillment of a vow or both as free will offering, since there is only one class of offering here, is in fulfillment of a vow or free will offerings, it is sufficient if. The drink offerings for one only are brought we are therefore taught otherwise and what need was there for the or in the verse and when thou preparest a bullock for a burnt offering or for a sacrifice it was necessary for without it I might have thought that that was so only where one brought a burnt offering and a peace offering both in fulfillment of a vow or both as free will offerings but where one brought two burnt offerings one in fulfillment of a vow and one as a free will offering or two peace offerings one in fulfillment of a vow and one as a free will offering since there is only one type of offering here is a peace offering or the burnt offering it is sufficient if the drink offerings for one only are brought we are therefore taught otherwise and what need was there for the or in the expression in fulfillment of a vow clearly uttered or for peace offerings it was necessary for without it I might have thought that that was so only where one brought two burnt Offerings one in fulfillment of a vow and one as a free will offering or two peace offerings one in fulfillment of a vow and one as a free will offering but where one brought two burnt offerings each in fulfillment of a vow or each as a free will offering or two peace offerings each in fulfillment of a vow or each as a free will offering since there is only one type of offering here is the burnt offering or the peace offering it is sufficient if the drink offerings for one only are brought we are therefore taught otherwise and according to our Josiah what need was there for the or in the expression of the herd or of the flock it was necessary for without it I might have thought that that was so only where the two animals were of two kinds but where they were both of one kind it is sufficient if the drink offerings for one only are brought we are therefore taught otherwise and what need was there for the verse so shall you do for everyone according to their number without it. I might have thought that that was so only where the two animals were consecrated one after the other but where they were consecrated simultaneously it is sufficient if the drink offerings for one only are brought we are therefore taught otherwise but the sin offering and the guilt offering of the leper require drink offerings how do we know this our rabbis taught in three tenth parts of an ephah of fine flour for a meal offering this verse refers to the meal offering that is offered with the animal offering you say it refers to the meal offering that is offered with the animal offering but perhaps it is not so but rather it refers to the meal offering that is offered by itself since it says and the priest shall offer the burnt offering and the meal offering you may be sure that the other verse also refers to the meal offering that is offered with the animal offering but I still do not know whether it requires a drink offering of wine or not the text therefore states and wine for the drink offering the fourth part of a hint shalt thou prepare with the burnt offering or for the sacrifice for each lamb the expression the burnt offering refers to the burnt offering of the leper the sacrifice to the sin offering of the leper and or for the sacrifice to the guilt offering of the leper but surely both the sin offering and the guilt offering of the leper can be derived from the sacrifice Talmud, Mos Menikoth before a master has said whence do I know it of it. Sin offering and of the guilt offering because the text states the sacrifice that is so only where both offerings serve the same purpose but where the guilt offering serves to qualify the person and the sin offering to make atonement for him we require
Offering of a woman after childbirth and each to the eleventh of the cattle tithe and this that the accessory should be more weighty than the principle we do not find elsewhere in the whole of the Torah. Rabbi said what case is there that requires three separate terms to include its offerings you must say it is a case of the leper what need was there for the expression for a ram Arshis hate said it includes Aaron's ram but is not Aaron's ram derived from the expression in your appointed seasons no for I might have thought that that applied only to the offerings of the community but not to the offering of an individual but wherein does it differ from the burnt offering of a woman after childbirth I might have thought that only an individual offering which has no fixed time was included but not that which has a fixed time the verse is therefore stated to include Aaron's ram what need is there for the expression or for a ram it includes the plaques this is quite in order. According to our Yohanan who holds that it is a distinct species for we have learned if a man under an obligation to bring a lamb or a ram for his sacrifice offered it a plax he must bring for it the drink offerings as for a ram but he does not thereby discharge the obligation of his sacrifice and our Yohanan said that the expression or for in ram included the plax but according to Barpata who holds that he must bring for it the drink offerings as for a ram and account for the possibilities for it is only a case of doubt it will be asked is a verse ever stated in order to include what is in a condition of doubt this is obviously a difficulty according to Barpata thus shall it be done for each bullet or for each ram or for each of the lambs or of the kids wherefore did the text state for each bullet it is because we find that holy writ distinguished between the drink offerings of a ram and the drink offerings of a lamb and I might have thought that there should also be a distinction between the drink offerings of a bullock and the drink offerings of a calf. The text therefore stated for each bullock. Wherefore did the text state or for each ram? It is because we find that holy writ distinguished between the drink offerings of a sheep in its first year and those of one in its second year. And I might have thought that there should likewise be a distinction between the drink offerings of a sheep in its second year and those of one in its third year. Scripture therefore stated or for each ram. Wherefore did the text state or for each of the lambs? It is because we find that holy writ distinguished between the drink offerings of a lamb and the drink offerings of a ram. And I might have thought that there should likewise be a distinction between the drink offerings of a ewe in its first year and those of a ewe in its second year. The text therefore stated or for each of the lambs. Wherefore did the text state or of the kids? It is because we find. That holy writ distinguished between the drink offerings of a lamb and the drink offerings of a ram, and I might have thought that there should likewise be a distinction between the drink offerings of a kid and those of an older goat. The text therefore stated, or of the kids, our Papa said, Rabba once tested us with the following question Talmud, Mas Menakotha, what is the quantity of drink offerings for you in its second year? And we answered him that this was clearly stated in a mission of it. Seal inscribed with kids signified drink offerings for offerings from the flock, whether large or small, male or female, accepting rams. Mission none of the offerings of the congregation require the laying on of hands, except the bullet that is offered for the transgression by the congregation of any of the commandments. And the scapegoat, our Simeon says also that he goat offered for the sin of idolatry. All the offerings of an individual require the laying on of hands, except the first lingot. Cattle tithe and the Passover offering the heir may lay his hands on his father's offering may bring the drink offerings for it and can substitute another animal for it. Gemara our rabbis taught none of the offerings of the congregation require the laying on of hands except the bullet that is offered for the transgression by the congregation of any of the commandments and that he goats offered for the sin of idolatry so are Simeon but our Judah says that he goats offered for the sin of idolatry. Do not require the laying on of hands what then must I include in their place the scapegoat but is it absolutely necessary to include another in their place Robin answered there is a tradition that among the offerings of the congregation there are two that require the laying on of hands our Simeon said to him is it not the law that the laying on of hands must be performed by the owners of the offering but on that Aaron and his sons lay the hands he replied even in that case the laying on. Of the hands is performed by the owner since Aaron and his sons obtained atonement through it. Or Jeremiah said they are indeed consistent in their views for it has been taught and he shall make atonement for the most holy place. This means the holy of holies and the tent of meeting. This means the holy place and the altar. This is to be taken in its usual sense. He shall make atonement. This means the various temple courts and for the priests. This is to be taken in its usual sense and for all the people of the assembly. This means the Israelites. He shall make atonement. This means the Levites. They are all declared alike in respect of one atonement in that they obtain atonement through the scapegoat for other sins. So are Judah. But our Simeon says just as the blood of the goat that is offered within the holy of holies makes atonement for Israelites for all matters of uncleanness touching the temple and the holy things thereof. So does the blood of the bullet make atonement for the priests. For all matters of uncleanness touching the temple and the holy things thereof, and just as the confession of sin pronounced over the scapegoat makes atonement for Israelites for other sins, so does the confession of sin pronounced over the bullet make atonement for priests for other sins. But according to our Simeon, it will be asked, surely they are declared alike, yes, they are all declared alike, and that they all obtain atonement, but each obtains atonement through its own offering. This means, therefore, that according to our Judah, for transgressions of the laws of uncleanness touching the temple and the holy things thereof, Israelites obtain atonement through the blood of the he goat that is sprinkled within the holy of holies, and priests through Aaron's bullet, and for other sins, all obtain atonement through the confession over the scapegoat. According to our Simeon, even for other sins, priests obtain atonement through the confession pronounced over the bullet, and so it is stated in. The tractate of Yah for all other sins the scapegoat makes atonement alike for Israelites priests and the anointed high priest wherein do Israelites differ from priests and the anointed high priest only in that the blood of the bullock makes atonement for priests for the transgressions of the laws of uncleanness touching the temple and the holy things thereof our Simeon says as the blood of the goat that is sprinkled within the holy of holies makes atonement for the Israelites so does the blood of the bullock make atonement for the priests and as the confession of sin pronounced over the scapegoat makes atonement for the Israelites so does the confession of sin pronounced over the bullock make atonement for the priests our rabbis taught it is written and the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands upon the head of the bullock this signifies that only the bullock requires the laying on of hands but the goats offered for the sin of idolatry do not require the Laying on of hands so are Judah but our Simeon says it signifies that only the bullock requires the laying on of hands by the elders but the he goats offered for the sin of idolatry do not require the laying on of hands by the elders but by Aaron there is however a berry though which conflicts with the above for it was taught it is written the live goat this signifies that only the live goat requires the laying on of hands but the he goats offered for the sin of idolatry do not require the laying on of hands so are Judah but our Simeon says it signifies that only the live goat requires the laying on of hands by Aaron Talmud Mos Menakoth be but the he goats offered for the sin of idolatry do not require the laying on of hands by Aaron but by the elders thereupon our she's hate said and do you think that the first berry that is correct has not our Simeon laid down the rule that the laying on of hands must be performed by the owners but you must correct the berry that as follows it. Bullock this signifies that only the bullock requires the laying on of hands but the he goats offered for the sin of idolatry do not require the laying on of hands so our Judah our Simeon says the live goat this signifies that only the live goat requires the laying on of hands by Aaron but the he goats offered for the sin of idolatry do not require the laying on of hands by Aaron but by the elders and this is really what our Simeon said to our Judah the he goats offered for the sin of idolatry most certainly require the laying on of hands for if you have heard anything to the effect that they do not require the laying on of hands you must have heard it only in regard to Aaron for they were excluded by the live goat but according to our Judah what need was there to exclude them by a verse has not Robin has stated that there is a tradition that among the offerings of the congregation there are two that require the laying on of hands it was merely an exercise in interpretation whence does our Simeon derive the law that the he goats offered for the sin of idolatry require the laying on of hands by the elders? He derives it from the following berry which was taught, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of the goat. This includes Nashon's goat in respect of the laying on of hands. So our Judah, but our Simeon says it includes the he goats offered for the sin of idolatry in respect of the laying on of hands. For our Simeon ruled that every sin offering whose blood was brought within required the laying on of hands. Why
informs us that it includes what is like the egoat of a ruler which makes atonement for the person who has knowledge of the transgression of the precept. All the offerings of the individual require the laying on of hands except the first ling the cattle tithe and the Passover offering or rabbis taught his offering requires the laying on of hands but not the first ling for without this exposition I should have argued as follows if the peace offering which is not holy from the womb requires the laying on of hands the first ling which is holy from the womb surely requires the laying on of hands the text therefore stated his offering but not the first ling his offering but not the tithe for without this exposition I should have argued as follows if the peace offering which does not sanctify what comes before it or what comes after it requires the laying on of hands the tithe which sanctifies what comes before it and what comes after it surely requires the laying on of hands the text Therefore stated his offering but not the tithe his offering but not the Passover offering for without this exposition I should have argued as follows if the peace offering which one is not bound to bring requires the laying on of hands the Passover offering which one is bound to bring surely requires the laying on of hands the text therefore stated his offering but not the Passover offering but surely all these arguments can be refuted it is so with the peace offering since it requires drink offerings and also the waving of the breast and the thigh indeed the verses are merely a support but Talmud Mas Menico what is the real purpose of these verses to teach the following his offering requires the laying on of hands but not the offering of another his offering but not the offering of a Gentile his offering this includes every owner of the offering for the right of the laying on of hands the ear may lay his hands are had and I recited the following teaching in the presence a robber the ear may not lay his hands on his father's offering and the ear cannot substitute another animal for his father's offering. Rabbi said to him, but we have learned the ear may lay his hands on his father's offering may bring the drink offerings for it and can substitute another animal for it. Shall I then reverse it? He asked no reply. The other for the teaching quoted by you is the view of our Judah for it was taught the ear may lay his hands on his father's offering and the ear can also substitute another animal for it. Our Judah says the ear may not lay his hands on his father's offering and the ear cannot substitute another animal for it. What is the reason for our Judah's view? It is written his offering but not the offering of his father and he compares the inception of the consecration with the termination of the consecration just as at the termination of the consecration the ear may not lay his hands on his father's offering so at the inception of the consecration the ear cannot substitute another animal for his father's offering and what is the reason for the view of the rabbis it is written and if he shall at all change this includes the ear and they compare the termination of the consecration with the inception of the consecration just as at the inception of the consecration the ear can substitute another animal for his father's offering so at the termination of the consecration the ear may lay his hands on his father's offering for what purpose do the rabbis utilize the expression his offering for the following his offering requires the laying on of hands but not the offering of a gentile his offering but not the offering of another his offering this includes every owner of the offering for the right of the laying on of hands and our Judah he does not hold the view that every owner of the offering is included for the right of the laying on of hands alternatively he may even hold that view but the offering of another and the offering of a Gentile are excluded from one verse hence two verses are at his disposal one for the teaching that only his offering requires the laying on of hands but not the offering of his father and the other to include every owner of the offering for the right of the laying on of hands and for what purpose does our Judah utilize the expression and if he shall at all change he requires it in order to include a woman for it was taught since the whole passage is stated in the masculine form whence do we know to include a woman because the text states and if he shall at all change and the rabbis they derive it by expounding the expression and if and our Judah he bases no exposition on the expression and if mission all may lay the hands on the offering except a deaf mute an imbecile a minor a blind man a Gentile a slave an agent or a woman the laying on of hands is outside the commandment one must lay both hands on the head of the animal and in the place where one lays on the hands there the animal must be slaughtered and the slaughtering must immediately follow the laying on of hands tomorrow we understand a deaf mute and imbecile or a minor being disqualified because they do not know what they are doing also a gentile because it is written the children of israel only they may lay on the hands but gentiles may not lay on the hands but why should a blind man be disqualified our hista and our isaac be of demi suggest different reasons one says it is because we deduce the laying on of hands for all offerings from the laying on of hands performed by the elders of the congregation and the other says it is because we deduce the laying on of hands for all offerings from the laying on of hands performed on the appearance burnt offering why does not he that deduces the law from the appearance burnt offering rather deduce it from the elders of the congregation talmud mas b it is more proper to deduce the offering of an individual from another offering of the individual rather than to deduce the offering of the individual from the offering of the congregation and why does not he that deduces the law from the elders of the congregation rather deduce it from the appearance burnt offering it is only proper to deduce the offering for which the right of laying on the hands is expressly prescribed from that offering for which the right of laying on the hands is also expressly prescribed but this is not the case with the appearance burnt offering for that is itself derived from the free will burnt offering for a tanner recited before our Isaac B. Abba and he presented the burnt offering and offered it according to the ordinance that is according to the ordinance of the free will burnt offering this teaches that the obligatory burnt offering requires the laying on of hands a slave an agent or a woman or rabbis taught his hand but not the hand of his slave his hand but not the hand of his agent his hand but not the hand of his wife why are all these required they are all necessary for if the divine law had only stated once the expression is hand I should have said that it only excluded the slave since he is not subject to the commandments but an agent since he is subject to the commandments and moreover a man's agent is like himself I would say may lay the hands on his principal's offering and if only these two had been stated I should have said that the reason they are disqualified is that they are not as part of himself but a man's wife since she is as part of himself I would say may lay the hands on her husband's offering therefore all three verses are necessary the laying on of hands is outside the commandment our rabbis taught and he shall lay his hand and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him does the laying on of hands make the atonement does not the atonement come through the blood as it is said for it is the blood that makes atonement by reason of it like this however informs you that if a man treated the laying on of the hands as outside the commandment scripture accounts it to him as though he has not obtained the highest form of atonement but he has obtained atonement the same was also taught with regard to the right of waving to be waved to make atonement for him does the waving make the atonement does not the atonement come through the blood as it is said for it is the blood that makes atonement by reason of the like this however informs you that if a man treated the waving as outside the commandment scripture accounts it to him as though he has not obtained the highest form of atonement but he has obtained atonement on the head or rabbis taught and he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering but not his hand upon the neck his hand upon the head but not his hand upon the back his hand upon the head but not his hand upon the breast why are all the three verses required they are all necessary for if it Divine law had only stated once the expression is hand upon the head I should have said that it only excluded the hand upon the neck since it is not on the same plane as the head but the laying of the hand upon the back which is on the same plane as the head I would say was not excluded and if only these two had been stated I should have said that the reason they are excluded is that they are not included in the right of waving but the breast since it is included in the right of waving I would say was not excluded therefore all three verses are necessary the question was asked what if the hands were laid upon the sides of the head come and here for it was taught Abba taught in the school of Eliezer B Jacob the expression is hand upon the head excludes the hand upon the sides of the head our Jeremiah inquired would a cloth be regarded as an interposition or not come and here but nothing shall interpose between him and the offering both hands whence do we Derived Rush Lakish said because the verse says and Aaron shall lay both his hands now actually there is written in the verse his hand and yet it says both this establishes the rule that wherever his hand is stated both hands are meant unless holy writ clearly specifies one R. Eliezer went and reported the statement in the Beth Hamadrash but did not report it in the name of Rush Lakish when Rush Lakish heard of it he was annoyed Rush Lakish then said to him if it is as you say that wherever his hand is stated both hands are meant why did scripture state at all his hands he thus questioned him from 24 passages where his hands occurs e.g. his hands shall bring his hands shall contend for him he guided his hands wittingly the other remained silent when Rush Lakish's mind had been appeased he said to the other why do you not answer me that you
Place in offerings of the individual and in offerings of the congregation Talmud, Mas Menikotha for living animals and for slaughtered animals and for things that have life and for things that have not life, but it is not so with the right of the laying on of hands. Gemara our rabbis taught it is written his offering. This includes every owner of the offering for the right of the laying on of hands. For without this exposition, I should have argued as follows if the right of waving which has been extended to apply to slaughtered animals is restricted in the case of fellow owners, the right of the laying on of hands which has not been extended to apply to slaughtered animals is surely restricted in the case of fellow owners. The text therefore stated his offering to include every owner of the offering for the right of the laying on of hands, but should not the right of waving be extended even in the case of fellow owners by the following a fortiori argument if the right of the laying. On of hands which has not been extended to apply to slaughtered animals is extended in the case of fellow owners. Is it then not logical that the right of waving which has been extended to apply to slaughtered animals should be extended also in the case of fellow owners? No, because it is not possible to do so. For how should it be done if you say let all wave it together? There would then be an interposition, and if you say let one first wave it and then the other, but the divine law speaks of one waving and not of many wavings. But is the right of the laying on of hands never applied to a slaughtered animal? Behold, we have learned whenever the high priest wished to burn the offering, he used to go up the ascent, having the deputy high priest at his right hand. When he had reached halfway up the ascent, the deputy took him by the right hand and led him up. The first priest handed to him the head and the hind leg, and he laid his hands on them and threw them upon the altar fire. The second. Priest handed to the first priest the two forelegs and he gave them to the high priest who laid his hands on them and threw them. The second priest then slipped away and departed in this way. They used to hand to him the rest of the limbs of the offering and he laid his hands on them and threw them. If he so desired, he would only lay his hands on them while others threw them. They said that was done there only out of respect for the high priest's dignity. Chapterx. I mission the two loaves of Pentecost were needed separately and baked separately. The cakes of the shoe bread were needed separately and baked in pairs. They were prepared in a mold and when they were taken out from the oven, they were again put in a mold lest they become damaged. Tomorrow, whence do we derive it? Our rabbis taught two tenth parts of an eva shall be in one cake. This teaches that they were needed separately and whence do we know that the two loaves were also needed in like manner because scripture. Says shall be and whence do we know that the cakes of the shoe bread were baked in pairs because the text states and thou shalt set them perhaps then the two loaves were also baked in like manner scripture therefore says them but have you not already drawn a deduction from the word them if for that purpose alone scripture would have used the expression and thou shalt set them why and thou shalt set them two deductions may therefore be made our rabbis taught and thou shalt set them that is in a mold there were three molds the shoe bread was first put into a mold while still dough in the oven there was also a kind of mold and when it was taken out from the oven it was put into a third mold lest it become damaged but why was it not put back again in the first mold because after the baking it would have swollen it was stated how did they fashion the shoe bread Talmud Mas Menikoth B.R. Hanan said like a broken box or Yohanan said like a ship's keel according to him who Says like a broken box, we clearly understand where the dishes of frankincense were placed. But according to him who says like a ship's keel, where were the dishes placed? A special place was made for them. Again, according to him who says like a broken box, we clearly understand how the rods lay on the sides of the cakes. But according to him who says like a ship's keel, how could the rods lie on the side of the cakes? Projections were attached to them on top. Again, according to him who says like a broken box, we clearly understand how the props supported the cakes. But according to him who says like a ship's keel, how could the props support the cakes? They were made obliquely. Now, according to him who says like a ship's keel, we clearly understand the need for props. But according to him who says like a broken box, what need was there for props? For otherwise they might break by reason of the pressure of the upper cakes. Again, according to him who says like a ship's keel, it is clear. That the props rested on the table, but according to him who says like a broken box, where were the props placed? Were they perhaps placed on the ground? Yes, for our Abba Bimel said, according to him who says like a ship's keel, the props stood on the table, and according to him who says like a broken box, they stood on the ground. With which view agrees the statement of our Judah that the cakes held up the props, and the props held up the cakes with the view that the cakes were like a ship's keel. Talmud, Mas Menikoth, an objection was raised. There was in the oven a mold in the form of a beehive, and it resembled a square plate. Rendered the top of it resembled a square plate. There is a very the top which agrees with the view that they were like a ship's keel, for it was taught there were four golden props there which put forth branches on top like brackets, and these supported the cakes which resembled a ship's keel. The question was raised: Was the shoe bread rendered invalid on? The journeys were not our Yohanan and our Joshua believe I hold different views. One said it was rendered invalid, the other said it was not rendered invalid. One said it was rendered invalid because it is written as they encamp, so they shall journey. Therefore, as when they encamped, it was rendered invalid by being taken outside the curtains of the tabernacle. So when they journeyed, it was rendered invalid since it was taken outside the tabernacle. The other says it was not rendered invalid because it is written and the continual bread shall remain thereon. And the other is there not written as they encamp, so they shall journey. This means quite the reverse. Just as when they encamped, it was not rendered invalid if it had not been taken outside the tabernacle. So when they journeyed, it was not rendered invalid if it had not been taken outside. And the other is there not written and the continual bread shall remain thereon. The fact is that when our Dimi came from Palestine, he reported as. Follows as regards the bread that was still set on the table, they do not differ, they differ only regarding the bread that had been removed. He who said it was rendered invalid argued thus it is written as they encamped, so they shall journey. Therefore, just as when they encamped, it was rendered invalid by being taken outside the tabernacle, so when they journeyed, it was rendered invalid since it was taken outside. But he who said it was not rendered invalid argued thus it is written, and it tent of meeting shall set forward thus, even though they had set forth, it was still the tent of meeting, and the other is there not written as they encamped, so they shall journey. It means quite the reverse, just as when they encamped, it was not rendered invalid if it had not been taken outside the tabernacle, so when they journeyed, it was not rendered invalid if it had not been taken outside, and the other is there not written, and the tent of meeting shall set forward that only comes to teach us. The order of the standards and the other he derives the order of the standards from the verse the camp of the Levites in the midst of the camps an objection was raised when the tabernacle was dismantled for journeying consecrated things became invalid since they were outside the tabernacle nonetheless persons suffering from an issue and lepers were to be put outside their respective bounds now this applies does it not also to the shoe bread no it applies to everything except it shoe bread but what is your view if you hold that it is still the tent of meeting then the consecrated things should also not become invalid and if you hold that it is no more the tent of meeting then even the shoe bread should become invalid rather the true position is as reported by Rabin when he came from Palestine one stated his view in respect of the shoe bread that was still set on the table while the other stated his view in respect of the shoe bread that had been removed and so they do not differ at all. Abbe said this proves that the tabernacle could be dismantled for journeying at night. For should you hold that the tabernacle could not be dismantled for journeying at night, but it was taken to parts only in the morning, then why did the consecrated things become invalid on the ground of being taken outside the tabernacle? Surely they became invalid by being kept overnight. Is not this obvious? Holy writ expressly says that they might go by day and by night. I might have thought that that was so only when they had already set out by day, but if they had not set out by day, they would not set out at night. We are therefore taught that it was not so. I can point out a contradiction to the above teaching. It was taught as soon as the curtains of the tabernacle were folded up, those that had an issue and lepers were permitted to enter into the camp. Our Ashi said this is no difficulty for one very the represents the view of our Eliza, the other the view of. The rabbis for it was taught Talmud, Mas Menikoth B.R. Eliezer says you might think that if those that had an issue and lepers had forced their way through and entered the temple court at a time when the Passover offering was being offered in uncleanness you might think that they are culpable. The text therefore stated they shall put out of the camp every leper and everyone that hath an issue and whosoever is unclean by the dead when those that are unclean by the dead are put out of it. Sanctuary those that have an issue and lepers are put out of their respective camps when those
View of Arashi, however, is beside the mark for take whichever view you will if the baking required the supervision of careful men and the kneading and the shaping also required the supervision of careful men and if the kneading and the shaping did not require the supervision of careful men and the baking also did not require the supervision of careful men, we must therefore say that Arashi's view is beside the mark. Arjuna says all these works were performed inside the temple court, etc. R. Abab Bikahana said both derived their views from the same verse and it is in a manner common, yet though it were sanctified this day in the vessel, Arjuna maintains that he found the priests baking the shoe bread on a weekday and said to them, You are baking it on a weekday, but since it has been sanctified this day in the vessel, it will become invalid by being kept overnight. Ar Simeon maintains that he found them baking it on the Sabbath and said to them, Should you not have baked it on a Weekday after all it is not the oven that hallows the bread but the table but how can it be said that he found them baking the shoe bread is it not written so the priest gave him hallowed bread for there was no bread there but the shoe bread that was taken from before the Lord rather it is this that he meant by in a manner common they said to him there is no bread here but the shoe bread that has been taken from before the Lord and he replied as to that bread there is no doubt at all for since it is no more subject to the law of sacrilege it is in a manner common but even that which has been sanctified this day in the vessel you may give him to eat Talmud Masmanagotha for he is in danger of his life Arjuna and Arsimian however differ as to the tradition and there is in fact evidence for this for it reads Arsimian says accustom thyself to say the two loaves and the shoe bread were valid whether made in the temple court or in Beth page this proves admission of needing it. Shaping and the baking of the high priest's griddle cakes were performed within the temple court and they overrode the Sabbath the grinding of the corn for it and the sifting did not override the Sabbath our Akiva laid down this general rule any work that can be done on the eve of the Sabbath does not override the Sabbath but that which cannot be done on the eve of the Sabbath overrides the Sabbath all meal offerings require a vessel of ministry for those works that are performed within but do not require a vessel of ministry for those works that are performed outside the two loaves were seven handbreadths long and four wide and their horns were four finger breadths the cakes of the shoe bread were ten handbreadths long and five wide and their horns were seven finger breadths Arjuna says lest you remember but the words sat at Yahaz Banzi Oma says and thou shalt set upon the table shoe bread before me continually shoe bread signifies that it shall have all its surfaces visible the table was ten handbreadths long and five wide. The cakes of the shoe bread were ten handbreadths long and five wide. Each cake was placed lengthwise across the breadth of the table, and two and a half handbreadths were turned up at either side so that its length filled the entire breadth of the table. This is the view of Arjuna. Our Mayor says the table was twelve handbreadths long and six wide. The cakes of the shoe bread were ten handbreadths long and five wide. Each cake was placed lengthwise across the breadth of the table, and two handbreadths were turned up at either side, and there was a space of two handbreadths between the two sets so that the wind could blow between them. Abbas says there they used to put the two dishes of frankincense pertaining to the shoe bread. They said to him, Is it not written, and thou shalt put pure frankincense upon Al He replied, But is it not written, and next unto Al him shall be the tribe of Manasseh? There were therefore golden props. Branched at the top which supported the cakes two for the one row and two for the other row and there were twenty-eight rods each shaped like the half of a hollow reed fourteen for the one row and fourteen for the other row neither the placing of the rods nor their removal overrode the Sabbath but a priest used to enter on the day before the Sabbath draw out the rods and place them parallel with the length of the table every article that stood in the temple was placed with its length. Parallel with the length of the house Gemara all meal offerings require a vessel of ministry for those works that are performed within Rabbi was asked how do you know it and he replied behold it is written and he said unto me this is the place where the priests shall boil the guilt offering and the sin offering where they shall bake the meal offering that they bring them not forth in the outer court the meal offering is placed alongside with the guilt offering and the sin offering is the Guilt offering and the sin offering require a vessel of ministry, so the meal offering also requires a vessel of ministry. The table was ten handbreadths long, our Yohanan said, according to him who says that two and a half handbreadths of each cake were turned up at either side, it will be seen that the table could hallow whatsoever was put upon it to the height of fifteen handbreadths, and according to him who says that two handbreadths were turned up at either side, it will be seen that the table could hallow to the height of twelve handbreadths, but there were the rods, the rods were sunken in, but what was the purpose of the rods to prevent the bread from becoming moldy was it not, but as now suggested the bread would still become moldy, it was raised a little, then that little should also be taken into account, since in all it did not amount to a handbreadth, it was of no significance, but there were the dishes of frankincense, they were placed in the bread and rose to the same height as the bread, and there were the corners. The corners were bent inward, and the bread rested upon them. Talmud, Mas Menakothi, but there was also the border of the table. It is in accordance with the view of him who says that the border was underneath the table. But what can be said according to him who says that the border was above the table? It slanted outward, so that the bread actually rested on the table, as was taught. Our Jose says there were no props there at all, but the border of the table supported the bread. But they said to him the border was beneath the table. Our Yohanan said according to him who says that the border was beneath the table, it follows that a board which can be used on either side is susceptible to uncleanness. But according to him who says that the border was above the table, there is still a doubt as to whether a board which can be used on either side is susceptible to uncleanness or not. It is evident from the above that the table was. Susceptible to uncleanness, but surely it is a wooden vessel made to rest, and a wooden vessel made to rest is not susceptible to uncleanness. For what reason we require it to be like a sack, just as a sack is movable, both full and empty. So everything that is movable, both full and empty, is susceptible to uncleanness. The table too was movable, both full and empty, in accordance with Reshlakish's statement. For Reshlakish said, "What is the meaning of the verse upon the clean table? The inference is that it is susceptible to uncleanness. But why it is a wooden vessel made to rest and cannot therefore contract uncleanness? It teaches that they used to lift it up and exhibit the shoe bread thereon to those who came up for the festival, saying to them, Behold, the love in which you are held by God. This is in accordance with our Joshua Belevi. For our Joshua Belevi said, A great miracle was wrought in regard to the shoe bread. It was taken away as fresh as when it was set down, as it is written to put hot. Bread in the day when it was taken away, but surely you can arrive at this from the fact that it was overlaid with gold. For we have learned if a table or a side table was damaged or was overlaid with marble, yet room enough was left to set cups thereon. It is still susceptible to uncleanness. Arjuna says there must be room enough left to set portions of food thereon. Now, if there was room enough left, it is susceptible. But if there was not room enough left, it is not susceptible. And should you say that in the one case the overlaying was fixed, whereas in the other it was not fixed? But it has been reported that Reshlakish inquired of our Yohanan, does it apply only to a fixed overlaying, or also to an overlaying that is not fixed? And furthermore, does it apply only to the case where the rooms were also overlaid? Talmud, Mas Menakoth, or also to the case where the rooms were not overlaid? And he replied, it makes no difference whether the overlaying was fixed or the overlaying was not. Fix whether the rooms were overlaid or the rooms were not overlaid, and should you further say that acacia wood being valuable is not nullified by the overlaying, this would be quite in order according to Reshlakish, who said that they taught this only of vessels of common wood which come from overseas, but vessels of fine wood are valuable and are not nullified by the overlaying. But what can one say according to our Yohanan, who said that even vessels of fine wood are nullified by the overlaying? One must therefore say that the table of the sanctuary was different for the divine law called it wood, for it is written the altar was of wood three cubits high, and the length thereof two cubits, and the corners thereof, and the length thereof, and the walls thereof were of wood. And he said unto me, This is the table that is before the Lord. The verse begins with the altar and ends with the table. Our Yohanan and our Eliezer both said, While the temple still stood, the altar used to make. Atonement for a man, but now that the temple no longer stands, a man's table makes atonement for him. There were therefore golden props, etc. How do we know this? Our Katna said for the verse says, And thou shalt make Kaarotha and Kapatha and Kesotha and Menachatha to cover with all Kaarotha are the molds, Kapatha, the dishes, Kesotha, the
their views from the same text and these are the measures of the altar by cubits a cubit is a cubit and a handbreadth Talmud. Mas manikot be the bottom shall be a cubit and a cubit the breadth and the border thereof by the edge thereof round about a span and this shall be the base of the altar the bottom shall be a cubit refers to the base of the altar and a cubit the breadth refers to the sobeb and the border thereof by the edge thereof round about a span refers to the horns and this shall be the base of the altar refers to the golden altar now our measure maintained that only this was measured by a cubit of five handbreadths but all the other vessels in the temple were measured by a cubit of six handbreadths whereas our Judah maintained that like this cubit shall be all the cubits for the vessels it was assumed that it was the height from the base to the sobeb that was measured by a cubit of five handbreadths and the verse the bottom shall be a cubit and a cubit the breadth meant to say that the height from the base which rose up one cubit to the sobeb which was one cubit wide was measured by a cubit of five handbreadths let us now consider the height of the altar was in all ten cubits six cubits being of five handbreadths each and four of six handbreadths each thus the height of the altar was fifty-four handbreadths and the half thereof was twenty-seven handbreadths the distance from the top of the horns down to the sobeb was twenty-four Handbreadths that is three handbreadths less than half the height of the altar and we have learned a red line went around the altar in the middle to separate between blood that must be sprinkled above and blood that must be sprinkled below how then could it have taught in connection with the burnt offering of a bird that the priest went up the ascent passed onto the sobeb and came to the southeastern horn nipped off the head closed by its neck and divided it asunder and drained out the blood on the altar wall and that if he did it even one cubit's distance below his feet it was valid he has then applied below to the extent of two handbreadths blood that must be applied above it must be said therefore that the bottom shall be a cubit refers to the rebatement of the base a cubit the breadth to the rebatement of the sobeb and the border thereof by the edge thereof round about to the rebatement of the horns accordingly the height of the altar was sixty handbreadths and a half Thereof was thirty handbreadths, the distance from the top of the horns down to the sobeb was twenty-four handbreadths, that is six handbreadths less than half the height of the altar, and therefore we have learned if he did it even one cubit's distance below his feet it was valid. How have you explained it as referring to the rebatements? But how can you explain it as referring to the rebatements? Behold, we have learned the altar was at its base thirty-two cubits long and thirty-two cubits wide. It rose up one cubit and receded one cubit, this formed the base, thus there were left thirty cubits by thirty according to you, however, it should be thirty cubits and two handbreadths by thirty cubits and two handbreadths, and further we have learned it rose up five cubits and receded one cubit, this formed the sobeb, thus there were left twenty-eight cubits by twenty-eight according to you, however, it should be twenty-eight cubits and four handbreadths by twenty-eight cubits and four handbreadths and should you say that since they were less than one cubit the ten have purposely omitted them but we have learned further the place of the horns was one cubit on every side thus there were left twenty six cubits by twenty six and according to you it should be twenty seven by twenty seven he was not exact in his reckoning but we have learned further the place on which the feet of the priests trod was one cubit on every side thus there were left twenty four cubits by twenty four the place for the altar fire according to you however it should be twenty five by twenty five should you say also here that he was not exact but it is written and the altar hearth shall be twelve cubits long by twelve broad square now you might say that it was only twelve cubits by twelve but when it also says in the four quarters thereof it teaches that one must measure from the middle twelve cubits in every direction and should you say that originally six of the thirty two cubits were cubits of five and breadths and the temple court must have had more space and we have learned the temple court was in all 187 cubits long and 135 cubits wide from east to west it was 187 cubits the place where the feet of the Israelites trod was 11 cubits the place where the feet of the priests trod was 11 cubits the altar was 32 cubits between the porch and the altar was 22 cubits the sanctuary was 100 cubits and 11 cubits behind the holy of holies you must therefore say that the bottom shall be a cubit refers to the height of the base a cubit the breadth to the rebatement of the sobeb and the border thereof by the edge thereof round about refers to the height of the horns but as to the space taken up by the horns Talmud Mas Menachoth it is immaterial whether the one or the other cubit was used accordingly the height of the altar was 58 and breadths and the half thereof was 29 handbreadths the distance from the top of the horns down to the sobeb was 23 handbreadths that is 6 handbreadths less than half the height of the altar and therefore we have learned if he did it even one cubit's distance below his feet it was valid this may be proved too for it is written the bottom shall be a cubit and a cubit the breadth this is conclusive how much is a cubit of medium size or you said 6 handbreadths are jose b Aben said we have also learned the same in our mission our mayor says the table was 12 handbreadths long and 6 wide it follows that there was a cubit larger than this there was as we have learned there were two cubits in the palace of shushan one at the northeastern corner and the other at the southeastern corner that at the northeastern corner was longer than the cubit of moses by half a finger breadth and that at the southeastern corner was longer than the other by half a finger breadth thus it was one finger breadth Longer than the cubit of Moses and why did they set up a large cubit and a small one so that the workmen might receive contracts of work according to the measure of the smaller cubit and deliver the work according to the measure of the larger cubit thereby avoiding any possible guilt of sacrilege and why two one was for working gold and silver and the other was for building we have learned elsewhere the eastern gate on which was portrayed the palace of Shushan what was the reason for this. Our Hista and our Isaac B of Demi offered different opinions one said so that they be ever mindful once they came the other said so that the fear of the dominant power be ever before them or Janay said the fear of the dominant power should ever be before you as it is written and all these thy servants shall come down unto me and bow down unto me saying but he did not say so of the king himself or Yohan and derives it from the following verse and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah and he girded up. His loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel and the leap thereof for healing Arhista and Arhisaki of Dimi each interpreted this verse one said to loosen the mouth above the other said to loosen the mouth below it has been likewise reported Hezekiah said to loosen the mouth of the dumb barkeeper said to loosen the mouth of barren women our rabbis taught had scripture said and thou shalt take fine flour and bake twelve cakes thereof and thou shalt set them in two rows and not added six in a row I would have said that one row may consist of four cakes and the other of eight scripture therefore said six in a row furthermore had scripture said in two rows six in a row and it had not stated twelve I would have said that there were to be three rows each of six cakes scripture therefore said twelve and further had scripture said twelve and also in rows but not in two rows nor six in a row I would have said that there were to be three rows each of four Cake scripture therefore set in two rows and six in a row hence without these three expressions we should not have known the proper practice and what was it the priest used to set them in two rows each of six cakes if he set one row of four and another of eight he has not fulfilled the obligation if he set two rows each of seven cakes the top cake of each row says rabbi is regarded as though it was not but does not the verse say and thou shalt put upon al each row pure frankincense. Our hista said to our hamnon other say our hamnon said to our hista rabbi consistently holds the view that al means by the side of as has been taught rabbi says in the verse and thou shalt put al each row pure frankincense the preposition al has the sense of by the side of you say it has the sense of by the side of but perhaps it is not so but rather it means actually upon it when it says and thou shalt place the veil as a screen al the ark you may learn from it that al generally has the sense of by the side of every article that stood in the temple etc our rabbis taught every article that stood in the temple was placed with its length parallel with the length of the house excepting the ark whose length was parallel with the breadth of the house so was it placed and so were its staves placed what can this mean it means as follows so was it placed for so were its staves placed and whence do we know this of the staves from the following barrier which was taught and the staves were so long i might have thought that they did not reach the curtain the text therefore further states that the ends of the staves were seen from the holy place but if i had the verse that the ends of the staves were seen only to go by i might have assumed that they tore through the curtain and protruded outside the text therefore states but they could not be seen without how then are we to understand the verse talmud mas medicoth be they pressed against the
Table on the side of the tabernacle towards the south you must therefore say that the candlestick of Moses stood in the middle with five candlesticks to the right of it and five to the left of it. One barrier states that the table stood in the inner half of the sanctuary whilst another barrier states that they stood in the inner third of the sanctuary. This however presents no difficulty for the one barrier that includes the Holy of Holies in the term sanctuary whilst the other does. Not include the Holy of Holies in the term sanctuary our rabbis taught the tables were placed lengthwise from east to west so Rabbi our Eliezer son of Arsimian says from north to south what is Rabbi's reason he derives it from the candlestick as the candlestick stood with its branches towards east and west so these stood from east to west but whence do we know this of the candlestick itself since of the western lamp the verse says Aaron shall order it before the Lord it follows that all the others were not before the Lord now if one were to assume that the candlestick stood with its branches towards north and south all the lamps would then be before the Lord and what is the reason for the view of our Eliezer son of Arsimian he derives it from the ark as the ark stood lengthwise in the direction of north and south so these also stood lengthwise from north to south and why does not Rabbi derive it from the ark one may infer an object that stood outside from another that stood outside but one may not infer that which stood outside from that which stood inside and why does not our Eliezer son of Arsimian derive it from the candlestick he maintains that even the candlestick stood with its branches extending towards north and south but is it not written Aaron and his sons shall order it before the Lord they were all made to face the middle lamp for it has been taught the seven lamps shall give light in front of the candlestick this teaches that they were made to face the middle lamp our Nathan said this shows that the middle one is specially prized it is quite clear according to him who said that the tables stood lengthwise from east to west to see how the ten tables were placed in the twenty cubits but according to him who said that they stood lengthwise from north to south how could the ten tables be placed in twenty cubits furthermore how could the priests enter the holy of holies furthermore we would then have five tables on the south side and further where did the table of Moses stand but according to your argument this question could also be raised against him who said that they stood lengthwise from east to west where did the table of Moses stand but in fact there is no difficulty for you have assumed have you not that they stood in one row in reality however they stood in two rows Talmud, Mos Menikotha then according to him who said that they stood lengthwise from north to south it is quite in order but according to him who said that they stood lengthwise from east to west there is a difficulty let us consider how far away was the table from the north wall two cubits and a half then there was one cubit the width of the table itself two cubits and a half the space between the tables one cubit the width of the table itself again two cubits and a half the space between the tables and one cubit the width of the table itself in all ten cubits and a half thus the tables had Encroached to the extent of half a cubit upon the south side of the sanctuary you have assumed have you not that the table of Moses stood between the two rows of tables but it was not so it actually stood at the head of the two rows of tables whilst the latter stood lower down like people sitting before their master our rabbis taught Solomon made ten tables they set the shoe bread however only on that made by Moses as it is written and the table whereon the shoe bread was also Solomon made. Ten candlesticks they lit however only that of Moses as it is written and the candlestick of gold with the lamps thereof to burn every evening our Eliezer B. Shamu says on all the tables they set the shoe bread as it is written and the tables whereon was the shoe bread and they lit all the candlesticks as it is written and the candlesticks with their lamps that they should burn according to the ordinance before the sanctuary of pure gold our Jose son of our Judah says they set the shoe bread only. On that of Moses, but how do I explain the verse which says, and the tables whereon was the shoe bread? These are the three tables that were in the temple. Two stood inside the porch at the entrance of the house, the one of silver and the other of gold. On the table of silver they laid the shoe bread when it was brought in, and on the table of gold they laid the shoe bread when it was brought out. Since what is holy we must raise in honor, but not bring down. And within the sanctuary was a table of gold whereon the shoe bread lay continually. Whence is it inferred that we may not bring down what is holy? Rabbi said from the verse, and Moses reared up the tabernacle and laid its sockets and set up the boards thereof and put in the bars thereof and reared up its pillars. And whence is it inferred that we must raise up in honor what is holy? Our Ahabi Jacob said from the verse, even the fire pans of these men who have sinned at the cost of their lives and let them be made beaten plates for a Covering of the altar for they are become holy because they were offered before the Lord that they may be assigned unto the children of Israel at first they were but accessories of the altar and now they are part of the altar itself which thou didst break and thou shalt put them in the ark our Joseph learned this teaches us that both the tablets and the fragments of the tablets were deposited in the ark hence we learned that a scholar who has forgotten his learning through no fault of his must not be treated with disrespect mnemonic suppression misdeed forgets rashly said there are times Talmud Mos Menikoth be when the suppression of the Torah may be the foundation of the Torah for it is written which thou didst break the holy one blessed be he said to Moses thou didst well to break rashly also said a scholar who has committed a misdeed must not be reproached publicly for it is written therefore shalt thou stumble in the day and the prophet also shall stumble with thee in the Night that is to say, keep it dark like night. Reshlakish further said, he who forgets one word of his study transgresses a negative precept, for it is written, only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things that's being in accordance with the rule laid down by our Abin in the name of our Ilay. For our Abin said, in the name of our Ilay, wherever there occur in holy writ the expressions, take heed, lest or do not they are negative precepts. Rabbin said, he transgresses two negative precepts, for take heed, and lest our two negative precepts are nomin. B. Isaac said, he transgresses three negative precepts, for it is written, only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things one might suppose that this is so, even when he forgets it through no fault of his. The text therefore states, unless they depart from thy heart, scripture thus speaks only of him who of set purpose puts them away from his heart. Our dose, thy son of our Jan, said one. My further suppose that this is so even when his study has been too hard for him the text therefore states only our Yohanan and our Eliezer both said the Torah was given in forty days and the soul is formed in forty days whosoever keeps the Torah his soul is kept and whosoever does not keep the Torah his soul is not kept Atana of the school of our Ishmael taught it is like the case of a man who entrusted a swallow to the care of his servant and said to him do you think that if you suffer it to perish I will take from you and suffer its value no I will take your soul from you Mishnah there were two tables inside the porch at the entrance of the house the one of marble and the other of gold on the table of marble they laid the shoe bread when it was brought in and on the table of gold they laid the shoe bread when it was brought out since what is holy we must raise in honor but not bring down and within the sanctuary was a table of gold whereon the shoe bread lay continually for Priests entered two bearing the two rows of the shoe bread in their hands and two bearing the two dishes of frankincense in their hands and four went in before them two to take away the two rows of the shoe bread and two to take away the two dishes of frankincense those who brought them in stood at the north side with their faces to the south and those who took them away stood at the south side with their faces to the north these withdrew the old and the others laid down the new the hand breadth of the one being by the side of the hand breadth of the other for it is written before me continually our Jose says even if these first took away the old and the others laid down the new later on this two fulfills the requirement of continually they went and laid the old bread on the table of gold that was in the porch the dishes of frankincense were then burnt and the cakes were distributed among the priests if the day of atonement fell on a sabbath the cakes were distributed in the evening, if it fell on a Friday, the goat of the Day of Atonement was consumed. In the evening, the Babylonian priests used to eat it raw, for they were not fastidious. Gemara, it was taught. Our Jose says, even if the old shoe bread was taken away in the morning and the new was set down in the evening, there is no harm. How then am I to explain the verse before me continually? It teaches that the table should not remain overnight without bread. Or am I said from these words of our Jose? We learn that even though a man learns but one chapter in the morning and one chapter in the evening, he has thereby fulfilled the precept of this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Our Yohanan said in the name of our Simeon, Biyohe, even though a man but reads the Shema morning and evening, he has thereby fulfilled the precept of this book of the law shall not depart. It is forbidden, however, to say this in the presence of Amhiras, but Rabbi said it is a
hath allured thee out of the mouth of straits that is out of Gehenna, whose mouth is narrow so that its smoke is stored up Talmud, Mas Menachoth within it, unless you say that as its mouth is narrow so the whole of Gehenna is narrow, the text therefore states deep and large, unless you say that it is not made ready for a king, the text therefore states yet for the king it is prepared, unless you say that there is no wood in it, the text therefore states the pile thereof is fire and much. Would unless you say that this is the sole reward of the Torah, the text therefore states, and that which is set on that table is full of fatness. If the day of atonement fell on a Sabbath, etc., Rabbi B. Barhanna said in the name of our Yohanan, they were not Babylonians but Alexandrians, but because the Palestinians hated the Babylonians, they called the Alexandrians by the name of Babylonians. It was likewise taught our Jose says they were not Babylonians but Alexandrians, but because the Palestinians hated the Babylonians, they called the Alexandrians by the name of Babylonians, said to him, Our Judah, may your mind be at ease, for you have set mine at ease, Mishnah. If the priest set the shoe bread on the Sabbath and the dishes of frankincense on the day after the Sabbath and burnt the dishes of frankincense on the next Sabbath, it is not valid and one is not liable thereby for pickle nut heart or uncle if he set the bread and the dishes of frankincense on the Sabbath and Burnt the dishes of frankincense on the day after the Sabbath, it is not valid, and one is not liable thereby for pickle nut heart or uncle Anas if he set the bread and the dishes of frankincense on the day after the Sabbath and burnt the dishes of frankincense on the next Sabbath, it is not valid. What should he do? He should leave it until the following Sabbath, for even if it remains many days on the table, there is no harm tomorrow. We have learned elsewhere. The officer said to them, Go forth and see if the time for slaughtering has arrived. If it had arrived, he that saw it called out, It is daylight. Matthew B. Samuel said, He that saw it called out, The whole east is a light as far as Hebron, and he answered, Yes, and why was all this necessary? Because once when the light of the moon arose, they thought that the east was already a light and slaughtered the daily offering, and they had to take it away to the place of burning. They led the high priest down to the place of immersion. This was it. Rule in the temple whosoever covered his feet required an immersion and whosoever made water required sanctification of hands and feet. The father of Arabin learned not only this but also the burnt offering of a bird whose head was nipped off at night and the meal offering from which the handful was taken at night must be taken away to the place of burning. This is quite right with regard to the burnt offering of a bird since what is done cannot be undone but with regard to the meal offering. Surely he can put back the handful in its place and take it again when it is day he learned it and he himself also gave the reason for it namely that vessels of ministry hallow what is put in them even outside the proper time an objection was raised whatsoever is offered up by day is hallowed by day and whatsoever is offered up by night is hallowed both by day and by night whatsoever is offered up by day is hallowed by day that is to say by day only and not by night it does not become. Hallowed by night so as to be permitted to be offered up, but it does become hallowed so that it can now become invalid. Our zero raised an objection if he set the bread and the dishes of frankincense on the day after the Sabbath and burnt the dishes of frankincense on the next Sabbath, it is not valid. What should he do? He should leave it until the following Sabbath, for even if it remains many days on the table, there is no harm now if you accept the view that vessels of ministry can hallow. Even outside the proper time, then it should become hallowed and also invalidated. Rabbi said he who raised the objection raised a valid one, but the father of Arabin was quoting a Beritha, and we must say therefore that the tana of that Beritha is of the opinion that the night is not considered out of time, whereas the day is considered out of time. But after all Talmud, Mas Menachoth be when Sabbath he approaches, let it then become hallowed and also invalidated. Rabbi said we must assume. That he had removed it before then Marzitra or as some say Arashi said you may even assume that he had not removed it before then since however he had set it down not in accordance with its prescribed right it is as though a monkey had set it mission the two loaves were eaten never earlier than on the second day and never later than on the third day how is this explained normally they were baked on the day before the festival and eaten on the festival that is on the second day of the festival fell on the day after the Sabbath they would be eaten on the third day the shoe bread was eaten never earlier than on the ninth day and never later than on the eleventh day how is this explained normally it was baked on the day before the Sabbath and eaten on the Sabbath of the following week that is on the ninth day of the festival fell on the day before the Sabbath it would then be eaten on the tenth day of the two days of the new year fell before the Sabbath it would then be eaten on the Eleventh day the baking overrides neither the Sabbath nor the festival. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel says in the name of our Simeon, son of the deputy high priest, it overrides the festival but not the fast day. Gamar said, according to him who rules that offerings in fulfillment of a vow and free will offerings may not be offered on a festival, you should not say that biblically they are allowed to be offered, but the rabbis forbade them only as a precautionary measure, lest one defer those offerings until the festival, but even biblically they are not allowed to be offered for the two loaves are obligatory for that day, so that there is no reason to apprehend lest one defer them until the festival. Yet our mission states the baking overrides neither the Sabbath nor the festival. Chaptexii mission if meal offerings and drink offerings became unclean before they were hallowed in a vessel of ministry, they may be redeemed if they became unclean after they were. Hallowed in a vessel they may not be redeemed for offerings the wood the frankincense and the vessels of ministry may not be redeemed for the rule of redemption applies only to offerings of cattle Gemara Samuel said even though they are clean they may be redeemed for so long as they have not been hallowed in a vessel of ministry they are holy only as to their value and whatsoever is holy as to its value may be redeemed but have we not learned in our mission became unclean the rule is it same even though they were not unclean but because the Tana wished to state the next clause after they were hallowed in a vessel they may not be redeemed in which case even though they were unclean they still may not be redeemed he therefore stated in the first clause became unclean if they became unclean after they were hallowed in a vessel they may not be redeemed but this is obvious for they are holy in themselves it was necessary to be stated for I might have argued that since what is Blemished is described as unclean, then surely what is unclean should be like that which is blemished, and therefore as that which has become blemished may be redeemed, even though it was holy in itself, so this too may be redeemed. We are therefore taught that the divine law did not describe what is blemished as unclean in that sense. Talmud, Mas Menachoth, for we do not find any case in which what has been hallowed in a vessel of ministry may be redeemed. Where do we find what is blemished? Described as unclean, it has been taught, and if it be any unclean beast of which they may not bring an offering unto the Lord, this verse speaks of blemished animals that they shall be redeemed. You say it speaks of blemished animals that they shall be redeemed, perhaps it is not so, but actually it speaks of an unclean beast when the verse says, and if it be of an unclean beast, then he shall redeem it according to thy valuation. The unclean beast is already spoken of, what then am I to make of it? Verse and if it be any unclean beast, the verse clearly speaks of blemished animals that they shall be redeemed. I might suppose that they may be redeemed even though they have but a passing blemish. The text therefore states of which they may not bring an offering unto the Lord, referring clearly to such animals as may at no time be brought as an offering unto the Lord, but one must exclude from this verse animals which may not be brought today, but which may be brought tomorrow or who not be mino. Raised an objection, bird offerings, the wood, the frankincense, and the vessels of ministry may not be redeemed, for the rule of redemption applies only to offerings of cattle. Now this is quite right with regard to bird offerings, for they are holy in themselves, and the rule of redemption applies only to offerings of cattle, but why may not the wood, the frankincense, and the vessels of ministry be redeemed? It must be because the others, if still clean, may not be redeemed, and these even though. Unclean are regarded as clean for wood and frankincense are no foodstuffs but are placed in the category of foodstuffs only by reason of sacred esteem accordingly wood so long as it has not been cut up into chips is not predisposed to uncleanness and frankincense so long as it has not been hallowed in a vessel of ministry is similarly not predisposed to uncleanness and as regards vessels of ministry since they can be made clean by immersion in a they are not regarded as unclean no. I still maintain that the others even though clean may be redeemed but these may not be redeemed even when unclean because they are scarce I grant you that frankincense and vessels of ministry are scarce but surely wood is not scarce even wood is scarce in view of a master's
Convey food uncleanness. Our Simeon, however, agrees that meat cooked in milk conveys food uncleanness. For there was a time when it was permitted, and R.C. had said in the name of our Yohanan, "What is the reason for our Simeon's view? Because it is written, all food therein which may be eaten, therefore food which you may give others to eat is termed food. But food which you may not give others to eat is not termed food. And the meal offering which was made pickle is also a food which you may not give others to eat. If that is so, then meat cooked in milk should convey food uncleanness by virtue of the fact that it is a food which you may give others to eat. For it has been taught, our Simeon, be Judah says in the name of our Simeon, meat cooked in milk is forbidden to be eaten, but is permitted for use. For it is written, for thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not see the kid in its mother's milk. Whilst elsewhere it is written, and ye shall be holy men unto me. Therefore ye shall. Not eat any flesh that is torn of beasts in the field, ye shall cast it to the dogs, just as there it is forbidden to be eaten, but is permitted for use. So here too it is forbidden to be eaten, but is permitted for use. He gave one reason, and yet another for one thing it is a food which you may give others to eat, and besides, even for the Israelite himself, there was a time when it was permitted. An objection was raised from the following Our Simeon says there is nut har which conveys food. Uncleanness, and there is also nut har which does not convey food uncleanness. Thus, if the flesh of the offering had remained overnight before the sprinkling of the blood, it does not convey food uncleanness, but if it had remained overnight after the sprinkling of the blood, it conveys food uncleanness, and an offering that had been made pickle be it of the most holy or of the less holy offerings does not convey food uncleanness, but a meal offering that had been made pickle conveys food. Uncleanness. This is no difficulty. For in the one case there was a time when it had been permitted, whilst in the other there was no time when it had been permitted. How is it that there was no time when it had been permitted, where the grain had been consecrated for a meal offering while it was still growing? But one could have redeemed it. This, of course, presents no difficulty according to that version which gives our Ashai's view. Thus, if they became unclean, they may be redeemed. But if they are clean, they may not be redeemed. But according to the other version which gives us his view, even though they are clean, they may be redeemed. Then the question will be asked here: One could have redeemed it. That is so. But the fact is that it had not been redeemed. But if one so desired, one could have redeemed it. And we have heard our Simeon say that whatsoever stands to be redeemed is as though it were redeemed. For it was taught the red cow conveys food uncleanness since there was a time. When it was permitted to be eaten, and Rechlech observed that Arsimian used to say that the red cow could be redeemed even on its wood pile, there is no comparison at all. The red cow can rightly be regarded as ready to be redeemed, for if another cow finer than this one is obtainable, it is a meritorious act to redeem it. But as regards meal offerings, is there any meritorious act to redeem what has been consecrated for a meal offering? But in the case where a portion of the sacrifice had remained overnight before the sprinkling of the blood, there was a duty to sprinkle the blood, and if one so desired, one could have sprinkled it. Nevertheless, the very states that it does not convey food uncleanness, we must assume that there was no time left during the day for the sprinkling of the blood. Then what would be the position where there was sufficient time left in the day for the sprinkling? It would convey food uncleanness if so, instead of teaching if it remained overnight. After the sprinkling of the blood, it conveys food uncleanness. The Tana should have drawn a distinction in the very case itself. In the following terms, this applies only where no time was left during the day for the sprinkling of the blood. But if there was sufficient time left in the day for the sprinkling, it conveys food uncleanness. That is just what the Tana meant to teach. If the portion of the sacrifice had remained overnight before the blood was ready for the sprinkling, it does not convey food uncleanness. But if after the blood was ready for the sprinkling, it conveys food uncleanness. But in the case where an offering either of the most holy or of the less holy kind had been made pickle, there was a duty to sprinkle the blood in the proper manner. Talmud, Mas Medikothe, and if one so desired, one could have sprinkled it properly. Nevertheless, the very the states that it does not convey food uncleanness. Now, presumably, the pickle intention was expressed during. The sprinkling no the pickle intention was expressed during the slaughtering then what would be his ruling where the pickle intention was expressed during the sprinkling it would have suggested convey food uncleanness if so instead of teaching a meal offering that had been made pickle conveys food uncleanness the tana should have drawn a distinction in the case of the animal offering itself in these terms this applies only where the pickle intention was expressed during the slaughtering but if the pickle intention was expressed during the sprinkling it conveys food uncleanness it was necessary for the tana to teach the case of the meal offering that had been made pickle for notwithstanding that the pickle intention was expressed at the time of the taking of the handful and the taking of the handful in the meal offering corresponds to the slaughtering in the animal offering nevertheless the meal offering conveys food uncleanness since there was a time when it was permitted in the beginning our Ashi said I stated this argument before our Naman and he said to me you may even say that the expression if it had remained overnight before the sprinkling shall be taken in the ordinary sense and moreover you may say that the pickle intention was expressed during the sprinkling and there is no difficulty at all for whilst we accept the principle if he so desired he could have redeemed it we do not accept the principle if he so desired he could have sprinkled it in. Objection was raised from the following our Joshua laid down this general rule whatsoever had a period of permissibility to the priest is not subject to the law of sacrilege and whatsoever had no period of permissibility to the priest is subject to the law of sacrilege what is that which had a period of permissibility to the priest that which remained overnight or became unclean or was taken out of the sanctuary and what is that which had no period of permissibility to the priests? Offerings that were slaughtered while the intention was expressed of eating of the flesh thereof outside the proper time or outside the proper place or whose blood was received or sprinkled by those that were unfit. It says here in the first part that which remained overnight or became unclean or was taken out. Now this means does it not that it actually remained overnight and yet it is considered as having had a period of permissibility to the priests by virtue of the fact that here if one so desired one could have sprinkled the blood and therefore it states that it is not subject to the law of sacrilege. No it means that it is ready to become disqualified if taken out or made unclean but what would be the position where it had actually remained overnight it would be subject to the law of sacrilege would it not then instead of saying whatsoever had a period of permissibility to the priests and whatsoever had no period of permissibility to the priests the tana should have Said whatsoever had been permissible to the priest is not subject to the law of sacrilege, and whatsoever had not been permissible to the priest is subject to the law of sacrilege. The fact is answered, Arashi, that one cannot point out a contradiction between the ruling concerning the law of sacrilege and that concerning uncleanness, the law of sacrilege applies only to that which is holy and not to that which is not holy. Therefore, once the holiness has departed, how can it revert on the other? And food uncleanness applies only to that which is a foodstuff and not to that which is not a foodstuff. Therefore, where the blood has been sprinkled, the flesh of the offering has thereby become a foodstuff and so conveys food uncleanness, but where the blood has not been sprinkled, the flesh of the offering has not become a foodstuff and so does not convey food uncleanness. An objection was raised from the following if a man brought a suspensive guilt offering and it became known to him. That he had not sent if the animal was not yet slaughtered, it may go forth and pasture among the flock. This is the opinion of our Meir the sages say Talmud, Mas Menikoth B. It must be left to pasture until it becomes blemished when it shall be sold and its money spent on a free will offering. Our Eliezer says it should be offered for if it was not offered for the sin, it can be taken as offered for some other sin if it became known to him that he had not sinned only after it was slaughtered. The blood must be poured out and the flesh burnt. If the blood had already been sprinkled, the flesh may be eaten. Our Jose says even if the blood was still in the basin, it should be sprinkled and the flesh eaten. And Rabbah had said that our Jose adopted the principle stated by our Simeon that whatsoever stands to be sprinkled is considered as already sprinkled. Is that indeed the reason for our Jose's view? No, in the West it was said in the name of our Jose Behanna that this is the reason for our Jose's view. Vessels of ministry hallow what is invalid so that it may be offered up in the first instance said Arashi to Arkahana since Arsimian holds that whatsoever is ready to be sprinkled is considered as already sprinkled and similarly he holds that whatsoever is ready to be burnt is considered as already burnt consequently why should not har and the red cow convey food uncleanness there but ashes
vessel they are invalid if he said I take upon myself to bring two tents in one vessel and he brought them in two vessels and when they said to him thou didst vow to bring them in one vessel he still offered them in two vessels they are invalid but if he thereupon offered them in one vessel they are valid if he said I take upon myself to bring two tents in two vessels and he brought them in one vessel and when they said to him thou didst vow to bring them in two vessels he thereupon offered them in two vessels they are valid but if he still kept them in one vessel they are reckoned as two meal offerings which have been mixed tomorrow all the cases indeed had to be stated for if the tanna had only taught us the first cases we should have said that the reason why he has not fulfilled his obligation was that he had promised a meal offering prepared on a griddle and brought one prepared in a pen but in the other cases where both were meal offerings prepared on a griddle or both were Meal offerings prepared in a pen we should have said that he has even discharged the obligation of his vow hence those other cases were necessary to be stated and if he had only stated those cases we should have said that the reason for the ruling was that he had divided up the meal offering but in the former cases where he had not divided up the meal offering we should have said that it was not so therefore all the cases were necessary to be stated our rabbis taught what he has brought he has brought but he has not discharged the obligation of his vow our Simeon says he has even discharged the obligation of his vow to bring this meal as a meal offering prepared on a griddle but it has been taught the vessels of ministry have not hallowed them Abbe answered they have not hallowed them to that extent that they may be offered upon the altar but they have hallowed them to the extent that they can become invalid Abbe further said this has been taught Talmud Mos only in the case where he determined the kind of vessel at the time of his vowing, but where he determined the kind of vessel at the time of his setting it apart, it is not invalid. For scripture says, according as thou hast vowed, and not according as thou hast set apart. This has also been stated. Our Ahabi Hanan said in the name of R.C. who said it in the name of our Yohanan. This has been taught only in the case where he determined the kind of vessel at the time of his vowing, but where he determined the kind of vessel at the time of his setting it apart, it is not invalid. For scripture says, according as thou hast vowed, and not according as thou hast set apart. Mishnah: If a man said, I take upon myself to bring a meal offering of barley, he must bring one of wheat. If of course meal, he must bring it of fine flour. If without oil and without frankincense, he must nevertheless bring it with oil and frankincense. If half a tenth, he must bring a whole tenth. If a tenth and a half, he must. Bring to our Simeon declares him exempt because he did not make his offering in the manner in which people usually make their offerings Gemara but why is this here is a vow and also it's an element of you expressed in our Mishnah said Hezekiah is that of Beth Shammai who maintained that one must always regard the first words of a man's statement as binding for we have learned if a man said I will be a Nazi right and abstain from dry fix and press fix Beth Shammai say he becomes a Nazi right in the ordinary sense but Beth Hillel say he does not become a Nazi right or you said you may even say that it is a view of Beth Hillel too for we assume that the man added had I but known that one may not vow a meal offering in this manner I should not have vowed in this manner but in that Hezekiah said this was taught only in the case where he said a meal offering of barley but where he said a meal offering of lentils he has not to bring a meal offering of wheat but let us Consider Hezekiah explained our mission according to the view of Beth Shammai did he not but since Beth Shammai maintained that one must always regard the first words of a man's statement as binding then surely it is immaterial whether he said of barley or of lentils he abandoned that view but why did he abandon it Rabbah said because our mission was to him difficult to understand why does it state a meal offering of barley and not of lentils obviously it is because of the man's error now in regard to barley a man may err but surely not in regard to lentils or Yohanan however said even if he said of lentils but consider our Yohanan explained our mission in accordance with the view of Beth Hillel did he not and Beth Hillel's view is based upon the man's error now I grant you that a man may err in regard to barley but surely he would not err in regard to lentils he said so only as a result of Hezekiah's argument for he reasoned with him thus why did you abandon your view because our mission does not state of lentils but it may be that that was so obvious that it was not even necessary to be stated thus not only where he said of lentils in which case it can only be said that he is revoking his vow do we hold that we must adopt the first words of his statement but even where he said of barley in which case it might be said that he has erred we still say that we must adopt the first words of his statement Talmud, Mos Medikothi Talmud, Mos Medikothi. Zeiri said this applies only where he said a meal offering but where he did not say a meal offering it is not so Arnaman was once sitting and reciting the above statement of Zeiri thereupon Robert raised the following objections against Arnaman if of course meal he must bring it of fine flour is it not the case that he did not say a meal offering no he actually said a meal offering if without oil and without frankincense he must nevertheless bring it with oil and frankincense is it not the case that he did not say a meal offering no he actually said a meal offering if half a tenth he must bring a whole tenth is it not the case that he did not say a meal offering no he actually said a meal offering if so consider the next clause if a tenth and a half he must bring two but as soon as he said a meal offering of a tenth he immediately was bound to bring a tenth and when he added and a half it is of no account the case must be that he said I take upon myself to bring a meal offering of half a tenth and a tenth for as soon as he said a meal offering he immediately was bound to bring a tenth when he added half a tenth it was of no account and when he finally said a tenth he became bound to bring another tenth if so what can be the reason for the last statement Arsimian declares him exempt because he did not make his offering in the manner in which people usually make their offerings Rob answered Arsimian stated this according to the view of Jose who maintained that a man is bound by his last words to mission a man may offer a meal offering consisting of sixty tents and bring them in one vessel if a man said I take upon myself to offer sixty tents he may bring them in one vessel but if he said I take upon myself to offer sixty one tents he must bring sixty in one vessel and the one in another vessel for since the congregation bring on the first day of the feast of tabernacles when it falls on a sabbath sixty one tents as a meal offering it is enough for an individual that his meal offering be less by one tenth than that of the congregation our Simeon said but some of these sixty one tents are for the bullocks and some for the lambs and they may not be mixed one with the other but the fact is that up to sixty tents they can be mingled in one vessel they said to him can sixty be mingled in one vessel and not sixty one he answered so it is with all the measures prescribed by the sages a man may immerse himself in forty seas of Water, but he may not immerse himself in 40 seahs less one quart of Gemara. This question was asked before Arjuna Bili. How do we know that if a man said, I take upon myself to offer 61 tents, he must bring 60 in one vessel and the one in another vessel? Arjuna Bili, the chief speaker on all occasions, opened the discussion and said, Since we find that the congregation bring on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles when it falls on a Sabbath, 61 tents, it is enough for an individual that his meal offering be less by one tenth than that of the congregation. Our Simeon said to him, But some of these 61 tents are for the bullocks and the rams, and some for the lambs, with some the mixture is thick and with some it is thin. Some are mingled in the morning and some in the evening, and they may not be mixed one with the other. Thereupon Arjuna said to him, You explained it, you replied, It is written, and every meal offering mingled with oil will dry thus the Torah. Says bring a meal offering that can be mingled in one vessel to this he objected saying can sixty be mingled in one vessel and not sixty one he replied so it is with all the measures prescribed by the sages a man may immerse himself in forty seahs of water but he may not immerse himself in forty seahs less one quart of an egg's bulk of food can convey food uncleanness but an egg's bulk of food less one sesame seed cannot convey food uncleanness a cloth that is three hand breadth square is susceptible to midras uncleanness but that which is three hand breadth square less one thread is not susceptible to midras uncleanness but what of it if they cannot be mingled have we not learned if he did not mingle it, it is valid our Zara answered wherever mingling is possible the mingling is not indispensable but wherever mingling is not possible the mingling is indispensable our said in the name of our Joshua be Levi once a mule belonging to the house of Rabbi died and the sages measured. The blood that flowed out there from to ascertain whether there was a quarter log our Isaac Bebison raised an objection from the following our Joshua and our Joshua B. But there testified that the blood of carcasses was clean moreover our
Quarter log of blood since it can congeal and amount to an olive's bulk. Mishnah one may not offer one log two or five logs, but one may offer three, four, six, or anything above six. Gemara the question was asked: Is the wine of the drink offerings indivisible or not? In what circumstances does the question arise? Where e.g. a man brought five logs of wine. If you say that the wine of the drink offerings is not indivisible, then four logs can be drawn off and offered since that is the proper quantity for a ram, and the remaining log would be for a free will offering. But if you say that it is indivisible, then these five logs may not be offered until the quantity is made up. How is it then? Abay said, Come and here there were six money chests for free will offerings. And to the question, what did they represent? The reply was given: They represented the surplus of the sin offering, the surplus of the guilt offering, the surplus of the guilt offering of the Nazi right, the surplus of the guilt. Offering of the leper, the surplus of the bird offerings, and the surplus of the sinner's meal offering. Now, if it were so, then another money chest should have been prepared for the surplus of the drink offerings, those served only for free will offerings of the community, whereas these were quite frequent, and therefore the surplus of the drink offerings of one man could be joined to that of another and could in this way be offered. Rabbis said, Come and hear homeborn. This teaches us that a man may offer wine for a drink offering. How much must he bring three logs? Whence do we know that if he desired to bring more, he may do so because the text states shall be. We might suppose that he may bring less. The text therefore states after this matter. Now, what is meant by bring more? Shall I say it means the bringing of four or six logs? But why are three logs admitted? Surely because that quantity is proper for a lamb, and similarly four and six logs are proper for a ram and a bullock. Respectively, hence it must mean the bringing of five logs, thus proving that the wine for the drink offerings is not indivisible. This indeed proves it, or as she said, but we have not learned so in our mission. For it states one may not offer one log, two or five logs, but one may offer three, four, six, or anything above six. Now here five is stated alongside with two, therefore, as two can under no circumstances be admitted for drink offerings, so five cannot be admitted at all. This does not necessarily follow, each follows its own rule. Abbe said, if you are able to prove that the wine of the drink offerings is not indivisible, then it is not indivisible, but if you prove that it is indivisible, then I am clear as to the law with regard to any number of logs up to ten, but about eleven Talmud, Mos Medicoth B, I am in doubt how am I to regard it. Shall I say that the man intended to offer the drink offerings of two bullocks, and therefore these may not be offered until this quantity has been made up or shall I rather say that he intended to bring the drink offerings of two rams and one lamb in other words the question is do we say that he meant to bring the drink offerings corresponding to two quantities of one kind and one of the other or not the question remains unsolved mission one may offer one but not oil this is the opinion of our Akibah but Artarfan says one may also offer oil Artarfan said as we find that one which is offered as an obligation may be offered as a free will offering so oil which is offered as an obligation may be offered as a free will offering our Akibah said to him no if you say so of one it is because it is offered by itself even when offered as an obligation can you say the same of oil which is not offered by itself when offered as an obligation two men may not jointly offer one tenth but they may jointly offer a burnt offering or a peace offering and a birds even a single bird Gemara Rabbah said from the opinions of both we may infer that a man may offer every day the meal offerings of the drink offerings, but is not this obvious? No, for I might have thought that in regard to the free will meal offering, the divine law has specified but five kinds of meal offerings, and no more. We are therefore taught that that is so only where the kind of the meal offering was not expressed, but where it was expressly stated, then it was so stated. Two men may not jointly offer one tenth. What is the reason? Shall I say because there is written bringeth, but with the burnt offering too there is written bringeth. But you will say that the reason this is so with the burnt offering is that there is written your burnt offerings, and with the meal offering too there is written and your meal offerings. The reason is that there is written in connection with the meal offering the word soul, and so too it was taught in a very the rabbi says it is written whosoever he be of the house of Israel that bringeth his offering, whether it be. Any of their vows or any of their free will offerings which they bring unto the Lord, thus every offering may be brought jointly, and the verse excluded only the meal offering in connection with which the expression soul is used. Our Isaac said, Why is the meal offering distinguished in that the expression soul is used therewith? Because the Holy One blessed be he said, Who is it that usually brings a meal offering? It is the poor man I account it as though he had offered his own soul to me. Our Isaac said, Why is the meal offering distinguished in that five kinds of oil dishes are stated in connection with it? This can be likened to the case of a human king for whom his friend had prepared a feast as the king knew that his friend was poor. He said to him, Prepare it for me in five kinds of dishes so that I will derive pleasure from you. Chaptertrxii mission. If a man said, I take upon myself to bring a tenth, he must bring one tenth of tenths, he must bring two tenths if he said, I Specified a certain number of tents, but I do not know what number I specified. He must bring sixty tents. If he said, I take upon myself to bring a meal offering, he may bring whichever kind he chooses. Our Judah says he must bring a meal offering of fine flour, for that is the principal meal offering. If he said a meal offering or a kind of meal offering, he must bring one of any kind of meal offerings or a kind of meal offerings. He must bring two of any one kind. If he said, I specified a certain kind, but I do not know what kind I specified. He must bring the five kinds. If he said, I specified a meal offering of a certain number of tents, but I do not know what number I specified. He must bring sixty tents. But Rabbi says he must bring meal offerings of every number of tents from one to sixty. Gemara, this is obvious. It was necessary to state the next clause of tents. He must bring two tents, but this two is obvious for the minimum of tents is two. It was necessary to. State the following clause if he said I specified a certain number of tents but I do not know what number I specified he must bring sixty tents whose view is taught here said Hezekiah it is not that of rabbi for rabbi has said he must bring meal offerings of every number of tents from one to sixty are you said you may even say that it sets forth the view of rabbi but we must assume that the man said I specified a certain number of tents but I had not determined them for one vessel in which case he must bring sixty tents in sixty vessels if he said I take upon myself to bring a meal offering he may bring whichever kind he chooses etc a tenet taught it is because holy writ stated it first in that case if a man said I take upon myself to bring a burnt offering he should have to bring a bullock since holy writ stated that Talmud Mos Medico the first end of the flock he should have to bring a lamb since holy writ stated that first end of the birds he should have to bring turtle dove since holy writ stated them first wherefore then have we learned if a man said I take upon myself to bring a burnt offering he should bring a lamb but our Eliezer B. Ezra says he may bring a turtle dove or a young pigeon and our Judah does not differ there we must therefore say that it is accounted the principal meal offering because it has no descriptive name but the Tana gave as the reason because holy writ stated it first this is what he meant to say which is the meal offering described as the principal one by virtue of the fact that it has no descriptive name it is that which holy writ stated first but this is obvious for our Judah expressly mentioned the meal offering of fine flour it is merely stated as a mnemonical sign if he said a meal offering or a kind of meal offering etc our papa raised the following question what if he said kinds of meal offering shall I say that since he said kinds he obviously meant to and the term meal offering is Generic since all meal offerings are referred to as meal offering as it is written and this is the law of the meal offering or shall I rather say that since he said meal offering he meant only one meal offering and by the expression kinds of meal offering he meant to imply of the kinds of meal offering I take upon myself to bring one meal offering come and here if he said a meal offering or a kind of meal offering he must bring one of any kind it follows however that if he said kinds of meal offering he would have to bring to read the next clause if meal offerings or a kind of meal offerings he must bring to it follows however that if he said kinds of meal offering he would have to bring only one the truth is that we cannot decide from here come and here if he said I take upon myself to bring a kind of meal offerings he must bring two meal offerings of the same kind it follows however that if he said kinds of meal offering he would only have to bring one Perhaps the inference is this if he said kinds of meal offering he must bring two meal offerings of two kinds but it has been taught otherwise if he said I take upon myself to bring a kind of meal offerings he must bring two meal offerings of the same kind but if he said I take
Simeon says on the following day he brings his guilt offering and a log of oil Talmud, Mas Menachoth be with it and says if I was a leper then this is my guilt offering and this the log of oil for it but if not let this be a free will peace offering and that guilt offering must be slaughtered on the north side its blood must be applied upon the thumb and the great toe it requires the laying on of hands and drink offerings and the waving of the breast and the thigh and it may be eaten by the males of the priesthood during that day and the following night until midnight and although the master in the tractate the slaughtering of consecrated animals has explained that our Simeon permitted a man to bring an offering and make conditions about it in the first instance only where there was no other possible way of making the man fit but in all the other cases he permitted it only where it had actually been done but not in the first instance that distinction applies only to peace. Offering since the effect of the conditions expressed is to reduce the time allowed for the eating and so consecrated food is rendered invalid before its time but in the case of meal offerings he would permit it even in the first instance our papa said to have a but according to our Simeon who said that he may bring it to half in cakes and a half in wafers he is then bringing one tenth out of two tenths and one log out of two logs he replied we have heard our Simeon express the view that if a man brought one tenth out of two tenths and one log out of two logs he has fulfilled his obligation but how does he take out the handful he takes one handful from the cakes and another from the wafers and makes the following conditions and says if I had specified a meal offering of cakes only or of wafers only then the handful I have taken from the cakes should serve the cakes and the handful I took from the wafers should serve the wafers but if I had specified originally a meal Offering the half in cakes and the half in wafers, then the handful I have taken from the cakes should serve half for the cakes and half for the wafers, and the handful I have taken from the wafers should also serve half for the wafers and half for the cakes, but surely he must take one handful from the cakes Talmud, Mas Menachoth and the wafers mixed together, whereas here he takes the handful from the cakes for the wafers and from the wafers for the cakes. We have heard our Simeon say that if, when taking the handful, there came into his hand only one of the two kinds, he has fulfilled his obligation, but what is to be done with the residue of the oil? For if he had originally specified a meal offering the half in cakes and the half in wafers, the residue of the oil would be put into the cakes, but if he had originally specified a meal offering of wafers, the residue of the oil would be consumed by the priests. The opinion of our Simeon son of Judah is followed for our Simeon son of Judah. Said in the name of our Simeon, he anoints them in the form of the Greek letter G, and the residue of the oil is consumed by the priest. Arkahana said to our Ashi, but should not the doubt include also the meal offering offered with the drink offerings? For Rabbah has said a man may offer every day the meal offerings of the drink offerings which accompany animal offerings. The doubt includes only that meal offering mnemonic individual by itself, frankincense log handful which is brought by an individual, but not that which is brought by the community. The doubt includes only that which is brought by itself, but not that which is brought to accompany the animal offering. The doubt includes only that which requires frankincense, but not that which does not require frankincense. The doubt includes only that which requires but one log of oil, but not that which requires three logs. The doubt includes only that from which the handful is taken, but not that from which the handful is not taken. If he said I specified a meal offering of a certain number of tents or rabbis taught if a man said I specified a meal offering of a certain number of tents and I determined them for one vessel but I do not know what number I specified he must bring a meal offering of 60 tents this is the opinion of the sages but rabbi says he must bring meal offerings of every number of tents from 1 to 60 that is 1830 tents if he said I specified a certain number of tents of a certain kind but I do not know what kind I specified or what number I specified he must bring the five kinds of meal offering each consisting of 60 tents that is 300 tents this is the opinion of the sages but rabbi says he must bring the five kinds of meal offering and of each kind every number of tents from 1 to 60 that is 9150 tents what is the issue between them are his said they differ as to whether or not it is permitted to bring unconsecrated food into the sanctuary. Rabbi holds that it is forbidden to bring unconsecrated food into the sanctuary. While the sages hold that it is permitted. Rabbi said all hold that it is forbidden to bring unconsecrated food into the sanctuary. But they differ as to whether or not it is permitted to mix the offering of obligation with the free will offering. The sages holding that it is permitted to mix the offering of obligation with the free will offering. While Rabbi holds that it is forbidden. Abay said to Rabbi according to the sages who hold that it is permitted to mix the offering of obligation with the free will offering. Should not two handfuls be taken therefrom? He replied first one handful is taken and then another. But he would be taking the handful from the offering of obligation for the free will offering and from the free will offering for the offering of obligation. He leaves it to the mind of the priest and says what the priest hand. Takes up the first time shall be the handful for the offering of obligation, and what it takes up the second time shall be for the free will offering. But how are the handfuls to be burnt if he burns the handful of the free will offering first? Then how may he thereafter burn the handful of the offering of obligation? Perhaps the entire meal offering was his offering of obligation. Consequently, the remainder of the meal offering has diminished between the taking of the handful and the burning. Thereof, and the master has stated that if the remainder had diminished between the taking of the handful and the burning, thereof the handful may not be burnt on behalf of it. And if he burns the handful of the offering of obligation first, then how may he thereafter burn the handful of the free will offering? Talmud, Mas Menachoth, be perhaps the entire meal offering was his offering of obligation, and any offering a portion of which had been put on the fire of the altar is subject to the prohibition. Ye shall not burn our Judah son of our Simeon because he replied it is burnt as wood in accordance with the ruling of our Eliezer for it was taught our Eliezer says it is written they shall not come up for a sweet savor on the altar thus for a sweet savor you may not bring it up but you may bring it up as wood our Ahab son of Rabbah said to our Ashi perhaps all hold that it is permitted to mix the offering of obligation with the free will offering but they differ over our Eliezer's ruling the sages accepting our Eliezer's ruling while Rabbi does not accept our Eliezer's ruling he replied if one could say that according to Rabbi it is permitted to mix the offering of obligation with the free will offering and that Rabbi does not accept our Eliezer's ruling then he could bring sixty tents in one vessel and one tent in another vessel bring the two into contact and take the handful from each Rabbah said all hold that it is permitted to mix the offering of obligation with the free will offering more overall Except our Eliezer's ruling, but they differ on the same principles as those which underlie the dispute between our Eliezer B. Jacob and the rabbis. For we have learned even a meal offering of sixty tents required sixty logs of oil. Our Eliezer B. Jacob says even a meal offering of sixty tents required but one log of oil. For it is written for a meal offering even a log of oil. The sages hold the same view as the rabbis who say that sixty logs are required for sixty tents, one log for each tent. While Rabbi holds the same view as our Eliezer B. Jacob who says that only one log is required, and therefore we do not know whether to regard the sixty tents as one meal offering for which one log is sufficient or as two meal offerings for which two logs are necessary. Our Ashi said they differ in the case of one who vowed to bring a small animal and brought a large one. The sages hold that one who vowed to bring a small animal and brought a large one has fulfilled his obligation. While Rabbi holds. That he has not fulfilled his obligation, but they have already differed in this matter. For we have learned if he said a small animal and he brought a large one, he has fulfilled his obligation. But Rabbi says he has not fulfilled his obligation. Both disputes were necessary. For if the dispute had only been stated here, I should have said that only here do the sages say that by bringing a larger offering he has fulfilled his obligation. Since in either case only one handful is offered, but in the other case, since there are more sacrificial portions in a larger animal, I might say that they agree with Rabbi that he has not thereby fulfilled his obligation. And if the dispute had only been stated there, I should have said that only there does Rabbi say that he has not fulfilled his obligation. Since there are more sacrificial portions, but in this case I might say that he agrees with the sages. Therefore both disputes were necessary. Nemotic with gold wine burnt offering. Thank. Offering ox mission. If a man said I take upon myself to offer pieces of wood, he must bring not less than two logs of frankincense. He must bring not less than a handful. The handful is specified in five cases. If a man said I take upon myself to bring frankincense, he must bring not less than a handful. If he offered
Therefrom is handful of the fine flour of the meal offering and of the oil thereof and all the frankincense. The frankincense is thus compared with the taking up of the meal offering as the taking up of the meal offering was a handful. So the frankincense must consist of a handful. Our rabbis taught if a man said I take upon myself to bring an offering for the altar he must bring frankincense for nothing is offered entirely upon the altar but frankincense if he said I specified an offering. For the altar but I do not know what it was I specified he must bring of everything that is offered entirely upon the altar is there nothing else but what about the burnt offering there is a skin thereof which belongs to the priests and what about the burnt offering of a bird there are talmud, moss go the crop and the feathers and what about the drink offerings they flow down into the pits and what about the meal offering that is offered with the drink offering since there is the ordinary meal offering which is eaten by the priest it is therefore not definite if a man said I take upon myself to offer gold he must bring not less than a golden dinar perhaps he meant a bar of gold our Eliezer said we must suppose that he said gold coin perhaps he meant small gold coins our Papa said small gold coin is not usually made of silver he must bring not less than a silver dinar perhaps he meant a bar of silver our Eliezer said we must suppose that he said silver coin and perhaps he meant small silver coin our Sheesh said it must be that in this place small silver coin was not current if copper he must bring not less than the value of a silver mile it was taught our Eliezer B. Jacob said he must bring not less than a small copper hook what is it fit for Abbe said with it one could trim the wicks and cleanse the lamps of iron it was taught others say he must bring not less than a scarecrow and how much is that our Joseph said one cubit square sum Reported thus he must bring not less than one cubit square what is it fit for our Joseph said for a scarecrow mission if a man said I take upon myself to offer one he must bring not less than three log of oil he must bring not less than one log but rabbi says not less than three logs if he said I specified how much I would offer but I do not know what quantity I specified he must bring that quantity which is the most that is brought on any one day tomorrow our rabbis taught homeborn this teaches us that a man may offer one as a free will offering how much must he bring three logs whence do we know that if he desired to bring more he may do so because the text states shall be we might suppose that he may bring less the text therefore states after this matter if well he must bring not less than one log but rabbi says not less than three logs on what principle do they differ the scholars suggested to our papa they differ as to whether we say deduce from it and again from it or deduce from it and establish it in its own place the rabbis are of the opinion that we say deduce from it and again from it thus deduce from it as one may offer a meal offering as a free will offering so one may offer oil and again from it as a meal offering needs but one log of oil so the offering of oil needs but one log rabbi however is of the opinion that we say deduce from it and establish it in its own place thus as one may offer a meal offering as a free will offering so one may offer oil as a free will offering and establish it in its own place it shall be like the drink offerings of one as the drink offerings of one require three logs so the offering of oil requires three logs thereupon our papa said to them if rabbi derived it from the meal offering he would certainly have said that the minimum quantity was one log for all are of the opinion that we say deduce from it and again from it the fact is however that rabbi derived it from the expression homeborn are who not son of our Nathan said to our Papa how can you say so behold it has been taught offering this teaches us that a man may offer oil as a free will offering and how much must he bring three logs now whom have you heard say three logs it is only rabbi and yet he derives it from the expression offering he replied if it was taught it was taught if he said I specified how much I would offer but I do not know what quantity I specified he must bring that quantity which is the most that is brought on any one day a tanna taught like the first day of the feast of tabernacles when it falls on a sabbath mission if a man said I take upon myself to offer a burnt offering he must bring a lamb or Eliezer B. Ezra said he may bring a turtle dove or a young pigeon if he said I specified a beast of a herd but I do not know what it was I specified he must bring a bull and a bull calf if he said I specified a beast of a cattle but I do not know what it was I specified he must bring a Bull a bull calf a ram a he go a he kid and a he lamb if he said I specified some kind but I do not know what it was I specified Talmud, Moss Manikoth be he must add to these a turtle dove and a young pigeon if a man said I take upon myself to offer a thank offering or a peace offering he must bring a lamb if he said I specified a beast of the herd but I do not know what it was I specified he must bring a bull and a cow a bull calf and a heifer if he said I specified a beast of it cattle but I do not know what it was I specified he must bring a bull and a cow a bull calf and a heifer a ram and a you a he go and a she go a he kid and a she kid a he lamb and a you lamb if a man said I take upon myself to offer an ox he must bring one with its drink offerings to the value of a main if a calf he must bring one with its drink offerings to the value of five sellers if a ram he must bring one with its drink offerings to the value of two sellers if a lamb he must bring one with its drink offerings to the value of one seller if he said an ox valued at one mana he must bring one worth a mana apart from its drink offerings if a calf valued at five sellers he must bring one worth five sellers apart from its drink offerings if a ram valued at two sellers he must bring one worth two sellers apart from its drink offerings and if a lamb valued at one seller he must bring one worth one seller apart from its drink offerings if he said I take upon myself to offer an ox valued at a mana and he brought two together worth a mana he has not fulfilled his obligation even if one was worth a mana less one dinar and the other also was worth a mana less one dinar if he said a black one and he brought a white one or a white one and he brought a black one or a large one and he brought a small one he has not fulfilled his obligation if he said a small one and he brought a large one he has fulfilled his obligation but rabbi says he has not fulfilled his obligation tomorrow. They do not differ for each rules according to the custom of his place. Our rabbis taught if a man said I take upon myself to offer a burnt offering valued at a cellar for the altar, he must bring a lamb for there is nothing else valued at a cellar offered upon the altar save a lamb. If he said I specified an offering valued at a cellar, but I do not know what it was I specified, he must bring every kind of offering valued at a cellar that is offered upon the altar. If he said I specified a beast of a herd, but I do not know what it was I specified, he must bring a bull and a bull calf, but why let him bring a bull for in any event that should fulfill his obligation? This represents rabbi's view who maintains that if a man offered to bring a small animal and he brought a large one, he has not fulfilled his obligation. If it is rabbi's view here, then read the following clauses. If he said I take upon myself to offer an ox valued at a mana and he brought two together worth a mana, he has not fulfilled his obligation even if one was worth a mana less one dinar and the other also was worth a mana less one dinar if he said a black one and he brought a white one or a white one and he brought a black one or a large one and he brought a small one he has not fulfilled his obligation if he said a small one and he brought a large one he has fulfilled his obligation but rabbi says he has not fulfilled his obligation it will then be that the first and last clauses represent rabbis view while the middle clauses represent the view of the rabbis that is so the first and last clauses represent rabbis view while the middle clauses represent the view of the rabbis and the tana of the mission wish to tell us that this ruling in the first part of the mission is really a matter of dispute between rabbi and the rabbis we have learned elsewhere there were six money chests for free will offerings what did they represent Nimon, K, and Z, P, S, H, A, Hezekiah said they represented it. Six priestly groups and the sages installed six money chests so that they should be at peace with each other. Our Yohanan said because of the abundant offerings the sages installed six money chests so that the money became not moldy. Z-E-I-R-I said they served for the offerings of a bull, a calf, a ram, a lamb, a kid, and a goat. This being in accord with Rabbi who said that if a man offered to bring a small animal and he brought a large one he has not fulfilled his obligation. Barpata said they served for the monies of bullocks, rams, Talmud, Moss, Manico, the lambs, goats, surplus monies, and the Maya. They all do not agree with Hezekiah's answer because there is no reason to apprehend any strife since each priestly group served on its own day. Neither do they agree with our Yohanan's answer because there is no fear of the money becoming moldy. Nor do they agree with Z-E-I-R-I's answer because they do not wish to interpret it in accordance with the view of an individual. Nor do they agree with. Barpat's answer for why have a separate chest for surplus monies were not all the other money surplus monies moreover the Maya chest
Offerings and the surplus of the meal offering was left to Rod. What does this mean? Arhis Das said it means this the surplus of the sinner's meal offering was for free will offerings and the surplus of the tenth of an ephah of the high priest's meal offering was left to Rod. Rabbi said even the surplus of the tenth of an ephah of the high priest's meal offering was for free will offerings, but the berry that teaches that the surplus of the cakes of the thank offering was left to Rod. There is also the following dispute on the matter as for the surplus of the tenth of an ephah of the high priest's meal offering. Our Yohanan said it was to go for free will offerings. Our Eliezer said it was to be left to Rod. An objection was raised. We have learned the surplus of money set aside for shekels is free for common use, but the surplus of money set aside for the tenth of an ephah and the surplus of money set aside for the bird offerings of men who had an issue for the bird offerings of women who had an issue for the bird offerings of women after childbirth or for sin offerings or guilt offerings their surplus is for free will offerings this refers does it not to the surplus of the tenth of an ephah of the high priest's meal offering no it refers to the surplus of the sinner's meal offering our nom and br isaac said the most reasonable view is that of him who holds that the surplus of the tenth of an ephah of the high priest's meal offering was left to rot for it was taught it is written he shall put no oil upon it neither shall he put any frankincense thereon for it is a sin offering our judah said it is called a sin offering but no other is called a sin offering this teaches us that the tenth of an ephah of the high priest's meal offering is not called a sin offering and that it requires frankincense now since it is not called a sin offering the surplus thereof must be left to rot mishnah if a man said this ox shall be a burnt offering and it suffered a blemish he may if he so desires bring two with the price thereof. If he said these two oxen shall be a burnt offering and they suffered a blemish, he may if he so desires bring one ox with the price thereof. But Rabbi forbids it. If he said this ram shall be a burnt offering and it suffered a blemish, he may if he so desires bring a lamb with the price thereof. If he said this lamb shall be a burnt offering and it suffered a blemish, he may if he so desires bring a ram with the price thereof. But Rabbi forbids it. Talmud, Mas Menachot be Gemara. But have you not stated in the earlier mission if a man said I take upon myself to offer an ox valued at a mina and he brought two together worth a mina he has not fulfilled his obligation. It is different here where he said this ox and it suffered a blemish. If he said these two oxen shall be a burnt offering and they suffered a blemish, he may if he so desires bring one ox with the price thereof. But Rabbi forbids it. Because it is like the case where. He bowed a large animal and he brought a small one for even though they have suffered a blemish rabbi does not permit it in the first instance should he not then differ in the first case too rabbi indeed disagrees with the whole teaching but he waited until the rabbis had stated their view in full and then expressed his dissent this can also be proved for the Mishnah states if he said this ram shall be a burnt offering and it suffered a blemish he may if he so desires bring a lamb with it. Price thereof if he said this lamb shall be a burnt offering and it suffered a blemish he may if he so desires bring a ram with the price thereof but rabbi forbids it this proves that the question was raised what is the rule where a different kind is brought for the original kind come and here if a man said this ox shall be a burnt offering and it suffered a blemish he may not bring a ram with the price thereof but he may bring two rams with the price thereof but rabbi forbids it for one may. Not mix them this proves it but if that is the case why two rams they should also permit him to bring one since according to the view of the rabbis where the original offering suffered a blemish it makes no difference whether a large or a small animal is brought with the price thereof two tanaim differ as to the view of the rabbis rabbi forbids it for one may not mix them now the reason for rabbis view is that one may not mix them but if one were allowed to mix them it would be permitted but we have learned if he said this ram shall be a burnt offering and it suffered a blemish he may if he so desires bring a lamb with the price thereof if he said this lamb shall be a burnt offering and it suffered a blemish he may if he so desires bring a ram with the price thereof but rabbi forbids it two tanaim differ as to the view of rabbis for unblemished animals if a man bowed a calf and he brought a bullock or a lamb and he brought a ram he has fulfilled his Obligation this is an anonymous teaching in accord with the view of the rabbis he may if he so desires bring to with the price thereof etc. Our mission of easy but said in the name of rab this rule applies only where the man said this ox shall be a burnt offering but if he said I take upon myself that this ox shall be a burnt offering there is a definite obligation perhaps he only meant I take upon myself to bring this ox the fact is that if such a statement was at all made it was made in these terms our mission of easy but said in the name of rab this rule applies only where the man said this ox shall be a burnt offering or where he said I take upon myself that this ox shall be a burnt offering but if he said I take upon myself that this ox or its value shall be a burnt offering there is a definite obligation mission if a man said one of my lambs shall be holy or one of my oxen shall be holy and he had two only the larger one is holy if he had three the middle one is holy if he said I Specified one, but I do not know which it was I specified, or if he said my father told me that he had specified one, but I do not know which it is the largest one among them must be holy Gamara. The larger one is holy. We thus see that he that sanctifies sanctifies in a liberal spirit. Now turn to the next clause. The middle one is holy, which shows that he that sanctifies sanctifies in a liberal spirit. Samuel said it means that we must take into account the possibility of the middle one. Also being holy for that shows a liberal spirit as compared with the smallest. What then should this man do? Hi said he must wait until the middle one suffers a blemish and then transfer its sanctity to the largest one. Arnaman said in the name of Rabbi Abu this applies only where a man said one of my oxen shall be holy, but if he said an ox among my oxen shall be holy, then the largest among them is holy, for he meant thereby the finest ox among my oxen, but surely this is not. Right for Arhunabi Hai said in the name of Ola if a man said to his fellow I sell you a house among my houses he may show him an attic Alaya is it not because this expression implies the worst no Alaya means the finest of his houses an objection was raised if a man said an ox among my oxen shall be holy and so too if an ox belonging to the sanctuary was confused with other unconsecrated oxen the largest one among them must be holy and all the others must be sold to be used for burnt offerings but the price thereof is free for common use this refers only to the case where an ox belonging to the sanctuary was confused with others but it says here and so too that refers only to the ruling that the largest one must be holy a further objection was raised if a man said I sell you a house among my houses and one of his houses fell down he may show him the fallen house or if he said I sell you a slave among my slaves and one of his slaves died he may show him it. Dead slave Talmud, Mas Menachotha, but why let us rather see which house it was that fell down or which slave it was that died you are speaking are you not of a purchaser but it is quite a different matter in the case of a purchaser for the holder of a deed is always at a disadvantage and now that you have arrived at this answer you may even say that Aliyah means the attic and the worst room was meant for the reason that the holder of a deed is always at a disadvantage Mishnah Eve. Man said I take upon myself to offer a burnt offering he must offer it in the temple and if he offered it in the temple of Onias he has not fulfilled his obligation if he said I take upon myself to offer a burnt offering but I will offer it in the temple of Onias he must offer it in the temple yet if he offered it in the temple of Onias he has fulfilled his obligation our Simeon says such is no burnt offering if a man said I will be a Nazi right he must bring his offerings in the temple and if he brought them in the temple of Onias, he has not fulfilled his obligation. If he said, I will be a Nazi right, but I will bring my offerings in the temple of Onias, he must bring them in the temple. Yet if he brought them in the temple of Onias, he has fulfilled his obligation. Our Simeon says such a one is not a Nazi right. Yet if he offered it in the temple of Onias, he has fulfilled his obligation, but he has only killed the offering and not sacrificed it. Our Hamnon answered, It is regarded as. Though he said, I take upon myself to offer a burnt offering on the condition that I shall not be held responsible for it, whereupon Rabbah said to him, In that case, will you also say the same of the final clause which reads, If he said, I will be a Nazi right, but I will bring my offerings in the temple of Onias, he must bring them in the temple. Yet if he brought them in the temple of Onias, he has fulfilled his obligation, namely that it is regarded as though he said, I will be a Nazi right on it. Condition that I shall not be held responsible for the offerings, but surely a Nazi right is not released
Jerusalem, and needless to say, this is so a priest who ministered to another matter, for it is written, Nevertheless, the priest of the high places came not up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they did eat unleavened bread among their brethren, thus they are like those that had a blemish, they are entitled to share and eat of the holy things, but they are not permitted to offer sacrifices. Gemara Rab Judah said, If a priest had slaughtered an animal to an idol, his offering in the temple is a sweet savor. Our Isaac B. of Dimi said, Where is their scriptural proof for this? It is written, Because they ministered unto them before their idols and became a stumbling block of iniquity unto the house of Israel. Therefore have I lifted up my hand against them, saith the Lord God, and they shall bear their iniquity, and immediately afterwards it is written, And they shall not come near unto me to minister unto me in the priest's office, thus only if they perform service unto idols are they. Disqualified, but slaughtering is no service. It was stated if a priest had inadvertently sprinkled blood to an idol, our Naaman says his offering in the temple is a sweet savor, but Arshis hate says his offering is not a sweet savor. Arshis hate said, Whence do I derive my view? It is written and became a stumbling block of iniquity unto the house of Israel. Now this surely means either through stumbling or through iniquity, and stumbling block signifies an inadvertent act and iniquity a deliberate act. Our Naaman, however, says it means a stumbling block of iniquity. Our Naaman said, Whence do I derive my view from the following Beritha which was taught? It is written and the priest shall make atonement for the soul that earth when he sinneth in error. This teaches us that the priest may make atonement for himself by his own sacrifice. Now, how did he minister unto the idol? Will you say by slaughtering before it? Then why does the verse speak of sinning in error? It is the same even though he sinned. Deliberately, it can only be that he ministered unto the idol by sprinkling before it. Arshis hate, however, can say, I still say by slaughtering before it, but it is not the same if he did so deliberately, for he then became a priest to the idol. They have indeed followed up these principles of theirs, for it has been stated if a priest had deliberately slaughtered an animal to an idol, Arnaman said his offering in the temple is a sweet savor, but Arshis hate said his offering is not a sweet savor. Arnaman said his offering is a sweet savor, for he had not performed a service before the idol. Arshis hate said his offering is not a sweet savor. Talmud, Mosmenikoth, before he had become a priest to idols, Arnaman said, Whence do I derive my view from the following which was taught if a priest ministered before idols and repented, his offering is a sweet savor. In what circumstances did he minister? Will you say inadvertently, then what is the point of and repented? He has always been. Repentant it must obviously be that he ministered deliberately and further it by sprinkling and even though he repented it avails not for he had performed a service before the idol it can only be by slaughtering before it or she's hate however will say I still maintain that he ministered inadvertently and the very means to say as follows if he had always been repentant that is to say when he ministered before the idol he ministered inadvertently his offering in the temple is a sweet savor otherwise his offering is not a sweet savor if a priest had prostrate himself before an idol or nomin said his offering in the temple is a sweet savor and our she's hate said his offering is not a sweet savor if he had acknowledged an idol or nomin said his offering in the temple is a sweet savor and our she's hate said his offering is not a sweet savor now all these disputes had to be stated for if only the first had been stated I would have said that only there did our she's hate Say that his offering was not a sweet savor since he had performed a service before the idol, but where he had slaughtered before the idol, since that was no service, I would have said that he agreed with Arnaman, hence the latter dispute had to be stated. And if the dispute regarding slaughtering had only been stated, I would have said that only there did Arshis hate say that his offering was not a sweet savor since he had performed some service before the idol, but not where he had prostrate himself before the idol, for that was no service, hence the latter had to be stated. And if the dispute regarding prostrating before the idol had only been stated, I would have said that only there did Arshis hate say that his offering was not a sweet savor since he had done some act before the idol, but not where he had merely acknowledged the idol, for that was a mere matter of words, therefore all had to be stated. Needless to say, this is so a priest who ministered to another. Matter since it says here needless to say this is so a priest who ministered to another matter it follows that the temple of Onias was not an idolatrous shrine or Tana thus concurs with the view of him who said that the temple of Onias was not an idolatrous shrine for it was taught in the year in which Simeon had just died he foretold them that he would die they said to him once do you know it he replied every day of atonement there met me an old man dressed in white and wrapped in white who entered with me into the holy of holies and left with me but this year there met me an old man dressed in black and wrapped in black who entered with me but did not leave with me after the festival of tabernacles he was ill for seven days and then died thereafter his brethren the priests forbore to pronounce the name in the priestly benediction in the hour of his departure from this life he said to them my son Onias shall assume the office of high priest after me his brother Shimai, who was two years and a half older than he was jealous of him and said to him come and I will teach you the order of the temple service he thereupon put upon him a gown girded him with a girdle placed him near the altar and said to his brethren the priests see what this man promised his beloved and has now fulfilled on the day in which I will assume the office of high priest I will put on your gown and gird myself with your girdle at this his brethren the priests sought to kill him he fled from them but they pursued him he then went to Alexandria in Egypt built an altar there and offered their own sacrifices in honor of idols when the sages heard of this they said if this is what happened through the jealousy of one who had never assumed the honor what would happen through the jealousy of one who had once assumed the honor and had been ousted from it this is the view of the events according to our Meir Arjuna said to him that was not what happened but the fact was that Onias did not accept the office of high priest because his brother Shimai was two years and a half older than he for all that Onias was jealous of his brother Shimai and he said to him come and I will teach you the order of the temple service he thereupon put on him a gown girded him with a girdle placed him near the altar and said to his brethren the priest see what this man promised his beloved and has now fulfilled on the day that I will assume the office of high priest I will put on your gown and gird myself with your girdle at this his brethren the priest sought to kill him but he explained to them all that occurred they thereupon sought to kill Onias he fled from them but they pursued him he fled to the king's palace but they pursued him there and whoever saw him cried out there he is there he is he thereupon went to Alexandria and Egypt built an altar there and offered their own sacrifices in honor of God for so it is written in that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord when the sages heard of this they said if this is what happened through the jealousy of one who had at first shunned the honor what would happen through the jealousy of one who seeks the honor it was taught our Joshua be prayed said at first whoever were to say to me take up the honor I would bind him and put him in front of a lion but now whoever were to say to me give up the honor I would pour over him a kettle of boiling water for we see that Saul at first shunned the throne but after he had taken it he sought to kill David Markashish son of Arhisda said to Abbe how does our Meir interpret that verse it is by Arjuna as in the following Barry which was taught after the downfall of Sennacherib Hezekiah went out and found princes sitting in their golden carriages he adjured them not to serve idols as it is written in that day there shall be five cities in the land of Egypt. That speak the language of Canaan Talmud, Mosmenico they and swear to the Lord of hosts thereupon they went to Alexandria and Egypt built an altar there and offered their own sacrifices in honor of God as it is written in that day there shall be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt one shall be called the city of Harris what is meant by the city of Harris as our Joseph rendered it in Aramaic the city of Beth Shemesh, the sun which is destined to destruction will be said to be one of them but once do we know that Harris signifies the sun for it is written who commanded the sun Harris and it rises not bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth bring my sons from far Arhuna said these are the exiles in Babylon who are at ease like sons and my daughters from the ends of the earth these are the exiles in other lands who are not at ease like daughters are Abu Bar Isaac said in the name of Arhista others say Rab Judah said in the name of Rab from Tyre to Carthage the nations know Israel and their father who is in heaven but from Tyre westwards and from Carthage eastwards the nations know neither Israel nor their father who is in heaven are Shimei Behai raised the following objection against Rab is it not written for from the rising of the sun even unto the going down of the same my name is great among
Offering a sin offering and a guilt offering Rabbah asked why then does the verse say for the burnt offering for the meal offering it should have said a burnt offering a meal offering rather said Rabbah it means that whosoever occupies himself with the study of the Torah needs neither burnt offering nor meal offering nor sin offering nor guilt offering our Isaac said what is the significance of the verses this is the law of the sin offering and this is the law of the guilt offering they teach that whosoever occupies himself with the study of the laws of the sin offering is as though he were offering a sin offering and whosoever occupies himself with the study of the laws of the guilt offering is as though he were offering a guilt offering Mishnah it is said of the burnt offerings of cattle an offering made by fire of a sweet savor and of the burnt offerings of birds an offering made by fire of a sweet savor and of the meal offering an offering made by fire of a sweet savor to teach you that it is the same whether a man offers much or little so long as he directs his heart to heaven. Gemara Arzara said, Where do we find a scriptural reference to this in the verse? Sweet is the sleep of a laboring man, whether he eat little or much. Our Abbi Ahabah said in the following verse, When goods increase, they are increased that eat them, and what advantage is there to the owner thereof, saving the beholding of them with his eyes? It was taught our Simeon Bza said, Come and see what is written in the chapter of the sacrifices. Neither El nor Elohim is found there, but only the Lord so as not to give sectarians any occasion to rebel. Furthermore, it is said of a large oxen offering made by fire of a sweet savor of a small bird, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor, and of a meal offering, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor to teach you that it is the same whether a man offers much or little so long as he directs his heart to heaven, unless you say he needs it for. Food the text therefore states if I were hungry I would not tell thee for the world is mine and the fullness thereof and it also says for every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle upon a thousand hills I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats I did not bid you to sacrifice so that you should say I will do his will that he may do my will you do not sacrifice for my sake but for your own sake as it is written ye shall sacrifice it at your will another interpretation is ye shall sacrifice it at your will sacrifice it of your own free will sacrifice it with the proper intention as Samuel once inquired of Arhuna once do we know that the offering is invalid if the act of slaughtering was performed incidentally he replied because it is written and he shall slaughter the bullock thus teaching that the slaughtering should be intended for the bullock said the other this we already know but once do we know that this rule is indispensable he replied because it is written ye shall sacrifice it at your will that is to say sacrifice it with the proper intention